Cloud computing is a domain that is worth over $350 billion and is expected to double this number within the next few years. Now, it is a very powerful domain that is adding immense amounts of value to our daily lives. Be it social media, emails, or even backing up your photos, you use this world of cloud computing in one way or another. When it comes to enterprise grade, this domain offers the fastest storage methodologies and compute power that is available throughout the world. Now guys, with the COVID-19 pandemic, you can see this important paradigm shift that is leading thousands and thousands of companies and of course millions of developers to look towards the cloud. This is causing a huge spike in the requirement for proficient cloud practitioners. And now keeping all of this in mind, we here at Great Learning have come up with this full course on cloud computing with an aim to help you get started with the domain and align your learning with what is required in the industry today. Make sure to watch this full course as we're covering everything from the basics all the way to using AWS, Azure and even GCP as well. Now, before we get started, I want to introduce you to Great Learning Academy. This is a free initiative by Great Learning where you get access to over 200 plus courses with 1000 plus hours of free content on all of the trending high demand domains that we have, be it uh, data science, machine learning, artificial intelligence, programming, cloud computing, digital marketing, DevOps, management, and a lot more absolutely free. Now we have have award-winning academicians and leading industry experts who design all of these courses. And the best part, you can also get a free certificate of completion when you enroll and complete all of these free courses. You will, of course, get access to all the presentations, be it the code notebooks, data sets, and the quizzes as well. So as of now, we have courses in English and Hindi. You can use these multilingual approach to make sure that you have the best learning experience possible in the language that you are comfortable with. So make sure you check out the description box of this video to get access to all of the relevant courses on Great Learning Academy. So what are you waiting for? Register now and start your learning journey today. If you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, I want to request you to hit the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell. This is done to make sure you do not miss out on any of the new updates or video releases from Great Learning. And of course, guys, if you enjoy this video, show us some love and do like this video. Knowledge increases by sharing, right? So make sure you share this video with your friends, colleague, and everyone who can make use of it. And at the end of it, make sure to comment on the video if you have any queries or any suggestions and I'll be more than happy to respond to all of your comments. So guys, welcome to this cloud computing full course. Here's a quick look at the agenda of all the modules that we're going to be taking a look at, right? We'll begin first module by understanding everything there is to know about cloud computing. We're going to take a very slow and a steady approach to make sure that even if you guys are complete beginners, absolute beginners, right? You can get the complete knowledge out of it. After which module two will be talking about how you can go on to understand the domain better, the current requirements in the domain, the trends and a lot of interesting things. After which module number three talks about diving right into the heart of content where we're going to be taking a look at uh, you know the working of cloud computing domain itself. There's a lot of important things that you guys have to know in module number three. And with that, we're going to be moving to module number four. In module number four, we're going to be taking a look at the various cloud computing providers out there. Right now, you might already know AWS, you might know Azure, you might know GCP and a lot of other guys. So we're going to be uh, discussing about them in, in detail for you you to understand the current trends after which we're going to be taking a look at the certifications that are provided now guys in the domain of cloud computing you really have to understand that uh, you know certifications are a really big thing and companies who are hiring for jobs are the ones who are looking for certifications almost to a level of uh, compulsion right so if you're applying for a really well paying job they're going to say you have to be a cloud solutions architect so to get that get to that point you're going to have to have certification so it's very important that you 
concentrate uh, you know with with respect to the certifications part of it and after that we're going to be diving right into the top three platforms aws azure and gcp with respect to module uh, you know six seven and eight there will be a good amount of theoretical knowledge with respect to aws we're going to be taking a look at uh, compute services storage services uh, networking services and a bit of other core uh, services as well uh, you know all of this theoretical learning is always uh, uh, you know it will always add a good amount of value if you have the practical knowledge that is why guys uh, you know these last couple of modules we're going to be taking a complete hands-on approach where we're going to be understanding everything there is to know about the interface itself be it aws azure or gcp and then we're going to be doing small projects we're going to be picking up demos and we're making sure that at the end of this full course that you guys have uh, you know a good amount of knowledge about the entire domain of cloud computing right so guys on that note let us get started with module number one which is introduction to cloud computing now it becomes very very important that you guys understand the importance of cloud computing itself but then to get to that point you need to know what the domain is right so uh, module one is completely dedicated for you to understand about the domain so firstly we're going to start out by checking out what cloud computing is now once you understand what it is you will need to know uh, you know things about why it is considered to be the future you know all the popular applications that surround this world uh, you know what's new in the particular domain how do you go about learning cloud computing what are the top companies uh, you know that use cloud computing and all of that and of course at the end of it i'm going to be giving you the details about uh, you know all the important things that you guys should know about if you're having a career or if you're looking forward to having a career in cloud computing right guys perfect i hope all of you all are as excited as me to begin module number one perfect coming to the first item of the agenda we're going to start out by taking a look at what cloud computing is now ladies and gentlemen when you talk about the world of cloud computing it becomes very important that you understand that cloud computing uh, went from being a term which only researchers knew all the way to you yourself using cloud computing at this very second you're watching this video right so what is it well uh, to talk about the textbook definition of what cloud computing is, I think it's very important for us to understand that it is a very simple delivery of services through using uh, the platform of internet. Now to reiterate on what I just said, it becomes important that you understand that, uh, you know, whatever is that uh, you know, is a thing that you can do offline. These days, there's a very common saying that says you can do it online as well. So whenever someone says stuff like, uh, you know, you can do things online, right? Think about a favorite example. Maybe you want to uh, back up all of your pictures to Google Photos, right? So maybe something might happen to your phone. Uh, you just want the photos to be there, very important memories and all of that. So you back it up somewhere. Now, where is this data going when you're backing it up, right? So Google is giving you a service which says, hey, you can use Google Photos photos to just push all your photos there it's going to be safe uh, and uh, you know no matter what happens to your phone mobile or laptop or something your data is going to be on the google cloud platform or on the google cloud server right see cloud server google cloud platform we're already talking in terms about uh, cloud computing right perfect that's one example now the second simple example that you might have heard the id team in your office talk about is hey let's back all of this data up into a server or something like that so when they say let's back up this data into a server or let's say uh, you know when they go on to clear things and they say hey okay so we need space in our actual server so let's move all the data that we have to a backup server so when they say they are backing up something, it means whatever that they're trying to back up is important, of course. The second thing is that are they backing up this data to a storage entity that's present in the office or what we call as an on-premise network or what it's also called as cloud computing where, uh, you know, your data is not physically present on a hard drive in the office, but it can be present in one of the data centers, which could be like right next door or it can be halfway around the world as well, right? So when they're backing it up to an online server, things like this happen and that's a wonderful thing right when you think about it now to talk about the third thing the third thing talks about the fantastic approach that uh, you know is a new trend uh, in the world of cloud computing today 
I'll give you a very simple example. When you have to think about executing, let's say, Python code, right? Python is a programming language. When you have to execute its code, uh, you, you're going to have to install Python. You're going to download it, install it, configure it. Uh, maybe on top of Python, you're going to have to require a user interface. So you're going to download something like PyCharm or anything, right? So to make sure that your coding experience is easy and all that. All of this process that I just mentioned takes time. But now what, uh, uh, you know, the world of cloud computing brings us, for example, with Google Collab, that is C-O-L-A-B Collab, uh, what they're trying to do is they're trying to give you a Python Jupyter Notebook ready for you to just type in your code, hit the play button and you're done. You don't have to download anything. You don't have to configure anything uh, locally. Uh, you can use it on your phone, on your tablet, on your laptop, on wherever you can open a web browser, you can go on to write Python code, uh, you know, so you might have a question now that says, hey, okay, so where is the processing power coming from for all this Python code to execute? All the processing power, all the storage, all the data elements, you know, everything that is required to run Python in this particular instance is coming from the Google Cloud Platform, right? Google Collab. Uh, it's a fantastic uh, Python Jupyter Notebook that I see myself using a lot, right? So guys, these are some of the really nice examples of cloud computing. Now, when we discuss popular applications, again, we're going to look at a lot more of these things. And I'm sure uh, we can pick up, you know, three or four things that is literally around us, uh, you know, that we can talk and bring towards the domain of cloud computing as well, right? Right? Perfect. Now uh, to talk about the second important thing about, uh, you know, cloud computing is why do we even require cloud computing guys? The first reason uh, that I can think of uh, is probably, uh, you know, the ability where you can uh, move an entire organization and, uh, you know, just say, hey, uh, you know, you're an organization, let's say you're a hundred people, uh, you know, you're a hundred people organization, you want to move all the data that you have uh, into a server or a cloud computing platform. Well, it is easy as probably three or four mouse clicks. How simple is that, right? All the data that you have drag and drop and it's going to be on a cloud computing platform. I mean, it's not as easy as that uh, to move an entire organization, but it is simplified. People sort of realize for so many reasons uh, that having a server in your office or what is also called as an on-premise network will make it very difficult in multiple regards. Let me talk to you about one very important thing. For all of you all who are uh, watching this on a laptop or watching this on a computer, you might know that your electronics heat up a lot and heat kills electronics, right? So in this particular case, if you have a very, very powerful server that can cater to thousands of people, it demands cooling. It is not like cooling is an option there. It, it demands it. If you don't cool it, it's going to, uh, it's going to shut off because, uh, you know, it, it literally fry that that's how hot things can get. Now, when that is the case, you have to make sure that at no point in time does your cooling equipment fail because if they do, your servers fail. If your servers fail, your data fails, your application fails, your website fails, whatever that you're trying to do, right? You get the point. Now, that's an important thing. The second thing is when you have an on-premise network, you have to make sure that you have people to maintain it right now. Having a server, buying a server is a simple thing. Just put your credit card out, buy a server, bring it to your office, keep it there. Who's going to configure it? Who's going to maintain it? Who's going to take a look at how it works? Who's going to integrate it into the uh, uh, you know already existing data? Who's going to create backups of that? Now you're going to need a guy. You're going to need a uh, when I say a guy, of course, a person uh, here who has the capability to do all of this, right? So that's a very important thing that you have to think about. All of the things that we're talking about adds an immense amount of cost to the company. But with cloud computing, you will not require any hardware. You can run your entire company if you have a good enough internet connection and probably a laptop or a computer. So everyone connects to a common platform and everyone uses the storage of that platform, the compute power of that platform. And I think this is the primary reason, uh, you know, why cloud computing is popular. So we've covered the first point. Now to talk about the second point is yes, whenever you take a look at data storage and powerful processing, uh, the amount of flexibility that you get is fantastic, right? Let's be very honest here. Uh, your laptop or your computer probably has 500 gigabytes, one terabyte, two terabyte, three terabytes of hardware space. And you know, uh, how expensive it can get uh, to replace, uh, uh, to buy another hard hard disk, right? So as of what I was checking, an external hard disk, a two terabyte hard disk retails for somewhere around five or 6,000 Indian rupees. That is pretty expensive considering if you're an organization, you can probably fill up two TB like this 
right? That's a fantastic thing that you have to think about knowing that you'll have to spend so much money uh, for it as well. Now, you and me, we're going to take probably a couple of months or years to fill four or five terabytes. But then, hey, you never know, right? It, it, it gets, especially in a working environment, terabytes just, just goes. You, you will not know. So that's an important thing. Paying for all of that, maintaining all of that. Again, hard disks are prone to fail, right? They keep, they keep going. Now, I have a hard disk which is sitting, which doesn't work anymore. It has fantastic data, very important data that I want two terabytes worth of it and I'm trying to re recover it, right? So if this happens to your official data, well, guys, you know, you already know it, right? So having the having less headache, uh, you know, where a company itself is maintaining all of this for you is the best way to go. Companies realized this. Companies who are worth millions, billions and trillions of dollars realize that this is when it comes to even these tiny things, cloud computing platform is winning people's hearts, right? Perfect. The third thing is the wide variety of services that are offered. Now, when you're talking about the big guys, uh, Amazon Web Services, uh, Google Cloud Platform, Microsoft Azure, all of these big guys are providing so many services on their platforms, right? These are the top three cloud computing uh, platforms out there right now. Uh, you know, when you're talking about what you can do with the cloud computing platform, a right question is to ask saying, what can you not do with your cloud computing platform? Because each and every one of these platforms are unique in their own ways. They do things similarly. They do things differently. But at the end of the day, for an end user, the amount of services that they provide is absolutely huge. So using all of those effectively will depend on how well versed a person is in cloud computing as well. So this is where we'll be tying up at the end to talk about how you guys should be learning cloud computing as well. It's a very important thing that people skip. But, uh, you know, to give you guys a complete clarity, I think we have to discuss that, right? Let's discuss the fourth point of why cloud computing is required. Guys, the fourth point is the most important one is the pay as you go plan. Now I'll give you a scenario. Think about uh, you guys uh, having to require maybe two terabytes worth of space and an i5 processor powered computer for 15 minutes of some task right? Now, would you go on to spend maybe somewhere around 50, 60,000 Indian rupees to just use a computer for uh, 15 minutes? Or would you probably pay, a uh, you know, 10% of that amount uh, to hire it hire it as in not physically hire it as to use a cloud computing platform who's giving you that compute power and just pay for the 15 minutes that you use? What would you pick? 15 minutes, right? Uh, that's the reason why, again, cloud computing platforms are popular. Whatever you use, you exactly pay for that. Do you want to use a platform just for 45 seconds? You will only be billed for 45 seconds. Do you want to use it for only 38.5 minutes? You can only use it for 38.5 minutes. If you want to use it for two years, you can use it for two years as well. Again, all of these uh, are chargeable uh, as and when you want it and how you want it as well. That's a huge advantage for a company, uh, regardless of the size, be it a small company, be it a medium sized company or a huge company as well, right? You guys get the point here. Perfect. Now we know what cloud computing is. Now we know why cloud computing is required. The third most important thing that we have to discuss is, you know, what have, what was the world doing before cloud computing came into the picture? Now, if you're wondering if cloud computing is a brand new concept that came up in like 2010, 2015, you know, all of these new periods, it is sort of not the case. We're going to come to that. Firstly, let us go back a couple of years. Let us go back 80 years when the world was completely depending on mainframes. 1960s was a fantastic period for computing. And if you guys don't realize 1969 at the end of this particular era is when humans first step foot on the moon. The processing power of the entire aircraft, the spaceship that took humans to the moon, had uh, the, a RAM, uh, you know, the RAM space, random access memory, somewhere around 0 0.00014 MB. <laughs> that sounds funny to you, I'm sure. 0 0.0014 MB, while the phone I have in my hand right now is powered with probably six or eight gigabytes. So it's a million times, six million times probably faster than, not six million, hey, it could be in the billions as well, right? So it's, it's exponentially faster than the entire spaceship that put humans on a, on a very different, uh, you know, soil, very different environment, right? Think about that. 
This was the era in the 1960s. Computers were slowly developing. Then came the 1970s. 1970s was a very fantastic period because this is when internet started coming up. Uh, it wasn't called internet back then. It was called ARPANET. Uh, it was mostly used for uh, military purposes, but it started then. You know, people realized that you can connect with someone else. You can connect two machines together to probably use them together. Uh, you can connect two machines to, uh, you know, probably move data around, move services around, all of these things. So it started developing over the next few years. 1980s, uh, you know, virtual machines came into the picture. Virtual machines was using the power of an actual computer to do multiple things at once. That was the era of the 1980s. And 1990s, 1990s, the internet blew up like anything, right? The World Wide Web came into the picture. So by early 2000s or maybe late 90s, people realized that, hey, you can not just connect two computers sitting next to each other, you can connect the entire globe if required. And that sort of gave way to the world of modern clouds that we have right now. Look around you, everyone or majority of the people are using smartphones, smart devices, or anything that would make them want to connect to the internet for anything, be it social media, be it to listen to music, be it to listen to watch videos, be it to uh, watch TV shows, whatever it is, right? People are on the internet for a variety of things. And whenever they're doing any of these things that I just mentioned, they are using cloud computing platforms, right? So way back from 2004, 2006, 2008, this is when people like Amazon came up with Amazon Web Services, Microsoft came up with Azure, Google came out with Google Cloud Platform and all of this. So they started very slow. They started putting one or two or three services. First, it, is usually, it usually starts with uh, storage. Storage is very easy to implement on a cloud computing platform, but having compute power, bringing DevOps together, working with machine learning on the cloud, uh, you know, and giving you probably a hundred other services is is not an easy task and that is when cloud computing really flourished but before that to get to this point of uh, all of us being interconnected with a cloud computing platform well you know you know what's happening for the last 80 years now right right from the 60s uh, to the 2000s we're already in 2021 so the discussion goes way way back now we talked about where we were and where we are now uh, one important thing that we have to talk about is the requirement for cloud computing. What is the need for cloud computing? Why is it considered to be so, so, so important today? We can uh, discuss about this all day long. In fact, in the previous set of slides, I've already given you five, six very good reasons of why we require cloud computing and why it's becoming popular as well. But, uh, you know, at the end of it, when you think about the actual requirement for it, it is very vital in all the fields of our lives. Now, whenever you're trying to think about the requirement of cloud computing, think about three things, strategy, operational efficiency, and flexibility. In terms of strategy, cloud computing is changing the way we look at data. It's changing the way we work with data. It's changing the way we store data and eventually, you know, do anything we want with it. All of this on someone else's server, all of this on someone else's platform, all of this on another part or uh, the other side of the globe itself, right? So it opens up your domain. Now, maybe you're an Indian company who's catering to US customers, right? When the US customers want to connect to your database uh, to make sure that they have very quick access, you can set up servers in the USA itself to make sure they connect to it easily, right? Strategically, that's helping you a lot. In terms of operational efficiency, we've already discussed hardware costs. We've already discussed software costs. We already discussed about having an actual employee to maintain all of these servers, right? So when you're removing all of that, eventually, uh, you know, a good thing is that your process becomes way more efficient because you don't have to spend man hours doing all of these things. Third thing, flexibility. Now, when we're talking about flexibility, pay as you go is the first highlight that we have to talk about. The second most important thing that we have to talk about in terms of flexibility is that you have a choice of picking up whatever service you require for your product or pick up whatever it is that you might need, not need, you might need in the future. So you can steer your company uh, into these cloud computing platforms, realizing and understanding what it is that they provide. Now, there might be a service that Microsoft Azure is giving you, which AWS might not or there is something that GCP, Google Cloud Platform is giving you that both of these guys are not doing, right? It's usually between these top three guys uh, that, you know, there's a, 
as soon as one comes up with a new service it is usually seen in the next few days and the other as well so they're constantly neck to neck fighting to be the best platform out there and as of now aws has the majority uh, market share but then trends seem to be changing we'll see how azure and aws uh, you know which azure and how gcp catch up on that right that's a discussion for another uh, particular uh, uh, you know another module but for now uh, to highlight a little bit about the three points that we spoke about uh, let's talk about strategy strategy is a fantastic thing even in all the points which i didn't mention right now because see uh, it, there was a time when people had to be face to face to converse right before phones came you had to be in front of someone to talk uh, you know to literally talk you could of course send email send uh, uh, you know mails telegrams and all of that but at the end of the day you had people uh, uh, face to face but today it's uh, it's it's in a situation where people are saying hey we have five times more collaboration and we don't even have to meet the person so someone sitting on the other side they have their camera on they have a microphone on they have internet connection we are being five times more productive with that how fantastic is that right the second point is that whenever you have your own servers whenever you are trying to host a uh, you know a server on your own you have to look towards software aspect of it one thing with software is software upgrades right uh, there's usually bugs and people keep fixing those bugs improvising things improving efficiency and all of that so again it's your headache to go on to fix all of these things but if you have a cloud computing platform later softwares are always in use right third point whenever i told you about efficiency is that you can spend less man hours on the things which you can automate and put man hours where it's required what are you trying to do you helping your business focus on the important requirements at hand you're giving your business the opportunity to make sure that they can put in their required manpower uh, you know to go on to do important operations which will eventually probably bring them revenue or something right an important point to consider The fourth thing we have to talk about is how uh, you know maybe today uh, your company is working in one way maybe tomorrow they're trying to do something else so you can pick up and set up a new service if you require it if you don't require a service that you're currently using drop it you will not be charged for it if you're not using it right so whatever you're using you're paying only for that if you want to try a new thing well use the service uh, see if you can do something there so you have that kind of a uh, flexibility in terms of strategy as well right that's an important point perfect that was point number 1 now we have to talk about point number 2 which is operational efficiency in terms of operational efficiency pay as you go should be the number 1 uh, point right no matter what extra cost you have it will be cut to a very good degree if you have the pay as you go policy we've already discussed this the second point is that whenever uh, you're trying to look at efficiency as well whenever you have data you have to secure it right data that is present on the internet is usually never safe that's a common saying but the trend is changing these days right all these cloud computing platforms they have huge amounts of security physically for the data centers where you have uh, armed guards where you many of the cases where there are ex military people having loaded weapons uh, you know so if you try to get into a data centers bad do not try to do it it will end up really bad right so it's illegal to go on to break into a data center and first of all there's they are so well protected right so check out these videos on uh, youtube or google which says amazon's data centers facebook data centers you will see how well they are guarded 10 12 layers of security before you can even see the server right probably once you have ac- physical access to the server uh, you know you can do something to the hard drives you can plug in a virus whatever it is because if you're outside the data center their firewalls are so fantastic that there is a good chance is a 99% chance that you cannot hack into their servers right so data security is fantastic so you don't have to break your head about keeping your data secure The third thing is one thing you have to talk about maybe you have an office on the coastal side of things or maybe you're in a country where there's lots of earthquakes and all of that so what happens when uh, you know the ground beneath you shakes or when there's water rushing in from the ocean right electronics cannot survive all of these they tend to go bad so uh, of course you will lose data if you uh, happen to be uh, you know during uh, if you happen to be active uh, during a calamity god forbid that doesn't happen but if it does happen uh, you lose the data to make sure this isn't the case uh, what these data centers do is they take all these required uh, precautions they take all of these uh, or disaster rec- recovery methodologies in a way where if you store your data with a cloud computing platform even if something happens to the data they will have backups or they'll offer you options of how you should back up your data in case something happens bad on their servers itself right they're giving you a lot of flexibility here 
The fourth thing that we have to discuss is that whenever you have cloud-based applications, the most important part is you can access it from any corner of the globe. You can be outside the globe. You can be sitting on the International Space Station. You can be in the moon. Uh, you can be on Mars and you can still access the data if there are satellites uh, you know, giving you internet connection there, right? That's a fantastic thing. Now, this recently happened to me where uh, you know I had to go to the airport uh, because I had a flight to catch. And at the end of the day, I probably forgot to uh, switch off the light for my aquarium, right? It's a very simple use case, but at the end of the day, if you keep the lights on constantly, there's a good chance that the light might heat up the water, it'll evaporate quicker. Uh, it's not very comfortable for the fishes as well, right? So all I had to do was I had to pick up my phone, I had to say, hey, Google, check if the aquarium light is on or not. So, uh, you know, Google uh, was speaking to a cloud computing platform, which eventually had an IoT device sitting at my home. It's a smart device which connects with uh, the platform. It checked, it said, hey, your light is on. You want me to turn it off? I said, yes, please turn it off. And I, I spoke to my phone and my phone spoke to the cloud computing server. The server checked with the actual device sitting in my home and the light was turned off. How fantastic is this, right? I gave you a very simple application. You can have critical applications like this. Maybe you forgot to turn off the stove. Uh, maybe you, uh, you know, left a light on. Maybe uh, you turned off your smoke alarm. Whatever it is, you have to be really careful with all of these things, right? And with cloud computing platform, you're just a a voice message away with your phone you can say hey alexa you know what's going on with the house so you can uh, you can say hey alexa open up the security feed of my house whatever you want to do it is possible wherever you are sitting across the globe right perfect point number two point number three flexibility Flexibility talks about how you can go on to uh, customize your requirement in a way where the cloud computing platform is giving you so much that you'll feel like, hey, these are way too many features that I'm going to use, right? It's rather good to have extra features than not have features at all, right? So you're better off to not use certain features that they're providing rather than being in a platform where they don't provide the feature that you critically require. That's flexibility. The second option is that uh, whenever you have workloads which might be fluctuating right so let's say you're a website uh, uh, you're an e-commerce website like amazon or something today you might have had thousand people who would have purchased something so your website has handled a thousand uh, clients tomorrow it so happens that you have a sale and now one million people want to buy a new phone or something so when there is this constant up and down uh, of fluctuation that's happening you always should not and cannot host a server which would uh, occupy for 10 million people if you have 1000 people coming and purchasing on your side, it costs a lot of money. So what these cloud computing platforms do is they have the complete capability to, uh, you know, customize themselves so they can scale up as and when required and scale down automatically. If they're seeing 1000 people, if your cloud computing platform is seeing only 1000 people of traffic, it'll only allocate that many servers to cater to it. But then suddenly if it sees a surge of people, it can automatically scale up copy all the operating systems, copy all the data, copy all the details and make sure that right now you have a server ready for 1 million people. How fantastic is this, right? Now, the third thing that we have to discuss is about a hybrid model. Now, when you're talking about a hybrid model, maybe you want to keep all your organization's data in your office, but you want to use services which are present in the cloud computing platform. Can you do that? The answer is absolute yes. You can have this kind of a flexibility where you can have the data stored on the cloud computing platform. You're going to use the computing power that you have, vice versa, both. Whatever is the permutation combination here, you can go on to do it. And this kind of a hybrid approach which gives users what? Flexibility, right? Perfect. Now, the fourth thing that as I uh, we have to speak about, as I just told you, is rapid scaling, right? Today, you have 1,000 people coming in. Your server is only working for 1,000 people. Tomorrow, you need a bigger server. It's automatically given to you. If it happens in the middle of the night, you're sleeping, you have absolutely nothing to worry about. Your cloud computing platform can automatically scale it up. And the next morning you woke up, you'll be like, oh, okay, so these many people came in my cloud computing platform took care of it, right? That's the kind of flexibility that's required uh, in today's world. Now. After understanding all of this, it becomes very, very important uh, that we go on to check why cloud computing is the future. We spoke about cloud computing's past. We spoke about cloud computing's present. But how important is it that we have to talk about cloud computing's future? There's a million reasons why. First of all, let us talk money. Let us talk the big numbers that govern this particular domain, right? The cloud computing market is set to touch somewhere around 300 to 400 billion dollars this particular year in 2021. 
This has shown steady growth over the last year. In uh, 2020, it was worth $40 billion less. In 2019, it was worth $90 billion lesser. So 90 plus 40 is 130. So right in the last two years, this industry has almost doubled, right? It's, it's, it's a trend which is not seen by a lot of other industries, even big guys like data science and all these other domains as well. So this kind of a steady approach, when you think about it, uh, which shows this growth and even during the pandemic, right? Even during the COVID-19 pandemic, there were uh, a lot of domains which came crashing down because of the pandemic. But then everyone realized that, you know, they're working from home, they're studying from home, learning from home. Home became the office, home became the school. When that was the case, their guardian was an internet connection and they had to use the internet to probably continue working, right? I mean, that's what I am doing right now. I'm working from my home. Uh, now, uh, so you you are watching this on a YouTube platform where YouTube platform itself is a cloud computing offering that uh, service that's provided to you where you can watch uh, videos for free, right? So considering a very simple example, this is a domain that is just showing an uptrend, a graph which just is keep, it's just going up and up. The salaries that are being paid to cloud computing experts are fantastic. Fantastic. We're going to discuss this, uh, you know, to a greater depth in another module, but understand that the salaries uh, are fantastic as well. If it's a domain that's worth $310 billion, you can do the math yourself, right? Now, everyone across the world, as I told you, teachers, students, uh, you know, IT professionals, tech guys, non-tech guys, digital marketers, everyone realized the power of cloud computing in 2020. And it saw a huge surge, especially at the end of 2019, right? $90 billion in one year is a fantastic thing. Fine. Fun with the numbers. Now uh, we have to go on to talk about how innovative everything is uh, in the cloud computing platform, right? One important thing that you guys have to realize is whatever it is that you guys can do offline, you can do it on the cloud, right? It is literally possible to do everything. You can see on your screen right now, the word everything is highlighted in bold. I have done it for a reason because you literally can do everything you want. Uh, you want to make a phone call, you can actually use a cloud computing platform to do it. Uh, do you have to uh, check something about uh, your house whenever you're, you're away from it? You can do it. Do you want your car to be connected to the internet? So probably when you're away from your car, you want details about your car. It's possible. A lot of these companies are now providing you cars which has internet built inside. Uh, I mean, it has the capability to connect to a satellite and all of that, but it is still possible, right? I give you three applications probably out of three million. So you guys know what, uh, uh, you know, you can do a lot of these things with this platform, right? Innovation is probably the middle name of cloud computing if you ask my opinion. Perfect. The next important thing is predict predictable pricing, right? So whenever you have this policy which says, hey, you only have to pay for what you use, this is hugely advantageous, especially for small companies, especially for individuals who are learning, especially for uh, mid-tier companies and even the big guys for uh, to a certain extent as well. You will know that this is the exact amount that you will be billed going ahead. It gives you a chance, it gives you a thought, it gives you the freedom to go on to invest probably another chunk of money elsewhere, uh, knowing that your cloud computing platform your entire organization running on the cloud computing platform is going to require XYZ dollars, right? That's a fantastic thing to know. Having predictable pricing and pay as you go policies uh, is the centerpiece is the reason of why cloud computing is considered to be the future, right? And when you're thinking about it at the end of the day, it is not only that. Uh, see, uh, when you're talking about cloud computing, you might have a question uh, which says, hey, so okay, so I'm using a cloud computing platform how much of a delay can I expect? How much of a lag can I expect? How much of a performance drop can I expect? Because you working on your own very powerful computer is very different from you being connected to a cloud computing platform, correct? Wrong. Uh, there is actually, uh, uh, you know, the cloud computing platform has grown so much these days uh, in these particular years that it provides the exact same flexibility, the exact same speed, the exact same high performance application. Of course, if you have a high uh, you know, good enough internet connection, you have access to all of these things. These are actual servers. It is just that it is sitting away from your office. It is still working at its full potential. It is still working the same. It doesn't mean that you're losing, you don't have a communication gap. That is the power uh, that cloud computing holds over the domain today, right? That's a very, very important thing that you have to know. Now, considering all of these things, knowing that it is the future, 
one thing uh, that keeps changing is whenever we go on to discuss anything about and we call it this is the future of cloud computing in 3 or 4 days it it is sort of implemented it is in research someone's already doing something about it right that is how fantastic this domain is now let us discuss some of the popular applications that are there for cloud computing which i think a lot of us use first thing social media come on let's be honest uh, whatever your logos that you see on your screen right now i'm sure you might have used either of these all of these or some of these right twitter google plus facebook instagram spotify linkedin behance pinterest snapchat whatsapp skype tumblr vimeo youtube uh, dropbox and i really don't know the last one so <laughs> you can think about it right so whenever you put your images on instagram it is forever there even if you lose your phone if your phone is broken it doesn't mean your data is gone from instagram unless the data is taken out from their server uh, uh, you know it is there correct makes sense same thing for snapchat same thing for whatsapp images same thing for skype whatever you're looking at your screen and all the other social media apps which aren't included on your screen right now it still works in a similar fashion the second fantastic thing is activity management right even something as simple as a video call a video meeting right now for all the people who are working professionals you might have you might be having meetings uh, online right so it can be zoom it can be google meet it can be uh, go to meeting whatever it is all of these things how do you think is connecting you guys together cloud computing platform it's a very popular thing and right now i don't think i have to talk about how popular video calls are right because the most popular the most commonly heard word today probably is can you hear me are you on mute uh, <laughs> you know all of these things it's just so funny but then understand that there is so much power uh, to this particular domain to get us to this point of convenience right it's an important thing the next popular application i absolutely love uh, 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 you know is something which has to do with online gaming now for all the ladies and gentlemen here uh, who are looking towards becoming gamers or you guys already are gamers i am sure you might have heard of one or two of these as well google stadia is a very fantastic project which has the capability to run some of the most resource intensive the most uh, 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 you know powerful games with the highest graphics possible just by using your web browser so it doesn't mean that it's using your computing power to go on to execute it it's using something from the google cloud platform and you are just given a user interface to play the game the delay isn't there you can play fantastic games and all you need is a good high speed internet connection now uh, when you think about it this is such a paradigm shift the entire world at one point said hey you have to spend uh, you know 1 and 1/2 lakh rupees on a gaming computer if you have to play good games the latest games now it's not the case you have to spend on a good internet connection to play good games well look at the jump right it doesn't cost you 1 and 1/2 lakhs to get a good internet connection and then think about playstation now playstation now works the same way whatever games you can play on playstation you can play it on your pc uh, by again connecting to a web browser downloading an app or whatever it is right now i have had the opportunity to check out stadia and i had the opportunity to check out psn psn isn't available in india as of the creation of this video but yes uh, you know at the end of the day it's it's a fantastic thing i'm absolutely a huge fan of this i think it's very popular there's millions and millions of people who are looking forward to getting into the gaming industry but there's a good chance that you know they might not be able to afford a really 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 high end computer to to play those favorite games the world right now is bridging that huge gap right now the gaming market itself is worth billions and billions of dollars i don't have to talk about that i'm sure you guys might know the popularity of games right uh, uh you know some of the latest ones pubg uh among us all of these things again when when it goes from just 100 people playing it to 100 million people playing it how do you think the people in the back end are doing they have to allot new servers to make sure that these people are accommodated right whenever you connect to a game and you're playing it you are connected to their server as well so you have a chunk that you go and you take into those servers so you, it, you, they cannot sit and cram everyone out there so right that's a very important point All right guys coming to the next popular application of cloud computing this is something that goes unsaid a lot but when you take a look at data storage right think about the first thing is emails whenever you send an email whenever you attach something to an email uh, a photo a screenshot whatever it is it isn't like as soon as you delete the mail from your uh, inbox that it deletes for the person who you have sent it also right no so whenever uh, you send an email receive an email a copy of that is stored in their particular servers it so happens that uh, you know no matter what device that you use you're using a tablet you're using a phone you're using a laptop 
your data is still there you're sitting in the usa you sent a mail you're sitting in india you can access that mail you know emails right uh, it's a fantastic application which goes unsaid but it is a very popular one it is just been incorporated so easily into our lives or so nicely into our lives we don't even know it's there anymore that's the convenience that google cloud computing or when you take a look at not just google right there are other guys who do emails as well uh, there's probably redif there's yahoo uh, you know microsoft has a fantastic uh, with their outlook uh, service and all of that so this is this is another important thing next when you're taking a look at data storage think about box think about dropbox think about the google cloud think about google photos think about google Drive, i uh, probably think about any other uh, company right now this was something that i figured out very recently is when you buy a dslr camera usually they do provide you free cloud service free uh, cloud storage maybe for a year or something to actually store all your data online how fantastic is that you click pictures and you don't want to lose them so you push them to a cloud it's there for one year for free and it's it's safe so you can delete it from your memory card and you don't have to spend more on your storage right i gave you just one or two simple applications but these are the ones uh, that are actually driving a lot of revenue for these cloud computing platforms as well these are the uh uh you know these are the applications these are the reasons that's making them money we're talking about how we can save money but we're never addressing the fact that uh you know even cloud computing platforms are there to make a profit right perfect and uh talking about the next important application has to be google collab i have already spoken to you about google collab at the start of this module so uh to just quickly give you a brief it's a python jupyter notebook hosted on the google cloud platform it's, you are one or two mouse clicks away from just executing simple python code you don't have to uh, download anything you don't have to configure anything you don't have to break your head about local dependencies all of these is absolutely not there you can use the power of cpus you can use the power of graphical uh, processing units of gpus as it's called which Uh, to a certain extent uh, you know google collab gives you gives it to you for free as well and for most of us i think it's more than enough right that's uh, a very good application of uh, cloud computing now guys to uh, talk about the next thing uh, in cloud computing i am sure you're curious like okay so all of these or some of these i might already know what's new uh, in the world of cloud computing right uh things that are new in this domain uh is something which is very finicky to discuss about because as i just told you today it's new tomorrow it's already being used by 10 companies but there are so many important things that we have to discuss one important thing is quantum computing right quantum computing talks about having the fastest computer in the entire world out there right that's that's literally how quantum computing uh, markets itself now uh compared to probably just 10 years back look at how much faster and efficient your phones are your laptops are your computers are your television sets are right uh, all of these have cpus all of these have microprocessors all of these have a certain computer in them uh, to function right quantum computing uh, with the power of cloud computing is going to unleash an entirely different beast to this world which of course is a uh is a friendly one that the entire world can go on to use that's cloud computing the second thing which is very popular these days is pass or it's also called as platform as a service now when you say platform as a service you usually as a cloud computing supplier you giving your entire platform to a person to use they just have to bring their own application they just have to bring their own data and they can use the entire platform to go on to have host their application keep their data run their application develop it test it deploy it all of that is possible this is extremely popular now right the third thing is iot now i gave you a fantastic example of iot right let's be honest sometimes uh, you know not not all of us might have smart lights not all of us might have smart homes and all of that but things are catching up if you realize the pace as, uh, at which the prices of these services the price of the actual hardware is decreasing you will know it. there was a time when i think smart lights were somewhere around 100 dollars or like 5000 indian rupees we were like wow you know why would you at the same light is probably you can get it for 15 indian rupees uh, to just make it smart you have to pay 100 times more now it's not the case prices are extremely competitive right prices are catching up to a point where people want you to use smart products that's the huge advantage when you see that the entire world there is a trend shift there's a paradigm shift where people want you to become smart by using smart gadgets well you cannot deny all of them right perfect now guys coming to a section where we are going to discuss about the things that you have to learn before you get started with cloud computing 
The first thing that I suggest you guys look towards before starting cloud computing is explore a little bit about programming. Now, for all the people who might ask a question uh, here saying, uh, you know, is programming important? Do we require programming for cloud computing? You know, can we do cloud computing without programming? I think it becomes important that you will require knowledge of programming in one way or another, right? Now you're working with a lot of data. Uh, to talk with data, you're going to require database languages such as SQL, structured query language. You're going to work with multiple databases, right? Now, they might be uh, databases, uh, which is relational databases, RELDBs as we call it, RDBMS, non-relational databases like MongoDB and all of that. So all of these terms, if you haven't heard, uh, you know, it's, it's no issue, but you definitely are going to require knowledge about this thing. So how you store data, how you retrieve data, uh, you know, how you bring in, update, remove all of these things when you have to perform these operations on data that's sitting on a server probably on the other side or on the other face of the earth well you're gonna have to require knowledge on all of these right that's important the second thing is that you're going to require a uh, programming language such as python now python is very popular in cloud computing because uh, in today's world you can deploy a lot of machine learning algorithms on the uh, on cloud on uh, you know cloud computing platforms and Python became popular for cloud computing just for the fact that people realize you can deploy machine learning algorithms using their platforms. How cool is that, right? The third thing, you're going to require some experience with the Microsoft .NET architecture. Now, the .NET architecture is, again, a huge world all of its own. It has .NET compatible languages. It has frameworks. It has tools. It has techniques. So it's something that you guys definitely should have at least basic functional knowledge of. Right. The last thing is whenever you're working with programming, be it SQL, be it Python, be it .NET architecture, make sure you guys are taking a hands-on approach. Make sure you guys are taking a look at all of these concepts practically because theoretically it all sounds simple until you go on to write your first piece of code, until you go on to write your first query to talk to a database, until you go on to implement or integrate something into an existing architecture. It's until you come to that point, uh, you'll feel like your theory is at its strongest, but uh, without practical knowledge, it becomes very very difficult uh, you know in the domain of cloud computing guys so that's a very important thing that you have to know the second most important thing that you guys definitely have to know about is to pick one popular cloud service provider out there there's amazon's web service sorry aws there's Microsoft who's providing Azure. There's Google who's providing Google Cloud Platform. And there's IBM also who's providing IBM Cloud. The top three guys are usually Azure, AWS, and GCP. But maybe you're working in a for a company or something who might be using another different cloud service. Well, at the end of the day, just pick one that aligns to your requirement. Now, there's a lot of things Azure can do that AWS cannot. There's a lot of things AWS can do that GCP cannot. There's a lot of things all three of the above can do that IBM Cloud cannot. Right? Now, I'm not picking anything i'm not telling you which one's the best which one's uh, good which one's bad or nothing like that it is just for the fact that it depends on what you want to do with their platform is what governs how you should pick one right uh, usually it, it so happens that people always start out with aws and that's a fantastic thing aws is a really good uh uh, you know, cloud computing platform to get started with. And uh, cloud computing is such a fantastic domain that even if you get started with AWS and you're a professional in AWS, maybe later down the line, if you have to move to Azure, things are similar to a point where you just have to do a little bit of learning, maybe clear one or two certifications, and you can go on to migrate everything that you have on AWS, completely move it to Azure. You can do that. That's a fantastic aspect of it. But to get to that point where you have the freedom in between multiple providers, you have to be thorough in at least one of them. So my suggestion is pick one of these providers, start learning on it, start implementing stuff, start solving problems, do these little challenges to push yourself, get certified in all of them, and then, uh, you know, you can go on to work with your favorite services there, right? That's exactly my next point here. Whenever you, even you say, uh, you know, you're a person who says, okay, so, hey, I, I want to learn AWS. Perfect. You made up your mind for AWS. I'm sure you have your reasons. Now with AWS, it so happens that AWS provides a ton of services. How do you know which one to pick? How would you know to learn all the services in AWS thoroughly? is a very daunting task. It's, it's not really that easy. It's not possible, at least in my opinion. So find the service that you like. Maybe if you're a person who likes machine learning algorithms, right? So machine learning algorithms in AWS, uh, there's a fantastic service called SageMaker. Uh, you can use SageMaker to work with your machine learning models. Uh, you know, if you're working with data storage, there's uh, you know Amazon S3. If you're trying to look at another set of databases, you have the Amazon DynamoDB. Uh, you have so many different services. Pick one that aligns with your interest, aligns with your requirements 
requirement aligns with your product uh, project recommendations and go on to concentrate that learn that use it fully before moving on to another service i'm not saying that just pick one service learn that and be there forever start with one become a master of it and then move to the other that's my important suggestion uh, for all of you all here right perfect the next thing is you are going to have to work uh, on your business management skills now it's a uh, Uh, it's an unorthodox thing to say hey a cloud computing guy has to be a good businessman as well i'm not asking you to be a good businessman i'm asking you uh, uh, to work on your things such as how you can be a better team player how you can have very good communication skills and negotiation skills sometimes after you get the job it so happens that uh, sometimes you have to go to a client you have to pitch your product you have to ask for pricing and all of that so you need that bargaining skill you need the negotiation skill you need that communication in a way where you will not be the only sole uh, person who's probably working for the company right one or two cases maybe yeah but at the end of the day if you are one guy who's handling entire aws it is not possible so you'll be working in a team have the complete capability to be a team player you'll have to be working with multiple vendors you'll be working with multiple service providers right so one client is going to require a product which the other client might not use so customization of offerings whatever you are providing to the client it will be so customized and personalized to their uh, uh, likes and interests that they will not not feel that it's a generic solution that you provided for their problem right that's a fantastic thing in terms of uh, client experience in terms of how you delivered the project on your end that's a very 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 important thing that you guys should work upon and i highly suggest you start with it right now right perfect the next thing that we're going to talk about is devops technology right well let's be honest if you're a person if you're a developer who's watching this video you will know that the one set of developers will start writing code continuously there's another set of people uh, operations who has to make sure that these lines of code go into the product and they work ex- as expected right so in this particular case to bring together the world of development and to bring together the world of operations uh, you know devops came into the picture so you have to have working knowledge about devops because devops on a cloud computing platform is really huge in terms of cloud computing jobs devops professionals usually get a very 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 high salary uh you know compared to others i'm not saying it's the highest but in majority of the cases devops cloud experts do get a fantastic salary right uh, so here when we talk about devops you're going to require knowledge about uh, tools such as chef puppet uh, ansible you have docker you have kubernetes it's a fantastic orchestration tool uh, you have containers containerization technology like docker that i just mentioned uh, you're going to have to work with virtual cloud environments you are not it i'm not saying that you have to become a master of this but before you get started completely to provide solutions with cloud computing i highly suggest you guys or uh, devote some time to learn all of these in the order uh, that we are trying to cover them through right so i hope that aspect of it is very clear for all of you all fantastic the next thing that we're going to check out is the top companies that make use of cloud computing So what you have in your screen is probably uh, seven or eight guys but at the end of the day when you think about it uh there's probably thousands if not millions of companies across the globe who use cloud computing right in one way or another a small way or a big way they are using if that company is connected to the internet they are using cloud computing now in that particular case think about the millions and millions i think it it would be in the billions right that people are connected to the internet well there's a good chance they're using cloud computing how fantastic is that but the top companies definitely who work completely based upon the cloud as netflix instagram apple uh, general electric you have ebay fitbit fitbit was acquired by google recently and then you have sap uh, or sap as it's called and at the end of the day when you think about all of these on your screen right now what four or five companies or whatever you see these guys are worth trillions and trillions of dollars if they can think that a cloud computing platform will just give them everything that uh, they require to run their businesses upon i think even as a small company an individual contributor a medium sized company all of us should definitely be fine right i'm not saying that if apple says it it works for them it has to work for me no in some cases it might not so it might not uh, happen that way but in majority of the cases if it's working for them you can scale it down and use it at your own uh, uh, level of uh, requirement is my uh, important uh, suggestion here but yes these are the top companies that use cloud computing they are worth trillions of dollars and it's working fantastically for all of them right perfect Okay, guys now to discuss about having a career in cloud computing right 
as i told you the industry grows in hundreds of billions of dollars right now so whatever numbers we saw at the start of this uh, presentation uh, we already realized that once you are an industry that's worth like 2 230 300 billion dollars and you're seeing a 100 120 billion dollars that are that, that's that you know adding every now and then you have to realize that there's huge growth there is a huge potential here 35% growth for something that's already valued in billions right 35% of 300 billion Oof, is a lot of money, right? Perfect. Now, the third thing that you definitely have to think about is right now during COVID nineteen, as we already discussed, people realize the power of cloud computing. So everyone is jumping to use cloud computing. This means that there is aggressive requirements, thousands and thousands of job openings that get created everywhere, and right time for you guys to jump in and make the best use of it. Ah, uh, maybe you can get your dream job at your dream companies. You can get a really high package, knowing that the world requires more cloud computing experts, but not enough of experts are being put out there right now. The demand and supply gap, right? If you fill that gap, it's going to be highly, ah, uh, 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 you know, advantages for you guys monetarily, ah, uh, to solve problems and of course a hundred other advantages as well. Right, perfect. Now, if we talk about a very important thing of what happens to cloud computing after COVID nineteen, I think we have to talk about what happened to what happened to cloud computing during COVID nineteen. Right, usually during March of twenty twenty or somewhere around that, people thought that there's going to be a huge recession, of course, because of the COVID nineteen pandemic of the lockdown and all of that. It did happen. Thousands of people lost their jobs. But when you take a look at cloud computing jobs. uh it was extremely stable people continuously required more and more experts right why would they fire the ones they have if they want 10 more people 15 more people it doesn't make sense so it just showed uh the actual requirement it showed the presence in the scene it showed how important it showed that cloud computing is a recession proof career or i would say an almost recession proof right because you never know when the world hits full recession that goes bonkers right but until then you realize that hey you know you have a safe career your your career is pretty secure because today if you choose to be a cloud computing expert there's a good chance you might see through it for the rest of your life right so you have to think about this point and i thought this was very important to be put here as well and right now everyone is concerned about their health everyone is looking towards healthcare uh, you know for what's ahead and all of that but cloud computing here again uh, is making sure that even in the world of cloud computing there's thousands of Not millions of solutions that are being put out, and hundreds of uh, healthcare companies across the globe are making use of cloud computing in one way or another. Right, guys? Perfect. Now to talk about, uh, you know, how you guys can, uh, you know, work upon building more on knowledge of. uh you guys um, you know are using other uh, resources or if you guys are looking towards doing a parallel learning kind of a thing my advice is to make sure you stick to one uh, course you stick to one syllabus finish it and then move on to the other because as a learner right you will be very much interested and fascinated by all the things that are present on the internet with the domain there is so much information out there of course good or bad that's your call but there's so much of information that It's like you being dropped in the middle of an ocean, right? So even if you know swimming, practically you cannot swim through an ocean, right? So you'll drown. Uh, our goal here at Great Learning is to make sure that you guys, uh, if you have picked up a domain, if you have picked up a concept, we want you to see it through. We want to make sure you come out of this particular cloud computing full course as a successful person who knows a lot about cloud computing. Right? That's an important thing. We are going to take a very, very, very structured, uh, very well thought of, uh, you know, way of creating our syllabus to make sure you get the best. out of your time and your efforts of learning as well right so guys uh make sure you guys any comments that you might have have whenever you're watching this video head to the comment section put it down there because uh we'll see it as soon as you put it we'll be more than happy to address your questions uh there's a good chance that you guys might have doubts as well right so talk to us uh you know uh, you can connect with us you can talk to us join in on our live sessions make sure that you are just keeping your learning rate up and to go on to do that it becomes very vital that you have the right channels to do it and here at great learning we provide Provide multiple channels, uh, and here at Great Learning, we provide multiple channels uh, for you guys to go on to learn more, to connect with us, and whatnot. Right? So, Great Learning Academy is a fantastic place for you guys to check out. We have two hundred plus courses uh, accessible for you guys, uh, absolutely free of cost. You can enroll for, uh, into it for free. You can learn for free. You can get a certificate of completion, absolutely free of cost as well. So, I highly suggest you guys check out uh, Great Learning Academy, and then you have the Great Learning YouTube channel through which you're watching this video, and you have Great Learning blogs, which again all. 
these things that you see even the free content is so well thought of here that we want to have the most impact as an e-learning company on you guys right providing the highest quality of education is everything that we stand for here at great learning and you have all of these sources that you guys can definitely use to improvise on your learning so guys, all of these things will definitely get you started with the domain, but I highly suggest if you're looking to become a thorough expert, take a look at all these specialization offerings, take a look at uh, you know all of these uh, courses we have here at Great Learning to make sure that you guys are uh, you know working towards becoming complete professionals in the domain, right? So guys, with that, we have come to the end of module number one. Uh, I'll see you in the next one. So, all right, guys, welcome to module number two, uh, which is uh, talking about understanding the cloud computing domain. Now, guys, it becomes very important that uh, all of you all who are watching this full course are very curious to understand about what exactly is your requirement, uh, you know, as a cloud engineer, as a cloud developer or a professional as well. Right. So to align yourself and to align your learning with respect to uh, what the industry is asking for, we are going to have a very important module here where we're going to be understanding the domain itself. Right. Guys, we can uh, go on to begin by checking out uh, the trends of cloud computing. See, you need to understand the current trends to make sure that you align your learning uh, with respect to that. OK, after that, uh, a very, very important thing that all of you all should definitely need to know about is the roles and responsibilities of a cloud engineer. Now, uh, if you just keep learning constantly without having to know what's happening in the industry, then there's a good chance that you might have overlearned something or you've underlearned something and at the end of the day uh, when you try to use it uh, for your industry level experience and to actually look for a job and do all of that you might be missing on some of the most important things which govern the domain itself right so to understand this kind of a thing i believe uh, module number two is going to add a lot of value for your learning and your interests uh, you know in a career in cloud computing right so after uh, checking out the roles and responsibilities of a cloud engineer next we're going to check take a look at some sample job descriptions now with respect to trends, we're going to analyze that in detail. With respect to roles and responsibilities, we're going to check that out in detail as well. Now, understanding both of these, uh, we have to make sure whatever we have learned is exactly what's going on in the industry, right? So we're going to take a look at sample job descriptions of multiple levels, you know, entry level jobs, mid level jobs, and even senior level jobs to see, uh, you know, whatever we're learning is aligning with respect to that. That is going to help you a lot, guys. After which, of course, we're going to take uh, uh, into account a very, very important thing and a very fun aspect of uh, cloud computing it's very interesting to know uh, that you know a cloud expert gets paid a very uh, handsome salary guys so make sure you stick till the end of this particular module the salary trends are absolutely amazing and i'm sure you guys are curious for the same as well right perfect guys i hope the agenda for this particular module is clear for everyone we can go on to begin now, even before we dive into the trends, I just wanted a quick did you know section, uh, you know, in the case of cloud computing for all of you all. Here are some really interesting, uh, you know, facts uh, which you may or may not know, right? Now, whenever you think about cloud computing, I think the names which come into your head are very common, AWS, GCP, uh, Azure and all of that. But did you know that uh, in the world that we live in as a consumer, most of the cloud computing activities that ever happen usually happen in the banking sector. Now, you would already know the world of finance. You would have already known the world of banking, right? So there's a lot of transactions going on. Uh, banks have to, uh, you know, be have a good uptime as in they cannot uh, shut down their online services and all of that. They'll take a loss in millions of dollars if that happens, right? But then the fun part is this. Uh, people usually think the IT sector has the biggest share in the cloud computing industry but it's actually not it's the banking and the finance sector there okay the second important uh, did you know point here is uh, actually that one half of the entirety of the American government the US government actually works based upon the cloud right so if they're using a cloud computing platform to run the governance or let's say half of the entire government that takes to run the country itself on the cloud I think it's safe to say that uh, you know this is a solution that will work for a variety of domains right perfect now, the third thing that we have to talk about is how 
uh, strong this particular domain fundamentally is. We already spoke about this in the previous module, but to reiterate, right? We already saw what the uh, you know market was worth: 200 billion, 300 billion, and all of that. We saw the growth from 2018 to 19, 19 to 20, and expected growth uh, uh, up to 21, 22, and all of that. But in the next three years, what happens three years from now, 2022, 2023, 2024, what happens here, right? Well, the market, the cloud market is going to explode. Uh, you know, it's going to touch $650 billion, guys. Now, uh, as a person, you watching this video, you might be like, okay, so $650 billion doesn't seem like a lot. But at the end of the day, the growth that we're going from $300 billion all the way to $600 billion, right? So you will know the amount of zeros that goes into to a billion so the uh, the fundamental trend, the fundamental strength that this particular domain shows in terms of its growth is absolutely astonishing. And, uh, you know, I think I would say that uh, it is unmatched by any other industry seeing looking at the trends right now. Right. And of course, uh, you know, considering all three of these points and a lot of other points, I think it shouldn't surprise you uh, that cloud computing is considered to be one of the fastest growing IT domains ever. Now, when you think about fastest growing, you usually look at revenue, you know, we just spoke about 300 billion to 600 billion and all of that. But the other side of thing that you really should be concerned about is, uh, you know, first of all, the thousands, if not millions of jobs that are being created. The second thing is that uh, companies who do not use cloud computing or only use some of it now wants to use the entirety of the domain itself, right? So they want to completely jump ship from on premise uh, to use a cloud computing network. Uh, they want to push with everything that they have to move an entire architecture to the cloud. This is not just one company. We have thousands of companies who are planning to do this in the, in, in the next couple of years, right? So this again shows, right? Uh, the third thing that you have to think about in this particular point is not just that uh, people are moving to the cloud. Sometimes it so happens that people are moving and switching between cloud providers. Maybe today they're using AWS and they require a service which AWS is not providing. So they might have to jump ship and take their entire project over to Microsoft Azure. Now in that particular case, migrating from AWS to Azure is a very, very tedious task. And of course, it's, it's the same vice versa as well. Uh, but the important train of thought here that you guys have to understand is that even to move from one domain to the other, one provider to the other, it takes hundreds of people. Uh, you know, it takes a lot of man hours. It creates a lot of jobs in itself, right? So people will want more architects to make sure that they can, uh, uh, you know, move uh, from AWS to Azure, Azure to AWS to GCP, whatever is the current requirement at hand. So this, these three reasons that I just mentioned are why, uh, you know, that cloud computing can be considered as the fastest growing domains, at least in my opinion, right? Perfect, guys. Now to align your learning with what's going on in the industry, I think it adds a lot of value that we go on to check out the latest trends in the cloud computing industry. It is, first of all, very important to understand trends. Let me tell you this, um, you know, it adds a lot of value to your learning and it aligns yourself to the industry. Now, what's happening in the world today is uh, there's a concept called hybrid cloud environment. We're going to cover this, uh, you know, in detail in the next module. Uh, but for now, we have to know that uh, hybrid cloud is like a company having their own cloud and also using a public cloud uh, like AWS, Azure or, uh, you know, GCP. So once there's a combination of a hybrid approach, right? Now, usually you would have heard the term hybrid usually in the automobile industry, right? So if you have a hybrid car, it means that it can run both on uh, fossil fuels and electricity as well, right? So it will have batteries, it will have a motor, and of course, uh, it runs on petrol, diesel, whatever it is, right? So hybrid is using two of these things. Here as well, you'll have an on-premise server and there's a good chance you'll have a public cloud as well. Now, aligning this to the trends part of things, this kind of an environment today for the companies who have not used cloud computing before is growing to a very good extent. So everyone who's looking to, uh, you know, get started with the cloud computing industry might not have the complete capability to switch entirely to a public cloud platform or a private cloud or whatever it is. So having a hybrid model like this is like a bridge for them. Uh, you know, it's like a halfway point to get into complete uh, domain itself, right? So people are doing this now and there's an uptrend here. Now, what does it mean for you as a learner? 
So for you as a learner, it adds so much value to understand that, hey, if you can work on learning about these hybrid uh, clouds, understanding how you can implement it, uh, knowing how different it is from public clouds, private clouds, community clouds, all of these things that will add a lot of value to your learning, right? That's my point here. First of all, understand that this is a very trending domain. There are trends created every single day, but all of the trends that you see here, uh, you know, I've researched this to a very good amount of extent, and these are the ones that are considered to be the top trends, if you may, right? Perfect. Now, uh, after the hybrid cloud thing, I think the next concern that everyone would have if you're moving to a cloud computing platform or if you're, uh, you know, giving your company's data to someone else to store or whatever it is, I think it has to be security concerns, right? Again, we're going to cover this in depth in the next module. Uh, but for now, I think it adds a lot of value for you to understand that today's cloud computing platforms are highly, highly, highly secure. Now, it so happens, right? So when you think about it, if you have a company, uh, you have a lot of data, which, not, which you do not want a lot of people to access uh, to, right? So you'll have authorized access. You'll be trying to uh, not hide your data, but you will make sure to provide authorized access to it. Now, if you're storing all your company's data or let's say you're running an entire company based on a cloud computing platform, it's a public cloud. So obviously it'll be managed by AWS, GCP, IBM, all of these guys. You're trusting them with your data, right? Now, uh, what is the, what are the chances that the data centers don't get hacked? What are the, uh, what are the chances that, you know, someone might misuse your data? How can you trust AWS? How can you trust Microsoft with your data, right? Now, these were some concerns which were raised probably a decade ago at the start of cloud computing. But then now that these guys have become big names where they're punching in, uh, you know, clients, again, who are pouring billions of dollars into the industry itself, I think it adds a lot of value uh, to knowing that your data is safe and secure with them, right? So this is not always the case. There have been cases where, uh, you know, data is actually breached by an unauthorized user, a hacker, and, you know, it can be physical access, it can be online access. If it's online access, they usually try to use your authentication keys and, uh, you know, try to get access to your cloud computing platform. Uh, they might try to break all the firewalls that exist and uh, uh, you know try to actually uh, pick up the data from the server directly uh, the third thing is if they actually have physical access to the servers themselves now this is a very very rare thing uh, you know if you go on to check uh, what a data center looks like right just watch a video Google's data center Facebook's data center and all of that you will realize that this is a fortified building right so to get into it and to actually touch the servers it is impossible for a common man. Let's be very honest with that because these data centers are 24 seven, 365 days under uh, guard, right? So all the people who are security guards here usually are ex-military. So, uh, and it's not just that they're from the military or anything like that, it's just that they're very heavily armed. So to go on to a private property and to go on to, uh, you know, mess with them will end up very badly. So people usually do not, uh, you know, try to physically get into a data center and all of that. And let's say you're a person who's authorized, right? So you can be authorized and you might misuse your data as well. In that particular case as well, once you even get into the data center, there's usually 11, 12, 13 levels of access clearance that you require before you can physically go touch the servers. Now, why am I saying touch the server? Is all this while. See, touching the servers means if you have physical contact with it, you can put a pen drive into it, you can connect another device to it, you can connect to the network physically and uh you know, try to work around the firewalls. Uh, you can probably steal hard drives. So all of these things are concerns, right? But then these days uh, with ongoing uh, increased security methodologies, uh, there is no chance. I would not say no chance, but there's a 99.9% .9 chance that your data is secure with all of these public cloud providers, right? Perfect, guys. Now if you take a look at another very important trend is uh, the costs of, uh, you know, running your company or a cloud computing platform is definitely exponentially cheaper than you actually buying the servers and maintaining it yourself. We've covered this in module number one. The most important thing that you have to probably realize here is that even these days, cloud computing platforms are getting so competitive that people are actually going to reduce the prices rather than increasing it, right? Now, what you might think is, uh, you know, the electricity prices are going up, storage hardware is going up. 
uh, minimum wages are going up so everything is going up but how can the costs of uh, running a cloud computing platform like aws or gcp come down right that is due to the competitive nature now here is an undue advantage for a user if aws is providing a service at let's say x cost so Azure is going to come up and Azure is going to say, hey, we can do that for cheaper. So when Azure does that for cheaper, Google Cloud Platform steps in and say, oh, what are you guys doing? You know, I can give it even for a cheaper price. Well, when that's the case, who do you think is the, uh, who do you think benefits the maximum out of here? It's the end user, right? Because of course, he or she is going to go find whoever is providing the services for the cheapest cost and all these names, right? Google, uh, 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 you know, Amazon, Microsoft, all these are really big names which you can trust. So at the end of the day, the customer is going to just walk in and use a platform of uh, whoever is giving the, uh, the best cost, the best return on their investment, right? So these providers constantly keep changing these prices. They keep working on it to make sure more and more users, uh, you know, get into the platform itself, right? Be it an individual contributor, uh, be it that you are a multinational corporation who makes maybe billions of dollars a year. You, uh, both of these people have the equal opportunity to, uh, you know, scale their businesses up really quick. Of course, an individual contributor will be billed a lot less than probably an entire company running on the cloud. But at the end of the day, the cost that you might have to bear is very, very similar in terms of the services that you use. Uh, why is this the case? Because of the pay as you go policy, right? Perfect. Now, uh, another very important trend that I think we should discuss is to talk about what all you can do in the cloud computing platform. There was a time when you can only probably send emails. There was a time when only you, when you could only back up data on the cloud computing platform and do nothing else. Well, now that's not the case. You can do a lot of, you know, especially in the world of data science, data science and cloud computing has come together in a fantastic way, especially with the case of machine learning, right? So, uh, you know, even multiple domains themselves have come uh, into collaboration with each other. Now, uh, let's say that you have something that Oracle provides. Uh, so you're moving to Oracle, but then you realize you want to make use of the power of Azure ML as well. So Oracle and Microsoft are coming together uh, to provide a multi-cloud agreement for you guys in a way where uh, you know you can use services from both these guys it's like a tie up in between uh, these one guy provides the networking while other guy provides the platform you know things like that it's a very complex thing but knowing that you know there's more than two or three companies who are willing to do this to give uh, the best services possible now why would Microsoft or Oracle want to do this because there is a demand for it people are looking forward to using both Oracle and Azure right now in those particular cases they are looking forward to give you the most seamless way of how you can integrate this and use it effectively for your business right that's a very very important trend ladies and gentlemen that you have to understand the next trend that we have to talk about i think is about disaster recovery services you can be very careful you can have armed guards uh, you can have the best firewall and all of that but if nature goes against you i don't think there's a lot we can do right think about earthquakes think about tsunamis uh, you know, any natural calamity. Uh, so these computers, these hardware, they're usually very, very finicky to these things, right? Uh, you know, it's the items that go into making a server into having a data center. They are very delicate. Think about throwing around your laptop or computer. Do you think that's going to work fine? No, right? So when the earth shakes or, you know, when probably server racks fall down or something happens, when there's physical damage, especially with your hard disks. You might know this. Uh, if you ever drop a hard disk, there's a good chance it's gone for good, right? So it, it so happens that even, you know, they're not water resistant as well. These are electronics. As soon as they see water, they short and they die, right? So, uh, so what happens to your data when this is the case? The latest trends, right? I mean, this is a concept. This is a very old concept where they would back up your data across multiple continents to make sure, uh, you know, if something happened to one part of your data sitting in, uh, uh, you know, Canada servers, it would have been backed up in India servers in a way where, you know, the company can uh, just log in here and pick up the data from here directly. So having these backups, having these redundancies are very important. And 
uh, with every passing day there are new methodologies new tools and new techniques that even the cloud computing platform themselves are giving the users saying hey uh, you do not have to worry about your data in case if there's data breaches in case if there's loss of data whatever it is we are going to take care of it here's the latest and the greatest things we are doing to do so that's a very important thing that you have to know right so guys these were some really fantastic trends that we took a look at but enough to align your learning to uh, you guys becoming cloud engineers i think it adds a lot of value for us to discuss the roles and responsibilities of a cloud engineer right so let's do that now right guys i think uh, when we talking about the roles and responsibilities for a cloud engineer it is very very important to understand uh, that as a cloud engineer you will be handling a lot of data right uh, you might say that hey i'm just learning right now you know there's not a lot of data that i might handle that's true but once you go on to complete your learning when you're working on industry level use cases and projects there's a good chance that the data that goes into making an application that the or the data uh, that you have to use is a large quantity now to manage this data you're going to require some skills so uh, as always as a responsibility you uh, uh, you know you're responsible for the data that you're handling of course the second thing is how you manage the data how you store it how you ensure that you know as and when data is required to be accessed deleted or updated you have the capability to provide services for that right now a client might come to you and say hey you're a cloud engineer i cannot access this part of my data or something is wrong here why so you have to own up to that if it's your mistake or sometimes it so happens it's the cloud provider changes something uh, you know when it's back end they would have notified saying hey we're changing this so whatever uh, you might have done you might have to change a little in your application and all of that if that is not done again it comes to a point where hey an application stops working because aws updated something and uh, the cloud engineer couldn't uh, you know rapidly scale up to make sure the latest software or hardware is used or whatever it is right so that's a huge uh, responsibility uh, which which usually goes unsaid until you get a job and then you're on the floor and this happens so uh, you know uh, i thought this is a very important thing that you guys should know right now uh, you know as you're learning so it had a lot of value uh, going ahead guys perfect the next uh, uh, you know the responsibility the roles and responsibility section that we're going to have to check out is the actual design and development of an application now the entire point of uh, you know using a cloud computing platform is probably to move your application or your data to the cloud computing platform right now when you're moving your data and your application there when you say moving your application first of all you have to have the capability to develop design and uh, uh, you know test all of these things and to make sure they work as they're expected to right so in this particular case you're going to need the skills uh, that is required uh, especially if you're working to becoming a cloud developer right so if you're working to become a cloud developer you need to know the latest and the greatest uh, development technologies you might need to know a programming language you need to know the programming standards you need to know methodologies of software development all of these things right this uh, understanding all of this will also help you uh, uh, you know to branch yourself into the multiple sub domains that exist in cloud computing so it's very vital that you guys are planning and you're understanding uh, software development application development alongside uh, your learning of the cloud computing platforms itself so this is a very very important point the next thing is uh, as a cloud engineer it will come to a point where sometimes you have to also provide uh, you know maintenance for the applications maintenance for the data maintenance for the platform itself and all of that so having the cloud architecture maintenance knowledge is something which is very very important here uh, if you have the latest and the greatest application running you know you have millions of customers and all of that but it so happens if your application uh, you know is probably running at a, on an older version when the newer version is out or there are issues bugs haven't been fixed uh, there's a bit of downtime server maintenance is all of these things will eventually hurt the user experience right now someone who wants to do a critical banking uh, transaction or something they have to send urgently money to someone uh, if they just log into the net banking and the net banking says sorry we are uh, you know something doesn't work the page doesn't load or something that is a very uh, uh, you know critical thing right the same thing happens in the healthcare industry as well uh, maybe there's like a brain mri or something that needs to be analyzed and they're using your cloud computing platform to do this so the mri is done at the end of the day they want to move it to the cloud to verify it and uh, analyze it and all of that and if that doesn't itself load 
well again there's a hold up yeah especially if it's a critical uh, thing such as healthcare finances and all these things well you know what's going to happen right so it's very very vital to understand that uh, not only development is important but alongside development maintenance of whatever is being developed is important as well right perfect guys now uh, that we understood the basic framework of uh, the roles and uh, you know responsibilities of a cloud engineer let us dive a little deeper into understanding the uh, roles of a cloud engineer now uh you know there are many important designations that i think you guys might already have heard of uh you know think about the uh, designations such as a cloud architect a systems engineer security analyst and there's a fantastic designation called as a cloud network developer as well now these are very very popular designation each of these designations again uh, you know have a lot of impact on the working of the platform itself uh, uh, their salary trends are again absolutely fantastic and i am i'm a huge fan of this domain for that particular reason is that uh, it of course takes a lot of skill it takes a lot of patience it takes a lot of time and effort to learn the domain but once you do it on the other side of things well you get rewarded handsomely for it right so that's an important thing now there's usually not just the case where you have three or four designations and a cloud engineer has to be a part of that there's usually many many types of cloud engineer uh, roles out there for example you can take a look at three more types of uh, diversifications right you have a systems engineer you have a cloud application engineer you have a cloud solutions architect and all of that so these you might have usually heard of uh, whenever uh, there is talk of certification programs and all of that but why are people wanting to get certified to have this kind of a designation right they're trying to prove that um, you know for a, for being a cloud solutions architect it takes a lot of work a cloud solutions architect will know the in and out of that particular domain so definitely takes a good amount of learning right but understanding that you do not have to always work towards becoming a systems engineer you do not have to always work towards uh, becoming a network engineer in this domain you can do a lot of different things that you can choose to inside the domain of cloud computing itself right but then to get to that well uh, you know you have full courses like this that will definitely get you started by understanding the domain uh, uh, you know before you can uh, you know you know look towards all of these as well but then having the knowledge about all of these i think is very very important right So guys let's quickly go on to check out the responsibilities of a systems engineer. Now a systems engineer uh, you know is a very important part of uh, of the cloud computing platforms. He or she must have the complete ability to work with the virtualization technologies. Uh now with virtualization technologies what we're trying to say is let's say uh, you know there are 10 people 100 people or 500 people who want to use your cloud computing platform every time they log in maybe they require a virtual operating system right so to assign all of that to make sure that uh you know you're taking your server you're providing access to all the people that require it right so maybe some people are using just an internet connection and a laptop and they want to get connected to your cloud computing platform so you have to have the ability to work with the, whatever is the latest technology to align with what the user and the client requires right that's an important thing the second uh, important responsibilities of a system engineer is to actually go on to create a uh, fault tolerant systems now fault tolerance is very important what happens uh, you know when when you speak about making your product robust you're talking about uh, you know what happens or what can we do to make sure that uh, you know the product does not fail this is fault tolerance when you're talking about disaster recovery you talk about okay so what do we do after the product has failed or after you know something has failed right so uh, the fault tolerance system talks about prevention and disaster recovery talks about a cure that's a very important thing you have to know so coming to the point here you guys have to have the ability to completely uh, look towards creating managing and also deploying these uh, systems in a way that you know they are uh, fault tolerant that they have the capability to stand against the test of Of, uh, uh, you know the test of time. Uh, let's say, right? It's a very important thing. The third thing is to make sure that you have the knowledge of how you can understand uh, the data flow. Uh, you know, in the provided architecture, right? Now, data might flow very differently in AWS compared to how uh, the pipeline is set up when you take a look at Azure or GCP. So, having an understanding of how the data natively moves around is a very important uh, responsibility that you guys must have. and it's not just that uh, you you also require the ability to also keep a tab on the costs right now 
you know in many cases this is a very common thing there is a service or something that someone has uh, started and they forget to turn it off if you do that you will actually get billed for the usage regardless of you using it or not as per the cloud computing platform it is allocated to you it is blocked to you and it is working for you right in those particular cases you are uh, being charged for it. So you have to be very careful as a systems engineer to make sure uh, that you know you only have services running which are required and you have to stop or terminate the sessions uh, which are not required it's not only just sessions uh, sometimes you have to sit on the strategy side of things to analyze and assess in detail about what it takes for the company to run uh, uh, you know on the cloud computing platform guys this is a very very important thing that you guys really have to work on uh, you guys really have to know about right perfect next let us take a look at the responsibilities of an application developer now a cloud application developer is going to require knowledge of programming as i just mentioned right usually a high level programming language like python java or whatever it is so you're going to have to uh, you know no programming as an application developer because you will be the person writing the application right you'll just be doing it on a cloud computing platform and aligning it uh, to the platform itself the second thing is that you are going to require knowledge about sdks or as they are also called software development kits now these sdks govern how you can go want to use these programming language to its fullest you're going to require all of that if you're writing a software right now the third thing is another beautiful concept in the world of cloud computing is containerization right now we're going to talk about containerization in detail in the upcoming modules but for now you really have to know uh, that uh, you need the capability as an application developer to go on to make use of uh, containerization tools uh, the latest techniques that are present here and to know that you know you can have data processing you can have data storage cut it down into smaller chunks and uh, store it safely use it safely whatever it is right so you can you you will require knowledge first of all that you can do it second of all how can you do it right that's required now the fourth point here is whenever you go on to write an application or uh, for all the people who have been into programming uh, you know who's checking out this video i think you will understand that uh, whenever you write a piece of code there's a good chance that there might be a small error or sometimes a huge error there as well right you cannot do anything about it uh, you have to just fix it uh, and you have to make sure that everything works before you deploy it to your uh, customers clients or whatever it is right so it so happens that you need to have uh, control over your applications number one the second thing is you need to have uh, the understanding of uh, how to fix something when things go wrong especially in your code right so Uh, many cloud computing platforms today provide a lot of tools which will help you with debugging and will make your deployment tasks easier as well but to go on to use them you're going to require skills so that's an important thing that i have to highlight here perfect we checked out an applications developer's responsibility next we're going to check the responsibilities of a solutions architect So guys a solutions architect is a person who knows first of all let's be clear with it a lot about cloud computing itself this person has to have the complete capability of knowing two entire platforms moving and migrating from one platform to another you know you might have complex applications which will require services from another platform you are going to require complete working knowledge hands on knowledge of doing this that's why a solutions architect is uh you know is always in requirement very high paying salaries and you know always trending right so this task itself requires a lot of skills guys uh the second thing of course is to have the complete capability to understand and know that you have to design and develop enterprise grade solutions using these cloud computing platforms so when you say enterprise grade uh, there's a good chance on the other side the users of these enterprise grade uh, uh, you know platforms or tools are going to be people in the thousands if not in the millions so that's why they call it enterprise grade so you have to have the ability to build and deploy systems based on that Now the third thing is you must have the complete capability to build a complete solution a reliable cloud computing architecture which is not only uh, there's usually a tug between reliability and how scalable it is but you have to have a small balance which says hey my cloud computing platform is completely scalable today if i am catering for 1000 people tomorrow if i have uh, 35000 people who come in i i have to accommodate that automatically and you have to also say okay so how reliable are we taking into consideration that you know you are uh, a cloud computing platform is scaling up and down rapidly right so you have to have uh, this kind of an approach into thinking there as well now the fourth thing is that whenever you take a look at understanding what services are required 
it is not as simple as it sounds because see there are uh, you know a lot of services which all of these big guys provide so for you to select what service is required to develop what application is a skill in itself as well at the end of the day things sometimes can get confusing because there are three or four services in aws or azure that do things similarly right i'm not just saying aws versus azure similarly is that in aws itself there are three c4 services which will do a uh, similar thing so you need to know what is the best one for your uh, application to go on to use it guys this is a very uh, important responsibility for a solutions architect right perfect guys now that we checked out the roles now that we checked out the responsibilities for various designations uh, in the cloud computing platform let us now take a look at one or two job descriptions to make sure that we are aligned with the industry about whatever we just learned right Take a look at this uh, job description from this company called Invesco. They're asking for a junior cloud engineer, right? They say you have to have the complete capability to build data pipelines using, uh, you know, the latest data engineering techniques, the latest cloud architectures and all of that. This is the point we already discussed, right? Next, you have to have the capability to manage your application and integrate platforms, uh, maybe using AWS cloud components. Another point we discussed. The third thing is you have to understand the business and uh, you know know the full life cycle of a development when it comes to developing your application, deploying it, reporting, integration, all of these things, right? Everything from planning and design all the way to rollout, you have to know it as per a software development standard, right? Something called agile, uh, you know, so we already discussed this point as well. Take a look at the fourth point. They say you have to be responsible for data availability for business reporting within the SLA. Now, what this means is that whenever there is a requirement that says, hey, you know, this the client is doing this, the data has to be there. It should be available when that is there. So you have to do, own up to your, uh, uh, you know, requirement to say, hey, so, okay, so we have to pull data from here. It has to be uh, brought here. It has to be put there for the uh, client to use and all of that. So data availability, making sure, first of all, that your data engineering pipeline is set is one thing. The second thing is to align your engineering pipeline to the cloud computing platform and use the services to the best of its abilities, right? That's an important thing. And, uh, you know, all these points that we see from an actual job, job description which i just pulled out a day ago uh, you know you're going to see that uh, whatever we just learned aligns to this now let's take a look at a mid tier mid level uh, uh, you know uh, no not, not a complete senior level senior level we're going to check out so this is in between a junior and a senior role right so ibm are looking for a cloud engineer now they say that you have to have uh, the complete capability to build new cloud based data center services so you have to build service environments uh, for cloud initiatives again we already spoke about this you have to assist with the planning potential of new features new capabilities new cloud services yes this is a very important thing right so it's not only you using cloud computing features you have to also sometimes if you're working for aws itself you have to create new services which people would want to use right now ibm is a cloud provider ibm cloud is again a very fantastic cloud service provider out there so you have to sometimes uh, make sure that you know you can provide services create services using ibm uh, similarly to what uh, aws azure or the people at gcp do Perfect, right? The third thing is you have to be a subject matter expert on all of these latest technologies, cloud-based technologies, uh, understanding what the market requires, understanding what the trend requires and align your learning, align your applications to that. Again, uh, we've discussed this in a lot of these points uh, that we checked out, right? Take a look at the fourth point. Fourth point says you have to collaborate with internal and external parties to perform high level uh, technical objectives into comprehensive technical requirements. So there are objectives which have to be met. So, uh, the client is going to come to you and say, hey, this is what I require. You need to have the skills and the manpower to say, okay, so we're going to take it from an objective and we're going to actually go on to create a product out of it. We're going to create an application out of it or uh, you have to map the requirements on your side that says, hey, here is everything that I require to achieve these objectives. Now, this is a very, very important pro uh, an important point here. And again, this, uh, this was among one of the points that we already discussed, right? Now, let's take a look at a senior cloud engineer's role. Uh, people at Apple are looking for a senior cloud engineer. Uh, they say that you must have a good amount of experience in enterprise-ready cloud warehousing platforms like Snowflake. Snowflake is a, a good platform, so they say it's highly valued if you have that. You're going to require proficiency in terms of big data tools. Uh, you're going to require knowledge of SQL. Of course, you'll be working with databases. You're going to require that. You know knowledge about data stores. You're going to require hands-on knowledge about Spark cluster frameworks, Kubernetes, uh, you know, you're going to require pro 
proficiency in at least one of these programming languages python scala or java now ladies and gentlemen take a look at all the four points first thing we said you have to be able to provide enterprise gate solutions done the second thing is that you will be working with a lot of data so it's always added to know a high level programming language when you even taking a look at a querying language such as sql we discussed this the third thing is you'll be working with big data whenever you're working with these big data technologies all of these apache tools right spark is basically spark scala all of these are from apache foundation so you need a working experience of that as well and alongside all of these you're going to require another programming language be it python scala or java right so uh, we took a look at a junior's role we took a look at a mid tier role and we took a look at a senior cloud engineer's role and we aligned everything so i hope uh, whatever we discussed in terms of theoretical aspects adds up and uh, now you understand that hey uh, you know whatever we are learning here is exactly what is being required by the industry itself if you would not know uh, this how will you even know what to learn where to learn uh, you know if you if you say hey you know i want to i want i want to become a cloud engineer for apple you're going to have to know all of this right so if you know that hey this is what apple wants you can sit and eventually go on to learn all of that and uh, you know apply for uh, uh, for a job there but if you do not know that you cannot do it guys so this is why it's very very important uh, for you guys to go on to do this right perfect now guys to talk about uh, you know the salary Uh, trends for cloud computing i am sure you guys are very 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 curious uh, to talk about these uh, salary trends uh, without further ado without any further discussion let us actually get uh, into and look at the numbers now as an associate cloud developer with maybe 0 to 1 year of experience the salary is fantastic in india uh, there's an average salary of somewhere around 7 uh, lakhs per annum or around 8 lakhs per annum in indian rupees of course and in the us it's somewhere around 63000 dollars now these are considered by taking a in the lower threshold and the upper threshold and making an average out of it as well now if you're familiar with the world of it you will know uh, that you know sometimes it so happens you might get a salary which is below Uh, the average salary and sometimes a number which is way way above the average salary as well in those cases to avoid this kind of a discrepancy we always talk about the average salary and as you can see the average salary considering even lower salaries is a fantastic number uh, for an associate developer who is just starting out uh, in the industry right that's a very important thing So after being an associate cloud developer you will be working towards being a senior cloud developer as a senior cloud developer uh, the salaries are fantastic look at the salaries in india it's somewhere around 13.5 lakhs per annum in the us it's somewhere around 85000 dollars these numbers go up and up i have seen i have uh, senior cloud developer friends who are making uh, uh, you know north of 18 20 lakhs per annum with just two or three uh, years of experience guys so numbers are achievable just consider this uh, for you your experience understand that uh, you know you can beat all of the benchmarks that you're literally seeing on your screen right now but you have to work for it right perfect now after a cloud and cloud developers role a senior developers role the next thing that you can go on to becoming you know with probably 5 6 7 years of experience is to become a cloud solutions architect right a cloud solutions architect gets somewhere around 25 lakhs per annum in india and around 130000 dollars in the usa and again i have cloud solutions architect friends uh, cloud architect friends, and these guys make a lot more than 25 lakhs per annum in india itself so for all the people who say hey is are these numbers achievable in india are these achievable in us uh, are these achievable in uk and all of that it definitely is achievable what all of these guys who hire uh, you as experts are looking for is your skills so if you're highly skilled they are ready to pay you the amount that you ask that is the freedom you get in cloud computing which i've rarely seen uh, in any other it industry right perfect now after a solutions architect what's next well the next thing is you'll be working on becoming a manager a cloud product manager you will know the in and out uh, uh, you know of cloud development uh, of what goes on in the cloud computing platform itself as a product manager the average salaries you know go up from uh, 30 lakhs per annum all the way to 50 60 lakhs per annum in the usa it's somewhere around 170000 dollars all the way to 200000 dollars per annum now these are fantastic numbers and 
uh, it it doesn't have to say that you know no one uh, has put a limit saying you have to work for 10 years to become a cloud product manager maybe you are very skilled at this maybe you're learning at a very rapid pace you absolutely love cloud computing you can become a, a cloud product manager with maybe 5 6 years of experience right you see people that's possible when you go on to linkedin and you search for designation and you see uh, uh, you know how much years of experience people had to get to get uh, you know to get to the point here well, it, it, it shows, right? So it's a very important thing that you guys have to understand. So to bring together all the numbers, here are uh, the numbers of the salaries of the associate cloud developer, a senior cloud developer, a cloud solutions architect, and a cloud product manager as well. So guys, uh, we have covered a lot of important things in module number two, right from the trends, understanding the roles and responsibilities. We took a look at how we can align your roles and responsibilities to the current requirement with some of the latest job descriptions from the junior level, mid-tier level and senior level. We also discussed the salary trends uh, in detail as well. So I hope this adds a lot of value to your own knowledge about the domain in which you're about to invest your time and your effort to learn it, right? So I hope this module adds a lot of value for your learning. With that, guys, you've come to the end of the module. I'll see you in the next one. So guys, welcome to module number three. Now, module number three is a very important one because here we're going to actually discuss how the world of cloud computing works. Now, uh, there are so many things that you guys have to know with this particular module, which is going to act as a foundation going ahead with the next couple of modules. So it becomes very important that you, uh, you know, pay full attention when we're going through this particular one, right? So guys, uh, without further ado, let us actually go on to take a look at understanding what it is that we're going to cover in module three, which is the working of cloud computing. Now, there's a good amount of detail that we're going to cover here, but uh, we're going to start out by understanding how the world of cloud computing even works now there are certain very very important components that uh, you know come together to make this world what it is so we're going to discuss all of that as well second thing we're going to discuss is how redundancies work in the world of cloud computing now redundancy in a uh, in a simple example is like uh, having the same uh, photo backed up in two or three uh, pen drives or two or three mobiles right now that's a redundancy we're going to discuss how that's a good thing in the world of cloud computing uh, the third thing we're going to discuss is a very important thing is we're going to check out how, uh, you know, clouds can be deployed for businesses to actually be used, right? Now, since we're trying to align our learning with what's happening in the industry, uh, it becomes vital that you understand, uh, you know, what type of these models, what type of these deployments are actually the ones that are being used today so that, you know, when you're preparing, you can learn towards that, you can push towards uh, understanding one or all of these deployment models and then, uh, you know, you can build upon using that right perfect now after that we're going to take a look at understanding the cloud computing architecture again there are many important components uh, the working of cloud computing itself uh, is a fascinating thing to so to dive deep into it to understand how it works is a fascinating thing so i'm sure you guys will enjoy this particular point right the next thing that we're going to have to check out is the differences uh, between having a cloud computing environment and of course you know having your own solution as an on premise architecture now if you don't know what on-premise architecture means absolutely no issues we're going to discuss all of this right and lastly we're going to take a look at the drawbacks of using cloud computing now if you have realized over the last two modules all we have been talking about is the immense amount of advantages right sure there are certain amount of disadvantages as well uh, you know if i can talk to you about 100 disadvantages repeat. So if I can talk to you about 100 advantages, I definitely can tell you about 10 disadvantages, uh, which may or may not be a concern for your business using cloud computing. So these are some very, very interesting things uh, that you guys have to know about, right? So perfect guys, I hope the agenda that we're going to cover in this module is clear for everyone. On that note, uh, we can go on to begin with the first point. So how does it work, uh, you know, cloud computing? Well, guys, I want you to head to the comment section and tell me what your thoughts are about, uh, you know, how you think cloud computing works. So head to the comment section and let me know. And, uh, you know, while you guys go on to do that, let me talk to you about two of the most important components. In fact, it's three components, but I'll tell you why these two happen to be the most important ones, right? So, uh, you know, in a cloud computing environment, an important thing is we divide the working into two parts. 
one is the front end and the other is the back end now when someone says hey you know we're trying to do something in the front end especially if you talk to web developers right they are usually uh, you know throwing around this term front end back end and all of that so what does it actually mean to give you a very simple example you know let, let us actually go into the terms of web development itself when you go on to uh, uh, you know amazon's website maybe you want to buy new shoes or something right as soon as you click amazon uh, dot in you go into their website you see all of these shoes is that is the front end what you interact with directly uh, you know the images the prices there's a discount there's an offer running uh, you can see uh, you know what address it has to be delivered to everything right so whatever you can see feel and interact uh, on a web page is considered to be the front end now uh, there is this kind of a division that happens saying hey data is not stored on the front end but data is stored in the back end what do we mean by that now whenever you have to show something on the website uh, you have to have data for it right for example images of all the shoes that you want to buy the image has to be stored somewhere physically now that image actually is stored on an amazon server in the back end right now that server can be as you know as always anywhere across the world now that becomes the back end there is a link uh, that goes on between the back end and the front end in such a way that whatever data is required and uh, you know addressed to by the front end the back end has the capability to provide this if it is applicable right now when you usually search for images of shoes you usually don't get images of uh, like let's say food or uh, you know shirts or something right you get the picture of shoes because the back end knows what it is being asked for and then it provides the exact same thing to the front end this again is a very important thing this distinction that has been created because the front end is a very very complicated thing to work on its own and a back end thing is again another completely different entity which is very complex to work with the data storage data handling uh, you know data manipulation you have to do so many things to make sure that your back end is ready to giving the data uh, to the front end right so in this particular case when we go on to dive a little deeper into understanding why there's a split in between these two we have to understand uh, you know what it is that we're doing this for and of course you know why it is considered important the front end is a very important thing uh, you know it will give you access to everything that is stored on the server instead of you directly connecting into the server you look at an interface which connects to the server on behalf of you of course indirectly you are still connected there but it is not like you are uh, you know opening up multiple folders uh, of data that's present in the server and then looking at pictures of shoes right so the same thing happens on cloud in fact the web development example i gave you also works on the cloud itself right so wherever the user has to access any sort of data you know it is it doesn't have to be data it can be a very simple button which says add to cart uh, remove from cart all of these are operations which are making uh, your user experience better right so this is uh, this is what defines the entire aspect of user experience so whenever someone says hey uh, you know amazon has such a nice user interface flipkart has such a nice user interface or any other app or web web application or anything that is it is because the front end has been designed in such a way that they know what the users are asking for and they're providing the exact same thing that is why uh, the front end is popular and of course whenever you use your applications as well right you're using the front end of youtube uh, right now it is not like you're typing in zeros and ones and uh, you know directly heading to the server uh, and accessing the file that is present there right your the same file is coming to you through the front end perfect now to talk about the back end back end is where everything right all the servers all the data and everything that is ever needed by the front end is actually stored there now uh, to give you a quick examples uh, you know whenever you go on to see some websites right now there are many sites uh, which uh, give you like a graph or something that shows uh, how far away the covid-19 pandemic has spread uh, you know by each country you can see uh, which cities have uh, the most amount of infection and all that right so you look at this uh, beautiful looking graphs and dashboards now uh, to power all of these graphs and dashboards there has to be certain data which went into creating all these uh, graphs right especially if they're real time graphs as in the graphs that keep changing as in when the data is changing the data is directly linked to it from the back end so directly it can access the data from the server it can send a request and the back end uh, you know responds to that particular request and this is how uh, 
you know the entire world of cloud computing is in fact catered uh, front end always puts out a request back end uh, checks if it's a valid request or not and then it responds to the request and uh, beat any simple service beat any complicated service this kind of a transaction that happens between request and response is the foundational concept of how uh, you know you would connect to a network yourself right now whenever you go on to amazon's website as well you're trying to request something uh, through the front end which again the data is going to be in the back end to bring so i I hope this clears up uh, everything that you have to know with respect to the front end and with respect to the back end, right? Now, there's a very important concept, another one called as middleware. Now, this is specifically in the world of cloud computing because middleware is actually a software platform, uh, you know, which acts like a bridge in between two devices or two applications. Now, uh, you know, middlewares are very, very common here. Uh, it is used by the end users directly. When you go on to use your laptop to access Amazon's website or you use your mobile uh, to access Amazon's website, what you're actually trying to do, you're using your device to connect to another device which has the data, right? So there has to be certain in software which understands what it is that you're requesting and what it is that the server has to give back so it sits in the middle as it sounds right between the server between the user the middleware acts as a bridge right it's a software platform it's a very important concept and at the end of the day, when you think about it, uh, direct usage is not there. You're using it, of course, right? You're not building the bridge, but you're crossing the bridge. That's an important thing you have to know. Directly, it's not used by the end user, but by all the developers who want to make sure that their cloud computing platform is accessible to the world. And whenever your application is on this platform, uh, that you know it can be accessed via multiple hardwares and softwares across the world, right? To go on to do this, middlewares are very, very important. It is considered as, uh, you know, one of the most important aspects aspect of how you can expand your world of cloud computing, right? If you just had one laptop and one server and there's nothing else that could connect to it, that would not serve as a cloud computing platform, to be honest, right? A cloud computing platform must be able to be accessed through from anywhere across the world if you have a stable internet connection, right? Now, I hope this clears up three important things, uh, the front end, the back end, and the middleware, right guys? Perfect. Now, uh, once you go on to understand that, there is another important concept here called redundancy, which is uh, vital for the working of cloud computing. Now, whenever you have certain data, let's say you have uh, 200 uh, gigabytes worth of data that you have to store in the cloud computing platform, uh, you might think that all 200 gigabytes might just sit on the same hard drive on the same server every single time, but it is not the case. So your data can, of course, uh, you know, be there on the single server, it can be there in a common place and all of that. But usually what happens is it is split across the world and there are multiple backups of the data and there are backups of the backup itself. Now, why is it that the world requires, uh, you know, so much of redundancy, right? The most important thing that we have to talk about here is all of these things that can affect your application in a way. Now, a very important thing that you have to know is if there is a downtime with your cloud computing platform, right? Be it AWS, GCP, let's say your application is on the cloud computing platform, your company is running on the cloud, uh, but there is something wrong with the cloud and their platform shuts down for maybe five or six hours. For the big companies who use this, uh, it is going to account for a financial loss of millions of dollars just because of a couple of hours of downtime, right? Now, probably for us who do not use a cloud computing platform, if we lose our internet for one or two hours, I don't think there's a drastic change of what might happen. Of course, uh, you know, this is not the same for everybody, but if this happens for the cloud computing platform where your entire company's data is sitting, well, you are going to take a big loss, right? So what are the things which affect uh, the working of cloud computing? The first thing of why you would require redundancy, I think, is security threats, right? Now, let's say you have all your data on a server, which is probably sitting in Mumbai. And uh, if the server is breached, uh, if there are security threats, if there are people who are hacked into the servers or someone came, stole the hard drives, you know, all of these are sometimes hypothetical, but sometimes they have actually happened, right? So with security threats, be it threats to software, be it actually storming into a data center and uh, you know running away with all the hardware, you have to think about it. If your data is present only on that server, if something happens to that server, if something happens to that hard disk, well, your data is lost, right? So 
to make sure it doesn't come to this, you back it up in multiple places. Now with multiple cloud computing platform, this backup is an automatic feature. There's multiple storage services given in a way where as soon as you push your data, let's say you have one image that you put to your cloud computing platform, this will automatically get back up in, backed up in multiple servers to make sure that even if there is something wrong with one server, your data is still accessible. You can pull it from another server, right? The second thing has to be natural calamities. I think when the force of nature uh, comes into play, there's not a lot that we can do, right? Think about uh, tsunamis, think about uh, earthquakes and all of this. Usually these data centers are placed in a safe place where, uh, you know, there's not a lot of these activities around, but then you never know. Sometimes it might happen that an entire data center can stop working if there's an earthquake. As we have discussed in the previous modules, hardware and software, especially these uh, electronic items are very, very susceptible to all of these things. So since they're very delicate, they have to be cared for uh, in a very important way. Now, there could be a very small thing. For example, there's an earthquake, but the building is fine. Your servers are fine and all of that. But something happened to the cooling system. Now, even for the cooling system, there's usually a backup cooling system because if this one fails and, um, you know, you cannot just shut down a data center and uh, tell your clients to say, hey, wait up right? So you have to move terabytes and terabytes worth of data to another data center to actually shut it down. And that usually doesn't happen. So even if a small thing is wrong with your cooling system, your entire server thing is going to shut down because if it cannot cool, it's going to touch really high temperatures and there's going to be an automatic shutdown which says, hey, sorry, uh, at this temperature, if the servers keep working, they're going to destroy themselves, right? So that's an important thing that you have to know about natural calamities. Now, the third thing is data breaches. I, again, as I've mentioned, uh, you know, sometimes it so happens that uh, with the cloud computing platform, if you're not careful with all these authentication keys and access protocols, someone might be able to access your data, misuse it and, uh, you know, uh, cause uh, you to have, first of all, be panicked. The second thing is misuse of your uh, data is something which is not considered as a small thing. Uh, the third thing is that it might hurt your company in a way where you know someone just came into your server, uh, messed around with things, you do not know about it, you go ahead, deliver it, and then once it is live, things go wrong, right? Now, that's a very important thing, uh, uh, which even if it goes wrong, there is nothing you can do. You have to shut it down, rework it, and then uh, bring the application back up again. But you have a backup. What usually happens is as soon as you see that there's a problem, shut it down, uh, start it up in the backup or something called as the, uh, you know, the secondary server node, and then start working on that uh, that will still be working fine because probably with version control it is using an older uh, software or something like that so it makes sure uh, that at the end of the day whenever you're working with the, a single point of data even if it's corrupt even if it's under threat there is something else that will still keep your application running right the fourth thing is data loss. Of course, data loss can be something that's caused by us. Data loss is something that can be done automatically. It so happens that hard drives are susceptible to its life, right? Every time you read and write, you're taking away a small amount of life from these hard drives. If you just put everything on a single hard drive, this might have happened to you. This definitely has happened to me right now. I have lost a two terabyte hard disk, which is full of important data for me. Of course, I'm trying to get it restored and all of that. But if uh, I hadn't backed up all the important information there, I would have lost it. And sometimes you lose it permanently. There's no way to restore them right now. Uh, there are so many important things which might be your personal things, which might be your company uh, related stuff. And this ensures that if you lose it, well, there's sometimes it is not possible to uh, bring it back again, right? Now, if you have important photos, uh, which uh, I think a lot of us, even a silly thing of resetting your mobile and deleting it, uh, these days have become a concern, right? People usually don't uh, remove everything there and then start up fresh because they're scared that, you know, they might lose some photos, contacts or important data. This is one of the reasons why Google Photos has become very popular as well, right? So every time you click a photo, it has the capability to automatically upload it to the cloud. So even if something happens to your device, uh, your photo is still present on the cloud. It is safe and it can be accessed by any device sitting at any corner of the globe if you have an internet connection. Now, these uh, reasons are why redundancies are very important. It is good to have your data backed up. Uh, now, you might ask a question saying, doesn't it cost to uh, add more storage? It does. But I'll tell you what, the failure of your application, the downtime is going to cost 10 times, 100 times more than actually paying for, uh, you know, having your data backed up. So when you think about it, I think it is definitely a worth investment to take a look at this and make sure your data is backed up uh, in the correct way, right? So it is a good thing. 
cloud companies itself providers itself provide you multiple different ways of how you can go on to have multiple copies of similar data and these these options that they give you will ensure that your data is spread across the world again whenever you are being given a you know a, a, this kind of a backup service if they still put it on the same server it doesn't make sense what if that server goes corrupt right so they spread your data out onto multiple servers on multiple continents now you might have a photo which is probably backed up in the us and the uk uh, somewhere in africa or uh, you you know the point here right so it is a good thing to have it is an important thing to have and this redundancy is what adds strength to the platform so it becomes vital that you guys understand that redundancy is a good thing it is required and it is a foundational concept in the world of cloud computing if it weren't for redundancy if you were to move everything on a single server uh, uh, you know sitting on the cloud not just even on the cloud even if it's an on premise network even if it's a server sitting in your office if you have everything on that server if it fails your data goes right so guys redundancy is a great thing to have in the world of cloud computing and i thought you guys definitely should know that since we are discussing the working of cloud computing here right perfect next we're going to take a look at the types of cloud deployment now there's multiple types of cloud deployment out there and i and i think you might have heard of one of these a few of these right there's four very important types of cloud deployment there's public cloud there's private cloud there's hybrid cloud and there's community cloud so let us check out all of these individually understand what is the advantage of using it understand what is the disadvantage of using them as well right so coming to public cloud now you guys know public cloud you might just not know that it is called as a public cloud right public cloud uh, is considered to be the most popular form of cloud deployment out there uh, it is one common infrastructure which gets shared by all the customers out there right whenever you think about it you know, aws is not meant for one company or azure is not just meant for three different companies who only use that particular platform right aws azure gcp all of these are common platforms which are used by thousands of people out there so this infrastructure is common it is shared to the public right a good example is of course aws azure and gcp and this itself is the public cloud so whenever you go on to train to be an aws expert uh, azure expert or gcp expert you are looking towards how you can work best uh, to uh, you know support the applications or make them works using a public cloud deployment methodology right so this is a public cloud but then when you take a look at the advantages and disadvantages the first big advantage uh, that we have to talk about i think is the pay as you go model right with the pay as you go model you are charged uh, on this particular platforms for either every minute or every hour of uh, you know the usage that you go on to make this is very important for you guys to know because when you think about it if you are using a platform for half an hour but you're being charged for an entire day your cost is going to rise up very high right but if you're using it for 37.3 minutes but you're charged for 37.3 minutes it makes sure that you know you are keeping a good check on your value for money as well the second advantage of public cloud platforms or uh, the deployment methodologies here is that you can create highly scalable systems very easily now when we talk about scalability i'll give you a good example today let's say you are a brand or a company uh, who is still new you're an entrepreneur you just started out something you're catering to maybe 10 people today 20 people today and all of that suddenly you start growing rapidly and you have 100 if not 1000 customers and of course you know maybe down the line you have millions of customers who are coming to purchase your products in that particular case you have to have your servers need to have the capability to make sure that it can host every time there is a person who is going to amazon they're making a request and the server is free to respond to it right it has some sort of resources and it can say hey okay so you're uh, requesting something let me respond because i am not busy now if your server is only meant for 10 people and it is continuously catering to these 10 people and now if it sees a traffic in rush of 1000 people there's only 10 people you cannot cater to 1000 people unless you make them wait right that's not the point here the point here is to make sure the company or whatever is the application you're running on the public cloud platform grows as much as it can and i think the most important advantage here when we talk about scalability is 
uh, you as a customer will be pushing the cloud computing platform. Uh, it's not that they will be a limitation. It is just that your company will, there's a good chance that you can never touch the limitations of, uh, you know, what these big guys like AWS, or Azure or GCP provide. If you say, hey, I require 1000 or 10,000 terabytes worth of storage, that would be a piece of cake for them to provide it for you. Right. So it's a very important thing that you guys have to know. Now, these are advantages. What is the disadvantage of using a public cloud? A very important disadvantage that you guys have to know here is that the complete control of how the entire infrastructure works, you know, what is happening with the services, what services gets added, dropped, service, support, hardware, software, all of this is in the control of the person who's providing it, right? So if you're using AWS, the working of AWS itself, the platform itself is in his or her control, uh, you know, whoever is running AWS. Uh, so you do not have that kind of a freedom, which you might say, uh, which, which you might have if you had your own server, right? If you just want to do things differently on your own server, you could. But if you're uh, bound to AWS Azure or GCP, sometimes you do have to think about their own architecture and you have to blend yourself to able to work efficiently in the, in that architecture, right? That's a disadvantage. Sure. Coming to private cloud. Private cloud is a fantastic thing. It's been used for a really, really long time, ever since the days servers have, uh, you know, come up and become popular. A private cloud is a very simple thing. It's a server or it's a network of servers that is being used by one organization. Now, uh, if you can think about a company, maybe your company or anything, they usually might have server racks in the office where this data is usually shared among the employees or it is, it is a, it is a, piece of data that is not put out on a platform out there, right? Like AWS, Azure, or anything like that. And it might be very important data. It might be confidential data and all of these things, which has to be accessed by only certain people, right? It might company your, it might uh, contain your company's secrets, all of these things. Now in that particular case, usually it is better to have a private cloud. And in that private cloud, you can have your own access methodologies. Maybe you want to provide access uh, to that particular server, to the CEO, CEO, and all of those people, but everyone else doesn't have access to that. Well, that is possible to do, right? In this case, you yourself will be completely owning the cloud platform that you yourself will be owning all the servers. If you have a network of servers and if you can access the data from an application anywhere in the world, that itself is actually a cloud computing platform, right? So you are responsible for a lot of different things here, be it infrastructure, be it software, be it hardware or everything in the world that is needed to make it work. In this case, again, you have to take a responsibility for a lot of things, right? Your own backups, your own cooling systems, your own electricity, your own, uh, um, you know, personnel to ma maintain all of these servers. There's a lot of things uh, which adds complexity in the world of private cloud, but then it is still popular. People still use it. There's multiple reasons of why that is the case. And, you know, one of these reasons is that data security you know, will be the highest priority, right? If you're a government organization or if you are something related to military or anything, you do not want your data on a public platform, right? It is encrypted. It is very secure. Data centers are protected by guns. Uh, you know, you cannot hack into it. Firewalls are very, very, uh, you know, tough to break into. All of those are good things, but still your data is out to a company uh, whom you may or may not trust. And sometimes it so happens when you're running governments or usually financial organizations, you do not want uh, to trust your, uh, uh, you know, data with these companies, right? So in that particular case, if data security becomes the highest priority, there is no better place than a private cloud. The second thing is whenever you have valuable assets in your particular uh, cloud computing servers, as we've just mentioned, it is easy to restrict access to anyone. So if you just choose to say, hey, okay, so this person doesn't have to access all of these things. These are important. These are meant only for higher level, uh, uh, you know, employees and all of that. Well, with two or three mouse clicks, you can actually do that. You can restrict access and the person will not have access to the servers. That's an important thing here, right? Confidentiality has to be championed and it doesn't get better than private cloud. Advantages are fine, but there's a disadvantage here as well. So whenever you talk about uh, versatility or whenever you talk about ease of scalability, it becomes very, very difficult and it's a hassle if you have a private cloud. You yourself have to go on to work on it. Uh, scaling up will be a problem. Today you have a server which caters 100 people. Tomorrow you see 10,000 people who want to use it. You have to go buy brand new servers. You have to integrate them with the one that's existing. Uh, you have to buy all the hardware, which is again, lot 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 expensive you have to find new people to maintain these you have to have people who uh, you know work on the software side of things the hardware side of things you have to work on a middleware 
it gets really complex, right? So even though the advantages are immense, there is a very good disadvantage here that you have to consider as well. So now that we checked out the public cloud and the private cloud, there's a very important type of cloud, which again is raising, uh, I would say it's running to its popularity today. That's the hybrid cloud. Now, when you say hybrid itself, uh, what does it mean, right? It's usually a combination of something. A hybrid a car is basically a combination that runs on maybe petroleum and electricity as well, right? So it has both electric motors, which can work on batteries and it has a uh, fuel and an engine which can work. And sometimes they do work hand in hand together, right? So the electric motors can spin faster than the engine to make it go faster and still have the engine working as well, right? So when you talk about this in the terms of uh, the cloud computing system, a hybrid cloud is basically a combination of both a private cloud and a public cloud. Now a private cloud, you know what it is. A public cloud, same, you know what it is. So you bring together a solution where uh, certain companies might have to have both of these, right? They can, they can have a ton of data, which they would not want to store on their private cloud. So they could, you know, move everything to a public cloud platform, but they can also have some very, very important data that they think that that should not leave the organization itself. So they can have it on their uh, private cloud, right? But then, of course, the private cloud aspect of things cannot scale up uh, with respect to the demands that are there. Uh, but in the case of a hybrid uh, cloud technology, what it usually happens is that all your data, all the compute power comes from the public cloud platform. So it is doing all the heavy lifting for you in a way where your private cloud is there for the sake of it. You can have all your data stored there. You can do a little bit of computing, but the heavy lifting that goes on is usually by the public cloud platform. So you're getting the advantage of having a huge uh, ocean of resources and still having a good amount of data security. That is what, uh, you know, makes hybrid cloud really, really popular. It is considered to be the next new standard uh, for the world of cloud computing itself. And to be honest with you, if there are thousands and thousands of companies who are using cloud computing, I bet uh, that, you know, the majority of them are using hybrid cloud in a way or the other, right? So in one way or another, they are very popular at it. Now, when you have to talk about the advantages and disadvantages of it, I think scalability has to be uh, the biggest thing in the case of a public cloud. The advantage here is you get scalability advantages from a public cloud. You also get the security of a private cloud. When you bring it together, it's the best of both worlds, right? That's the biggest advantage. The second thing I think has to be cost effectivity. Now, when you, when you have to set up your own servers to cater an entire applications, you might have to pay 10, if not 100 times more than what you would do for a cloud computing provider. So have all your data on a public cloud platform. Of course, whatever is not on your private cloud, have it run there, use their services. Whenever it's needed, you can move your data between your private and public cloud and all of that. So in terms of cost effectiveness, it is actually very, very good. And it is extremely cheap compared to just having and running a private cloud, right? Perfect. These are two advantages. Let's talk about one disadvantage here. So whenever you're talking about data be moving uh, in between the private and the public cloud, it so happens that there can be multiple attacks to your data and it can be breached on the way. There's so many different types of attacks, man in the middle attack and all of that, where hackers actually get physically connected uh, into the network between your private and public cloud. They'll start pulling in all your data. You know, they can start feeding in new data. They can replace everything. It is not easy as it sounds, but it does happen. So this one slight disadvantage of when your data moves from the private cloud to the uh, public cloud or vice versa is where, uh, you know, breaches can happen. It, uh, it, it has happened in multiple different cases. This is a downside. It exists. All the cloud computing platforms today are ramping up to make sure that they're providing all the security methodologies to make sure this doesn't happen in the future. But then, hey, as and when the security methodologies keeps going up, I think uh, the people who uh, like to unethically hack into an application also find new methodologies there, right? So that's an important concern that you guys have to know about in the case of a hybrid cloud. Fantastic. Now we've checked out public cloud. We know what's a private cloud. We know what's a hybrid cloud. Now there's another type of uh, cloud deployment model. It's called as the community cloud. So what is community cloud, right? So community cloud is like this common platform. It's very similar to a public cloud platform, but here uh, it is usually based on an industry, right? So there's usually hospitals, healthcare industries who will require similar software and similar hardware, right? Uh, there might be government agencies who say, hey, you know, I want this mix of private and public uh, clouds. And this is common among all the state governments, all the central governments and all of that. And there are companies like banks who say, hey, uh, usually when all these banks work, when someone 
is doing a state of the art security methodologies, usually it's implemented by another bank as well to make sure that their data, their money, whatever it is, is safe. So in this particular case, the huge advantage is that is multiple organizations, uh, usually in the same industry, can use, can make use of these common structures, uh, can make use of these common architectures that exist, whatever it is in terms of security, in terms of performance, in terms of storage. So that, uh, you know, is a very important thing, right? Uh, so with this, you'll have a question saying, okay, so what is the difference between a public cloud and a community cloud then? The most important difference here is that in the community cloud, you can manage it completely privately, even though you're trying to use, uh, you know, the common security methodologies and performance requirements, you still have your data, uh, you know, with you and uh, the added security benefits gives it an even uh, upper hand in terms of uh, the hybrid nature of it is what I'd like to say, right? As I told you, it's very, very popular among organizations who do the same thing. Amazon, Flipkart, uh, Walmart, all of these companies are e-commerce companies. So there are things that e-commerce companies do in common. Of course, it can be very, very different at its functional level, but they usually do the same thing. They have a website, uh, there's an add to cart button. So whatever is the user experience part of it at least remains similar right so these can be a standard these can be a scaffolding uh, you know foundational structure which can be implemented across the industry itself that's the point with community cloud now what are some of the advantages and disadvantages right so with the community cloud, I think the advantages that you have to talk about is that whenever there's an industry requirement that says, hey, this is what, uh, you know, the e-commerce e industry requires, this is what the healthcare industry requires, you can provide solutions using the community cloud easily because since that is the standard, everyone usually looks towards working the standard, right? That's an important thing. The second advantage here is that there is huge amounts of flexibility whenever there is individual companies involved, even though they are from the same industry, uh, whenever you are accessing uh, your protocols, whenever you are trying to deploy your applications, whatever it is, the access that you get is again state of the art. It doesn't make sure it collides with another industry, right? Now, if there are two e-commerce companies, there's a good chance they're direct competitors or indirect competitors as well, right? So it doesn't mean uh, that, you know, both companies are sharing data and all of that. Well, that would uh, sort of hurt the purpose of of the business right so that's an important advantage here the disadvantage that we have to talk about is that uh, usually all of these industry who use these common platforms have the same storage structures have the same performance bandwidth that is usually shared between these companies uh, in the industry so whenever one company starts pulling in or uh, you know more bandwidth than it expected uh, the platform usually doesn't say no it starts uh, you know giving providing the bandwidth that's required and whenever you're sharing things one or two times there can be bottlenecks where you know there's another company which requires performance or storage methodologies but the servers are not able to cater to their request because there's another company uh, uh, you know who probably have a critical task that the servers are handling right so in this particular case you have to understand that whenever you're sharing uh, something right especially with respect to storage with respect to compute methodologies one or two times there will come a situation where there will be bottlenecks, right? So your application will slow down because someone else uh, is using all the resources up. Now, this is a very important disadvantage, which you definitely have to think about and you have to know about, right? So guys, this is public cloud. This is a private cloud. Uh, we discussed about the hybrid cloud and of course the community cloud as well. Coming into a very important aspect of discussion is the cloud computing architecture. Now, how does the world of cloud computing architecture work uh, in the concepts of everything that we've discussed in now, right? So there's two important things, the front end and the back end that we've discussed. Middleware will keep out of it because middleware is just a bridge between the front end and the back end, right? In terms of the front end, there are two important components we have to discuss. It's the client infrastructure and the user interface. Now, the client infrastructure talks about how your application is hosted on the cloud computing platform, right? The back end of your application, how your data is actually accessed. Uh, you know, Amazon's website is very, very different from, uh, say, Nike's website, right? Even though both of them sell products, uh, the fundamental working, the fundamental infrastructure, the fundamental uh, drive of the user experience and the user interface face itself is different. That is where the second point comes in here. Having a customized user interfaces, having, uh, you know, knowing that your user interface drives a good user experience is a very important thing. And in fact, you can actually cater uh, different user interfaces to different people uh, using the same platform. That's a wonderful thing. Now, some people, uh, you know, you might have actually used a concept such as this. Uh, usually browsers or uh, even YouTube, there's something called as dark mode, which you guys have seen. It usually uh, removes all the 
white uh, in the user interface replaces it with, with black so that it's a little uh, easier on your eyes at night or something like that right now i am a person who uses dark mode wherever it is possible but some of the people might still use a light mode they might still want to look at all the white stuff out there right so in that particular case you you you're providing the same user interface but the user experience is very different and it's not like you're using two servers to go on to do this it's the same server it's just that your front end is working slightly differently and this kind of a difference also the data that is powering this difference again comes from where your back end right this is the front end aspect of things the back end aspect of things has a lot of things right first of all it's storage it has physical hard drives physical ssds physical servers which make sure that all the data that is ever needed for your application to run is present there even all the data that powers your application itself is also put there right the second thing is the services cloud computing platforms offer hundreds of services today and all of these services for the services themselves to work they have to be stored somewhere right again they are stored in the back end itself the third thing is all the applications which you uh, are uh, you know using on the cloud computing platform or all the applications that are provided by the platform itself the actual storage of it goes on the application side of things in the back end now the security aspect of things where does the security protocol sit now if everything is sitting on the front end it is usually known by the world and it can be accessed right there are some things which has to be hidden uh, from the front end to make sure that your data is safe and security methodologies are one of these things that has to be uh, you know they usually take a back seat they are hidden in the uh, back end side of things to make sure that people do not get access to it on the front end right on the front end you will see the data but if you do not know where the data is stored in the entire world there is no way you can access it right that, that's a neat trick uh, that is used by you know i think all the companies uh, in the in the world today perfect guys okay, so this uh, bringing together of front end and back end and you connecting to the front end using a valid internet connection right so that is what makes up uh, the entire architecture of cloud computing but then there are certain components that we have to talk about it there's three important things uh, that govern the world of uh, cloud computing architecture it's management software it's something called as hypervisor and it's something called as deployment tools if you have heard of these good enough if you haven't do not worry i'll explain what they are right let's talk about management software management software is a very important entity because it is completely responsible here to manage and monitor what is happening in the entire cloud computing platform because if there is someone who's breaching into your data and accessing it but if you do not know that that's happening well they can just keep doing it right it doesn't make sense to make sure uh, that your data is safe everything is working as it's supposed to this is like a security guard uh, this is like a person um, just like a manager in your company right he or she knows what's going on on the floor who's doing what work uh, you know what's going on with the product and all of that so that's literally the management software in the cloud computing platform as well uh, it is also responsible for an important thing which is contingency planning right if something fails what can we do now planning for contingency is is like uh, uh you know preparing for a disaster but then what happens when the actual disaster happens is taken care by the disaster recovery services right so when your data actually fails from one server you go to the other server and pull it back it's more like a prevention and a cure uh, contingency planning is like prevention try to see how you can avoid uh, uh, you know these kind of uh, uh, data failures and all of that but then cure is when actually something go wrong and you try to make things right again right so this is all of this this entire world is taken care by the manager software the next thing that we have to talk about is the hypervisor now a hypervisor is a fantastic concept because see whenever you use a cloud computing platform if you have ever used it you'll realize that whenever each user connects there is sometimes in the world of virtual computing right so there's usually a operating system that's given to them uh, it's called as a virtual machine and every single virtual machine will have its own operating system and in fact you can choose it do you want linux do you want windows or do you want some other operating system so the hypervisor is actually the entity that is sitting to assign these operating systems to all the platforms and all the users out there so in the back end it automatically knows how to uh, you know move windows into a set of servers so there's a physical set of servers with maybe three or four computers uh, in that one server is usually virtually allocated to a user that says hey this user wants linux so let's quickly install linux and push it to the user it doesn't take 2 hours it doesn't take 3 hours it takes a minute or two to have an operating system ready there and to give it to the user for usage right so to go on to do all of this there's a lot of process 
thing that happens at the back end and all of these things are taken care by the hypervisor. So the management uh, unit takes care of everything on the overlook side of things to assign individual operating systems, virtual operating systems, you have the hypervisor. And the third thing is in terms of deployment tools, right? This is a place, uh, you know, like a bag, which consists of all the softwares, all the configurations that are ever needed to run a cloud service. Now, whenever you think, uh, think about uh, things such as uh, running machine learning on the cloud computing platform. So you have to run Python code on the Google Cloud platform. So you require uh, the Python interpreter there, right? You, you need something on the cloud computing platform that understands Python. So all of the tools, softwares and configurations required for that are again taken care uh, by the deployment tools as well. I just gave you a quick analogy of what it means. And whenever uh, you deploy any of these services, whenever you take it from its working stages to its actual usage stages, you see it's deployed, right? Whenever you're working on an application, it is in the development stage. Whenever you put it out for people to use, it's deployed, right? So. And deploying this on a platform again uh, is usually done by using these deployment tools guys. So these are some of the most important tools, some of the most important concepts, uh, you know, the back end, the front end, the management entity, uh, the hypervisor deployment tools, all of these come together in a brilliant way to create this architecture right perfect guys the next thing that we have to discuss is a very important uh, distinction that exists between a cloud computing platform and an on-premise architecture as well right so we are going to compare it based on four very very important points what does it uh, you know what is the difference of you having your own uh, server in your company you you just storing everything right in front of you versus you you know using a cloud computing platform we're going to discuss four points in terms of deployment in terms of cost in terms of control and in terms of security as well right let's talk about deployment so whenever you're deploying an application right all your resources if it's in a cloud computing architecture are managed by who it's managed by the provider. So whenever you're using AWS, Azure, or GCP to uh, you know put your application there, all the resources that that is needed for your application to run is managed by uh, you know AWS, Azure, or GCP people, right? Perfect. But if it's an on-premise setup, you are the person who has to maintain the software. You are the person who has to maintain hardware. You have to provide support for it. You have to keep updating the software. You have to keep updating the hardware. If something fails, you're responsible. So in terms of complete uh, ease of use and flexibility, I think cl the cloud computing uh, platform usually works better for this point in terms of deployment. The next thing is cost. Again, here as well, cloud computing architecture uh, takes the huge advantage because you will pay as you go rather than just uh, spend thousands, if not millions of dollars to buy everything, right? Because uh, as an on-premise uh, server setup, you are responsible for, first of all, buying all the extremely expensive servers, extremely expensive hardware. Uh, you're responsible for paying the electricity bills to run these and running huge servers are not cheap, right? So you will know the cost of electricity, I'm sure, and then maintaining it, cool it providing electricity for the cooling systems making sure that you know your cooling systems are being maintained and pay for the maintenance people well guys I think you get the point here uh, if I were to pick a side I think you would know which one I definitely would pick uh, the cloud architecture for its simplicity in terms of cost right perfect the next point we're going to discuss is control now, control is where I think the on-premise architecture is very important, right? So as an on-premise setup, you have complete control of your data. You can have your data on your own setup. You can push it to anyone and at any given point in time, you are responsible for your own data. You have your own data to be responsible for. So you'll be retaining everything. And do you want to delete it? You can. Do you want to uh, stop your application from running? You can. Uh, you want to pause it? You can. So you can do everything. Complete control is in your hand. But in the case of a cloud computing architecture, that might not be the case, right? Because if there's an unexpected downtime, let's say AWS has a small failure with a couple of servers or something and your important data is sitting there without which your websites will not work. Even the backups have failed for some reason. Well, in that case, your data is stuck there on their platform and you absolutely cannot do anything about it until they fix it, right? So in this point, I think it's very important to understand that there's a huge advantage uh, for the on-premise architecture here, right? Perfect. Next point, let's talk about security. Security is a very important point to discuss, right? Because in the case of public clouds, uh, in the case of these popular cloud computing platforms as well, be it GCP, Azure or AWS, 
there have been cases where it has been breached into there has been cases where uh, data theft has happened it is not like it is bulletproof and your data never has been stolen there it is not like it happens every day also understand this these are trusted platforms who are doing everything in their power to make sure your data is as secure as possible but as i said there are outlier cases where uh, you know your data has been pulled out but if you have very 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 sensitive information which is probably like you know something for your government uh, or any of your company secrets and all of that it makes more sense to have it in your own server so that you are in control of it you know for sure you are responsible for it and if something happens to you whether of course it's in your head right you cannot blame anyone for it so but then having the flexibility to know hey i have extra sensitive information and i i'm doing everything to keep it safe myself is i think uh, a satisfaction that is uh, that is powering the world of information technology right now because they know that if this is out to the public uh, you know it it might not uh, help them or in fact it might be detrimental to their progress as well right so in terms of security i think it is uh, the on premise setup that works so we discussed four points where uh, you know two points were immensely advantages for the cloud platform and two points were immensely advantages for the on premise architecture so guys at this point in time what is it that you think uh, you know is going to add more value right uh, is it the cloud that is going to work better for the things that you have in your mind or is it the on premise architecture head to the comments and let me know with this we'll discuss the last point on the agenda on this particular module which has to be the drawbacks of using cloud computing right now when we go on to take a look at the drawbacks of using a cloud computing i think one of the most important drawback uh, it is not considered as a hard drawback but it's an important thing that you definitely have to think about is your complete dependency on an internet connection if you do not have an internet connection uh, uh, let's say your application is on the google cloud platform or wherever it is it is deployed it is working fine your customers are accessing and all of that there is one important bridge there is one important point without which none of this will work it's the internet right so even if you have the best of the best internet connection sometimes if there's a downtime you cannot access something that's going on in your cloud computing platform that's going that might hurt you right i'm not going to say that's going to hurt you that might hurt you so internet becomes such a big thing that if something happens to it things come to a grinding halt right so this is a important drawback that you have to understand if you have it on premise only you can directly hook your laptop up uh, into the server and even if there is no internet you will have a virtual private network in a way where you are just connected to the server the server is connected to your organization it is working fine if the internet stops well nothing happens your data is still safe on your server you can still access it you can still work with it and do whatever it is that you want just that you probably cannot push it outside uh, your organization without an internet connection right perfect the second disadvantage that we have to talk about is the trust that goes uh, into uh, you know this particular platform itself right now uh, you know my train of thought here is that uh, i would trust and care for my products a lot more than someone else might they say that they're going to do it yes they might but at the end of the day if i am taking care of a piece of uh, you know for example think about it like uh, my bike or my car for example now i am a junkie who works on my bike and car so i have all the tools that's required i sit i trust it at the end of the day and uh, i am proficient uh, on working on it on critical systems such as braking systems and all of that so uh, when i'm when i'm riding i have the confidence saying hey i took care of it i did things correctly and i know that it's going to stop if i apply the brake right the same thing with your data can uh, you know it's very difficult thing to say that someone else that you have given your data to will make sure that you know that they would care for it the same that you would care for it right sometimes it so happens that you can you know work on your product better than someone else working on it because at the end it's yours and it's not theirs they're probably doing it as a service for you but for you it is more than a service right this is an important drawback that you guys have to know about right perfect the third thing is security i think uh, we have spoken about this for a lot of time now you guys will know what i'm going to talk about here you know companies cloud computing companies are going to say that hey we are the best in the world we provide top notch security all of this everything is fine but sometimes again with data breaches with uh, people having uh, access to the data that they're not supposed to access sometimes it so happens that they are not as secure as they originally claimed to be right again i'm not making any accusations against any companies here but it 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 has happened in the past and if that data is important to a company and it's out to the public world well guys that can be detrimental so you know this point let us not discuss further it's a very important thing it's a it's, it's a drawback that is existing and uh, with 
again with with time it is improving right so there's a lot of new te- security methodologies that are coming into the picture i think this next point that we're going to discuss downtime is a very important one uh you know i i read it uh, i think way back in 2018 or something that there was a downtime with aws uh, maybe in 2017 or something it cost companies millions and millions of dollars because some aspect of uh, aws or was it azure i don't actually remember it's just that something wasn't working you know some of these servers physically shut down there was a problem with their data center so something happened that downtime reflected in the way where uh, millions and millions of dollars uh, were lost in just in a matter of 3 or 4 hours just because all these companies are completely dependent on these platforms right if something happens to them these companies are the ones that are going to take the loss again there's going to be uh, disaster recovery services there's going to be agreements and dealings with the platform and the user itself but at the end of the day if there's a downtime there's absolutely nothing you can do as we discussed uh, in the previous points where we compared on premise architecture and uh, you know where we took a look uh, at the advantages of cloud computing as well right perfect so guys these are uh, some of the most important drawbacks but here's another one which you might not have thought of it's vendor lock in it becomes important that you understand that your company maybe is running completely on aws but there is a service that aws is not providing but this service is being provided by azure now that would be a very critical service that has to be implemented uh, for your uh, particular uh, you know requirement so what usually people do i've seen this this happens popularly is people start jumping ship uh, someone who's using aws will completely want to move to azure someone who's using azure completely wants to move to gcp vice versa whatever it is so once you're switching to one from one provider to another it's a very very tedious task uh, is going to cost you a lot of money because you're going to require architects who are going to do this it is not as easy as just copying your files pasting it over in their server and say you're done it is going to take months if not years of work by thousands of people working on it at the same time so it's uh you know having a vendor lock in knowing that hey you know you're forced to either use these guys because that's the services that they only provide or uh, that someone else provides another service and you have to jump that process again is very very complex right? so this is an important point that you guys have to know about guys perfect so with this again we come to the point of discussion where how you guys can go on to learn further in the world of cloud computing it becomes important first of all that you guys are not overwhelmed with all the data that is present online a simple google search which says uh, you know which you say learn cloud computing will give you millions of result by the time i do this right so it will get very confusing for you if you do not know uh, without a it's just like a map if you do not have a map you will get lost and uh, it becomes difficult uh, it's even if you have a map you know how to navigate through it if you do not do it in a slow and a structured way it's like you just being dropped in the middle of an ocean you cannot swim from the middle of the ocean to the land right no matter how good you are uh, it there's a chance that you might not do it good chance that you might not do it right so that's an important thing having structured path taking it slow knowing that uh, you know you have a structured way of learning and talking to us experts who have been in this industry for a really long time now will help you make sure that you know you guys uh, have a good amount of uh, learning itself high quality of learning material and a good path to becoming experts right Now on that note we have many places in great learning where you can access free content of course we have great learning academy where you have 200 plus uh, courses for free you can sign up for free enroll into all 200 courses if you want to uh, you can uh, learn for free at the end of it you will be given a certificate of completion absolutely free of course you should know at this point in time the amount of value that a certificate uh, adds uh, to your profile to your resume or whatever it is right so guys make sure you guys are checking out great learning academy and of course uh, since you're watching this on the great learning youtube Ch- channel uh, i know you guys uh, you know know the amount of uh, you know high quality content that we provide here so make sure you guys are subscribed to the great learning youtube channel for more uh, amazing courses and a lot more videos like this and for all the people who love reading we have great learning blogs where i think you definitely should uh, check it out because here again all of these three places uh, we have subject matter experts who are working day in and day out to bring you the highest quality of learning material possible but then at the end of the day in that discussion all the free content in the world will definitely get you started uh, with the these particular platforms but if it has to come to a point where you guys have to be handheld from being beginners all the way to becoming a thorough expert you guys should definitely spend some time on cloud computing specializations right now let me take a quick second of yours to actually uh, uh, you know showcase uh, the cloud computing specialization we have here at great learning so i'll just quickly go into greatlearning.in website i'll click on explore programs and here i'll come to cloud computing right so here we have a post graduation program in cloud computing this is india's first mentorship
leadership driven programs is a six months online course uh, you know this is done in collaboration with uh, great lakes executive learning and it's powered by aws educate uh, you have millions of reasons of why you guys should take a look at this uh, you know you will learn 90 plus cloud services in everything in aws in azure in gcp you will have 15 plus uh, you know hands on labs that you guys will be working on industry level projects you'll get one is to one mentorships 100 plus hours of instructional content live sessions to clear your doubts and uh, you know this is uh, this should not come as a surprise to you guys but great learning is considered to be as india's leader uh, in terms of cloud industry and of course uh, in the terms of how we are the preferred choice uh, for top technology professionals out there right so we are the first ones to actually go on to do a mentorship driven program in india and this is available for international learners everywhere across the world as well upon completion you'll be given a postgraduate program certification that looks like this from executive learning this is going to add a lot of value uh, for your uh, you know for your profile as you've discussed uh, the curriculum is very 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 comprehensive uh, you do not actually require uh, some sort of knowledge to get started with it you will be given all the preparatory work course as you can see uh, you know cloud primer right you will understand the basics of linux basics of python you will go on to take a look at the foundation of cloud you will understand how the cloud works before using it all the big data management tools cloud security migration private cloud uh, big data management microservices containerization all of these things will have quizzes all of these modules will have uh, projects and then you take a look at the top providers out there, right? So you completely learn uh, AWS. So you're a specialist in AWS as soon as you go on to finish this particular uh, aspect of learning. Then you have Azure Essentials. You're going to learn everything there is to know about Azure. Again, with the case of GCP, it's the same as well. You're going to learn everything there is to know. And at the end of it, you're going to do a capstone project where you're working on an industry level use case to show the world that you have uh, uh, you know, worked on solving an industry, industry level problem, right? You'll be learning languages such as Python, Docker, Cassandra, Hadoop, Hive, Terraform, and a lot lot of other languages as well you can actually take a look at all the capstone projects you can find out more about them you can understand about the top faculty these are leading academicians in the field of cloud computing who are going to be teaching these are uh, these people are thoroughly experienced in what they do they're from top organizations and uh, you know they are some of the most amazing people to be learning from so at the end of the day guys you have a lot of advantages here you have many different reviews testimonials you can check out of course uh, it has an admission and a fee criteria as well so you get 300 plus hours of learning Learning, six months of online learning 15 plus industry level use cases 90 plus cloud services and a ton of other advantages as well so make sure you guys are checking it out there's an application process uh, you know all of the details for this are mentioned on our website itself as you can see uh, you can check out the batch dates you can check out frequently rated programs more related programs and of course at the end of it you have a section where you can contact uh, you know us and our experts will make sure uh, to give you a call within just four hours of you guys filling this up to uh, answer any of your queries that you might have in this uh, you know world of cloud computing or of course any other domain itself guys so this is a course that's going to take you from you guys being a beginner all the way to you guys becoming an expert in six months time and i believe uh, that it will add a lot of value but then yes you do have to put in a good amount of time and effort to get there so guys with this we've come to the end of module three i hope you guys are clear with everything that we've covered here because these are some of the most important points we checked out the working of cloud computing we checked out the architecture we understood the various types of cloud deployment models out there. Uh, we made sure to check out the differences that exist between the cloud computing platform and an on-premise structure. And we also took a look at the disadvantages of uh, using cloud computing platforms, right? Perfect, guys. With this, we've come to the end of it. I'll see you on the next module. All right, guys, welcome to module number four. Module number four is a very, very important one because here we're going to talk about various cloud computing providers out there. Now, as we have talked about it in the previous modules, uh, we've come across many names such as Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud Platform, and, uh, you know, even IBM Cloud and all of that, right? We've just spoken about it, but I definitely think that, you know, it adds a lot of value for your structured learning process if you guys know uh, you know these providers thoroughly right so we have module number four discussing just that uh, we are going to take a look at the agenda for this particular module now let us start out uh, you know by taking a quick introduction to understand what uh, you know these cloud computing providers are and who they are how much of market share do they hold uh, you know how big of a company they are and all of that now after that we're going to take a look at some key features of these top providers uh, you know these are sort of the reasons which make them 
become really popular right now whenever we think about cloud computing the three or four names that always comes up aws azure gcp ibm there is a reason that you know in a domain that is worth 400 billion dollars and it is uh, aimed and seemed up to go up to you know somewhere around 800 billion dollars uh, you know in the next uh, couple of years i think it adds a lot of value to understand why there are always three names or four names that comes up in such a huge huge uh, domain right perfect after we understand all the key features and the reasons that make uh, this cloud computing platforms what they are, uh, we're going to take a look at all the popular clients of these top providers based on the amount that they actually spend. Now, when you usually say top uh, providers or popular clients and all of that, it is very hard to uh, you know put a, a judgmental factor on it and say, hey, here is why uh, you know these companies are popular and here is why they prefer AWS, right? But a really good way to go about it is is to use data and to back up everything that we're going to say right uh, we're going to say hey so uh, you know linkedin is a really popular client of aws because they spend so much uh, you know so and so money on a monthly basis on a yearly basis or whatever so we're going to take that approach uh, in point number three and in point number four uh, we'll have a quick again a numerical comparison you know between all the services that these guys provide uh, you know who's doing what what are the number of services that are in the market right now what's in demand there's a lot of numerical data that we're going to use for a straight up comparison uh, between AWS, Azure and GCP, right? Okay, guys, so I hope the agenda that we're going to cover in this session is clear to everyone and we can go on to begin module number four. So I hope you guys are as excited as me for this particular module. So let's get started with it, guys. We'll begin, uh, you know, with the introduction to cloud providers. All right. Now, uh, to make things clear, I think it should come as no surprise to you that the cloud providers that you see on your screen right now are, in fact, the most popular ones out there, right? Uh, you know, in fact, there are many, many uh, providers out there. When you think about it, this entire market is not just governed by these four or five people that you see on your screen right now. It is just that these guys are doing things in such a right way or these guys are catering exactly to the requirement of the industry in a way where everyone just wants to use them, right? Now, when you think about companies who are looking to move to the cloud, the first thing they want to see is how easy is it for them to get there? The second thing is how much is it going to cost them? The third thing is, is the cloud computing platform a new one? Is it reliable? Can you trust them with your data, right? All of these points we've already checked out in the previous modules. But at the end of the day, all of, when you think about uh, all of these points, right, the five or 10 important points, which, uh, you know, which add value to the providers themselves, I think it should come as no surprise that these guys are here, right? Because again, there's trillions of dollars worth of uh, companies that you see on your screen right now, be it Amazon, be it Microsoft, be it Google, uh, you know, be it IBM, DigitalOcean, all of these guys, right? Now, uh, usually DigitalOcean and IBM Cloud are, uh, you know, they they sometimes do take the backseat when people are talking about it. You always hear people talk about AWS, Azure or GCP and a little less about DigitalOcean and IBM. In fact, DigitalOcean is actually breaking through the trend now. It's breaking through the chart. It's becoming more uh, popular than ever before, right? So we're seeing these new companies grow up and come to the same scale uh, as the three big boys that you see on your uh, screen, right? Perfect, guys. Now you understand that there's many providers out there. Let's quickly take a look at each one of them. Now, uh, if we have to talk about uh, Amazon Web Services or AWS as it's called, let me tell you a little bit about AWS first. I think when someone thinks about Amazon, they do think about a good amount of trust right now. Uh, you know, I have shopped a lot on Amazon. I'm sure uh, if you're watching this, you might have shopped a lot on Amazon as well. So once you're shopping with them, you're giving them your money even before they deliver a product to you, right? So uh, it's not a company where they take your money and they don't give you the product, something like that, right? So it is trust that you're giving your money to them and they are you know, promise they're giving you what they're promised, right? So this is a monetary transaction. Now, when you think about a data transaction, the same level of trust actually holds, in fact, even more, right? Now, if you give Amazon 100 bucks and uh, they're supposed to give you something back or uh, a product worth 100 bucks, but if they don't, well, it is a monetary loss. But then if you give them certain data, which is confidential, which is used to run your multi-million dollar business, and if you don't trust them, and if there's a chance, I'm not saying that they will misuse it, but uh, you know, if you give it to a company who might uh, you know, go on to misuse it, think about the, uh, you know, 
effects it will have on your company right every company has its own secrets its own ways of working its own trade secrets which it doesn't want the world to know uh, well at the end of the day again you have to think about all of these things right perfect and of course uh, coming back to the point i think aws is very popular because the world uh, trusts amazon right perfect now these guys uh, you know the team the cloud team actually in the world of uh, amazon came up with this wonderful product called as amazon web services way back in the year 2004 uh, it was announced in the year 2004 people were very excited for it and uh, in the year 2006 was when it was actually launched and it said hey we are here to provide uh, the cloud computing platform but then if you look at the trends of cloud computing i think it was until 2010 or 12 that uh, you know aws or azure didn't really take off uh, as quickly as people thought it would but then now it's skyrocketing beyond control right uh, so at the end of the day from then onwards from 2006 to today uh, you know amazon web services is powering guess what hundreds of thousands of companies out there now each of these companies be it small be it medium companies or be it large scale companies generate some amount of revenue right so at the end of the day if they're giving a good chunk of money if 100000 businesses are giving their money uh, to amazon web services i think it shows uh, that you know that these guys are good enough to handle anything uh, that you would throw at them now uh, i already told you that the cloud market is worth somewhere around 400 billion dollars today right but when you think about the market share when you think about who holds uh, the majority share right who gets the most customers uh, who makes the most money in this industry i think it's aws because they hold a 35% market share uh, you know in an industry that is worth 400 billion dollars now guys you quickly open up your calculator just type 400 into 0.35 you will get the amount in billions uh, you know which it shows you how much uh, you know they are worth right it should be somewhere around 100 150 billion dollars and how amazing uh, is that right and it's not just that when you think about experts when you think about uh, practitioners when you think about people who have been uh, in the cloud computing industry for a really long time 10 years 20 years 25 years back when you know the cloud computing industry itself was at its infancy right so when you ask them hey what cloud computing domain would you prefer the majority of them said hey we understand that there's a lot of guys right now aws azure gcp and all of them but we do prefer aws for so and so and so reasons right now when you have experts say um, you know these guys are the ones who made cloud computing industry the way uh, we see today and if they attest to uh, you know the goodness the amount of services the professionalism shown by aws and of course the very powerful services provided by them i think definitely we can take their word for it right so this uh, is something that you guys should understand but then coming to a point where uh, you know you have to understand Uh, you know why AWS is uh, has become so popular these days, right? Because at the end of the day, I think it all comes down to trust, guys. I'll be very honest with you. We've discussed this in the previous modules, and I think you know where I am coming from on this particular point. As I just mentioned, if you have a lot of data, be it confidential data, non-confidential data, it can be a simple photo, right? A simple photo of you is a personal thing for you. You do not want someone else to see it. You do not want someone to misuse it or whatever it is. Even uh, a simple transaction of you. clicking a picture of yourself uh, on on a vacation or something and uploading it to the google cloud you have to make sure that you know it remains safe and only you are authorized to access that right so when hundreds of thousands of companies pour in their trust to a company i don't think uh, you know there should be any other big reason apart from this right so that's why i thought it'll add value to show you guys that this has to be the number one uh, reason that aws is popular when you look at technical side of things uh, yes uh, you know we going to take a look at the next point which is going to add so much value for that uh you know on the tech side of things if i'm being very honest with you when someone thinks about the cloud computing platform the first thing that's going to come into their head is usually photo backups the second thing that is going to come into their head is probably a transaction over uh, the internet maybe like email or uh, you know or something like that right but at the end of the day cloud computing platforms are so much powerful today that they can cater to any sort of workload that you throw at them uh you know be it game development now for all you gamers out there i am pretty sure you guys know the amount of resources it takes to first of all run a game and the immense amount of resources it takes to build a game and create a game right so in the field of game development as well aws is extremely popular there and then when we talking about data processing when the world generates 
terabytes worth of data by the time i do this right so there's so much data that, that was generated right there it could fill up my hard disk 10 times and probably uh, fill up 10 other 10 terabyte hard disks 10 times over just by the second I did that. That is how much of data that the world is generating, uh, you know, every single minute of the world. Now, at the, uh, on the onset of that, it becomes very important for you guys to understand that when you're talking about data processing, it's not just the large amount of data that needs to be processed. It is also the computing power that is needed to process this large amount of data, right? First of all, you're going to need storage. Second of all, you're going to need compute methodologies to help you you know, to do the actual processing, to do the actual analysis. There again, uh, you know, AWS is pretty popular there and no matter how much you throw at it, you will never, uh, you know, bottom out with AWS, right? There is always headroom there. There is always some space for more and you can just add more and more. Uh, you can, uh, I don't think there is a company in the world who have ever tested AWS to its complete limit to its max and said, hey, uh, you know, we have this amount of data, we have this amount of processing and we're going to take up the entire batch bandwidth of your of the platform that you're going to provide i don't think so uh, that any company have done that and i don't think uh, there can be a company who can do that because uh, the amount of services the amount of servers uh, the amount of uh, compute power that aws hold in today's world is the reason why they are the most popular guys uh, you know in the industry right perfect and of course the same reasons that i said spill over to the next industry as well in the case of data warehousing data warehousing also requires uh, you know a lot of people working on it first of all secondly again uh, you're going to have uh, experts who are uh, you know trying to use data warehousing on the aws platform as well which again at the end of the day uh, you know shows uh, why aws is considered uh, you know for this particular domain again it's considered to be very powerful at the same time the other thing that we haven't talked about until now is efficiency right how efficient is aws at handling your data how quickly can they process it and if you upload something to aws for data processing how long are they taking uh, to give you back the result that you're expecting right now that is another thing which is very popular in the field of data warehousing now, I think the next point that we're going to discuss, um, you know, is the reason that makes AWS so popular is that uh, with AWS, the thing is there are uh, so many services, there are so many things that makes your life easy as a cloud developer, right? Now, if you're a person who's an application developer, you know, using AWS, uh, at the end of the day, your job is mainly going to be focusing on your uh, writing your actual code, creating your application and making sure it deploys easily on the cloud right so you will not be breaking your head about how best uh, should you uh, uh, you know look at other things like uh, you know compilers interpreters uh, First of all, to get your code to run, uh, you will not have to break your head to take, think about 100 different things. The time that you would have spent there is now saved and you can use the same time to build the logic, to build a better application, to look at the various development methodologies, to look at the various deployment uh, methods. And, you know, you will probably spend more time, uh, uh, to be very honest with you, about researching how best you can use your application, right? You know that you have your application, you know it is good, and now you want to find the most popular way of how you guys can uh, go on to put it out for the world to use right now you will actually sit uh, you know i've had a lot of uh, you know friends in the industry tell me this as well so they'll be like uh, you know Anirudh, we were taking a look at this particular app we were taking a look at this deployment methodology and we were confused about what to use because every offering at the end of the day is really good but we have to be very careful about what we use you know because that is what is going to remain as the foundation for uh, the product going ahead for that company as well so there's so many things uh, uh, that goes into uh, this particular point as well. Perfect. I think the next point is something that I am a huge fan of. It's the AWS Mobile Hub. Now, AWS Mobile Hub is an uh, application that's available both on the Android uh, Play Store and of course on the Apple App Store as well. So if you guys use Android and iOS or, uh, you know, multiple other operating systems, you guys have access to this. Uh, you know, with your mobile phone, I think these days uh, it's a common trend, right? Uh, having more power, doing a million things that you would do on your laptop specifically that you wouldn't do on your phone uh, is the the trend that is changing today now there was a time when you couldn't click pictures on your phone and now look at where we are you can do a you can do a million things do you want to write python code you can do that do you want to run your entire company which is on the aws uh, uh you know platform using your mobile phone 
you can do that as well right now that's the advantage you can monitor so many different services you can check what's happening you can quickly change things around there's a lot of things uh, that we can uh, you know go on to discuss about the aws mobile hub itself but then for you guys the most important thing right now is for you to understand that there is a feature such as this and the world is very keen on it and they do have millions of people going on to use uh, this application for that purpose as well right guys perfect now once you understand uh, mobile access the next important point we have to talk about is a little deeper into what they offer in terms of database services now cloud computing is a domain where usually when a client comes in they're very particular about the type of data the database that they want or how they want their data to be stored what is the amount of redundancy what is their application what is their dependencies on the data there's so many things that they will say hey this is what i want and you know uh, i will not move away from what i want in that particular case if you have 10 people coming and saying i want a relational database you know i want to go on to use something like sql mysql server or something like that but then someone else comes in and say hey no i want mongodb i'm not going to use anything else for my application apart from mongodb you have to have the capability to provide for both of them right uh, that is the train of thought that has led aws to give us uh, this kind of an amazing versatility in terms of databases right do you want to use relational databases of course you can non relational databases yes Data data warehousing solutions again absolutely yes in memory storage is yes graph databases yes so uh, regardless of where you are regardless of what industry you, you come from or what your application is uh, you can be rest assured that in the in, in the scenario or in the usage of databases at least aw uh, you know aws has something for you guys in a way where uh, you know you would not be uh surprised to say hey oh no you know i did not have this particular database on aws so i had to migrate to something else or i had to uh, move my data into another type of database something like that you will never come to a situation like that in most of the cases uh, because aws does provide so many things right perfect the next thing that we have to talk about is their storage uh, uh, facilities right at the end of the day Amazon is very very well known for their storage services be it Amazon S3 be it Amazon EBS be it Glacier or whatever it is right with EBS uh, you know uh, you usually are very keen on block level storages you know uh, BS stands for block storage as well at the end of the day there is so many things that uh, you know each of these storage facilities can do if you look at Amazon S3 right when you say S3 it stands for S S and S that's why it says S3 uh, it's also like S cube something like that uh, so at the end of the day S3 actually stands for simple storage uh, service it's a very popular one whenever uh, you know usually the files which are accessed by the user like videos or something like that they usually are sitting on um, you know amazon's uh, s3 as well and when you look at glacier glacier is a very popular uh, storage facility usually uh, for backups uh, be it automatic backups be it manual backups uh, you know uh, we don't call it backups all the time we'll just say uh, you know long term storage so maybe you store something here that you probably want one year from now and if something crashes to your main system there's going to be that uh, entity there which is sitting there for a while and we call it what a backup right so that's what uh, glacier is very popular for as well uh, you know so guys we just took a look at databases we just took a look at the storage facilities but then the other thing which is most popular which i uh, you know absolutely love is the case of security right uh, when you take a look at what aws does in the case of security they do provide amazing stuff uh, you know protocol level security done do you want port level access that is also there and uh, they have the complete capability and a very very strong firewall which can filter out any incoming and outgoing traffic in a thorough fashion now when this is the particular case uh, you know when things are being tracked to its most elemental state i think that it becomes very difficult for people uh, you know to have unauthorized access uh, you know to break into the servers to hack into the network something like that right so when uh, people again i think this point directly relates to trust don't you think uh, because with if they are being very secure you will eventually trust them more uh, with your data right perfect the next point that we are going to have to discuss is the aws marketplace now aws marketplace took off like a rocket ship there was absolutely no holding it back it launched in the year 2012 and it's like this online store where you would go and uh, you know buy softwares which are ready to use you would integrate it with your own application you would deploy it using one or two clicks and uh, you know the best part is when you go on to buy a software on ma marketplace or you know go on to use a service there uh, 
the best part is you would uh, still use this service called pay as you go right so just for what you use is exactly what you would pay uh, it's not like you're using a software maybe uh, you, you know to a certain extent but you have to pay the entire amount uh, to this again when we're talking about this it is usually in the hundred uh, uh, thousand dollars or uh, something like that for a very big multinational corporation right so it is something which is helping even uh, the newcomers even the entrepreneurs who are launching on AWS be it the mid-tier companies or of course the multinational corporations who make a uh, really good use of AWS marketplace as well so perfect guys this was everything there is uh, to know to get quickly started about AWS we checked out the introduction we checked out the key features we understood why uh, you know it's popular but then now I think uh, it is very, very important for us to check out uh, the next big competitor in line who's Microsoft Azure, right? Microsoft, I think, is a name that is uh, tattooed in the world of information technology because at the end of the day, I am using an operating system that is powered by Microsoft, right? So they are the ones who created the windows that I'm sitting and using right now. And similarly, I think hundreds of thousands of people across the globe, uh, you know, even for a person who is not initiated into the world of IT will know Microsoft in one way or another. That's the that's the best marketing for a company out there, right? Now that would definitely help in an industry worth four hundred billion dollars, right? Uh, you know, when AWS came out, uh, you know, actually Azure was the second company ever to say, hey, even you know, we are going to launch our own platform, uh, you know, our own cloud computing platform, just like AWS, and these guys launched it uh, in the year two thousand and ten. Uh, since Microsoft was a brand which was already very well established by Bill Gates uh, with respect to the operating system industry and so on, they were already established. They really didn't have to work with, uh, uh, you know, customers not having to trust them. Uh, they really didn't have any issues uh, to get started with as well. So that is the reason why they grew uh, up to popularity really, really quick. And now they stand head to head, neck to neck uh, with uh, AWS as well. The third important point that you guys have to know about Microsoft Azure is that these guys hold the second biggest market share in the industry. We know that, uh, you know, AWS holds 35%, but the second number, I think it's 8% is uh, of the $400 billion industry is held by Microsoft Azure, right? Uh, when you talk to experts on this particular uh, domain, when you uh, ask them about their opinion of Microsoft Azure, you know, every time I've asked about 10 people saying, hey, what's your view on Microsoft Azure, seven or eight of them have always come back to me and say, hey, you know what, when you're thinking about the world of DevOps, thus just think Microsoft Azure. When you're thinking about deploying machine learning solutions, think Microsoft Azure. When you think about IoT, Internet of Things, think Microsoft Azure, right? Now, uh, these guys are the pioneers these guys are the pundits in their own domain and when they come and say hey uh, you know what if it's your requirement is that you should just check this out and uh, you know of course probably check your other options as well but you should champion this because these guys are doing it really well I think it adds a lot of value in this particular domain as well right perfect now coming to the section where we'll quickly discuss why Azure has become so popular I think the first reason for me, for any entrepreneur, for a mid-tier company, for a big company out there right now uh, is the amount that they have to spend on these platforms right now. All of these guys, AWS, GCP, Azure, they give you a free tier account where you can do a little bit of things, explore around. But at the end of the day, if you really have to run your company out there, you do have to pay them for all the services that you use. Now, if there's only one guy, if there's only monopoly uh, here, right, if it's like a monarchy, uh, you know, if one guy gets to set the price, he or she can just set whatever price they want if there's no one to check them on it, right? But then this is where Azure does this really wonderful thing is they help AWS, they help the world keep the price in check. Uh, if AWS increases its price in something, Azure decreases the price for the same services. So people run around and come to Azure and AWS start losing their customers for that as well. So AWS, again, what are they supposed to do to have their customers back? They're supposed to bring the prices down, right? So in a way, in a really small way, but which has a big impact, Impact on us. Azure is helping the market control uh, the prices as well because if you if it's, if it's like just one company as I just mentioned they can set any price that they want and if the world has to have a cloud computing platform to use well they will have to pay up the big amount right uh, so I think I, I am really a huge fan of this uh, for uh, you know in, with respect to Azure is because uh, whenever someone increases a price out of something these guys are the first ones to drop the price and say hey we are doing it cheaper come, come uh, you know join with us or something 
something like that that again brings a lot of businesses trust me it brings millions of dollars uh, worth of business right uh, the second thing that uh, we have to talk about is of course the number of services at the end of the day at the time of the creation of this particular video there's 100 plus there's literally over 100 services uh, that azure provide be it in the field of compute services be it in networking be it in storage uh, be it in any sort of administration be it in cloud management whatever it is so these guys are doing so many things that uh, you know if you have a problem and uh, you think that there is a se separate domain for a solution my recommendation to you is to just see if that solution itself is implemented on the cloud first if If it is if it is uh, done so, start learning the cloud path of it as well because at the end of it you will become an expert in the domain that you are looking at and also cloud computing. Now, for example, if you want to become a machine learning engineer and you also want to understand how you can deploy it on the cloud, start learning services such as Azure ML. Right now, here there is two benefits. So one, you will get to learn everything there is to know about machine learning. Of course, the next thing is you will get to know about development and deployment on the Azure platform itself. So what happens when you add one plus one? Uh, you know, at the end of the day, you are uh, being open. You are, uh, uh, you know, you understand two different things instead of just one, right? So that is a way more uh, knowledge that is. Uh, that you can convert into a monetary benefit because people are looking for experts in Azure ML and you can get a lot more salary than a person who is just uh, an ML engineer. Now, being an uh, ML engineer is also uh, you know a very high paying job. But if you know machine learning and Azure as well, well, just for those skills, you'll be paid higher. And that's my uh, point here, guys. Perfect. So Microsoft have been, uh, you know, around the customer space for a really long time, right? Around three decades, thirty, thirty-five, forty years, uh, you know, they have been in this industry. So they know that even if they create an amazing product, but the but if they have If they provide bad service uh, to this particular product, at the end of the day, it will not bring customers. Right? Even though even though your product is the best in the world, if something goes wrong, if you're not there to support it, people will not want your thing. This is like just like the uh, you know warranty thing that we look out for when we buy a mobile phone or an electronic item, right? So since these guys have been doing it for a really long time, they know how to handle customers. They know how to handle these problems. They have the infrastructure set up ready to support customers on their platform. form launched and again that is what uh, made them really really popular right the next point is a little technical we're going to talk about how uh, companies have the capability to uh, you know auto scale to their requirements right uh, this is a fantastic concept today you're catering to 10 people tomorrow you have 1000 people walk in uh, if you have an in house server there is a good chance your server will crash right sometimes if you have seen uh, you know these flash sales or something that happen there is usually an immense amount of traffic because there is a new phone launching or something thousands if not millions of people will come to uh, these popular sites to order them and as soon as the website sees so many traffic the server in the back end will not able to handle so many requests so what What do you think it does? It crashes because it cannot handle all of them at the same time. But with Azure, the more customers you bring in, the better it can handle it. If you're bringing in thousand customers, it is going to scale up its services. It is going to, uh, you know, allocate more resources for you in a way where it says, "Hey, okay, now I've given you thousand. Why don't you try bringing ten thousand people?" When you bring ten thousand people, uh, it is going to scale it up and say, "Hey, okay, so this is good. Why don't you bring ten lakh people?" Right. So you are the limit here. Uh, whenever someone tells me that you know there's only so much that AWS or Azure can do, I I would say the opposite thing. I am like. there is only so much that you would do to push uh, their platform to the limit because these guys are giants they have servers sitting on every part every single part of the globe today and to fill all of them up is not an easy task right so i would say to a virtually unlimited level these guys are providing you these auto scaling capabilities so what is your uh, potential what is your uh, you know maximum push that you can do is what you should be thinking at rather than looking at the other side of the bridge to think about how uh, you know where the limit stands uh, with respect to azure right perfect the next point that we're going to talk about some people definitely are going to be interested when we talk about blockchain the first thing that's going to come into your mind is probably cryptocurrencies uh, bitcoin uh, and all of that right now uh, azure is so popular here because they are the first company 
the cloud computing company to say, hey, you know what, we, we will provide a blockchain as a service. Now, blockchain as a service is a talk of its uh, own. We can have a half an hour, one hour talk to show about, uh, you know, why uh, uh, Azure's uh, BAS service, or it's also called as blockchain as a service, is so popular. But then, uh, you know, let's have this discussion in, in the next couple of modules. But for now, you need to know that these guys are the first ones in the world uh, to go on to provide blockchain as a service. Right, perfect. Uh, the next reason of why Azure is considered to be so popular, in my opinion, is that they give you the seamless integration between, you know, your own server, servers that are sitting uh, on premise and with the cloud instances that you would have created, right? Now, when we say a cloud instance, you're basically using the compute power and the storage of a virtual server that is allocated to you. So how do you make that virtual server talk to the actual server that is probably sitting in your office uh, server room, right? So that integration is very seamless in a way where you would wouldn't have to spend uh, hundreds of man hours, you wouldn't have to hire probably 100 different experts to go on to, uh, you know, uh, you know, bridge that gap that exists between your server and theirs. So this excellent model of how easy it is uh, to, uh, you know, engage this hybrid platform where you have your own servers and uh, you also get to talk to uh, the cloud instances that are present there. I think this is the reason why uh, hundreds of thousands of companies also uh, prefer Azure, right? So perfect guys, again, we checked out everything there is to know to quickly get started with Microsoft Azure. We checked out all the reasons why uh, they are popular and I think it's high time we talk about the newest boy in town uh, which is google cloud platform right now i said they are the newest uh, boys in town even though they launched two years earlier uh, than microsoft azure now i told you azure launched in 2010 gcp came out in 2008 but when you look at popularity when you look at trends when you look at uh, the actual usage that went into the platform these guys uh, in terms of growth they were a little slow because First of all, these guys are brand new. Google is not a new brand to you, I'm sure, but Google Cloud Platform, uh, you know, to provide these kind of services itself, they were slightly new in this particular domain. Uh, to scale up to already existing giants is not an easy thing, right? Now, all of you all who are watching it, in case if you guys want to become entrepreneurs, you want to start your own company, think about Facebook, Google, Twitter being your direct competitor. In that particular case, for you to grow as big as them, it's not an easy task, right? Similar what happened to Google Cloud Platform as well. AWS and Azure were already there who had the majority of the industry. Everyone trusted them. Everyone started using them. So there weren't a lot of people, first of all, to start using the Google Cloud Platform because the services that was provided here were in number a little less. And that so when someone is accustomed to one particular uh, cloud platform, I'll tell you this from my personal experience, usually they will not want to switch. Uh, if you're looking to migrate from AWS to Azure, if you're looking to like cancel all your subscriptions and all of that, AWS will do everything in their power. And of course, all of this is legal and everything to make sure that you stay on their platform and not leave. They're going to provide you services. They're going to provide you discounts. Uh, they're going to do so many things to make sure you don't jump ship and go to someone else. That's not a bad thing. That's actually a great thing. But at the end of the day, if you are a person like, uh, uh, you know, the experts at GCP who's looking for more customers, then from your point of view, that doesn't look, uh, you know, that great, right? Uh, so that is one of the reasons I think they slowed down, but then now they're catching up at a pace, which, which which is phenomenally fast, which I've never seen before. And the number of job openings, if you look at it on LinkedIn or Indeed.com for uh, experts who are wanted on the Google Cloud platform, you will realize every single point that I just told you all, right? Perfect. The second point, uh, the most important one in discussion here, the point that I am a huge fan of personally is that the data centers at Google run for their Google Cloud platform are environmentally friendly, guys. They all run on 100% uh, renewable energy sources, be it solar power, be it wind energy, uh, be it hydrothermal, whatever it is, uh, you know, so this is telling us that, hey, you know, we can have sustainable ways of running the world of information technology and not have to hurt uh, our planet, right? Because the planet provides, uh, you know, it is 
it 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 can be eternal uh, if we take care of it but then if you go on to misuse a lot of different things uh, that mother earth provides well pff, at the end of the day you know there's going to come a time where the balance is lost and you cannot gain uh, back the things which are once lost right now there are so many uh, you know animals or species that have become ex- extinct when you think about it right they are lost forever uh, now at the end of the day uh, for me as a person who uh, values all of these things and similarly we have hundreds of thousands of people who think like this as well now you look at a trend where people are buying electric vehicles because they don't like the amount of pollution an actual petroleum or a diesel car puts out now even these guys have a thought saying hey they might be hurting the environment more than way more than they initially thought they would and they are jumping ship right this happens even in millions of dollars worth of transaction even big companies who put them out who market themselves as a company that says we are environmentally friendly but then they're running on servers uh, which are you know not environmentally friendly i'm not saying that aws is bad i'm not saying azure is bad or that you know they're polluting the environment all of those things but at the end of the day when you take a look at it having this kind of a bragging right which says we are using servers which are environmentally friendly something that's going to market itself uh, for the days to come right that's important guys the third thing as i already told you was aws has a ton of services azure has a ton of services guess what in the next couple of years even google cloud platform is going to have ton of services as well uh, uh, the most popular applications of gcp in my opinion you know again when i asked a couple of people when i ran a poll uh, why I, I asked why uh, you know people think google cloud uh, platform is popular or what are they best known for uh, 8 out of 10 people always were willing to choose big data services now uh, the big data service that google provides and there's multiple things big query and a lot of other things so these guys are known really really well in fact better than aws and azure to handle that kind of a, a data in a seamless fashion so that is uh, one of the reasons uh, why when you take a look at uh, the rapid establishment and the rapid growth uh, you know uh, now they are playing the catch up game in the world of cloud computing but I have a personal feeling that somewhere down the line it'll be the others who'll play the catch up game uh, with GCP right perfect guys now to talk about the popularity of GCP really quick uh the first point again has to be return on investment right what are you getting for the amount that you're spending uh whenever we have championed all of these modules whenever i say pay as you go you're paying only for the minute you're paying only for the hour that you're using the product and all of that there is a slight catch here when you go on to use aws and some of these services in aws usually rounds it to the next hour now what i mean by that is if you use a platform for 3 hours 35 minutes or 3 hours 40 minutes sometimes you build for 4 hours it rounds up to the next hour of usage right now you are paying for uh, 20 minutes that you have, you haven't used but in the case of gcps these guys are very efficient in terms of pricing if you have used it for 3 hours 32 minutes you are probably billed for 3 hours 32 minutes or 3 hours 33 minutes so one minute extra it rounds out uh, to the one to the next minute and uh, you know that's the ceiling of it you're not paying for the next 20 minutes as well now uh in in our discussion for a learner this will seem like okay does it really make that big of a difference well at the end of the day think about it in the perspective of a company who who would probably spend millions of dollars uh, to keep their application running on the cloud right uh, they would save uh, you know thousands if not hundreds of thousands of dollars with just this uh, 20 minute adjustment or whatever it is i gave you an example but when you think about the enterprise level solution that gcp are offering in terms of rounding up to the next minute rather than the next next hour is again attracting uh, a lot, lot of clients to these guys right perfect all right guys checking out the next reason of why gcp has been so popular is that uh you know google as a company themselves uh, has such a strong footing that these guys are foundational to the world of networking uh, these guys are the only guys in the entire world to have like uh you know the most amount of uh, fastest uh, uh you know connections underground uh, you know optic fiber networks uh, networks which support up to 10 terabits per second of transfer you know this is not just in one country this is across the world these guys hold the dominion there uh, they are ranking top in the industry they have laid out uh, cables under the ocean floor uh, you know so they when when they are saying hey you know what we will give you the fastest data transfer speed in the entire world do you do you really think that customers should not be interested there well uh, 10 terabits a second 
is like <laughs> when you think about it i am honestly surprised because at the end of the day it's really not something easy to provide when you have hundreds of thousands of customers who are looking for the same speed now at the end of the day google say we can do it they are doing it and uh, remember the point where i told you that is the other companies are going to start playing catch up well this is the first point for them uh, to actually go on to start catching up uh, with gcp perfect now taking a look at the next point i think it adds a lot of value to understand that in the world of data analytics as well as the world of big data you know there's multiple services and innovative tools that these guys are providing right the first logo you see is of google bigquery the second logo is you see uh, is of another service called as google uh, cloud dataflow now both dataflow and bigquery are so amazing that if you're a person who's learning big data or if you're a person who's looking towards data analysis and if you're doing it on google cloud platform these will be the first services uh that you will absolutely fall in love with uh you know that is something again i've heard from a lot of people it is true i've tried it myself these are amazingly intuitive services to use their user interface uh is actually good it is getting way 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 better uh than what it was and i think it's google at the end of the day everyone loves uh the uh, ecosystem the uh, user interface the user experience uh which google provides for us right perfect the next point that we have to discuss again uh, you know rounding back to our first point is what is the amount of return that you're going to get on your investment roi uh, as we call it right so when you give your money out to gcp what is the amount of uh, you know return that you're getting there right uh, in that particular case when you take a look at one particular type of service that gcp aws and azure provide the compute engine or the compute services their gcp's pricing is so amazing that this is almost somewhere around 50% cheaper uh, than what aws and azure azure are providing to a good extent now in some cases this definitely is true and at the end of the day if it's 50% cheaper why would you want to spend 50% more uh, uh, you know when you could be spending it less right when you think as uh when you think as a company this is the first thing that you would think about uh, doing as well and in that particular case i think catch up game uh, is on uh, for aws and azure in terms of pricing as well The next thing is, uh, you know, data security is something we really have to talk about. And with Google, they have been in the world of networking. They have been on the internet uh, for twenty, twenty-five years right now. And these guys have known how to, uh, you know, integrate security into their products for all these years. And since their entire product line requires so much of uh, data security, requires so much of authentications, requires so. The, basically, at the end of the day, my point here is that. Uh, when they have been in an industry where they've been doing this for a really long time they have the experience to go on to become the professionals in it right so in terms of data security trust i think there's no better way to go uh, you know other than gcp right perfect guys so again we checked out the quick introduction to gcp you guys know what it is when it is launched why it is popular we discuss a lot of these points similar to aws and azure as well now we are coming to an important part where we are going to discuss all the popular clients uh, that these guys have right first of all if you're thinking about aws as i mentioned you know thousands of thousands thousands and thousands of companies go on to make use of aws and these guys try to actually push the platform to its limits now uh you've seen so many people so many companies who use aws in a way where they are actually in a position of they say hey aws we're going to push you with uh, you know everything we've got and we hope uh, you can hold it at your end uh, you know be it individuals be it small companies or big companies alike uh, you know if you have thousands if not hundreds of thousands of businesses doing this day in and day out uh, aws has to be uh, you know that can that they, they have to be fundamentally strong uh, to handle all these things and of course uh, they are but then guys i think the most important way that we can numerically assess the popular clients is not just say hey facebook is the most popular client of aws well it wouldn't make sense why is facebook the most popular client of aws right that is the reason i thought it had a lot of value to actually show you guys who the top spenders are on aws so netflix is paying 20 million dollars or you know monthly you know in american dollars of course to aws because they're using all of their services similarly twitch is a, again a popular streaming platform it is mostly known in the world of gamers i myself stream on twitch whenever i play on my playstation uh so there as well 
Twitch people to host maybe all of their streamers. They are using compute services on AWS. They're providing 16 million monthly. LinkedIn are paying uh, AWS 14 million dollars uh, monthly. Facebook are paying 12 million dollars. BBC, the British broadcasting uh, service, you know, the channel. Uh, these guys are also providing 10 million dollars. And this amount that you see is not uh, an amount that they get. These guys are paying to AWS on a yearly basis. This is a monthly basis. So this is the amount of money AWS are making for the services uh, that these guys are providing right now uh, if you're talking about azure similarly even uh, with azure let's look at the top spenders the first big guy who's spending a lot of money i think is verizon right verizon or verizon as it's called uh, is again a very big network provider in the continental united states now uh, even these guys you know there's many providers out there i think sprint verizon at&t all these guys are big there's so these guys uh you know put put a bill uh, of get a get a bill of somewhere around 80 million dollars a month from aws then you have msi computers msi is this uh, uh you know beautiful i think laptop manufacturers who's very well known in the gaming industry then you have lg electronics right so lg is a very big name in uh, home appliances uh then you have adobe adobe of course we all know then you have intel and if you again look at it right so these guys are spending millions and millions of amount to get solutions uh from microsoft azure as well but the fun part that i want to talk about is in gcp as well you saw that these companies right twitch facebook and linkedin they were also using AWS, but these guys also use uh, Google Cloud Platform, and they are, uh, you know, billing 65 million dollars, uh, you know, 42 million dollars, 41 million dollars. So this is what is happening. This paradigm shift. I'm not saying that they're leaving AWS to come to GCP. They're using the best of both. AWS is providing certain services which they absolutely require. GCP is doing something way better than AWS that these guys are interested in. So that's the reason they say, you know what, why should we not have uh, this guy do one thing, this platform do the other thing. So that's uh, one of the reasons why many companies, it's not, it's just, it's not just these five, six people that you see on your screen right now. It's hundreds of companies who do this. They use multiple platforms to get multiple jobs uh, at the hand done, right? So this is an important point that you guys have to know. And I hope when we, when we took a look at these top spending, this was the best way, uh, you know, we, uh, I could come up uh, with telling you who these popular clients are and you would of course know the popularity of it, right? Be it Facebook, LinkedIn, Yahoo, Twitch uh, and all of these platforms. And now guys, I think when we're talking about the quick comparison that I have in mind for you guys with AWS, DCP and Azure, now that you would have got a basic sense of it, I don't think I have to, uh, you know, spend a lot of time to tell you the differences that exist between these. When we go on to uh, check out these platforms individually on a hands-on, uh, you know, level, you will come to know the differences that exist. But for now, to quickly take a look at the number of services that these guys are providing. Now, all of this data is as of March 2021, guys. AWS is providing somewhere around 13 compute services azure is providing nine compute services while gcp is also uh, you know providing nine compute services so in the terms of just the number of compute services that is being provided i think aws has the upper hand because they are providing more services which means that they they have more capability and they can cater to a wider audience base right Perfect. In the case of storage services as well, AWS leads because they do provide seven storage services. Azure provides six and GCP provides four as well. Now, I'm not saying that, uh, you know, either of these are inefficient and all of that. That is the, that is out of the talk right now, but just with the number of services, right? The things that you could do with every single number. Now, if AWS is providing one more service, which would bring them millions of dollars of revenue each month, why do you think they wouldn't do it? Right? That's the reason uh, why these guys keep Keep adding services and services they know that the world wants it and they are there uh, to provide it but again uh, in the case of storage services as well AWS is leading right uh, then when we talk about a really fun thing, which I absolutely love is bringing two domains together. In this case, it's artificial intelligence or machine learning solutions, development, deployment of these solutions. Here again, AWS takes a slight edge uh, with the number of services at least, right? AWS provides this really fantastic service called AWS SageMaker for working with machine learning solutions, right? So uh, here they provide 12 AI ML solutions, that is AWS. Uh, Azure provides somewhere around three services, but then Azure ML is actually very, very, very uh, well established, very popular amongst a lot of people. And then GCP, GCP in fact have beaten uh, Azure to this particular uh, service in this 
domain and there's a good chance they might overtake AWS as well because they are very getting very close to AWS with seven services now. AWS provides 12, GCP provides seven, Azure provides three. Right, perfect. Next when we talk about database services, uh, there is no other comparison we have to champion about Azure here right now. Azure leads this particular uh, service domain with nine services. AWS provides only seven, while GCP provide only five services. Now again, we can talk about each of these uh, services to greater extent, but for your learning uh, path right now, I do believe that if you know these numbers, uh, it is more than enough to go ahead. Right guys, so this is database services. The next thing which is very, very important that you guys have to understand is server locations. AWS here is again a little bit more popular because they're catering to 24 geographic locations and they have 77 availability zones. Now, when you quickly go on to the AWS site to check about where they're available and all of that, you will be presented with a beautiful looking graph uh, that will show you what are the regions that are catering for. Similarly, Azure, uh, you know, has their footprint in 65 plus regions across the globe and GCP is showing immense amount of, uh, you know, growth. Uh, in this particular case, they are present in 22 regions and of course, they are looking at expanding rapidly from their existing 62 zones as well. So at the end of the day, when you're comparing Azure, AWS and GCP, for me, the first thing, I am a guy who's driven by data and for me, I think all of these data that I just showed you, uh, should give you an important idea about what the industry is requiring uh, right now and what these guys are providing. Because see, if AWS comes up with one more service, that is going to create hundreds of thousands of jobs because people are required to be experts there to solve people's problems using that service, right? You have to be trained to use that service. So these creation of jobs, every time there's a new service that comes up, be it in GCP, Azure or AWS, I am really happy because it creates hundreds if not thousands of jobs uh, for that particular service as well, guys. So guys, with this, we have come to the end of this particular module. We took a lot of, uh, uh, you know, introductions to all these different domains. We understood about AWS, we understood about Azure, GCP, uh, you know, we found out when they were launched, why they're popular, uh, what are their most popular use cases, and we saw the most popular clients out there, and we also took a look at uh, a quick comparison powered by data, powered by numerical uh, digits of, uh, you know, why these guys have been uh, popular as well, right? So with this particular module, my aim was to provide you guys with this fundamental knowledge that you have to have about these three big guys, because uh, I'll be very honest with you. If you're a person who's looking for a job in this industry, there's a good chance when you start out, it'll be either be in AWS, Azure or GCP. So I thought it will add a lot of value to your learning that we check this out now. So guys, with that, we have come to the end of this module. All right, guys, welcome to module number five. I hope everything that we've covered in the last four modules have been completely clear for you all. Now, module number five, we're going to take a look at the various cloud computing certifications that are there. Now, this is a very important thing for you as a learner to get started with, because at the end of the day, since you will be looking for a job after you complete this full course, or, uh, you know, you will be looking towards uh, becoming a specialist in the domain itself, it adds a lot of value for your learning at this point of time for you guys to understand the certifications. Now, when you take a look at the job trends, as we have discussed, in the previous modules, usually they ask uh, for a person who's uh, who's certified in either AWS, uh, Azure or GCP, right? So you are going to need uh, the in-depth knowledge about, you know, how many certifications are there, what are the costs to these certifications, validity, what are the actual certifications, the order of certifications you're supposed to look at, everything, right? So we're going to cover all of that in detail in module number five, which is cloud computing certifications, guys. So as I just mentioned, we're going to take an introduction to all the uh, certifications that are uh, present in AWS. Similarly, we're going to take a look at the certifications that Microsoft Azure offers to us. And of course, uh, you know, we're going to be taking a look at all the certifications uh, that GCP provides as well. Now, guys, it is very important uh, for you to, uh, you know, concentrate on either of these three. Now, why do I say this? Because it's usually when you find a person who uh, has been in the cloud computing industry for a while, they usually find one, uh, you know, one of their favorite uh, providers, either AWS, Azure or GCP. 
GCP. They stick to that. Uh, they clear all the certifications in that and then, uh, you know, they go on to become an expert in that domain. So uh, there are multiple certifications in AWS as you're going to see multiple in Azure and multiple in GCP. So it doesn't mean that you have to complete all of these certifications or even that you have to complete at least one minimum in either of these, right? So, uh, you know, based on what it is, what is the path that you're looking towards? We've discussed the job roles. Uh, so whatever it is that you want to do in your favorite provider, right? Uh, so you can just go on to pick that. That is why to cater to all of you all who might be interested in AWS, Azure and GCP, uh, you know, we're going to be covering certifications from all these three big boys, right? Perfect, guys. Now, without further ado, let us dive right into the module to take a look at AWS certifications. Now with AWS certifications, there are many important pointers that we're going to have to discuss. Uh, you know, we're going to have to take a look at uh, the order of certifications, we're going to take a look at the certifications uh, themselves and a lot more. So let's begin. Now, let us come to a section where we are going to answer this question. Which AWS certification is the right one for you? Now, if there are multiple AWS certifications, I'm sure uh, you guys already know this. That would be the reason why you guys have tuned into this session. So to answer this question is very important. Now, what are the domains that you guys are looking for? Because let me tell you, this cloud computing is like an ocean, right? If you throw a stone, it will not dent the ocean into it or nor will it matter a lot right so you have to hone in uh, you know you might be a person who's into data science you might be a person who wants to do machine learning or you are a devops professional or something right so you need to find your niche and then see which cloud provider is sort of providing support for your uh, niche element to be used in this online world of cloud computing right that is an important thing now you might say saying hey okay i am a database developer uh, you know how what's my uh, thing uh, if i'm looking towards cloud do i have any scope or something like that as I've told you, right, nine out of 10 domains here are something that can be scalable on the cloud. It literally, you will not find a difference of you using an offline server or you actually being connected to a cloud computing platform and working on it. Both are highly, highly efficient. Both eventually will, it depends on your requirement of which will cost the higher or not. But coming back to certifications, there are multiple certifications and each of these certifications have a cost to it. So you need to know which certification is right for you before you get started, right? Let's answer that question. Which AWS certification is right for you? Now, before you think about how these certifications sort of, uh, you know, do you actually get a physical certificate mailed to your house and all of that are some of the questions that we get. The first thing is AWS provides these badges, these virtual badges called as acclaim badges, which uh, are sort of the validation that, you know, you guys are certified in that domain. I'm going to show you what the badges look like, but once you have these badges, it means you're a person, uh, you know, who is certified in these domains, right? There are certain examinations uh, that usually one certification comes with one examination that you have to clear to make sure that you're showing uh, the world that hey here is something that I learned here is an examination where I verified what I learned and I proved my worth and then AWS gives you a badge saying yes this person is an expert right you got that you prepare for it you take up an examination you pass the examination with the score that is required and then you are a professional in that particular uh, subdomain in the world of AWS right now the next question we get asked saying is, do I compulsorily have to know English to get started with AWS certification or can I take it in any other language? Well, of course, AWS at the moment supports four different languages. You can take it in English. You can take all of these examinations in Japanese as well, Chinese and Korean, depending on where you are from and what you're proficient in as well. So it is not only just that uh, compulsory requirement that you have to do it in English. There are other languages as well. And I'm sure AWS is working on bringing more and more and more languages in to the domain to make sure that people who are not so proficient in the English can definitely make complete use of it, right? So keep that thought in your mind, even though maybe your language is not listed here at the moment, right? The second set of things that you really have to know about AWS certifications is that uh, when I said exams, right, these exams are not free. Uh, you know, some of these exams cost somewhere around $100 all the way to $350 uh, that you will have to pay uh, for every single attempt that you take, right? Now, uh, in, in Indian currency, it is basically 7,000 rupees all the way till somewhere around 26,000 rupees per attempt for an examination that you guys will have to pay to become an expert in all of these uh, domains and have a certification for the same, right? Now, 
since i've already mentioned that there are multiple multiple uh, you know uh, examinations that are available certifications that are available if we take the average of all of these and find a duration the average of an examination is somewhere around 2 hours guys so you will be preparing for weeks and months together to give a 2 hour exam that is eventually going to give you a badge and a claim badge that shows that you are an expert in this particular domain right so uh, uh keeping this in mind you might say okay so it's a 2 hour examination i learn for a couple of weeks or months i write it i am certified am i a lifelong aws expert now in terms of certification validity right all aws certificates that you uh you know sort of uh, take the exam and get the acclaim badge for this acclaim badge or certification is valid for 3 years ladies and gentlemen so for every uh, after every third year you have to prove yourself again and uh, you know just to make sure that you guys uh, usually in today's world what happens is once you prove your worth you get into a cloud computing job later down the line no one is going to ask you to retake these examinations again and again because they already know that you have years worth of experience but there are certain companies uh, who say you definitely have to have an active certification if you're a part of the company so in those cases after every 3 years you might have to take up the same certification again but usually people build upon uh, you know multiple uh, certifications which are out there uh, from the beginner level to the advanced level which we are uh, you know going to talk about uh, right now right there are three different tiers when we talk about aws certifications ladies and gentlemen it is the foundational certification it is the associate certification and of course it's the aws professional certification as well now aws foundational certification is usually recommended for the people who have somewhere around 6 months of experience uh, you know they like to work with uh, uh, you know cloud computing they want to work with aws they might have not worked with it previously they want to understand the entire foundation of uh, you know the functional working of cloud computing basically for those people aws foundation is the right one then when you're thinking about aws associate certification this is when there's a recommended experience to have it is somewhere around 12 months or cause one years worth of experience before you should take up the certification and actively work on clearing it and then after associate there's another level of professional there's another level of certification called as the AWS professional certification this uh, again uh, mind you is somewhere from around 12 uh, to 24 months of experience right so uh, it is actually supposed to be beyond 12 months of experience for uh, this one for aws certification but of course it is not a compulsion saying uh, you have to have 12 12 24 6 months of experience to get started with it is their recommended uh, you know uh, recommended amount of uh, experience that it requires because you can you can not clear a certification with maybe 5 10 days of expertise right you have to know the in depths of the domain that is why it's called as a certification right guys now before we go on to talk about each of these individual certifications again uh, if you guys are very much interested in all of these uh, courses in cloud computing and any other course make sure you guys are actively checking out great learning academy and of course uh, do subscribe to the great learning youtube channel and take a second to hit that like button uh, if you love everything you're seeing on your screen right now guys it's an amazing thing about aws foundation certifications that you're supposed to know a lot of different things right see on the right you have something called as the acclaim badge that we saw about and in the case of uh, aws foundational certifications there is one very important certificate that you guys have to work on start taking notes from this point on guys it's called as the aws certified cloud practitioner certification now uh, you know this is a certification which talks a lot about how you can clear and have a clear understanding about the foundational aspects that govern the entire world of cloud computing uh, you know if you're a person who's familiar with the microsoft azure environment right so this certification is very similar to the one that they offer uh, which is called as microsoft azure fundamentals certification right so it's a certification that you use to get started with the domain understand it uh, be thorough in the foundations and then have a certificate ficket saying yes i am a cloud practitioner i know how uh, you know this cloud computing domain works but then to go on to do it you require one examination that examination is called as aws clf c01 this examination has to be cleared and to work on these examinations right uh, especially the examination c01 that i spoke about will test you on four very important concepts uh, first of all all the cloud concepts you know it will be talking about the various services provided what each services mean what uh, you know when someone is when a cloud computing platform is providing a service what are all the things that 
the client has to know what all are the things uh, that the cloud computing platforms themselves are providing and all of that. Next, uh, of course, whenever you're thinking about putting your data out there on a public platform, you have to understand about keeping that data secure, right? So next day, uh, you'll be talking about security, you will be tested on compliance and of course, the basic technology that goes into work, having and understanding a working cloud environment, right? Technology is something that you will be, uh, you know, quizzed upon here as well. And the fourth thing is, as I told you, uh, to get started with an AWS cloud computing platform, it is sort of free in a way. They give you a free trial and a good amount of credit that you can use to learn. But uh, going on, the major majority of the money, of course, comes in from their products, which are being billed to customers and all the pricing that is being given to the customers, right? So you have to understand for what amount of usage is what amount of bill uh, that is eventually costing to the company, right? So that is an important thing that we'll be talking about in the AWS foundational certification, guys. So there's only one cloud practitioner certification in the foundational level. Coming on uh, on the second uh, thing is the AWS associate certifications. Now associate certifications is one step up from the foundational certifications in a way where uh, here you have three choices to pick from. You have the AWS certified associate, uh, you know, the, Arc the solutions architect associate. Next, you have the sysops administrator associate and you have the developer associate certification. You can pick one of these or you can pick all of these as well. But usually you can either work on a solutions architect associate or a developers associate. But if you're a person who loves uh, working on the admin side of things, you definitely should look towards the sysops administrator associate as well. Right guys, now whenever you're taking a look at the first one, which was the AWS Certified Solutions Architect Associate, right? Uh, again, uh, this certification requires an examination that is called as SAA uh, C02. SAA stands for Solutions Architect Associate. C02 is the name of the examination that you have to take to clear this. And this is an examination which will test you on how well you understand certain design principles that exist in the world of software, right? Uh, there is, there is, uh, you know, a structured way of how we look at building a software or even maintaining a software and eventually using it. So to understand all of these of how it works in a cloud computing platform is exactly what you'll be taught uh, in this certification as well. So you have to know this, you'll be tested uh, based upon this, uh, right? So it is, uh, again, if you have a problem, if you have a project, it is not only one way of how you can solve it. There can be 10 solutions. There can be 100 solutions, right? So you need to know all of these best practices that go into finding the best solution for a project. That is what you will be tested on as well, right? So you'll be tested on four things of how you can design resilient architectures, which will stand, uh, uh, you know, if even if the company is scaling really quickly. The second thing is whenever you're working about providing a solution, you have to talk about if the cloud computing platform is providing high performance computing and high performance architecture for the companies, you will be tested upon that as well. And the third thing, as always, is an important thing with AWS is security. You will be tested on security applications, security architectures, how you understand security, how you implement it and all of that in AWS, right? And the fourth thing is sometimes you can, uh, you know, cross your budgets really, really easily. So having uh, cost optimization is an important skill to have you'll be trained upon all of that and you instead of uh, uh, you know trained upon with this certification you'll be tested upon that directly guys so you have to have the working knowledge of how you can uh, you know optimize the costs when it come to when it comes to using these platforms right you might require one uh, computer you know a simple uh, uh, you know, i3 or an i5 machine to get your job done. And there's a good chance you might have used a very, very powerful computer, uh, which will uh, maybe not come in your budget, right? So in that particular case as well, you have to look towards uh, a solution where you can optimize the best way possible in terms of returns and in terms of money. Right, guys. Now, after uh, uh, the first AWS Associate certification, the second thing which you're going to check out is the SysOps Administrator Associate. With the SysOps uh, Administrator Associate, you have to take an exam, SOA C01. You have to clear this to make sure you have the certification. Uh, this is a certification which is definitely uh, testing you on your ability of how you can deploy services on AWS, how you can manage services on AWS, and of course, how you can operate these systems, right? Uh, 
this is the practical knowledge this is the foundational concept that you would have built upon from your foundational certification as an associate you definitely should know how to deploy maintain or operate systems on the cloud computing platform and it is not only this it makes sure that you know you can have the complete capability to take an on-premise workload move it on to aws and make sure that whatever was the load that you know your aws system can handle it it can work on it and effectively provide a solution based upon it as well right so that's sysops administrator associate you will be tested upon your skills of how uh, you know about monitoring and reporting in aws how, what is the amount of availability that uh, you know you are aware of how you can map different things on the platform what is your knowledge upon deployment and provisioning storage and management security and compliance See, security is a very important thing everywhere right and then networking networking is very important for sysops and of course the world of automation and how you can optimize things not only finances wise but even uh, you know providing a solution to a product right that is why a sysops administrator certification is very very important the next certification that we're going to be checking out is the aws certified developer associate now this is a very 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 popular certification which a lot of people look towards so guys again there's an examination for this the examination is dva c01 d uh, va stands for the developer associate c01 this needs to be cleared where in a way where uh, you know you can clear this if uh, you have the complete capability to understand all of the different services provided by aws you have a functional knowledge of the architecture you have had some hands-on experience in that right so uh, it will test you on a lot of different things including all of the stuff that i just said and also it will be checking your capability if you can uh, you know develop cloud-based solutions you can can you deploy cloud-based solutions how well can you do it how effectively are you trying to solve a problem all of that is being discussed in the aws associate developers uh, you know aws certified developers associate certification as well in this particular case, you will be uh, tested upon uh, all of these things of how you can go on to provide deployment. What is the methods of security you're going to be impl uh, you know, implementing when you're designing and deploying a product or a software here? And of course, how can you do native development using all the services provided by AWS? And of course, a lot of monitoring, troubleshooting, understanding what is going on, right? So it's almost like you definitely being a developer, but being a developer on an entirely different uh, platform right so you require that sort of uh, thinking the mindset that a developer would have but in this case you're going to be using all that knowledge to scale upon things that are present in the cloud computing environment so these are the aws associate certifications guys there are two important AWS professional certifications that you guys should be looking towards. It is the AWS Certified Solutions Architect Professional and the AWS Certified DevOps Engineer Professional, right? These two certifications uh, are sort of the pinnacle of AWS certifications, at least in my opinion, because if you are an AWS Certified Solutions Architect, it means that you have the complete working knowledge of this domain. You might have come from the foundational level, you might have come through the associate level and now you have also cleared the professional certification right so let us check out what these two certifications are all about in the case of AWS Certified Architect Professional, right, there's an exam which you need, uh, which you have to clear, which is the SAP C01. SAP stands for Solutions Architect Professional. This uh, is definitely a requirement for you guys to clear the certification. Uh, to clear it, you will be tested on a lot of things. One, one very, very important thing that you'll be tested upon is how you can design and deploy fault tolerant systems, how you can design and deploy scalable applications as well, right? Now, when I say a scalable application at uh, the end of the day, you might have a product which is working fine if you get a customer base of 10. Now, if you have to up that into 100,000, 10,000 or 1 lakh customers that you haven't expected but eventually rushed into your uh, you know, platform or your website, you have to make sure that your, your application, your software doesn't crash, right? But guess what? AWS has the complete capability to do auto scaling for you in a way where if uh, it will allocate uh, systems automatically based on the traffic, based on the resources that are being used. So if a smaller amount of resources are being used one to one to five or ten computers are allocated uh, if a lot of people are coming in and the rushes is pouring in and in and in you definitely can just automatically set it to scale up so eventually things don't fail right now 
a lot of e-commerce sites eventually use this principle whenever there is a flash sale whenever there is a, a launch event or something where uh, you know product gets sold out in a few seconds uh, all the traffic is pouring in in that particular second so their site should not crash right so they allocate in the back end the resources required automatically to scale up based on the traffic that is hand so this is a certification that will test you on all of these abilities that you might have it will talk about how you can work on cost control strategies as well because once you go up and up and up in this domain uh, your costs will also go up because of the convenience and the numerous advantages that you're being provided with it is vital that you work on how you can effectively minimize your cost and maximize your value for money right so there's a lot of content online uh, you know which which uh, content outline which you definitely can look towards you will be working on uh, you know you would have worked on the design for organizational complexity that is something you'll be tested upon how can you provide new solutions that is something you'll be tested upon what is your plan for migrating from one system to another one maybe one platform into another taking an offline server and bringing it to the cloud eventually cost control and how can you improvise the solutions that already exist right now it doesn't mean that you if you're using cloud computing you started on scratch it might be that you have a system which you already took to the cloud and now you look towards improving that right in that particular case continuous improvement is something which is very 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 vital ladies and gentlemen right this brings us to the second professional certifications where we'll be discussing about the aws certified devops engineer professional the word DevOps here is a very fun one because DevOps is again a domain on its own which is trying to bridge the gap that exists between developers and operations team, right? Now, developers go on to write code, uh, write a varieties of software. It is the department, uh, it is the operations department that eventually makes sure that the latest stuff gets verified, tested, and then uh, becomes live on the web application, website, or whatever software it is, right? Uh, so to know that you're a person who has the capability to do this on a cloud computing platform, you are going to require to clear an examination dop c01 dop stands for devops uh, uh, devops engineer a professional c01 this needs to be cleared there's an examination to go on to clear it it will make sure that uh, you know you have to be proficient in the case of how you can implement continuous delivery systems on the world of uh, uh, you know amazon web services it will also talk about how not only can you deploy things better but your ability to track the metrics behind these deployments to talk about how well can you monitor solutions using this and what is your proficiency in terms of logging right logging is this a fundamental structured thing which is done to track a lot of different things a million things can be logged at your fingertips and you can have the information ready in the case of aws but to read those logs and understand them you require certain knowledge right so you'll be tested upon all of these different things uh you know you'll be tested upon how you can automate the software development life cycle that is what sdlc stands for you'll also be talking about uh, working on configuration management and using infrastructure as code you will be tested upon uh, you know your ability to monitor and work on logging as I just mentioned and of course there are certain policies and standards which can be automated as well you will be tested upon that too and in it so happens in some cases that there are certain incidents so to make sure that your systems are fault tolerant and you already have a plan in case of disaster strikes right it's called as disaster recovery and incident and event responses as well so everything is covered right from the best case uh, situation till the worst case situation where something might happen and your data is gone from the amazon's uh, data center right maybe a huge earthquake maybe a tsunami uh, whatever it is right i mean these uh, uh, data centers are placed in a way where it is extremely safe and to get access to it by a public person is nearly 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 impossible because it is highly secure and uh, it is impossible to break in because there are 15 16 layers of security that one must go through even before getting to touch the server where your data is stored right so, so they're making sure that you know all of these things as a professional it becomes uh, very very vital uh, that you know all of these ladies and gentlemen now to talk about the AWS specialty certifications. Well, this uh, is a certification which is again bringing down into the niche domain where you are trying to cover about things which are very vital. Again, they are a special thing. They are a small thing, but it might have a huge, huge impact, right? Now, uh, in this case, in the case of AWS, you have three different uh, specialty certifications, the AWS Certified Database Certification, you have the AWS Certified Data Analytics Certification, and of course, the AWS Certified machine learning certification as well so let us uh, quickly talk about 
three more certifications that are there from the first three that I just mentioned. You have AWS Certified Security, AWS Certified Networking, and AWS Certified Alexa Skill Builder as well, guys. Now, uh, whenever we are talking about these certifications, right? Look to your screen. There are six that are mentioned. One, two, three, four, five, six. Each of these specialty certifications have certain uh, uh, meaning to them. For example, if you want to look towards becoming an expert in the case of database management and working with it on a cloud computing platform, you would look at AWS Certified Database. If you are a person who's into data analytics and you want to take your entire knowledge to the cloud, you definitely will be working on AWS Certified Data Analytics as well. And the third thing is if you're a person who is looking towards machine learning to provide solutions based upon this domain of data science and you want to expand all of this to the cloud, you definitely should be looking towards AWS Certified Machine Learning as well. Right, guys, point number four talks about AWS Certified Security. Again, if you are a person who is looking towards certification in the domain of security, you want to understand it better, uh, you'll be looking towards AWS Security. If you're a person who wants to understand how the back end of networking works in the world of cloud computing, AWS Certified Networking will help you. And number six, right, AWS Certified Alexa Skill Builder. Alexa is again a part of the Amazon's ecosystem. So if you're looking towards that kind of, it, uh, that kind of uh, ecosystem to learn in as well, uh, you can bring that platform to the cloud and use it too, guys. So these are some of the six specialty certifications that you can cover uh, with the help of AWS. There is no order to any sort of AWS certifications, guys. There was a time when you compulsorily had to clear a particular order uh, to make sure, uh, you know, uh, that you can, uh, for example, you have to clear foundational to get to associate, then you have to clear associate to get to professionals. Now everything is standalone for the last couple of months to get started with, but it is highly recommended you start with the cloud uh, certified cloud practitioner because this will get you started with the domain itself. Don't just jump towards professional certification thinking that you've put in uh, you know a good amount of time. Professional certifications are very difficult to clear and these examinations can be challenging as well. So get started with certified cloud practitioner then look towards associate examinations and then look towards uh, these professional ones, right? So depending on your interest, depending on what it is that you want to learn, I'm sure there is a certification, right? We also discussed the specialty certifications that are there here. So based upon all of that, uh, you know, you definitely require uh, this kind of a knowledge. For example, in many cases for certain professional uh, certifications, you do require associate certification as well. So in that case, uh, it is vital to know, but it is a very recent policy change in Amazon that says that no matter what, all AWS certifications are standalone. All right, guys. So I hope we were clear, uh, you know, completely with respect to all the AWS certifications out there. Now, similarly, you know, Microsoft Azure also provides certifications. So we are going to have to check them out as well. Uh, AWS were the, uh, were the first people to say, hey, we're going to provide certifications on our platform. And then Azure said, hey, you know what? Even we can do that. So even these guys are providing certifications to add that much uh, of a value to your knowledge and your learning as well. Right. So let us go on to check out the various certifications that are provided by Microsoft Azure. Now, uh, uh, you know, after having understood that, hey, Azure is popular, Azure is one among the top three, uh, you know, they're doing things really amazingly well, all of the things set apart. Now that we're talking about certifications, which Azure certification should you go for? There are a lot of certification and I'm sure you guys are curious, right? Now, to be honest with you, there's multiple certifications, but all of these certifications are brought down and simplified into four different tiers. We have the Azure fundamental certifications. We have multiple Azure associate uh, level certifications. We have the Azure expert level certifications and we have specialty certifications. Now, uh, if you take a look at the name itself, the name itself is going to give you a good amount of clarity of what you should expect from the certification programs, right? Azure fundamentals talk about how you can quickly pace yourself up with respect to Azure, uh, you know, the domain itself, the working knowledge of the domain and all of that. Associate certification you're supposed to be looking at if you're a person, maybe uh, six months or one year experience and you want to challenge yourself, you want to push yourself to be certified, right? So that is an associate level certification. Then you have the expert level certification. So once you have two or three years worth of experience, you definitely will want to uh, uh, you know, look towards Azure expert certifications because at the end of the day, using that, you can become 
become an architect you can become a cloud architect and if you are a cloud architect especially with proficiency in azure uh, you know you definitely can look towards amazing jobs in your dream companies dream designations whatever it is ladies and gentlemen right and then we have azure specialty certifications specialty certifications are really nice because at the end of the day if you have certain niche concepts or certain niche domains you bring it towards uh, uh, you know azure and you can use iot by making use of microsoft azure now that is not the only purpose of uh, microsoft azure but then hey they are providing a certification which says you can become an expert in iot to work on it and provide wide solutions using the azure platform right how amazing is that so how many certifications do we have in total well to answer this question we have 14 azure certifications in total that you can work towards now a common question we get saying is okay so if i am looking to become certified in microsoft azure do i have to do all 14 of these and the answer to this is absolutely no see these are role based certifications and these are specialty certifications in which you can pick up what it is that you would want to do and you can you know work on that as well if you're directly jumping to an expert level certification sometimes there are prerequisites uh, you know regarding certification or the most important part in, in the knowledge itself that you have to clear the associate level to get to that right so it's highly suggested you take it uh, you know step by step work with the fundamentals and then go ahead right so this is an important thing there are 14 certifications in total that are split down into four tiers which we checked out in this particular slide fundamentals associate expert and specialty right perfect ladies and gentlemen now let us go on to check out what these certifications cost you right now these certifications are not free you have to take an examination uh, to go on to show your proficiency in the matter and these have a cost attached to it as well so if you're in the us these exams cost somewhere around 100 dollars to all the way to 400 dollars uh, for every attempt uh, that you take the examination and in india it roughly translates to somewhere around 7000 rupees all the way up to 28000 rupees as well so this is for every single attempt that you're going to take up that particular examination right now guys point number 2 here is a very very important point uh point number 2 states that from june 2021 all of the azure certifications are, is going to be valid for one year right so it's it's one of these things that's going to come to into your head the thought that's going to come to your head is okay so after one year you know when we have probably paid a lot of money for a certification what happens guess what microsoft uh, says that they will renew your certifications absolutely free of cost but then you have to take an online assessment examination for that so it's like one year down the line you just have to reprove yourself with a small examination and that again extends your uh, your certification that you are certified in that duration for another year as well right so how amazing is this you'll be paying a uh, for the examination once but definitely you get this kind of a free renewal every year that will just uh, you know make sure that you down the line do not have to keep paying uh, microsoft to keep renewing your certifications right so that's a very important thing now guys let us get started with azure fundamental certifications right see with azure fundamentals you have three certifications out here and one of these certifications itself is called azure fundamentals right azure fundamentals in itself is a certification that you have to look forward to there is an exam that you have to clear for this it's the exam az900 that you have to clear uh, to be certified to be called as an azure fundamentals right to have that badge that you see on your screen right now uh, it is this now what does a fundamental azure fundamental uh, you know uh, certification test you on the first thing is that you definitely will have to uh, have the basic knowledge of how data is uh, used on azure how azure itself works all the ui components you getting familiar uh, familiarity with the entire ecosystem is something very important that you're going to be tested on uh, in az 900 so it's a very vital thing guys uh, if you don't have your pen and paper or something i highly suggest you take a note of these exams and of course the certifications that go with it uh, it is going to add a lot of value if you guys are very serious about your uh, cloud career right perfect now uh, whenever we go on to take a look at the second certification in the azure fundamental section we have the azure data fundamentals now azure data fundamentals is the second certifications in the category of fundamentals which is very very popular here now just like uh, azure fundamentals you have to clear another exam here the exam is called as dp 900 and once you go on to clear this particular examination you will be given a badge that looks like that right it's a fantastic badge uh, these fundamental courses right we're going to be discussing 
coursing and other fundamental course here. These three will add immense amount of value to showcase that you're showing, uh, you know, good amount of, uh, the, uh, you know, good amount of uh, knowledge in terms of the domain itself, but it also uh, has another advantage. It showcases that you're using it as a stepping stone to maybe look towards associate and even expert level certifications, right? Perfect. So coming back to data fundamentals, you'll actually be tested on multiple life cycle concepts, multiple main services, which are, uh, you know, a key part of Azure. So you have to have some working knowledge about what are the services that are being provided for you in Azure? What are the life cycles? How is the development methodology working? Is there something that Azure is doing very differently for the other platforms? And all of that is something you have to know. You're going to be tested based upon that. Now, since we're talking about data fundamentals, if you're a person who is very interested in the field of data engineering, right? Or let's say you're a person who's looking towards uh, database administration roles and all of that, this certification is an amazing place uh, for you guys to start upon it, right? And look at what I told. I told you that uh, Azure is, uh, you know, it provides all role-based certifications, right? Now, uh, you might be thinking about, hey, you know, I want to work on Azure, but I do not want to become a full-blown uh, cloud computing expert. And I want to become a data engineer. Can I still use Azure? I hope this answers your question to that, right? To talk about the third fundamental uh, certification we have here in Azure, it's the Azure AI fundamentals. Now, for all of you guys who are looking towards uh, the domain of artificial intelligence and you want to deploy artificial intelligence, AI-based solutions on the cloud, look no further than Azure AI fundamentals, right? Uh, as always, here's another exam that you have to clear. Exam AI 900 has to be cleared uh, for this certification. It is extremely popular whenever uh, you know you're coming from a domain of data science or anything that's related to you providing a solution by using artificial intelligence right so attaining artificial intelligence is a goal of data science but if you have to do all of this on a cloud computing platform that is possible these days as well that's the most fantastic thing about these cloud computing platforms so you can perform a variety of tests on all of your uh, machine learning algorithms you can work on natural language processing or the concept of NLP as it's called and you can use a ton of other services that Microsoft Azure uh, you know, are going to give you to work with artificial intelligence based solutions, right? So to go on to do all of that, you have to showcase your proficiency and to go, uh, you know, with working knowledge of the domain, you definitely can attempt the AI 900 examination. And uh, upon clearing it, you guys will uh, clear the Azure AI fundamentals uh, certification, right? Now we discussed three things, Azure fundamentals, Azure data fundamentals, and Azure AI fundamentals. Now, a question that you might ask is saying, do I have to finish all three of these to go ahead? The answer is absolutely no, right? But a good place to start is definitely Azure Fundamentals. It'll get you started with the domain. Clearing that examination will uh, put a concrete foundation to your learning. So I highly suggest you guys check that out. But then of course, if you're a person who's into data engineering, if you're a person who's into machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence and all of that, you can look at data fundamentals or you can look at AI fundamentals. Perfect. The next thing that we're going to check out is the associate certifications from Azure. Now, to go on to work on these associate certifications, you have to have a decent amount of experience. Six months to one year is what is recommended for this, right? There are seven uh, very important associate certifications that we have to discuss here. Uh, we have the Azure Administrator Certification, we have the AI Engineer Certification, DBA, which stands for Database Administrator, we have the Data Engineer Certification, Data Scientist, Azure Developer, Azure Security Engineer. Can you see how uh, these certifications are again role-based? So if you want to become a Database Administrator, you have a certification of your own. If you want to become a Data Scientist and use Azure, you have a different certifications. If you're a person who's looking towards security aspect of things, you have an entirely different certification as well right so that's the most amazing thing uh, whenever we talk about these things perfect let us go on to discuss about the first certification that we have which is the azure administrator certification with Azure Administrator, you have to clear this exam. It's called as AZ104. Uh, you know, this is a very important examination that you have to clear if you're looking towards becoming an Azure Administrator. Uh, this will test you on your ability of how you can monitor situations, uh, you know, manage solutions, and of course, how you can implement new solutions on existing problems or maybe on novel problems as well. So it will test you a lot about these things. Uh, you know, you have to work on a lot about uh, understanding how processing works, how the networking aspect of things work, and how storage itself works on the Azure cloud. So once you have a concrete understanding of all of these, you definitely can attempt the examination. Clearing it adds a lot of value to your resume. 
right guys moving on to the next one we have the azure ai engineer now hey this is an associate ai engineer uh, certification right so for this again uh, you have an examination called as ai 100 that needs to be cleared uh, it is very very similar to the uh, azure ai foundation uh, you know the fundamental certification that we just took a look at uh, two minutes back but here the level of complexity just becomes bigger right so it's a lot more complex you will be asked questions uh, you know to a far more in depth uh, regarding ai and that is a very important thing so whenever you're talking about the concepts of knowledge mining whenever you're talking about uh, using cognitive services on azure cloud or whenever you just want to provide an ai based solutions using the platform uh, itself right you definitely need uh, you know this certification again whenever you looking for a job as well people realize that hey this person is certified in this particular concept right perfect now guys uh, to talk about the next certification we have the azure uh, you know database administrator uh, engineer certification now this talks about how you guys can work on becoming experts in azure uh, database administration an exam needs to be cleared for this as well the exam is called exam d uh, 300 it's a very important examination it's going to completely test you on how you have the capability to not only manage uh, solutions but also deploy the same uh, using the cloud computing platform right so you will be thought about how you you could be working with safe environments how you will be implementing data platform resources and a lot more so having knowledge about these is exactly on what you're going to be tested on uh, in the exam d300 guys so this is the azure database administrator certification you definitely should look towards this uh, if you're a person who's very interested in handling the backend uh, aspect of things using azure of course right perfect Next, uh, we're going to talk about the Azure Data Engineer Certification. Now, Data Engineer Certification is a very important certification. This requires two examinations for you to clear, unlike all of these exams that we just took about where you have to clear only one, right? So in this particular case, you have to clear two examinations, the DP200 and of course the DP201 as well so to become a Data Engineer, to become a certified Azure Data Engineer, right? All right. Uh, perfect guys now to talk about what uh, you know uh, you you're going to be uh, how different is azure data engineer examination from the others right well this is the only associate level uh, of certification where you'll have to give two examinations to clear it so uh, you know you'll be uh, quizzed on a lot about data security data monitoring and the concepts of data management itself so having knowledge about this is a concrete requirement for you guys to clear these two examinations dp200 and of course dp201 right and if you are a person who is looking towards handling the concepts of big data, data ingestion and all of these in the life cycle of data itself, I highly suggest you guys check out the Azure Data Engineer certification, right? Perfect. Now to move on, uh, you know, the next one we're going to be checking out is the Azure Data Scientist certification. Now, the Azure Data Scientist certification is a fascinating one because again, this requires one examination DP100 that you have to clear. And uh, the huge advantage of you guys looking towards two very fantastic domains such as data science and cloud computing is that you can deploy all of your machine learning models, AI models, deep learning models, whatever it is using the Azure ecosystem itself. And that is exactly what you'll be tested upon is how best can you make use of the Azure ecosystem and how best can your model perform when uh, it is used on these particular ecosystems as well, right? So you will be tested on your ability to uh, implement solutions, to deploy machine learning solutions and a lot more. So it becomes very important that if you guys are looking towards expertise in data science on uh, the Azure platform, you highly uh, uh, you know should look towards and work towards uh, the DP100 examination. To talk about the next associate certification, ladies and gentlemen, is the Azure Developer uh, Certification, right? So for this, uh, you are going to require an examination, another examination called AZ204 that needs to be cleared. Here, you'll be tested on your ability of how you can work with Azure services, how you can not only design, but also create, maintain, and test all of these services at the same time as well. It's a very important thing uh, that you guys have to know about. The third thing is that it is also very, very important that you guys have to know about how you can work with the software development kit itself. That is what SDK stands for. So whenever you go on to use this Azure SDK, having the working knowledge on that is very, very important for you guys to work towards becoming an Azure developer, right? Perfect. The next one, uh, you know, the last one of the Azure uh, associate certifications that we're going to be checking out is the Azure Security Engineer certification. 
Now, uh, a common thing is that whenever you put your data, uh, you know, somewhere else, whenever you put your data, uh, uh, you know, on the cloud platform, it is usually like saying, hey, is my data safe or not? Of course, uh, again, uh, for you to portray yourself to be an expert in terms of Azure security, there's another certification here. The exam you have to clear for it is AZ500. This will test you on your ability of how you can implement security controls, how you can work with identity management, uh, even role-based authentication as well. There's a lot of different things that you have to know about and hey guys whenever we're talking about data uh, one important thing is to protect it and uh, you know these data protection techniques keep changing day in and day out right so you have to have the knowledge about the latest data protection methodologies and uh, once you have working knowledge of all of that I think it's uh, vital that you guys take up AZ500 if you're looking towards the data security aspect of things all right perfect so next we're going to move on to understand the azure expert certifications now we saw the uh, we saw the fundamental uh, we saw the associate level certifications now we're going to take a look at the expert certifications well in terms of expert certifications the offering from microsoft are pretty uh, nice out here because we have two very 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 important azure expert certifications which is the azure solutions architect certification and the azure devops engineer right so let us discuss uh, each of them them individually to start out with firstly if you're taking a look at the azure solutions architect right now being certified in this right so it means that you actually are a thorough expert in azure itself right how amazing is that but then to go on to showcase yourself saying hey i am thorough in azure you have to clear two important examinations azure az uh, 303 and of course 304 as well now again uh, in the expert category here is another certification where you have to clear two examinations for it right of course this uh certification certification is definitely going to be challenging you're going to require complete knowledge of application design working on security how you can look towards infrastructure management infrastructure maintenance cost cutting uh, even with the respect of how you can use data to solve problems right so when you're calling yourself as an expert azure uh, 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 you know developer or let's say an azure solutions architect as an architect you have to know things in and out right so it's vital to have a lot of experience before attempting this particular examination it's a very popular examination and once on the other side once you become a certified azure solutions architect the salary trends increase in an exponential way so people are out there are looking for uh, solutions architects and i think all of you all who are tuned into this session can definitely work towards becoming experts there right Perfect, guys. Uh, the next one we're going to check out is the Azure DevOps Engineer Certification. Now, with the Azure DevOps uh, Engineer Certification, unlike the previous one, we do not require two examinations to clear. You require one examination. It's called as the AZ400 that you have to clear right but uh, to get to this point to call yourself as an azure devops engineer it becomes very vital that you either using it and providing solutions on a wonderful cloud computing platform such as azure it becomes vital that you understand all the strategies that go on into doing this understand code understand all the testing methodologies implementation and how you can do all of this on the azure platform right so once you can go on to do all of this then uh, you know providing a solution catering via azure becomes very easy but to become certified you to write the exam AZ400. So I hope you are clear with all the fundamental certifications, associate certifications and the expert level certifications, right? Perfect, guys. Now we're going to take a look at two fantastic specialty certifications that we have uh, here at Microsoft Azure. It's the Azure IoT Developer Certificate and the, of course, the Azure for SAP workloads as well. Now, in this particular case, uh, with the Azure IoT Developer Certification, as someone of you asked in the comment section, uh, you know, you can implement uh, Internet of Things, uh, the entire technology, the entire domain and provide solutions using Azure as well. So uh, to go on to become an expert in IoT, to become certified saying, hey, I can implement IoT solutions on Microsoft Azure, you are going to take a look at uh, the Azure IoT Developer Certification, right? It's a specialty certification. Again, on the other side of things, if you're a person who's looking towards integrating SAP technologies and of course bringing it together with Microsoft Azure, uh, you have another specialty certification for it. It's called as Azure for SAP Workload. So depending on what it is that you require. Now, IoT is a very, very different thing when you compare it to handling a SAP Workload, right? Or SAP Workload. So it is a specialty it is not what everyone would want to do but then hey if you're a person who's willing to do it well uh you know microsoft azure has a certification ready for you guys to take up and of course you have to clear the exam 
combinations and all of that right all right guys so i hope all the azure certifications we quickly covered in this particular video was completely clear for you all now similarly as i mentioned let us take a look at the certifications that are provided by the people at google uh, you know for the gcp or the google cloud platform let's begin the other important pointer that i have to talk to you about the world of gcp about the world of certifications is i think we need to take a step back to understand why certifications are so important for the world of cloud computing right now whenever you have met a person who's an expert in the cloud there's a good chance that he or she is certified now this certification is like a seal of uh, guarantee uh, you know that this person has the complete working knowledge to work on this domain now aws provides many certifications azure provides many certifications and just like aws and azure uh, you know even gcp does provide uh, multiple different certification as well and especially now during the covid 19 pandemic the entire world uh, realized that hey i think we definitely should look more into cloud so the investments uh, that people are making towards the cloud computing industry has quadrupled uh, you know from 2020 on so uh, there's an estimate which says that in the next 4 years 85% of the entire it workload on the globe is going to be moved to the cloud computing platform 85 percent of an uh, of the entire it uh, industry how amazing is this right and the second thing is that these certifications are extremely important in today's world because companies who are hiring for cloud computing experts are making sure that these certifications are a compulsion now there are certain companies who says hey if you have the skills it's more than enough but a majority of the companies in this particular domain say hey you have to be certified in this particular domain so that they are sure uh, that you know the in and out of that particular domain subdomain whatever it is right perfect an added advantage to this is that all the certifications that uh, you know you have in gcp are all role based so based on whatever it is that you want to do you guys can pick them up it is not like you pick up a certification in gcp and you are forever uh, stuck in that particular role if you want to do another certification you can go on to do it so this opens up your profile towards multiple industries ladies and gentlemen that's a very very uh, uh, you know important thing right perfect Look at the last point. Look at the third point here. I think you will be very much interested to understand that, uh, you know, GCP developers, Google cloud platform developers are paid really, really well. Uh, the average salary is somewhere around 130,000 American dollars goes all the way to 180,000 dollars in India. It, it starts somewhere around 12 lakhs per annum and it goes all the way to 35, 40 lakhs per annum. Ladies and gentlemen, all of these numbers are definitely achievable. Uh, as I always say, in all of my cloud computing uh, uh, you know sessions that we have is that this is a domain where you know no matter uh, where you're staying in the world you can of course work remotely that's what the world is doing now uh, you know you can expect a very very good salary or you can you know even ask for a brilliant salary here because that kind of an expertise is required in the domain right once you become an expert in a niche product it ensures that uh, you know a lot of people will be interested to have your services uh, in that you know by making them go on to use that particular domain as well so it's a very important thing that you guys understand that there's a lot of demand there's thousands and thousands of jobs which are being created and of course these uh, jobs are paying amazing salaries regardless of your experience you might be a fresher you might be a person who has five years experience 10 years experience and all of that right so that's an important thing uh, you know that you guys should know about now, uh, you know, to talk about a very important thing here, I'm sure you guys are very curious about understanding which GCP certification should you eventually go for, right? Now, there are multiple certifications. Let us discuss, uh, you know, one after the other. First of all, ladies and gentlemen, uh, there are two tiers of important certifications out here. Uh, it's the Google Cloud Associate certification and then you have the Google Cloud Professional certifications. Perfect. So uh, understand right now, guys, do take a note of this. This is a very important point. There are two tiers, Associate and Professional. So without further ado, I think we have to talk more about what these certifications are, how many certifications are there before jumping into the Associate certifications, right? 
Perfect. First of all, you guys have to understand that there are nine different GCP certifications that you can work towards. I'll answer one question right away. You might say, hey, if I want to, uh, you know, work on all nine certifications, can I do it? The answer is absolute yes. You can work on all of these. There is absolutely no prerequisites for these certifications. Uh, you know, there is no hard and concrete prerequisite that says you have to have uh, two years of experience, three years of experience to take up this uh, examination to clear the certifications. Absolutely no. Uh, you know, you will definitely uh, the suggested amount of uh, experience I'm going to talk about whenever we talk about each of these certificates. But for now, you have to realize that there is no hard prerequisites, right? Perfect. So whenever you go on to take up these examinations to clear the certification, guys, all of the questions will be multiple choice questions. And since these are all role based certifications or, you know, even Google G Suite certifications, it will make your uh, job to prepare for these certifications easy as well, right? Perfect guys. Now we can go on to check out uh, the validity of these certifications. Now uh, you will have a question saying, okay, so if I become certified in GCP, how long will my certificate be valid for? Very good question. Your certificate will be valid for two years. And what happens after two years, right? So at the end of your uh, two years of certification, you will be reminded constantly by Google to recertify. Now, uh, the price of recertification is at a 50% discounted rate, uh, you know, uh, compared to the actual price of every attempt. Now, uh, these examinations that you have to take, you have to clear one examination for every certification. These exams can cost somewhere around $125 all the way to $200 and of course uh, in India it's 9,000 rupees all the way to 15,000 rupees right now this is the amount you have to pay for every single attempt of every single exam that you guys will have to take the exact number will vary upon the uh, actual certification but here is the uh, lower threshold and here is the upper threshold uh, that consists of these numbers as well right Perfect guys, now we can go on to check out uh, the GCP associate certification. Now, one important thing I mentioned is that there are nine certifications out there, but I've mentioned associate certification instead of associate certifications. Why is that? Well, GCP associate certification is only one. In the associate level, there's only one certification here and the people at Google recommend that you have to have somewhere around six months of experience working with the Google Cloud platform before actually you take up this particular uh, certification right they don't say you have to compulsorily have six months but they recommend that hey you know what you're spending a good amount of money if you have to clear it in your first attempt you guys definitely require this amount of experience right now to go on to earn this particular certification you have to pass an examination the examination is called as the associate cloud engineer examination guys take a note of this right this will completely test your ability on how is your fundamental knowledge with the particular domain how well can you go on to deploy a cloud-based solution how can you make sure uh, that at the end of the day, uh, you know, your uh, solution uh, works without being interrupted, you know, without failure and all of that, guys. So in terms of data security, you already know data can be vulnerable in the cloud computing platform. So you have to talk about uh, security protocols, access methodologies and a lot of these things. Of course, you will be not drilled on like a very, uh, uh, you know, complex level or a very hard question kind of a thing here but all of these will be simple questions but it can get tricky so that's why they say you have to work on the platform uh, you know for six months straight guys now that we took a look at the associate certification it's high time we take a look at the professional certifications now with professional certifications as i told you there are uh, there were nine in total out of which one was the associate so we have the remaining eight that we're going to discuss quickly right so you have the cloud architect certification the cloud developer data engineer cloud devops engineer cloud security engineer cloud network engineer collaboration engineer and of course machine learning engineer right perfect guys let's Let's quickly go on to take a look at each and every one of these. Now, the first certification that we're going to discuss is the professional cloud architect certification. Now, this is a certification. Again, all of these certifications have examinations that you guys have to clear. But this particular uh, certification talks about how you can go on to have the capability to design and plan a cloud solution architecture. So you have to have uh, that kind of an ability. You're going to require all the knowledge about how you can work with various network topologies, star topologies, uh, you know, and all of these different things in a way where you're trying to say, hey, 
as a professional cloud architect you can uh, you know completely solve anyone's problem a client's problem uh, and provide a solution using the google cloud platform right that is what you will be tested upon uh, that's what your abilities will be tested upon in this particular certification now the next certification that we're going to check out is the professional cloud developer certification now the name itself suggests developer right so you must have the ability to build and test and deploy cloud based application so wherever you're talking about cloud based applications usually they have to be very scalable right today your application is serving maybe for 10 people uh, you know maybe you're a pizza company you opened a uh, you know you opened a pizza place 10 people are ordering now maybe you get really popular and thousand people start ordering your pizzas right in that particular case your application has to have the capability to hand thousand people here now that that kind of an approach of your application development is exactly what you guys will be tested upon in professional cloud developer right I hope I was clear with that perfect the next one that we're going to take a look at is the professional data engineer certification now with data engineering we always talk about big data and how you guys can go on to work with data warehousing and maintaining data processing systems as well so you will have to have the ability to design and maintain these systems and there's multiple different services out there where, where you have to have hands-on experience like cloud big table you have cloud spanner cloud data store and more guys so it becomes very important that you take a note of all of these different things that we're discussing here we're going to take a look at the next uh, uh, certification which is the professional cloud devops engineer now with your cloud devops engineering you already know that you require the understanding of de uh, development and operations concept called as devops you'll be using a lot of devops concept across the cloud so having the ability to not only know about ci cd pipelines which is continuous integration and continuous uh, development uh, deployment uh, pipelines you have to use it you have to implement it and you have to make sure that it is working robustly on the the Google Cloud platform so uh, with respect to site reliability with respect to services with respect to how you bring together uh, you know these DevOps principles and DevOps methodologies to the world of GCP is exactly what you'll be quizzed upon and you guys have to prepare for that for the professional cloud DevOps engineer certification so I hope I was clear with that right perfect guys uh, so the next uh, certification that you guys should definitely look towards is the cloud security engineer certification now with the cloud security engineer certification it will uh, as the name itself suggests we're talking about firewalls we're talking about security we're talking about not only securing your platform but also securing the applications that you guys are, will be developing and deploying on your cloud platform right so that is a very important thing here uh, you need to have the complete capability of how you can configure access management management now access management is something we all do in our daily lives right now uh, for all the people who have tuned into uh, this particular live session from your mobile phones uh, I am sure you guys uh, you know will have a password on uh, it can be a fingerprint it can be a pattern it can be a pin and all of that so what are you trying to do you're trying to restrict someone else accessing your particular phone right that is exactly what you're going to be doing here but with your product on the google cloud platform as well not everyone will have access to it even though the data is sitting on a public server right perfect so the next certification you guys definitely should look forward to is the cloud network engineer network engineer will talk about how you are completely well versed with the gcp network how you can work with dns strategies and another concept called as disaster recovery services so whenever let's say you have, you have data loss uh, you know the hard drives crashed in the servers there's an earthquake there's a tsunami and somehow the data center uh, lost your data so they will have services where they would have backed up your data and you can access all of these so disaster recovery is like a cure for an illness right so that's a definite uh, thing here as well and an important thing guys that you have to note about the cloud network engineer certification is that here you will be uh, quizzed upon how you guys can implement the VPC or it's also called as the virtual private cloud uh, it's a fantastic offering we have here at GCP and uh, knowledge of this is very much required right Perfect guys, taking a look at the next certification now is the professional collaboration engineer. Now a collaboration engineer's role is fantastic, I'll tell you why. You have used apps like, uh, you know, Gmail, Google Drive, uh, you know, Google Meet, Google Calendar and all of these, right? So these are called as the workspace core apps. So you will have to work on configuring these to make sure your application works really well with them, right? So you have to have the ability to plan, have the ability to implement and make sure you're deploying uh, 
you know these particular google workspace apps and they have to bring it together and uh, make sure it works well with your usage it has to work well with your applications guys this is a very very important certification if you guys are looking towards uh, working with the google workspace core apps right so uh, now that we checked out these certifications uh, that are out there, these very important certifications, I am confident that you guys will have a question saying, okay, so in which order uh, should we go on to complete these certifications? You know, should you take up one? Should you take up all? If you have to take up more than one, is there an order and all of that, right? See, one very, very important point here that I have to make is whenever you take a look at the certification order, right? There is no particular order for any of these GCP certifications. If you have to take up, uh, you know, a machine learning engineer certification, you can take that up. Do you want to become a network engineer and you have to take up the network engineering, uh, uh, you know, uh, certification, you can do that, right? But before you work on the professional certifications, look at the second point, guys. It becomes very, very important that you guys work on the associate certification first. The associate certification is basically telling, uh, you know, you know, telling yourself and telling the world that you have gotten started with that particular platform and to a certain degree, you're good with it. And then working on a professional certification will show that you're completely proficient in that domain. Right. And the third thing is that uh, whenever someone asks me a question saying, which should I go on to do? I highly suggest, of course, start with the associate. There's only one associate certification in GCP. Whenever you're looking towards professional uh, certifications, make sure you guys are working towards whatever it is that you want to do. Now, some of you might be very interested in working with network security. Some of you uh, might be working with data engineering. Some of you might be interested in working with the Google core apps. Some of you might be very much interested in, uh, uh, you know, working with machine learning applications and all of that. So find what it is that you want to work with, pick that certification and then get certified in that, right? Perfect guys. And the last point is that as always, it is not only your interest, but also you have to take a look at what the current industry demands as well. For example, now DevOps, machine learning, all of these concepts are highly, highly trending. And if you're looking towards making a, a you know, a career, which is highly rewarding monetarily. And of course, it gives you the satisfaction of knowing that you can, uh, you know, deliver fantastic solutions using the cloud platforms such as GCP. Then of course, you know, you're going to be looking at that certification and you're going to be working on on the same as well right perfect guys uh you know uh there is a question that i always get at the end of these sessions is that okay Anirudh, so how do i go on uh to learn more about uh the cloud, the cloud computing world or any other domain uh, as such right Guys, I have an important piece of advice for all of you all. There is a lot of content on the web. If you just go on to Google and type learn cloud computing, you will be given millions of articles by before even you can snap your finger, right? This is a good thing and a bad thing. Good thing is that you have access to a lot of material. The bad thing here is that if you do not know how to navigate across these material and how to effectively grasp them, it becomes very, very difficult because there is so much to learn here. It can get confusing really quick. And and it can get tiring and you guys can quit our job here at great learning is to make sure that you know you guys see through whatever it is that you have started that you guys complete all the courses you guys complete your learning and as always right whenever you're talking to us experts here uh you know we are subject matter experts uh we completely know the subject in and out so whenever you talk to us we will uh give you the aspect of what the industry wants so when we give you our views based upon uh the exact requirement in the industry it will add a huge amount of advantage to your particular learning, right? So whenever we have these live sessions, that's why I always suggest subscribe to the Great Learning YouTube channel and make sure you guys are tuning in for this session. If you subscribe and hit that bell, the second we put out a video, you guys will be notified of it. So you can join us that instant, you can learn and you can take away a fantastic amount of knowledge with the sessions, right? Perfect. Now to talk about uh, the free content we have on cloud computing, guys, there are three platforms where you definitely can take away a good amount of knowledge. Uh, first, we have Great Learning Academy. Great Learning Academy is a place where 200 plus courses taught by subject matter experts. You can learn for free, get a certificate of completion absolutely free of cost as well. There's no hidden charges there. Are, first, first of all, there's no charges there at all, right? The second thing is the Great Learning YouTube channel as you've tuned in and, uh, you know, as all of our beloved audience always absolutely 
absolutely love to join us on all our sessions i am sure uh, you know uh, we, we we hope uh, that you guys are having a fantastic ride with us here at great learning right perfect the third thing is for all the people who absolutely love reading now i am a person who loves reading so uh, you know again we have blogs written by subject matter experts that you guys can definitely check out so based on what it is that you want to do if you want a certificate of completion look at great learning academy if you want uh, you know comprehensively put together courses live sessions uh, expert sessions talk shows whatever it is guys make sure you guys are subscribing to the great learning youtube channel right now coming to this part where i told you that uh, you know i'm going to be guiding you guys on how you can become experts in cloud computing all these particular free content uh, you know they are fantastic they are uh, keeping you in mind your time uh, you know our efforts all of these things make sure that you guys are getting the best uh, uh, you know learning material possible as you can see here right but then uh, if you guys have to go from being complete beginners and then go all the way to becoming an expert i highly suggest uh, you know you guys put your efforts uh, into working on a post graduation program we have here at great learning now this is india's first mentorship driven program this is a 6 month program done in collaboration uh, with the great lakes executive learning powered by aws uh, educate of course uh, you know we can talk about this for a lot of uh, different uh, uh, you know we can go on hours and hours to talk to you about why uh, you know this program is fantastic but if you go on to head to this particular page you will see uh, you know you'll be learning 90 plus cloud services you'll be learning aws you'll be learning azure you'll be learning gcp you'll be learning devops you'll be working on 15 plus hands on project ladies and gentlemen and of course the most advantage that this program is going to add is uh, because of the live uh, you know personalized mentorship right So we have hundred plus hours of instructional content. We have live sessions. You will be taught by some of the most fantastic uh, faculty out there, right? Okay, so this is a certificate. Uh, this is what the certificate looks like. It's from Great Lakes Institute of Learning. It will have your name. It will say you're a person who completed the postgraduate program in cloud computing, right? Now, guys, when we take a look at the curriculum out here, first of all, you will have to. master the basics thoroughly so we have complete foundations courses with multiple different modules uh, each of these modules you can check out what it is that you will learn all the quizzes all the projects you'll be doing and then we're going to take a look at aws we're going to take a look at azure in detail and then we're going to take a look at gcp in uh, detail as well right so this is a cloud computing course uh, you know this is a cloud computing program which will get you started with both uh, aws and azure and if you think that's the end of it no you will also uh, get get complete uh, you know i have a self paced uh, program on the google cloud platform as well there's a lot of things to learn and at the end of it you will be completing a capstone project now a capstone project is going to add immense amount of value to your resume right now guys you can find out a lot of different things for example you can find out the details of which project you guys will be working on all of that as i mentioned uh, you guys will be learning from leading academicians in this particular field these guys are uh, uh, you know top practitioners from all these top organization these guys are thorough expert uh, you know in all of these particular uh, concepts right so be it faculties be it mentors uh, you know you are getting the best of your time and money ladies and gentlemen you know there are many many advantages you can check out the reviews you can check out the testimonials and all of that and at the end of it right guys since this is a program which is comprehensively put together to make sure you guys become thorough experts it is 6 months long and it is 300 plus hours of learning with 90 plus cloud services and multiple multiple other very fits you can get all the details of it on our greatlearning.in website make sure you guys are uh, you know reaching out to our experts here at great learning there's an application process for this program you'll have to fill an application form and there's a, there's going to be a short interview process and the screening call after which there are limited seats uh, you know you'll be rolled out an offer letter to join these particular uh, courses guys so there's multiple deadlines as you can see there's a deadline tomorrow there's multiple batches uh, starting soon as you keep scrolling down you can find out more faqs or also called as frequently asked questions and all of that but i'm sure at the end of it you guys will have more questions right so you can put on your name email and your phone number and you can submit it we will make sure uh, you know in the next 4 hours as soon as you do this it is usually the next moment as soon as you go on to do this we will make sure our experts uh, are in touch with you and they can guide you completely about the program right in the meantime you can check out the website you can download the brochure and i and i believe that this program is going to add a lot of value uh, into your life especially now that you guys are looking towards cloud specializations right so all right guys so we covered a 
lot of different things in this particular module. We took a look at various AWS certifications, Azure certifications, GCP certifications, lot of important pointers, uh, you know, a lot of things about what exams you have to clear, what are the costs of these exams, what do you require in terms of knowledge to clear these exams. And the most important thing uh, we discussed even was the validity of the certifications, how you can get recertif uh, recertified after the uh, validity ends and all of that, right? So these are some really, really important pointers that you guys should definitely know. So I hope all of you all uh, took a note of these points. These are very important going ahead, uh, you know, for you guys uh, to work on your career path to becoming experts in cloud computing. Now, uh, the most important part that we checked out here uh, is the cloud computing specialization, guys. As you checked out in the specialization, uh, you know, you're going to be learning uh, everything from AWS, uh, Azure, all the way to GCP as well. So again, depending on what it is that you want to specialize in, uh, you know, you have the option to uh, become a thorough expert, uh, you know, right from being a beginner uh, to having complete proficiency in the domain as well. So I hope this module added a lot of value to your learning. I'll see you on the next one. So, all right, guys, welcome to module number six. Module number six is going to be a very comprehensive module where we're going to be covering a lot that is to know about AWS. Uh, with all the knowledge that we have over the first five modules, now we're going to take a, uh, a, the practical approach to make sure that we align uh, your learning to give you the practical experience that is required as well, right? So in module number six, we're going to cover a lot of things in depth. Uh, we're going to begin by taking a look at the core services that AWS has to offer, after which we're going to jump into three important services AWS compute AWS storage and the AWS networking uh, services as well right now each of these uh, types of services have uh, uh, you know sub services in them for example with storage you have Amazon s3 with networking you have a couple of services compute you have EC2 so you have a lot of uh, different services which are very very important for you to know as a cloud computing expert so we're gonna take a look at that uh, after this we're gonna take a look at AWS Honeycode and AWS amplify now these two are brilliant modules which will help us build a very very simple Simple and elegant uh, looking mobile app as well. So we're going to take a look at how we can use that, uh, walk you through and of course building an actual mobile app as well, right? So I hope uh, the agenda that we're going to cover in module number six is clear for all, right? Perfect. Without further ado, guys, let's get started by taking a look at the core services of AWS. Let us now go ahead and understand some of the core domains or core services that AWS has to offer to us, okay? So there are quite a few services. Let's quickly take a look at some of the domains that are there and the services that fall under it. Okay, so talking about the AWS core services, as I've already mentioned, there are like 200 plus AWS services that AWS has to offer to us, right? So uh, this number keeps on growing actually. So I'm actually not aware what the exact number is, but if I'm not wrong, it's around 200 services that AWS offers. So to actually name all of these services individually or to have them as individual services, it is a complex process, right? I mean, um, there has to be some clustering, some grouping of these services for clear management or better understanding. So when you talk about AWS, what it does is it classifies its services under certain domains. Now, these service domains are many. Um, if you talk about the core domains, you have your computation, you have your storage, you have your networking, security, management messaging databases now these are some of the core services when you talk about cloud computing certifications or the roles that we discussed every certification or every role would want you to know what computation is what storage is what database services are what networking is what security is and what messaging are because these form fundamentals of your architecting and sysops admin roles now there are developer tools as well but those are specific to developer rules right or roles so I will discuss that. Do not worry about that. But um, as I've mentioned, there are quite a few domains as well. Some of those are not even mentioned or you cannot even see those on the screen right now. Uh, I've captured some major ones that I felt was uh, that I felt were important, actually. Uh, but again, each day there are so many services that get launched and there are so many services AWS offers. The definition of something being important is very surface level here. And this is more from my perspective. So um, because for you, machine learning services might be more important, right? For some of you, only the developer tools might be important. Say, for example, AWS DevOps services or for some of you, IoT services might be important. So that is a perspective based uh, response to it. So when you talk about the core domains, these are some of the ones that are most discussed. And these are the ones that you see in the certification courses that people people op offer across the globe. But I would try and shed light on as many services as possible. 
the point that I'm trying to make here is when you cluster these services, you get some of these domains which offer different kind of services. So let us try and discuss the ones that are there on the screen first. And as we move further, we'll be talking about other services as well. So do not worry about that. Okay. Now, when you talk about the service domains, first one that we see on the screen is compute. Now compute again is a popular cloud service domain. In this service domain, you have quite a few popular services like EC2 Elastic Cloud Compute or Elastic Compute Cloud, which again is a popular computation service and is IaaS in nature, that is infrastructure as a service. So we've already discussed what infrastructure as a service is, but when you talk about um, compute service like EC2, it offers um, AMIs and instances or VMs. We'll be talking about that service set length and in detail as we get into the demo part. But um, these are the services or uh, this is one of the services that compute domain offers. Now, these are the services that let you do computation on cloud platforms, right? So this could be your infra VM that you launch. It could be um, a service like uh, AWS Lambda, which is serverless in nature, right? Which takes care of um, a lot of activities that you otherwise would be involved in. Or it can be your EBS or Elast not EBS, sorry, Elastic Beanstalk service. So when you talk about Elastic Beanstalk service, it is platform as a service compute service that AWS has to offer to you. So it provides you with a platform where you can do a lot of computations. So basically when you talk about compute services, they help you in the computation part of your data and resources that reside on your cloud platform. Next is your storage domain. Now when you talk about the storage domain, as the name suggests, this is where you actually go ahead and store your data, right? So there are services that let you store data in form of objects, in form of files, uh, structured and structured data and stuff like that, right? So AWS has quite a few services which take care of even your hot storage, cold storage. Now, some of the terminologies that I'm mentioning, I'll go ahead and discuss those in detail. But um, yes, when you talk about storage services as well, so AWS gives you quite a few storage services, right from your um, object file structured and structured data to even hot and cold kind of storages or even your archival storage. When you talk about a cold storage, it is called as archival storage or data that you do not access frequently. Okay. Um, so apart from that, there are your database domains where you have your database services like um, now there are plethora of services here to be frank. You have your Amazon RDS, right? Um, then you have your Amazon Redshift. Um, these services are popularly known for uh, providing you different types of database instances where you can store different kinds of data and have different benefits. So there are very few databases out there in the market. Those are not supported by AWS to be frank. Then you have other popular database services as well like Aurora and quite a few others. So even these services are something that we'll discuss as we move ahead. But for now, uh, this is what your database services do. They actually let you go ahead and um, have database services launched in your AWS cloud platform. The next bit in this session or the next bit in these services that we have are your networking domains or networking domain services, basically. So when we talk about the networking domain, right? I mean, um, when you talk about cloud platforms in particular, networking is very important, right? Because all our data is residing over a network in different data centers. It is connected through a network. So having a network that connects these things properly is very important, which also governs the security of the network is also important. So there are quite a few networking services that help you connect your cloud, your data centers and networks or your data with each other using these networking services. Okay. So to name um, one of those, we have VPC that Amazon has to offer to us. That is virtual private cloud. It lets you have your subnets or virtual subnets rather or virtual networks that you need to govern your data or the cloud network. Next, you have your security domain. Now, there's a lot being said about data being secure or not being secure on cloud platforms, right? Now, if you talk about the security services that AWS has to offer to you, the number is plenty. I mean, you have services that let you do so much when you talk about security, right? Um, right from ensuring that your data is secure over the network, right? Deciding who gets to access what, giving you proper access management, then ensuring that um, you have encryption of your data that moves over the network and firewalls to ensure that whatever comes into your network or goes out of your network is secure. Then you have your security managers that actually act 
as inspectors on these networks they keep a track of the um health of a network that is uh, functioning your services to ensure that those are healthy and those are functioning normally okay apart from that it gives you suggestions on what security principles should be implemented that are cost effective and secure as well this was about the network security that i've mentioned um when you talk about platforms like aws they have 24/7 um working personnel that physically guards your data centers right and there is a layer of security that ensures that your data is secure physically as well apart from that when you talk about these regions uh, these regions are so um profound so unknown or so secretly kept that even quite a few people who work at amazon do not know where these data centers are exactly located in those regions to ensure that the security of these regions is at a very high level so when you talk about security there are quite a few services that ensure your data is secure okay migration yes so when you talk about migration it is not always that you are just going to go ahead and start a new application on cloud right there could be a situation where your data is already residing somewhere you need to move it to cloud so does that mean that cloud won't help you here it would definitely help you here so what cloud does is it ensures that there are quite a few services that readily amalgamate with its platform so you can directly migrate to cloud if not it also helps you in ensuring that your data can be moved to cloud um you have relevant resources that support your migration and most importantly it follows quite a few principles that not only help you in moving your data but even reshaping or modeling your data and applications in such a way that they can actually reshaped or even rebuilt on top of cloud platforms so migration is something that aws supports a lot and there are quite a few services that let you do this now this is something that i doubt will be discussing in this session because this is a very detailed topic and to be frank there are complete courses that talk about migration but i'll give you some idea about it do not worry about that next in this list we have management tools right so once the data is there on your cloud platforms you need to do quite a few things right there are management tools that let you throw in triggers that let you throw in thresholds or uh, alarms when there is a particular threshold breach that is um, that has happened or if you want to keep a track of the health of the resources this is something your management tools do for you so they manage all the data and resources that are there on your cloud platform right from keeping a track of your pipelines to throwing in alarms when um, a certain requirement is met or not met everything is taken care by your management tools or management services that aws has to offer to you when you talk about messaging now again you need to communicate over the network right even though you have security you need services that can help you pass messages emails right communicate with different users and stuff like that so there are n number of messaging services that aws has to offer to you those fall under this domain and then you see the analytics domain here now the reason i have put forth this name here is everybody talks about machine learning data science and then people ask me questions as in can you do that on top of cloud platforms like aws definitely you can do that on top of platforms like aws aws has a plethora of machine learning big data analytics services whether you talk about cognitive services that let you use ai nlp if you want to use ready to use apis even those applications or apis are available that let you do face detection image detection sentiment analysis uh fraud detection quite a few other things okay um text to speech speech to text right these kind of applications as well if you talk about core analytics like running machine learning models building machine learning models um then you have services like amazon sage maker that let you do this at length and in detail okay apart from that there are quite a few services that let you perform big data operations etl operations and data warehousing operations as well so whether you talk about big data ai machine learning everything is taken care by um aws now these are some of the domains that you see on screen are there domains that are not there on the screen yes there are quite a few domains that are actually not there on the screen so if i were to talk about other domains or other services that aws has to offer to you there are domains like iot internet of things right um internet of things is nothing but a practice where um devices are connected to each other through the internet and over the internet we collect the data from these devices through sensors now this data some is something that can let you actually one operate these devices and also generate insights from the data that we get from here making those devices smarter 
So that is what the aim of IoT is, right? Say, for example, smart signals that we have, right? Smart home devices or appliances. Now, some of these work on Internet of Things, right? So since Internet of Things is a big thing these days, AWS has made room for it as well. Now, this was about um, IoT. For IoT, you have like services that give you um, administrative devices with AWS that are like uh, AWS IoT Core and other services, which actually let you um, connect your IoT devices to AWS Cloud Platform with ease. There are other services like IoT Greengrass and quite a few other services that AWS has to offer to us. But that is not the point of discussion. I just want to tell you that IoT is something that is supported by AWS. That is one of the domains. Then the other domains can be your DevOps domain, right? When you talk about the DevOps domain, um, these are the developer tools, right? What is DevOps? DevOps is an approach where we break silos between developers and administrators. Now, these are the two teams that are involved in software development process. So the developers build it in a developer environment, whereas the operations team or the administrative team operates on the software in the production environment, two different environments altogether. But when you talk about um, them, they have to work together because they are connected with each other in the form of the software that was built. So in previous days or in the agile method or the methods that were before that, we had problems where these two teams had quite a few conflicts because what worked in development environment did not work in production environment and vice versa. And both these teams believed that it was the fault of the other team. So what happened was we had a newer approach called as DevOps that actually combined these two teams to work together and they generated a continuous integration and deployment kind of a process where you could work together and build software at a better and a faster pace. All the patches could be fixed in quickly and everything could be done at a quicker pace and at a continuous pace. So this is what DevOps brought into picture when you talk about software development, something that has revolutionized um, software development. There would be quite a few people who are attending this system or uh, this session, sorry, and they know about uh, DevOps, right? So they can relate to these things. So basically that is what DevOps does and it is very popular in the market. So AWS has also provided quite a few services like AWS Cloud Pipeline, AWS Code Commit, which is similar to Git, right? You have AWS Code Build Services, you have AWS Code Commit, Code um, Code Deploy, right? And a Code Pipeline as well. So these are the services that actually let you perform DevOps operations. And right from writing a code to committing it, to deploying it, to building it, everything is taken care here on this AWS cloud platform. So when you talk about the domains and services that AWS has to offer to you, um, the possibilities are many. Once we get into the console, I would show you some of those services, not worry about that. But this is about the core service domains that AWS has to offer to you. I believe I've talked enough about them. Um, quite a lot actually. So let us just go ahead and take a look at one of the um, first domains that comes under AWS and let's try and explore that a little more. We should first take a look at the free tier account or the AWS console that it has to offer. Okay, so let's do that. Let's quickly take a look at the AWS free tier console, right? Let me give you some information on these pointers and then we'll go ahead and talk about um, some of the services that AWS has to offer to us. So again, let me switch into my tab, right? I'll have to log in or sign into my console here. Let's do that. Should not be difficult. I have an account here. So I feel so relaxed. It is working. Okay. So this is a demo account that I have. I use for quite a few activities mostly for demonstrations. So let's quickly take a look at this account. So guys, this is what the free tier account of Amazon Web Services looks like. So when I say a free tier account, it uh, offers quite a few features that are available to users free of cost. This is for learning purposes right now. AWS, since it's a global platform, it wants more and more people to use its platform, its services, right? So what it does is it gives you a free tier account that is valid for one year. And for this one year, you have most of the services that AWS has to offer to you available to you free of cost with some upper caps. That means all these resources will have a certain limit on it. Say, for example, EC2 is a compute service. So you can launch virtual machines here with AWS. What it does is it gives you or the ability to launch basic instances that are that you can launch at free of cost. If you want to launch bigger instances, then you might be charged. Okay. 
So this is what a free tier limit is. Say for example, S3 is a storage service where you can store data up to 5 GB. If you exceed that, you'll be charged. So that is what a free tier cap is. Now, for people who want to start practicing AWS, these resources are more than enough. You can do a lot of things with these resources, right? So um, if you do not have an account, make sure you go ahead and have one. How do you create an account? You just have to search for AWS free tier, okay? Once you search for AWS free tier, you would be having access to, um, or you'll have to sign up to AWS free tier. You'll have to give in your details, like um, basic details, what your name is, email ID, where you reside, your address, and you would be actually accept, expected to give in your credit card details. So the reason they ask you for credit card details is they want to verify you are a legit user. And in case if you cross the limits and you have to pay the amount above the cap that you crossed, um, that would be deducted from your credit card, but it does not debit your uh, money without asking you. It will ask for it. And if you approve only then it will charge you. If it is a free tier account, you can even put in your debit card details. It says you have to give in your credit card details, but with AWS, I've tried using my debit card and it works as well. So they cannot charge you without your permission. So do ensure you have a free tier account and you start practicing AWS just like, um, or whatever I'll be talking about in this session as well, so that you can at least get started with this platform if you haven't. Okay. So, um, this was about how do you get started? Let's take a look at the services it offers. Now for that, if I click on the services option, you see all the major domains you have, right? We've discussed some of these. Say, for example, your compute domain, right? In your compute domain, you have these services. Some of them I've already mentioned. We'll be discussing these. Do not worry. Uh, analytics, right? quite a few services like Athena, EMR, Cloud Search, Elastic Service, Elastic Search Service, sorry. Kinesis, QuickSight, QuickSight is your BI service, uh, just like your uh, uh, Tableau or uh, Power BI that you have, right? It lets you um, visualize the data. Data Pipeline, Data Exchange, Blue, Lake Formation, MSK. Uh, then if you go into the machine learning part, you have specific machine learning services as well. We'll take a look at it, do not worry. But for now, let me just scroll up and see what are the other services that I wanted to talk about. Uh, business applications, Alexa for business, Amazon Chime, Workmail. I haven't used these to be frank, but these are useful services. Storage, in storage, uh, you have S3, EFS. Um, now, this is your object storage. This is your file storage, archival storage. Storage gateway is something that lets you connect different storages in different regions, right? Um, now you have your management services. I've mentioned that quite a few actually organizations, CloudWatch, auto scaling, formation, trail, config. So these are important services. You can study these as well. Security, you have your IAM, right? Secrets manager, guard duty. Um, there are other services as well. We'll discuss this. WAF and shield are something that are very popular. Internet of things. Now the services that I mentioned, right? IoT core, uh, free RTOS. You also have your green grass that I mentioned, IoT one click that lets you do quite a few things just at a click as the name suggests. Okay. Databases, you have popular database services like RDS, DynamoDB, Elastic Cache. DynamoDB is something that is your, um, it is similar to Cosmo DB that uh, Azure has to offer to you. Let's not talk about that for now. It will divert us. Um, and then you have your document DB as well. Kinesis is. Sorry, Redshift is one that lets you connect to or uh, basically take care of your unstructured databases as well. Okay. So if I scroll down, there are networking services here. You have your machine learning services. SageMaker is something that lets you have or use ready to use no notebooks, Python notebooks that it offers. It lets you build a machine learning solution end to end, right from writing codes to actually going ahead and deploying that. So it is an end to end solution, right? Augmented AI. So this is this and comprehend. These are some of the AI services, right? Uh, comprehend in particular is more of an API or an application service, which is ready to use application. You put in your data and get information. Uh, it lets you do sentiment analysis to be frank. Okay. So then you have Amazon Lex, which lets you build, um, chatbots that can actually be integrated with different platforms as well. And this lets you do it with a lot of ease. Okay. Amazon Poly is one of your speech synthesizers. Um, so this is uh, more of a text to speech kind of a thing. You enter a text and it converts it to speech. Okay. So, and its logo is of a parrot. So that tells you, right? 
it speaks what you tell what you tell it to speak right so transcribe is more of into these uh, translation things so there are quite a few services that are there i might or you might want to come here and take a look at those one by one um this is about the console that aws has to offer to you you can actually go ahead and click on these right away or if you do not see one of these you can just type its name if i type s3 it will show amazon s3 service to me i can click on it and i'll be taken to that particular thing what you see here is the region part you can choose what region do you want to create your resources as well okay um so you have options here you can choose different regions you can see the names of the regions that are here okay uh again if you scroll down there are some of the tutorials as well that you can actually go, go ahead and use to get started with some of the things that you would want to do even the time is given how long it would take for you to do all these things right 6 minutes for you to build a web app 2 to 3 minutes for you to launch an instance we'll launch an instance shortly do not worry about that so um when you talk about aws it uh, gives you quite a few options and this is how the console looks like all right guys so now that we understand all the core services that are there now we have to take a look at a very very important aspect of aws which is uh, why it's extremely popular it's aws compute services so let's get started what is the first domain that we have in our hands what is the first domain that we have on our plate right so when you talk about this domain it is aws computation service right or compute services rather so when you talk about these compute services uh it has quite a few compute services that aws has to offer to you or aws has quite a few compute services it would like to offer to you one of those or the first ones that you see on the screen is amazon elastic beanstalk so amazon elastic beanstalk is one of those services um which actually lets you go ahead and have or use pass offerings that aws has to offer to you okay so when i say pass offerings um here basically a complete platform is made available to you which you can access which you can use using aws say for example i have an application that is up and ready for me i just need to move my code to aws and start working on it right let's assume that that application is built in python so in this case what i would do is i can actually go ahead and launch an instance so instead of launching an instance and setting it up launching a virtual machine and setting it up configuring it totally okay what i can do with elastic beanstalk is i can actually just go ahead and fire up one of the environments that elastic beanstalk has to offer to me and here the environment is ready made for me all i have to do is put my code and my application will start working for me the other approach what it also does is it gives me an environment where i can actually start coding as well let's assume that i'm good with python and i i know how to build an application in python so it will actually go ahead and create a virtual machine for me it would create an environment on top of fit and i can actually just go ahead and fire up that environment and just start writing my python code and my application would be up and ready for deployment it also lets you deploy your application with a lot more ease gives you complete status in what stage is your Uh, application and what stage of deployment it is in exactly and using that i can actually go ahead and deploy my um aws elastic beanstalk application so we've already discussed what platform as a services are so you can see on the screen on the left hand side there's a small image that tells you it's a pass offering that means my vendor takes care of everything right from networking to runtime whether it's my middleware operating system virtualization servers and storage everything is managed by my vendor all i manage is the application or the data that i have to control and if i were to define this service i would say it is a compute service which gives me pass offerings right now unlike ec2 something that we'll be discussing next you do not have to set up underlying infrastructure and instead you can actually just go ahead and quickly deploy these applications to aws cloud platform and manage them so basically it is nothing but a pass offering that aws has to offer to you So I believe Elastic Beanstalk is clear to you people. Let us go ahead and talk about the other service or the other domain. So the next service that we have here is Amazon Lambda. Now, when you talk about Amazon Lambda, it is a serverless compute service that Amazon Web Services has to offer to us. Now, when I say a serverless compute service, what it does is it basically takes load off the developers to a very great extent when you talk about configuring part. Right here, you do not have to worry about 
resources you do not have to worry about how to launch them or how to manage them whole management part and even the configuration part that we talked about in the past thing it is taken care by a lambda service it basically actually goes ahead and works with cloud formation we'll discuss that do not worry about it cloud formation to ensure that most of these tasks are automated once you have your application your data you just put it here and it starts working for you you do not have to worry about the management part as well in simple words you do not have to worry about the server underlying server everything is taken care here by your cloud platform so that is what your lambda service does for you so all you have to do is you just have to go ahead and put your code on the amazon lambda and it should work for you as simple as that we'll explore this a little more once we get into the demo but this is what the gist of aws lambda service is okay let us go ahead and talk about the other services that aws has to offer to us so one of them is your elastic load balancers now when you talk about elastic load balancers consider this scenario right i've mentioned about cloud platforms there could be a situation where your application experiences a spike in traffic now since there is a spike in traffic there could be a situation that your servers are overloaded and they are not functioning well in some cases your application might even crash for some unknown reason as well or say for example you have Uh, a virtual machine with you and even that crashes where all your data resides so what do you do in this situation when you talk about elastic load balancers as the name suggests these services ensure that you can balance your load on different resources let's try and understand this point a little more so guys there's a lot of theory that i've been talking about do not worry um let me explain these concepts i'll recap some of these for you and we'll take a look at the demonstrations of some of these services as well so when you talk about an elastic load balancer okay what this service does is it distributes your incoming traffic across several targets okay so everywhere you've been reading this term amazon ec2 instances this is something i'm afraid we should have discussed first to give you a general idea when you talk about an ec2 instance these are your virtual machines that aws lets you configure you can actually plan what storage what network it falls under and on top of these virtual machines these can be your windows linux and all these kind of virtual machines right so um, most of your applications would be residing on your ec2 compute instances okay so that is why we see this term everywhere like amazon ec2 instance we'll be talking about that in detail but to give you an just give you a just this is what it is so when you talk about elastic load balancers what it does is it distributes your traffic okay so in your case you could have multiple ec2 instances with you okay so it traffic it diverts your traffic to those instances which are idle or have lesser traffic say for example your one ec2 instance is experiencing a lot of traffic so instead of diverting all your traffic there it will divert your traffic to some other instance for that it uses aws lambda function okay so lambda function as i mentioned it manages this load it helps you transfer this load um and then there are containers something that we'll discuss again later so let's not focus on the word containers for now but in simple words what your load balancer service does is it calculates what are the um ec2 instances that are functioning in those regions and distributes a load evenly so that none of your instance faces too much traffic and crashes down okay what it does is these are some of the features that you see on the screen it lets you automatically scale to meet the incoming incoming traffic that you have okay uh, that is something that we've discussed already it improves your overall performance of applications that is obvious to happen let's assume that there is so much traffic on one of your instance that it is not able to handle that traffic right uh, ddos attack is something that you might have heard of where people just throw in multiple requests on a particular application so that it crashes but if this happens when you talk about your aws instances uh, it would get redirected to other instances and whoever planned that ddos attack that person might fail okay um and this also means that your application performs better right because traffic is getting distributed increases availability and fault tolerance yes your instances are not crashing that means they are available and if one of the instance is facing problems others are available for it regular health checks to send only healthy targets so this falls under management as well your lambda and some of your management services what they also do is they keep health checks to ensure that all the instances in a region are healthy or in your uh, application basically network basically so uh, if 
an instance is not healthy, the traffic won't be diverted to that instance. So that is what load balancer does, guys. As the name suggests, it balances the load of your resources for you. Okay. Let us go ahead and take a look at some other pointers. Okay. Let's talk about um, what are the types of elastic load balancers that you have with you. You have your classic load balancer, network load balancer, and your application load balancer. So when you talk about your um, load balancers, your classic load balancer is the typical EC2 uh, load balancer that we've discussed, right? So what it does is it basically understands that one of the instances facing more traffic and it diverts them to other instances. But when you talk about your network load balancers or application load balancers, now these function a little differently. These operate in your network layer of your uh, um, application basically or we when you talk about uh, when you talk about computer networking we have different layers right which um, fall under your network where um, basically your resources reside or your data resides right so when you talk about load balancers that operate in the network layer we call them as your network load balancers and the one that fall under your application layer are called as your application load balancers now this is something that we should not get into the details of but these are some of the types that aws has to offer to you so the next point that we have on our screen is auto scaling. So when you talk about auto scaling in particular, what Amazon does is it gives you the freedom of upscaling and downscaling your instances. Okay. So let's assume that you have certain instances where your uh, data is residing. So in this case, what happens is um, there could be a situation that I've already mentioned that some of your instances might experience a lot of traffic. In some cases, they might just not experience traffic. So you can actually ensure that your EC2 instances are always available to handle a particular set of load. In case if you assume that or you know that the load of your particular instance is going to increase, in that case, you can always set them up for auto scaling. When the traffic increases, they scale up to ensure that the functioning is smooth and in place. Okay. And you can even actually go ahead and terminate some of the instances right away. Let's assume that your instance is not expecting any traffic and it is not expecting or not having any traffic at all. In that case, paying money for that instance does not make a lot of sense, right? In that case, you can actually go ahead and terminate that particular piece or set of instance so that you do not shed any extra money on that instance. What are the features that Amazon auto scaling offers to you? It offers better fault tolerance. It is highly available and gives you better cost management. So I do not see a point upon, um, I do not see a point where we talk about these pointers a lot more because uh, it's pretty evident from the definition itself what it is. Let us go ahead and try to understand something else here. Okay. Okay. So this is one of the most important bits that we would be talking about in the compute services domain. Okay, so we've heard about EC2, 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 something that I should have discussed prior to all the services that I discussed, but it does not matter. We'll cover this now and probably all that we discussed will still make sense to you. Okay, so this is one of the most important services that AWS compute has to offer to you. It is one of the most popular services when you talk about computation domains on cloud platforms. Okay, so it is one of those services that was started in 2004. Okay, um, I believe. Um, this was uh, basically found by Christopher Brown, if I'm not wrong, in 2004, he was based in Cape Town. I'm not sure whether it is the same service or some other service that he found, but it was one of those first services. It was found in 2004 and uh, it soon became one of the most beloved services in the world. And these days, EC2 provides you with so many options. Let's try and understand what EC2 service is. So guys, when you talk about Amazon Elastic Compute Cloud or Amazon EC2, it is a web service that provides secure, resizable compute capacity in the cloud. It is designed to make web scale cloud computing easier for developers. Okay. So as the definition suggests, it lets you launch instances or virtual machines to be frank. Now these instances are scalable in nature. They're highly cost efficient and flexible as well. As we talk about the families of EC2 that we have on our plate, you'll understand these terms to a greater or a better extent. Do not worry about it. I'll explain all these points to you in detail. But this is what the definition has to say. But I've mentioned a term instances here, right? 
let's try and understand what an instance is. So when you talk about an instance, an instance is a virtual server for running applications on Amazon EC2. Okay, so guys, um, let me give you an example here. So when you talk about building a particular application, right? What we do is, uh, let's assume that you are given some project that you're supposed to make on your computer. Now you do not have a computer or a resource that lets you build that. In that case, what you would actually do is, um, you would actually go ahead and buy that resource. But that would be a costlier affair for you. To give you an example, if you have to buy a laptop in India, it costs you around 40,000 rupees for a good laptop, right? With decent specs and good functioning. But what if my work was only for 10 days? Spending like 40,000 rupees for that laptop won't make a lot of sense, right? So instead, what if I could rent a laptop for say 400 rupees a day? So in 10 days, it would cost me like 4,000, right? So that is like one tenth of the cost that I would otherwise invest, right? So uh, when you talk about application development, it always won't make sense for you to actually go ahead and buy everything, right? To give you another example, let's assume that I have one laptop with me, okay? And in that, I need to run a project that I'm working on that works on Windows operating system. And I have another project that I'm working on that works on some other operating system, say Linux or Ubuntu. So instead of actually going ahead and having two operating systems, which is a difficult task, right? In my system, I'll have to boot it up, set up two operating systems and the performance would be compromised as well, right? With cloud computing, what you can do is you can actually go ahead and launch such operating systems or virtual machines. And you can launch plenty of those. What that does is that gives you a freedom of working on a different virtual machine. So what a virtual machine is, it creates a virtual replica of an operating system for you. So since, and since it is based on a server, you can launch multiple virtual machines on your laptop and your laptop won't hang. You won't have uh, configuration or RAM issues, right? So that is what a virtual machine is. Think of it as a small computer, which has its own network, its own storage and its own capacities. So that is what EC2 does. It lets you launch these different kinds of instances, these different kinds of virtual machines. Let us just go ahead and talk about what we have next. So there are quite a few um, families that EC2 offers to you. When you talk about EC2, now there's so many types of instances, so many pricing models it follows and so many things. So we'll be discussing these points in a lot more detail. So stay tuned. And what I would also suggest is uh, some of these pointers you'll have to revisit as well, because I would be talking about a lot of information here. And once we do that, we'll get into the demo part. So guys, let us go ahead and now understand the different types of instances that AWS has to offer to us. So when you talk about an AWS EC2 instance, uh, to be honest, there are quite a few types of instances that are available. I mean, you can classify them based on their pricing, right? Upon the way they function and uh, upon their applications as well. Okay. So uh, I'm not going to complicate the process for you. Let us talk about these things one by one and try to simplify the whole process as much as we can. Okay. So let's quickly get started. So when you talk about the types of instances, these are some of the families of instances that AWS offers. One is your general purpose instance, right? So when you say a general purpose instance, these are those instances that are used for general purpose applications. They would be giving you a certain amount of throughput or performance. Okay. So let's assume that you have an instance that works at N capacity. Okay. N is the total amount of capacity it has. But when you talk about a general purpose instance, it reserves its capacity. Okay. So these are also called as burstable instances. Let me throw in some light on this topic. Okay. So when you talk about a general purpose instance, let's assume it is working at a particular capacity. Okay. So in this case, it would not work at an N capacity. Instead, it would work at N minus 80 or N minus 30 capacity. That means 30% or 20% of its capacity it will work at. Okay. So if there is a requirement where you need to have a bigger or a better performance, in that case, it will burst out of its shell of 30 or 20% performance and it will perform better. With AWS, you get certain credits that are assigned for burstable performance. So you can use burstable performance for those credits. Okay. So that is what a general purpose instance is. Um, 
do not worry we'll be launching an instance or two where we'll talk about these pointers next is your compute instance now these are those instances where you need heavy computation right so um basically when you're talking about high compute power that is where your computation instances come into picture memory instances now these are the instances that talk about processing data in memory we are talking about our ram rom all those kind of features here gpu instances that you see on the screen these are used for graphical processing okay so when you are talking about uh, video rendering modeling um other applications that related to graphical processing those are the things that work well on your gpu instances storage instances as the name suggests these are the instances that give you better storage capacity okay so these are the types of instances based on their families so these are the families that is general compute memory storage and gpu okay ec2 pricing model now there are instances that are classified on their pricing model as well right so when you say an on demand instance it is that instance that is available on demand it is available any time you want it but it comes at a higher price it's just like renting a hotel room right you visit to a new city and you rent a hotel room so there what you do is you get whatever i mean you go there you'll just demand something you'll pick a hotel room whatever you want and you'll take that right so this could be costlier why because you are doing it on the spot not on the spot but on demand right next is your dedicated instance so dedicated instance is an instance that is dedicated for a particular kind of application okay so you are a user and you say that i have a particular set of applications that i need to run and i want this instance that is available only for my requirements in that case you go for a dedicated instance reserved instance it's just like reserving your hotel in advance right you know you are visiting maybe goa or maybe maldives or something like that right so you know you are going there for 4 days and these are the days that you are going to visit there so you reserve those uh, hotels in advance so you get those at a cheaper price so same is with reserved instances you know that you are going to need these many instances for this duration so you'll book them in advance okay so they come to you at a cheaper price why because you are reserving them in advance and for a longer duration on spot now this is like bidding on something where let's assume that you have an activity that needs to be done you do not have any specific requirement here any kind of instance will work for you this is where on spot instance comes into picture you just go there and you look for an on spot instance it is little different from on demand instance when you talk about an on spot instance it is you get you use what you get okay so um the pricing here is not fixed there is a bidding on these instance if you match that bid you will be given that instance at that bidding price once you release that instance there could be a possibility that you might not get that instance at the same price okay so these are the types of instances that we have from a pricing perspective so let us now go ahead and understand something else so let us talk about their applications right so when you say a burstable instance okay so a burstable instance as i've already explained it is something that performs at an optimal performance to start with but when you require it to burst out of its um, optimal performance it can do that for you as well ebs optimized now these are applications that are used for um optimal performance now in this case let's talk about a uh, messaging system right suppose you want to deliver messages to people in larger volumes but at a consistent rate so you know that the rate is consistent you need good performance constant performance but in lower volume will also work for you so that is called as your ebs optimized instance uh, or these instances are used in those places dedicated we've already discussed that they are meant for a specific application let's assume that i have highly secure data that i want to preserve and want to work on it in private right so i can have dedicated resources which are not shared by anyone and i'm getting the access to those resources for the time duration i want to access them cluster networking now cluster networking is something that basically uh, classifies your instances on a particular cluster performance say for example i need a particular set of performance in a particular cluster of applications so i'll be using that kind of an instance there say for example i might have an instance for back end operations and one for front end operations and both the instances are clustered or all the resources um, that are there in that cluster they work similarly okay or for a similar cause so that is what your uh, cluster network instances are so this was about the theory of uh, compute instances let us quickly go ahead and log into our console and uh, let's see how do these instances work okay 
Okay, so I'm gonna quickly go ahead and fire up my AWS management console again. It will ask me to sign in again. That is the standard procedure it has. Each time you sign off for a while, it will ask you to log in again. So there you go, guys. This is my um, console. So we've discussed this console a little. Let's just go ahead and talk about EC2 instances. Now you can see there's an instance that is up and running already. I do not need this instance. I'm going to terminate it quickly. So guys, when you terminate an instance, it is not available for you to use any further. If you stop it, the instance will be there, but it would be in a stop state. It won't be functioning. You won't be charged for this instance. Okay. But uh, if you terminate it, it would be deleted permanently. So when you talk about AWS EC2, basically, as I've already mentioned, you can launch instances here. You can launch virtual machines here, right? So what we are going to do is we're going to go ahead and launch a virtual machine and understand it from a perspective where we get to know almost all the things about it. Okay. So let's just quickly go ahead and do that. So again, I'm going to come back to the running part. It is shutting down this instance. So meanwhile, just go ahead and launch one more instance. And once we launch that instance, I'll be talking about other pointers as well. Okay. Do not worry about that. So let's just go ahead and say launch. So guys, when you try to launch an instance, you get quite a few options here. So when I say options, there are options to choose from type of virtual machine that you want to launch. So what you see on the top of the screen is it says choose an Amazon image, right? Amazon machine image. So that means you are given a choice to pick a particular Amazon machine. So your instance of virtual machine is nothing but a machine, right? So when it says choose an image, that means image is nothing but or AMI is nothing but it is a template instance or a virtual machine that AWS has created, which has some configured or pre configured values with it. Okay. So you can actually go ahead and uh, um, launch that particular instance or that AMI and it will have a set of values or principles or resources attached to it. You can actually go ahead and also create your custom AMIs, but that is a complex process. Let's not do that. Um, what you can also do is once you create an AMI, you can take, uh, you can make a copy of it and save it with you so that actually when you actually want to go ahead and launch a similar instance, you can do that as well. Okay. So this was about uh, the instances in general, AMIs in general. Let's just go ahead and launch one of these instances and see how it works. Okay. So if I scroll down, you can see that there are types here. I have Linux instances, right? I have my Red Hat instance, Suze. I have uh, Ubuntu. Um, it says that you can actually try out Lambda as well. Lambda, as we've discussed, is a serverless computing service that AWS has to offer to you. Um, you can launch your Microsoft server instance as well. So guys, what you've note here is, see, it's written free tier eligible below it, right? So these are the instances that are available to you free of cost. You are not supposed to pay for them even if you release or launch these instances. Not all these instances are free of cost. If you scroll down, you see these deep learning AMIs. Now, these are something that are not free for you. Why? Because um, uh, actually these are something that come with higher configuration and that is why you're charged for these instances. So the minimal size of instance is something that you can launch under your free tier account that you have. Okay. So this again is a free tier instance you see here. Okay. So, okay, you can actually go ahead and launch some of these instances. Let me quickly just go ahead and launch which instance should I launch? Let's launch the Windows one. It is the easiest one to actually go ahead and configure. Okay. So, um, there are different ways in which you connect to these instances. Say, for example, your um, Windows instance can be connected through remote desktop processing. But if you have a Linux instance or a Ubuntu instance, for that, you have to actually go through, uh, putty gen. Uh, and putty that is something that lets you decrypt your keys and then you can log into those instances using uh, putty generator okay it's called as putty if i'm not i'm not sure the exact pronunciation whether it's putty or putty but i call it putty somebody recently corrected me telling me that it is putty so let's stick to it being putty okay um let's just go ahead and now um launch this instance for now so i say next um it gives you details about the VPC here, virtual private cloud. It is a networking service that you have in your hand. 
so you can decide what kind of subnet do you want it to fall under okay so it will give you all the details here for that you can actually go ahead and change that iam role is a security service uh, iam that lets you create iam roles who gets to access what so you can create a new one or you can use something that you already have if you want one if i don't do anything it creates one role by default for me so i do not have to do anything i'm just going to go ahead and say next for now so when it creates something by default for you it comes with basic settings and security if you want to optimize on it you can do that now this is where the storage part comes in okay so when you say a storage part okay so um by default it comes with 30 gb of storage attached to it okay so i can actually go ahead and attach more storage or i can just change the storage value here i can go up to 100 gb if i want so we gonna see how to actually go ahead and attach volume to an instance but we'll do that in the later half of the session let's not do that now okay so um and this these are the types of volumes that attach that is a general purpose ssd provisioned iops ssd magnetic standard right so these are ssds you can also have sdds but you don't see that here in option right because sdds are nothing but a hard disk drives something that you attach externally so if i add more volume to it right this is where i'll get more options here right see cold sdd throughput sdd right so this is the option that you get when you attach something or volume externally so the volume thing will get into the details of it later let's just go ahead and say now add tags tags are something that let you differentiate your instances because when you launch like 50 60 instances it is difficult to classify all those instances so tagging is a good habit security now by default see i'm going to rdp sign in to this instance it will use tcp protocol this port range and source from any traffic it will let me get the traffic in i can choose what ip i want to use as well if i want to so depending upon what kind of security you want you can make changes here right so if i use the basic one it says rules with source so and so to access the instance we recommend setting up security group rules to allow access for known ip only it says that change it to your personal ip because that would make it more secure but this is a demo uh, instance we do not have to worry about it so let's just say launch it again giving it is again giving me a notice saying that you can improve the security but let's skip that so this is the last bit of it which again is important if you ask me so um when you talk about these instances right so basically what aws does is it lets you sign into these instance through different media different ways so what are those different ways and different mediums through which you can sign into an instance so uh not different ways basically i misspell or misuse the words there so basically when you talk about a key pair here what aws does is in these ec2 instances it actually lets you um sign in with a key pair so key pair is nothing but a collection of public and a private key as you see on the screen so what this does is um you basically are given a private key and aws has a public key together they allow you to connect to an instance you cannot do it without uh, one or the other okay so uh, when you actually go ahead and choose a private key here it gets downloaded and you have to ensure you keep it safe with you because if a private key is lost you cannot access your instance going ahead so that is an important criterion there so make sure you have your um, private key safe with you okay so how do you do that you just come here and say create new let's call it demo 321 and i say download so as i've mentioned keep it safe with you whenever you use it and now i'm going to just go ahead and say launch my instance so launching this instance will take a couple of minutes okay so let that instance get launched and then we'll see how the instance works and what all can we do with that particular instance okay so what shall we do now okay so let's just go ahead and uh, take a look at some other pointers meanwhile this instance gets launched okay so if i click on ec2 it will show that one instance is running why is that because i've deleted or terminated one of the instances as you can see here so it does not show me two instances up and running right if i scroll down here you see that i have these spot requests um the pricing that we talked about right reserved instances saving plans dedicated hosts scheduled instances and all those things images amis you have it here you can choose different amis right you can create your own as well 
volumes now if i come to volumes there is one volume that is already here with me i can actually go ahead and create other volumes as well let's say i want to create one more volume of 30 gb let's call it 50 gb just to be safe i can choose a region where i want that volume to be in so preferably keep it in the same region where your instance is and then you just say create volume and just like that your volume would be created here we don't see any right now because uh, it will take time there you go your volume is here right its performance is also different so you can always have a volume that is up and ready with you so if i click on this it will give me an option of modifying my volume i can increase its size if i have an attached volume i can increase its size right uh, if i actually have to delete a volume i can do that i can detach a volume from an existing instance and attach a new volume to it as well so these are the options that i get with an instance that i create okay or volume that i create for now let's just go ahead and delete it i can take a snapshot of it as well so i can create an image of my volume as well so that i can reuse it repurpose it let's just delete it for now we do not need it okay so it will delete the volume of the instance so let that happen at its piece okay mm, let's just meanwhile go ahead and see if our instance is up and running so that we can start using that instance there you go our instance is up and running its status check is still showing initializing so basically it goes through two status checks for you um, you can actually go ahead and uh, wait for it to happen you can even launch instance right away but let's that let that status check actually go ahead. If I click on this instance and if I scroll down, you'll get more information about the instance, right? Um, what family it belongs to, hmm? uh, which region is it located in, availability zone, as you can see, scheduled events, um, its type, okay, a root device, this is the root volume. So when you actually go ahead and detach a volume and attach a new one, you have to ensure that you attach it to this device or this root device only, only then, that you can attach a different volume to it. So these are some of the things that happen when you, or uh, these are some of the things that are there. Status checks, if you come here, yeah, it will give you status check, uh, status. So one of the status checks is already passed. See, now both of them are passed. Instance reachability check passed and this also passed. So there you go, we have cleared our status checks, status checks rather. So let's just go ahead and launch our instance, shall we? So I say connect, it would say download RDP. Using this, I'm gonna connect to my instance, okay? And for that, I would be needing my public private key, right? Private key that I have, but I need to decrypt it first. So I'll have to choose my file. So if I just go to downloads and if I look for demo, I should be having demo 321. This was the one we used. There you go. And now it, I will say de decrypt the key. So no sooner I say decrypt the key, it will actually go ahead and generate a password for me. So I just copy it from here. There you go. I close it. I launch my RDP. It will say connect to the instance. Now, what do we do? We enter the password that we've used. Let's say, okay. And I say yes. Just like that, we've actually gone ahead and launched a virtual machine with a lot of ease. Now this is a Windows virtual machine, so it would look like most of the Windows systems that you use, right? So you'd be having similar tabs, similar ability to connect to internet and stuff like that. Yeah, there you go. It, it is just like the normal instance that we have, right? And uh, here are some links that you can visit. So you can actually go ahead and connect to internet as well. Um, whatever internet that you use at home, it is accessible or you can access that internet using this instance. Again, this acts as a separate machine altogether. See, so I can launch multiple instances in my system. If I click on this thing, it will, uh, okay, let's go here. Okay, and uh, let's take a look at the volume that we have. So we have this uh, 30 GB of volume, 16 GB of it is used for obvious purposes. C consumes that, right? For the software that is installed. And 29.9% was the total 30 GB that we actually assigned to it, right? 
can we change the volume here yes definitely we can change the volume let's see how to do that okay for that i'm gonna terminate this machine for now let's say yes and uh, what do i need to do i need to stop this instance to do that okay so we will just say stop the instance yes stop there you go so it will take half a minute to stop so i've actually gone ahead and i've uh, i have a volume that is attached to it right so let's just go ahead and do one thing let's just go ahead and change its size okay and see how does it reflect for that we'll be needing a command called as uh, yeah this is the command that we need okay so this is something that lets us connect to our instance basically not connect but lets us manage our um, disk space disk mgmt msc okay so um, i'll show you why that is used we'll get into the details of it as well but our instance is stopped meanwhile so let's just go ahead and uh, quickly go into volumes first volumes and in volumes um, I have 30 GB of volume let's just say modify volume and say make it 100 GB there you go and I say modify are you sure it may take some time for performance changes to take full effect you need to extend OS file system or the volume to a okay so it's just like uh, our hard drive guys uh, I'll brief you on that what they mentioned by the commands that are there so let's just go back to the instance and whatever change that you've implemented they say that it might take a while for that to reflect okay so let's just go ahead and uh, see what we can do with it um, I'll say start my instance so it will take half a minute again to start the instance so let this instance start okay so there you go so it will initialize my instance again okay So I hope I've launched the right instance. Yep. So the other one is terminated. So this should not be a problem. Once this is up and running and it is initialized, we can actually go ahead and connect our um or make the changes to a volume that we have, right? So I was telling you about this command, right? So basically when you say disk mg empty msc. Okay, so what this command does is this lets you manage your disk space. Okay, so once we actually go ahead and connect to our instance, let's see if we can connect to it. Whenever you restart an instance, it actually takes time for you to go ahead and connect to that instance. So let's see if we can do it like right away. When I say decrypt, I say copy. You do not have to go ahead and uh, launch RDP each time, okay? I mean, download it each time. You can use the one that is already there with you. So let's see if it connects because uh, normally when you detach a volume and attach it again, it is then that it takes time. But now in this case, it has successfully launched in, okay? So, um, okay, so if I just uh, come here again, and if I just click on this icon, and I say file explorer and if I look at the PC okay it still shows 30 GB there's a reason for it for that I have to go back again and I will have to go into my run command run option okay desktop app disk mgmt dot msc maybe you can start it from here again 
so if i click on here it will give me certain options right extend volume so i say next hmm? and i say next say finish so now my volume would change here let's just go ahead and see the changed volume you can okay it's still not reflecting it will reflect do not worry we've changed it right the reason we had to do this was there you go 100 gb so it's just like formatting your disks right when you attach a volume to it you have to format it so that is what i did when i went into disk mgmt dot msc okay so um this is how you launch an instance this is how you actually go ahead and do the things that i did with the instance right so this was about ec2 instances you can actually do a lot of things there are stuff like public ips private ips right um you can control quite a few other things as well we'll discuss that some other time but uh, as far as ec2 is concerned i believe you people have understood what ec2 is right so let's just go ahead and terminate this instance for now okay so i'm just gonna say instance state to terminate and this will take half a minute for this instance to actually go ahead and terminate okay so um when you talk about uh, AWS again, there are other services as well, right? Um, you have storage services like S3 here, where you can actually go ahead and store your data, right? So this is more of a bucket and object kind of a storage. Um, you can see there are certain buckets that are created here. You can create one. Now each bucket is uh, globally unique, right? It does not show any region here, why? Because you can, uh, because buckets are considered as um, globally unique so buckets act as folders right where you actually go ahead and upload some data which you can do like right away here let's say add a file so i'm gonna just go ahead and pick up one of the thumbnails that i have and i'm gonna say upload okay and within a minute that file would be uploaded here right away okay so this is a uh, hot storage that means you store hot data here that is something that you need to retrieve or store right away you have cold or archival storage called as glacier where you store that data that you are not going to access frequently so it comes at a cheaper price so when you talk about aws there are quite a few services that are similar to this right and you can do so many things with these services it's just the matter of coming here and exploring these services so yeah we just actually did go back and saw how ec2 works on aws platform right it is a virtual machine service or compute service that AWS has to offer to us. Uh, we talked about EC2 instances, right? So let's just go ahead and talk about Elastic Beanstalk as well. Let me see if we can actually go ahead and take a look at a demo. Okay. Okay. So um, when you talk about EC2, right? Or when you talk about computation services, I've talked about what platform as a service is, right? what kind of service model it is and what kind of services it has to offer to us, right? So let us just go ahead and try to explore Elastic Beanstalk, which is a platform as a service that AWS offers to us. So for that, I'm going to just go ahead and type Elastic Beanstalk hmm? and it will redirect me to that page. Unfortunately, I don't think I have um, Git repositories with me. Let's see if we can just launch a sample application for now. Okay. Getting started. It says application information. Let's call it sample demo. Okay. Sample demo looks good. Let D be capital so that we can keep track of it. So guys, this is how the interface looks like. Um, I'll be talking about quite a few things as we move further. Do not worry about that platform. Let me choose one. Let's say PHP. Um, it will by default take an environment. Okay. And then it says use sample application. You can even upload your own code, but let's just go ahead and upload a sample application, right? So, um, let me explain you what is happening here. As I've mentioned, when you talk about elastic beanstalk, it is a platform as a service. What that means is you can actually go ahead and launch 
applications on a platform that is already there with you. So as you can see, I'm launching a template application here, right? I've named it sample demo. So it asks me what platform you want to use. See, it's giving me all the options that I hear, right? I can choose these platforms. There's so many of them here, right? So a pre-configured platform is given to me, right? So it chooses, a, I, I can actually go ahead and make changes to the versions as well that I have. Okay. So it gives me all these kinds of freedoms. So that is what platform as a service is, right? When we launched an EC2 instance, what did we see? We saw that we had to configure everything from the scratch there. I had to choose, I mean, a particular AMI, right? A virtual machine, a template of it. Then I had to, uh, even though I selected by default options, but I selected a subnet for it, security group. I could even control the access there. So I'm setting up an instance at a root level here. A platform is given to me. So this platform is also based on a particular instance, right? So the configuration of the instance and all those things are taken care by my platform or AWS in this case. And it sets up this platform for me with ease and with so many features for me to actually go ahead and use, right? So, um, let's go ahead and launch a sample application and then we can talk about these things a little more. So let's just say launch an application. I hope it does not ask me for my Git account. I do not have one right now. Okay, so it's creating all the environment by default, as you can see, right? So see, it will take few minutes because it will do all this process that you see at 10, uh, 58 PM, right? Um, what it's doing is it's actually going ahead and setting up an Amazon S3 uh, storage bucket. So this is where my data would be stored if I use any, right? Um, first it creates a bucket. We'll talk about S3 buckets. It's a storage service where you can store your data going ahead. It would create an environment. Okay. So, uh, you can see using elastic beanstalk, it has chosen a region for my bucket as well. South actually buckets are globally accessible. We'll discuss that later, but yep. Uh, you should know that. Uh, but it's based in this region is what it's suggesting. Um, Again, what else is it doing? It's creating an EIP that is elastic IP address that is associated with my instance. Okay. So a security group would be created that keeps my resources secure. Okay. So guys, uh, what is happening here is the environment is getting created for me. I'm not required to do any of these activities, right? So let this happen, right? Once this happens, uh, so this would be a basic application. We are not doing anything major here, but let this happen, right? I mean, um, uh, some demo is better than nothing. So, um, let this application get created. So it might take half a minute. So let that happen. Once that is done, we can actually go ahead and talk about other things as well. Now it says that it's waiting for EC2 instance to launch. So basically it will configure the complete EC2 instance that is required for this application to run. And I do not have to worry about anything here. Okay. So added instance as well to our environment. Now it will actually go ahead and put everything in place for us. So hopefully we can start sooner. Okay. So meanwhile, it creates this environment. Is there anything else that we can do? Right. So let's quickly just, um, open another console. I do not want to tinker with the console that is open already because um, I do not like the elastic beanstalk interface. It last time I created an application and it took me a while to actually search for it. So that is why. Okay. So, um, successfully launched an environment environment health has transitioned from pending to okay. Initialization completed 32 seconds ago and took two minutes in total. Okay. So we are almost set and ready to go. So you can see that the process started like three minutes ago, right? And within three minutes, an environment was created for me. And you can even actually go ahead and uh, deploy your application if you want. If I just actually go ahead and click on this link, it would open that PHP website for me, right? The application that it launched. So this application that we've launched is nothing but a documentation that AWS has to offer to us. Okay. And this documentation um, or this application that is here, it is residing on an EC2 instance, okay, on a platform that is created by Elastic Beanstalk, okay. So if I come back here, okay, I even have an option of upload and deploy. So I can actually go ahead and deploy my set of piece or my set of code as well, whatever it is. And the option that you saw when we said create a sample application, I selected a by default application, right? We can actually go ahead and do one thing. We can also, um, 
if you select to upload a code there, you can actually go ahead and connect your GitHub repository to it. So once you do that, if you have pieces of code that you've worked on and you want to move into these environments, you can do that as well. So as I explained in the initial concept phase where I talked about platform as a service, I mentioned that you can move your data to a platform or you can create ready to use applications based on the platform that is available to you. The platform setting up process is something that is taken care by your vendor in this case, AWS and Elastic Beanstalk. So as you can see our, um, I mean, basic application is up and ready and we have an environment with us as well, right? And from right from creating your application, you can actually go ahead and deploy it as well. Okay. So these are the options that you get when you actually go ahead and work with Elastic Beanstalk. Okay. Let's just refresh it for now. Okay. I go to applications and let's see if we can delete it. So make sure whatever you create, you always delete those applications because it says delete the name of the application. Okay. Sample demo. That is why I have names that you always remember guys. So that you do not have to waste your time doing these things. So sample demo, I select it and I delete it. Delete it because even though these resources are under free tier, it's always advisable that you actually go ahead and delete these applications so that in future, if you forget any of these and you connect something else to these devices, which are chargeable, you do not want that to actually go ahead and uh, terminate or harm your uh, free tier basically. Okay. So it is under the process of deletion. So it should be deleted. Not worry about that. We should let go of it and go back to our presentation, right? And talk about other concepts. So we've actually gone ahead and successfully explored EC2 instances, right? How they work. We've also talked about elastic bean stock, right? Um, how you can actually go ahead and uh, set up an environment with ease. You don't have to set it up. Um, Elastic Beanstalk does that for you. Yes, uh, you are open to make changes to it, but uh, since you're opting for platform as a service, it's better all the configuration part is something that is taken care by your vendor. Okay. So I hope you guys got a thorough knowledge about the compute services that are present in AWS. Now, similarly, we're going to take a look at the storage services that are offered by AWS. So uh, we finally come to the next topic of discussion that is AWS storage services. Okay. So in this, uh, there are quite a few AWS storage services that are there on our hands that we can use. We are going to get into the demo of these services. Um, while talking about uh, EC2 instances, we did talk about EBS and we saw how to actually go ahead and um, increase the volume of uh, the instance, right? So that volume was EBS backed up. It was EBS in nature. So it is one of the storage services. We'll talk about that at length, but uh, let's just go ahead and talk about storage services in general and try to understand how cloud storage is actually different from normal storage. So what exactly is cloud storage, right? Let's try and understand that. So um, let me give you an example. Uh, if I were to go back, I mean, recently there was a time, not recently, some seven, eight months back, I was interviewing quite a few people. And then I asked them a question as in, can you tell me about uh, cloud computing in general? So these were some set of interns that we were trying to hire. So they were fairly new to the topics, but uh, since they had written um, these things in their CVs, I thought let's go ahead and test them on these uh, topics, right? So when I asked them about cloud computing, they said that it's a mechanism to store data. So they were correct to whatever they said, right? I mean, when you think of cloud, what you think of it as Google drives and right Google drives where you take your backups and stuff like that, which is true because that's nothing but a cloud resource for you, right? A cloud service for you. But when you actually do cloud computing work on these cloud platforms, you realize that cloud computing is a lot more than just the cloud storage that you have at your disposal, right? I mean, um, cloud computing is not just storing data. It is a lot more than that. So um, that is where I could realize that uh, maybe there are quite a few people out there in the world who actually have some myths about cloud computing, cloud storages and storages in general. That is when I had actually gone at and taken quite a few sessions uh, on YouTube as well that talked about uh, differentiating between normal storage and cloud storage and stuff like that. So that was an instance I remembered. I thought I should share it with you people. Let's just go ahead and understand cloud storage, how it works, right? So when you talk about AWS cloud storage or cloud storage in general, right? 
we are referring to online storage that is available over a network okay it is when you talk about cloud storage right it is nothing but um providing online storage to people over a network right which consumers can consume over a network as storage as a service so basically yes cloud storage is a storage where you store data but the major point that you need to note here is it is made available over a network so you can access it through the internet right so say for example when you talk about the storage you can actually go ahead and store your movies your chat right it can be backed up on your google drive or your drive not google drive your drive in general right can be any cloud drive so um to give you an example here right um say for example my whatsapp chat gets backed up uh, at 2 pm i'm not sure that that happens every day but that happens at 2 pm so there is a cycle that is set up there so where does this chat get stored does it get stored in your phone always no you always link your um, email id with your cell phones these days right with your smartphones so basically your data is getting backed up into the drive that is connected to your email id right if it is a gmail it would be your google drive which again is a cloud service right so your data gets backed up there so this is what cloud storage is your data is getting stored over a data center that is that is residing somewhere across the globe where the data center is and uh, it is getting backed up through the internet i mean you are not physically putting your data there it's getting backed up through your mobile through the internet it is flowing over a network and it gets backed up to the data center that you are using so that is what cloud storage is and there's a lot that you can do with cloud storage we'll explore that as we move further but i believe the basic definition is clear to you people as to what cloud storage is okay so what are the features or some pointers that you need to know about cloud storage first one is your data backup okay so when you say data backup i've already explained that giving you the example of whatsapp which is a messaging uh, app right i'm sure most of you are aware about it um next one is your uh, <clears throat> messaging data right so um again whatsapp is an example here but let's talk about it from a bigger or a longer perspective right or a wider perspective rather say for example i have multiple applications right that communicate with each other over a network now this messaging or communication is again nothing but messages and data right it needs to be stored somewhere even though it is flowing on the network right so it would be backed up on your cloud storage so that is one of the applications or usage of cloud storage application data now you can also store your application data communication is again application data but when you talk about an application that we just created right so you saw that there was an s3 bucket that was getting created right so s3 bucket would hold all the relevant data that concerns um your application right some of the data would also be backed up on the um ephemeral and uh, persistent storage that you have right we'll talk about that do not worry about it. what ephemeral and persistent storage are but it also will get backed up on those things as well right so application data is also getting stored on cloud that reside on cloud or are connected to cloud right multimedia so um you have your files right you can talk about um your images your videos that you upload right even the chat in whatsapp there would be always images and stuff that get backed up right so uh, your multimedia files can also be stored on cloud and also processing an application data so cloud is not just limited to storing images and videos and messages you can actually process your data and even that can be stored using cloud storage so this is an important thing that you need to know do not worry we'll be talking about quite a few pointers uh, i also remembered one more example related to multimedia so one of my friends he actually um, never used to take cloud backups okay so for me and my generation people cloud backups are fairly i mean these are cool things for us because i come from an age where we actually did not have cloud when i grew up and we i've also lived a life where there was there were no phones actually to be very frank um, and uh, no mobile phones to be specific and no smartphones so i've seen all this transition so uh, if i am not to go to back i remember one of my friends losing all his data why because his phone got some rebooted or auto booted okay so he lost all the data he had in his phone then he decided to actually go ahead and start backing up his data next time when his phone got rebooted his data was stored on the cloud drive 
So that is how he saved his data. So that is what cloud storage also lets you do. The backup lets you retrieve your data, even if your phone is not in a condition to handle the data. Okay. So this was about different storages that cloud has to offer to us. Okay. Or different applications that cloud storage gives to us. Let's go ahead and talk about the AWS cloud storage services that are in our hand. Okay. Okay. Now there are some benefits that we need to discuss first. So let me talk about those first. Okay. So what are the benefits? The data is readily available for you. So when you say readily available, I mentioned that it is cloud backed up, right? So I can actually just go ahead and access that data and it is, uh, it will stay, it is persistent, right? Even if I change my um, move to a new phone and stuff like that, my data would always be there with me because it's backed up on cloud. It's cost effective. Um, cloud platforms are cheaper, right? We've talked about that a little, not at length, but we've talked about that to some extent. So let's not elaborate on that point, right? Uh, secure, yes. So um, another example to give you of cost effectiveness is you do not pay for your Gmail, do you? No, we don't, right? So yes, we pay for the internet. I understand these things, but uh, buying a physical hardware to store your data, then to store it on drive is, uh, is a better option and it's a cheaper option. That is why cost effective. Security, yes, since you have data backup, your data is secure as well, right? You do not have to worry about it getting lost physically because it's stored over the network on your cloud platform. And cloud platforms are very secure. We've discussed that as well. Easy processing. Now, when you say easy processing, yeah, since the data is available, um, you can one, consume it right away and processing. We'll discuss this in the database part, right? When we talk about data processing and stuff like that. Okay. So it makes, or when you talk about data being on cloud, it is easier to process your cloud data basically. So these are some of the benefits of AWS. Okay. So cloud storage myths. So we still haven't gotten into AWS services. So I believe I'm a couple of slides away from the storage services that AWS has to offer to us. So let's discuss um, storage myths first, and then we'll get into the um, AWS cloud storage services that are there on our hand, right? We'll discuss those in detail and at length. Okay, so cloud storage myths, right? When you talk about cloud storage myths, um, people have quite a few misconceptions like they have about cloud computing. They also have myths about cloud storage as well. Let's try and discuss those one by one and in detail, okay? So when you talk about cloud storage myths, um, one of the major myths that people have is cloud consumes a lot of power. So what they assume is since there are so many big, big data centers that are running out there, it's going to consume a lot of power. So that's obvious, right? It will consume a lot of power, but at cost of what? You have to understand that as well. So when you talk about a data center, the amount of data that it can store is huge, right? So even if you do not move it to cloud, you will be moving this data somewhere in even those resources will consume your power when you use it or do whatever you want to. So does cloud consume power? It does, but does it consume more than what you would use otherwise? That's debatable. Another important point that you need to understand here is when you talk about popular cloud platforms in the market, they do a lot of research on these things as in how to optimize resource usage, how to optimize use of electricity as well. GCP, Google Cloud Platform in particular, does a lot of research on these topics. So what that means is they've ensured that they make use of minimal amount of electricity to do these things. And the amount of electricity that they use that also serves a very large audience, which would other which way consume electricity in that amount. That is why GCP, if you see uh, on a shorter run, it is one of the most affordable, not one of the, it is the most affordable cloud platform. If you look at services from a shorter duration perspective, and it also offers you per second billing. So that tells you, um, the research that they've done in ensuring that, um, their data centers consume less amount of resources and electricity. And that is why they can actually provide these services to you at a cheaper price. So this is one of the reasons. Okay. So I believe that clears your myth as to cloud, even though it consumes a lot of power, um, it caters a bigger and a wider audience. Complexity in data storage. So when you say complexity in data storage, what people assume is it is difficult to store data on cloud as in people, first of all, have this uh, mythical feeling about a cloud that it is something that is very um, 
it's located somewhere far away the data storage takes time it is not secure and stuff like that so people have these beliefs in their mind which are not always true so is it complex to store data we'll take a look at uh, s3 service you'll understand how it e easy it is to store data there okay so is it complex to store data on cloud no it is definitely not complex to store data on cloud not for small scale businesses why are we discussing small scale businesses even as an individual our whatsapp data gets backed up somewhere right so from a user perspective definitely you are using cloud whether you want it or not from a business perspective um is it only for large scale businesses no that's not true um even small scale businesses can actually use cloud platforms you can host your applications your websites your data and even store it there at a cheaper price so nowadays the flexible pricing model ensures that people can actually afford these services at a very cheaper price and even by not investing too much money next one is downtime and security so does cloud have downtime i won't deny to this point totally okay i mean see when you're talking about uh, any resource any domain it is never 100% clean or right absolutely right or correct right there would be some fault anywhere right so when you talk about downtime if you take a look at disaster recovery and reliability numbers something that we'll see in future slides you'll realize how um how safe this cloud platform is from downtime and stuff like that yes if you go back to like two early 2010s like 2011 12 back then there were some outages which were major but we are like 8 years away from that and the uh, i mean outages handling downtime handling has improved like anything when you talk about these cloud platforms and since you have option of availability and disaster recovery data backup options downtime is very minimal if it happens and uh, your data is very secure there since you have uh, um ability to actually take backup of your data you can always stay assured that your data can be restored even if you lose your data to give you one more example we talk about netflix right we stream our data regularly so when we stream data on netflix it is rare that netflix goes down even if it goes down it is up and running for us right we do not have to worry about the outages there and netflix itself resides on aws that tells you what kind of service um, or what kind of storage and what kind of different um, mechanisms they have actually to prevent downtime and have security issues or to prevent security issues rather so do we have downtime and security issues see there's always a possibility but that is very 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 minimal and very rare i don't need cloud at all now this is one of the um, one of those myths that i've come across and people saying that i just do not need cloud maybe from a business perspective you do not for now but uh, you've been already using cloud whether you're posting a facebook image or anything right because it is using cloud other things than that see uh, we all have been hit by corona pandemic right now right what are we doing we are sitting at home and working it's been like 4 months now that i haven't hit my office i've been working from home and i've been actually working a lot and i'm sure that is true with many of you right how are you actually working on your office stuff most of you are using cloud at least the ones who work in it or fields that require you to be online all the time right my brother is a public relations officer and he too is working from home is a company that never used laptops to this great extent have ensured that all the employees have laptop now using internet and using all these cloud platforms they can communicate with each other with the apps that use these cloud platforms so do you need cloud do you not need cloud um, you can debate that but uh, to be very frank the future is uh, very much towards cloud computing at least for next decade or so until something new comes up so uh, these are some of the myths right um i've been talking about these myths very personally as if cloud is something that i own but that is how cloud computing is to me um, the love for it comes naturally okay so um these are some of the myths that i feel that i could throw more light on um debatable for some but yeah that is how it is so this was about cloud storage myths let's now go ahead and talk about cloud storage services on aws finally we have reached this slide let's try and talk about this okay so guys when you talk about cloud storage services right so aws offers following kind of cloud storage services now these are some of those there are other services as well um we will discuss some of those too do not worry so when you talk about cloud storages or aws cloud storage services rather these are the major ones 
first one is your block storage so the first two services that you see are block stores the next two are your object stores and the third one is your EFS which is a file store at the bottom of the screen apart from that there are some services that let you move your data physically from one data center to the other like your snowmobile and snowmobile we'll talk about that do not worry let's try and understand the services that are there on the screen first and then I'll actually go ahead and talk about the ones that are not there on the screen so when you talk about EBS it is elastic block store a type of block storage so when you say a block store this is a storage that comes in the form of blocks and it needs a virtual machine or a host machine to which it can connect to okay uh, to give you an example the hard drive that you connect to your system right it's a good example of uh, block store okay so on cloud you have or on AWS cloud you have these services so EBS is something that we saw right so when I launched an instance um, it came up with a storage right that was attached to it and when I deleted that instance even the storage that was attached to it got deleted right so that was an attached storage that came in with my EC2 instance okay so this kind of storage is called as ephemeral storage okay so this needs an instance to survive a host machine to survive and it exists only as long as the host machine is there with you okay so if you delete the host machine the storage will go the other storage that was um, I also showed you that we can create volume right so this volume is something that do not require a host machine okay the volumes are same whether you talk about ephemeral or uh, the EBS that you see on the screen I mean both work similarly but the one or the ephemeral one that comes attached with EC2 it gets deleted when the instance is deleted so all the data that was there on it it would also get deleted but if I take a backup of it or if I have created a separate volume which was not connected to the instance it is persistent in nature it is not necessary or it will not happen that if I delete the EC2 instance uh, the volume persistent volume that I created separately would also delete why because it is a separate entity it can survive without an instance but if you want to use it you'll have to connect it to some instance okay and detach it again to save it okay so this is what your EBS is um, I unfortunately did not talk a lot about it when I when we launched the EC2 instance but do not worry as we get back into the demo I'll talk about it again okay um, then you have your object storage so here all your storage files are treated as objects and these files get stored in a folder the folder is called as your bucket okay so what you see on screen is two types of storages one is your Amazon S3 storage the other one is your Amazon Glacier storage so your Amazon S3 storage um, is a hot storage so when I say a hot storage it is that storage that basically stores data that needs quick retrieval or storage so I can instantly put in my data there delete it or connect it to some resource and start processing it right uh, so that is why this data is accessible right away so you also have to note one more thing it is also a costlier source of data why because retrieval time is higher here the other storage that you see on the screen is Amazon Glacier from the name Glacier you can make out that glaciers are cold right we are talking about ice glaciers here right so these are cold in nature so um, Amazon S3 is hot in nature when you talk about glacier it is cold in nature why is that because um, it stores archival data do you know what archives are archives are that set of data that you do not actually go ahead and take a look at regularly so to give you one example um, I recently not recently and it's been a while to that as well so um, I was creating my passport it was in 2013-14 if I'm not wrong so I needed my birth certificate something I did not have a copy to so for that I actually had to go to a hospital where I was born and when I went there I realized that that hospital existed no longer so I was in a jiffy because I could not get my birth certificate I had to put in some um, I had to put in extra efforts to get my birth certificate something that you can do in India right we call it Jugaad Lagana in Hindi so that means basically making arrangements to uh, some 
under the table arrangements to get your um, job done. So uh, this is what the point that I'm trying to make here is I do not want to digress from the main subject. So the point that I'm trying to make here is see, um, the birth certificate is something that I might not go to the hospital to get every day, right? So if you go to a hospital, not every data that is stored in hospital is something that you'll need every day. Same with government offices as well. Mm, and if I go to a hospital, it's not that I say, give me my birth certificate and that person will say, oh, come here, take it and go away. Right. Nowadays with everything going online, that is possible. But uh, I've still belong to the ages where we used to use written documents as well. So to find a particular document, these people used to take a day or two. So when I apply for it, I might or I had to be in a situation where I could actually go back and collect that data in a couple of days time. Right. So the point I'm trying to make here is when you talk about archival data, it is this kind of data, something that you might not access right away or you are certain that you might not get access to it right away. So when you store that kind of data, you can use something like Glacier. Why? One, it comes at a cheaper price compared to S3. Now, why does it come at a cheaper price compared to S3? Since it is archival data, you cannot retrieve this data like right away. It takes few hours for you to actually go ahead and retrieve this data. So we store only that data that is not very important for us or we do not need immediate access to that data there. So that is what Glacier as it stores archival data for you. And then you have your EFS. So basically when you are dealing with file systems, what kind of storage would you use when you use AWS? You'll go for EFS. It is elastic file system for you. I also mentioned that there are other kinds of storages that AWS offers to you. Now, what are those other kinds of storages that AWS offers to you, right? We cannot exactly call it storage, but these are basically data movement mechanism or data storage movement mechanism that AWS offers. Now, AWS Snowball is one thing. So basically, it is something that holds your data physically, You would, like you have a hard drive, right? Now, let's assume, I'll give you one more example here. Uh, back then, I mean, if I go like five, six, seven years back, if I needed to get some series or movies that I wanted to watch. So I used to connect. Uh, I mean, I used to visit a friend who always had this, all the data stored with him. Used to give him my pen drive, copy all the data that I wanted. And I used to move it to my system and watch it. Right. Because back then, uh, we could actually, we could not stream that this data this easily. Right. So we had to actually go ahead and uh, use, um, physical devices to move data. Okay. So um, when you talk about moving short data, like images, messages, mails, you can do that online and it was possible back then as well. So that is something that you can do over the network easily. But in some situations, you might be required to move a large amount of data. And if you are to move it physically, right, you always not over the network. In that case, you can use a service like Snowball, which lets you move your data physically. Snowmobile is something that lets you move a larger amount of data, um, something that would be required or that would require a proper mobile to move it. So these services basically let you move your data when it is in smaller amount compared to the snowmobile, you can move it through snowball. If it is very large in size, like a data center size of data, you move it through snowmobile, which physically moves data from one location to the other. Okay. So this was about um, your services like uh, cloud storage services that AWS has to offer to you. Okay. Let's just go ahead and take a look at these services one by one. Okay. So first on our screen, we have elastic block store. I do not want to talk about elastic block store first. First, let us talk about S3 and then we'll come back to elastic block store. Okay. So we'll talk about S3, take a look at its demo, and then we'll actually go back and talk about EBS. So S3, um, Amazon S3 uh, stands for simple storage service. Okay. That is SSS and that is what is called as S3 to make it more appealing. It's a simple web services or basically has a, um, has simple web services interface is what the definition says. I'm never good with the definitions. Let's go through that and then, and then I'll break it down for you in simpler words. Okay. So what the definition says is S3 has a simple web services interface that you can use to store and retrieve any amount of data at any time from anywhere on the web. Okay. So basically what you're doing here is you are using a web interface. We'll get into the demo part. I'll show you how to create buckets and stuff like that. Okay. Uh, you'll get to know how easy it is. So you can use this web interface, create these folders, these buckets for you, 
and you can store and retrieve your data from there with ease just using your internet. What are some of its important features? We have flexibility, right? We have durability. We have availability, cost efficiency, security and scalability. So um, durability and flexibility, I'll give you numbers on these. Do not worry about that. Okay. But we've talked about some of these features at length, what scalability is, what security is, and all those apply to your Amazon S3 as well. Just to throw a light from a normal perspective, secure, it is very secure. Um, you can actually decide who gets to access your bucket, who doesn't. You can set rules on it. Um, you can even uh, set in rules as in how do you want to move your data in cycles, storage, stored data in cycles. Uh, again, we'll discuss this in the demo part, not worry about it. Okay. So we can actually um, ensure that our buckets and our data in the S3 services very secure. Cost efficient. Again, it is very cost efficient. Um, yes, it charges you a lot, but uh, you, you have a mechanism where you can move your data to Glacier. If you feel that uh, the, your data is not being used frequently and it is costing you more you can first move to infrequent access uh, data store in S3 and then you can actually move to Glacier where you would be charged according to the rates of Glacier and infrequent access which are cheaper than standard S3 charges okay so cost efficient yes it is very cost efficient scalable yes it scales and you can store a lot of data here as well durability is something we'll discuss later okay available yes you can take backup of your data so data is available and you have quite a few options so hence it is highly flexible as well okay so um how does s3 work exactly when you talk about amazon s3 you can store data in the form of uh, buckets and objects so the definition is same if I'm not wrong what you see on the screen. Let's just talk about buckets and objects. Okay. So when you talk about buckets and objects, right? Buckets are nothing but your containers that hold your S3 data. Okay. So um, the data can be files, images and stuff like that, right? Multimedia sources as well. So your object is nothing but your data that you're storing in your buckets, right? So the data that you store always comes when comes in with um, your key and version ID. So you can actually have versioning to your data. Let me see if we have something called as versioning in the next slides. I'll talk about it. If not, I'll talk about it in the demo part as in what versioning is because it is a very important topic when you talk about S3 data. Okay. Okay. The presentation isn't in the best of formats. Forgive me for that. Okay. So um, Amazon S3 cross region replication okay so it is nothing but it is an ability using which um, you can automatically and asynchronously copy your object objects across buckets that are based in different regions so buckets are configured for cross region replication and you can also automate um, automate this process basically so basically let's assume that i have two buckets based in different regions or i have two different buckets right so I can set up policies that ensure that after a particular action trigger or amount of time, my data from one bucket gets replicated into the other bucket. So this ensures my data is secure, right? So if one of the buckets goes down, I will have a backup of it in the other bucket. Okay. So this was about my um, S3 cross region replication. Okay. Versioning, it's there. So now um, we'll discuss this. Do not worry. So we'll take a look at it in the demo part as well, but let's talk about it. So guys, when you talk about versioning, it is nothing but maintaining different versions of a particular file. Now there could be a situation where my file got changed, right? And once I changed the data, I re-uploaded it to my S3 bucket, which already had the same file. So when I restore that bucket, so I will, if versioning is activated on my bucket, I'll tell you what way it is. Do not worry. If versioning is activated on my bucket and if I re-upload the same file again, so what it will do is it will maintain a copy of the latest file that I uploaded. Say for example, my first document had an ID 123333, right? Then I stored same file again, but with modifications in it. So it's new ID would be 4323333. If versioning is activated on my bucket, if there's a situation where I feel that I needed previous version of the file, I just click on that file and it will give me multiple version IDs. So I can choose the previous version ID as well. So when I say versioning, what it does is basically S3 keeps both the versions of my file with it. So I can always go back and refer to the older versions as well. Okay, so this was about versioning. 
as in what versioning is right i mean um if there are multiple versions of a particular file that you want to maintain you can do that by using um amazon s3 versioning so we'll see this as we would get into the demo part let's just go ahead and talk about some other features about s3 as well right so we've discussed certain pointers saying that uh, what kind of storage s3 offers we've discussed about um what kind of features aws offers in general right we say that it is highly reliable right so if you talk about its durability it's pretty visible here right it's 99.99 percent whether you talk about the standard infrequent or glacier okay we'll discuss these pointers do not worry about that but even availability is 99.99 and if you take a look at the actual number it is 99.7 to 9 times 99999 so that tells you how deep it goes when you talk about its general durability and availability as well right so um going away from the topic that we were discussing let's just understand what are the types of storages that aws s3 offers to us right there are different classes in it so when you talk about these classes in general so you have the standard one um which is most commonly used or by default used right then you have your standard infrequent access mm -hmm. and finally you have your glacier access so when you say standard this is where standard charges apply and you have uh, normal or the standard input output or even retrieval rather okay but when you talk about infrequent access this is what we are talking about data which we do not access right away okay so it's uh when you talk about retrieving this data it would take longer than your standard um uh, your standard storage that aws s3 class has to offer to you and then you have your glacier now this is where you actually go ahead and store your archival data we'll discuss s3 sorry glacier in detail once we get into the aws glacier part but this is where we actually store our archival data data that we do not access frequently so the important point that you need to note here is when you talk about an object size your infrequent storage is the only one that requires minimum size for you to have that is it is um 128 kb in general right so it has to be minimum of that size when you talk about uh, your s3 classes like standard and glacier there's no limit there but obviously there has to be some size because you'll store something there end of the day right apart from that if you talk about minimum storage duration standard uh, duration or the standard s3 class will actually have no minimum duration and that's obvious as well because it is the costliest one so you will end up paying whatever money you do but when are these cycles coming into picture i mean the standard one the infrequent one and the glacier one so what s3 does for you is it has a particular kind of life cycle right where well, let's assume that i am using certain data that i need on daily basis i know i have to access it whether i like it or not so uh, i would be putting it at or in a storage where it can be accessed right away okay whenever i need it that is why this is where standard storage comes into picture when you talk about s3 classes and it is the costlier one compared to the other two if you talk about infrequent access let's assume that um there is some data that you are not accessing frequently you can put that in infrequent um access place where you have to have the data there for at least 30 days okay and then when you talk about glacier it has to be there for at least 90 days the fact that you are putting your data in there for 90 days they know that you'd be using this service for this longer duration and it is why and that is why it is cheaper another important point that you need to note is the retrieval rate so first byte latency is milliseconds for the first two um, methods right so when you say milliseconds latency that means you can retrieve this data for the first byte in this lesser time now depending upon the size of remaining data this time might vary right but if you talk about glacier in particular it takes like three to five hours so it's written as standard as four hours here it takes like three to four hours for you to actually retrieve your data right and that is if you follow the normal procedure so there are expedited um, extraction of data there and the normal extraction of data so when you talk about normal extraction of data it, it will take at least four hours for you to retrieve that data so that is why it's called as cold storage as well and that is why it is cheaper compared to the other two so if you can see uh, retrieval fees standard access you are not charged anything for retrieving your data and that is obvious right i mean because you are already paying for a storage that you want to use frequently and you are not going to pay money if you want to frequently store or remove the data from there but um the hindsight to this is that you'll be actually ending up paying more money because you are storing storing your data in the costliest vault here 
the other two however these are cheaper but if you want to retrieve your data you'll be charged on per gb rates and these prices vary depending upon how much data and how frequently or how quickly do you want to actually access that data so when you talk about storing it it is very cheap compared to these things and since we are storing archival data in the other two that means data that we do not access frequently that means we would be retrieving this data once in a while right so that is why paying this per gb fees is also not a problem here so these are the types of classes that aws s3 has to offer to us okay so we are into the demo part let's do one thing let's quickly go ahead and see how s3 works then we would come back understand what glacier is how it works right and we'll also talk about ebs something that i said we'll discuss later right so let's just quickly get into the s3 demo part for that i'll have to go ahead and log into my console so there you go it says you are logged out let me quickly just go ahead and log in and let's see how s3 works right so when you talk about s3 so um as i've already mentioned you can search for your service under the storage domain here you can type it here it is even available in your history if you've used it recently right so these are some of the services that i've used whether it's SageMaker, elastic beanstalk cloudfront s3 right so um let's just go ahead and open s3 for now what it says is we've permanently re-enabled the previous version of s3 console while we continue to improve s3 console okay they uh keep on um experimenting with the consoles that they have so there's a possibility that if you see this demo and if you go back the console might change that is how um, aws is they're not major changes but they keep playing with the console so uh, you can see there are quite a few buckets that i've created not all of these buckets are something that i use we can actually go ahead and delete it i'll show you how to delete one so um when i try to delete a bucket it will ask me for the name of my bucket s3 bucket demo 321 is the name here right so if i say delete so it will ask me to enter the name s3 bucket demo 321 and naming convention is also particular here you are not allowed to use caps when you um, actually go ahead and create an s3 bucket sample demo 321 sample demo 321 so i I will delete this one as well and I'll let the elastic beanstalk buckets be there it's a pain to actually delete those I think I've left some of my instance open up and running and that is why um, I cannot delete, delete these buckets because these fall under a particular resource group okay so that is why I'm not able to delete these I'm not deleting them for now let's just go ahead and create a new one okay I say create a bucket let's call it Okay, see, it says you cannot use caps here, right? I again miss by mistake. I put a caps there. Let's say demo bucket for today. Let's call it demo bucket. Let's see whether it accepts this name. The probability of getting these kind of names is uh, very less because uh, these names are unique across um, the whole globe. So if somebody's used this name, you cannot actually. So in Mumbai specific or Pacific rather, it is going to get collect uh, created. See, its access is global, right? I mean, whenever you try to create a bucket or you are in S3, the access always shows global. But where is it residing right now? It is in Asia Pacific, Mumbai. So let's just say next. See, I told you it would be rare that we get this kind of bucket name and it has denied us that, right? Let's just use the standard formula, add in 321 to it and just say next. Okay, demo bucket 321 also exists. 321 one more time. Now let's just see now it should be definitely there right so a uh, versioning do i want to keep versioning on i can actually go back and activate it again if i want server logs something that i do not need so i'm not going to activate it here because i want to show you how to maintain the versions of the files that you upload right let's just say next for now block all accesses do i want it to be an open bucket let's just say it's an open bucket block all access may result in bucket and objects within becoming public yes let them be pub public for now if we are to do anything i do not want this bucket to be access restricted so i'm not gonna keep it restricted because then you have to come back look for it what access do you need to give it and all those things so let's not get through all that pain right i mean why waste our time doing all those things so let's just go ahead and see whether the bucket is there it's up and ready here for use so let's just say open right so um 
there are certain things that let us look into those first then we'll see how to put in objects here and other things right so when you talk about properties in general right you see virginity something that we are going to enable okay server access login website static website hosting so basically when you host a website right no matter what application you run you are going to store your data somewhere right if it's residing on an instance ebs storage might be used for the data that is concerned with the instance there but whatever application data that you're talking about you need to store it somewhere right so this is where your s3 bucket comes into picture so when you talk about content delivery networks as well right so um you would be needing a particular server location where you host your data so when you create that central point in that case to your data gets stored in your s3 you have an option of putting your data in s3 so there are quite a few other applications that you'd be using um during the course of uh, your usage with aws and you'd realize that s3 is one of the most reliable storages where you actually go ahead and store all this data that you have there with you okay so object level logging default encryption this is something that aws lets you do on its own so you do not have to tinker with it if it's disabled that means it's not going to happen but if you enable it, uh, it your data would get encrypted right i've mentioned about the fact that when you talk about aws your security is taken care of whether you talk about it being over the network or inside an app or even physically right so when you talk about encryption it is something that ensures that when your data moves through the network right uh it is secure while it is moving through the network and the firewalls are the gateways that you have right not the gateways the firewalls rather so firewalls ensure that even at the entry check in and check out points your data do not um gets corrupted in any possible way so that is what uh, the default encryption lets you do if you activate it something that we are not going to do for now okay uh permissions okay so this is where i've actually made it public right it says do you want to block public access no for now let it be open if you want to you can so what you can also do here is create a bucket policy okay so when you click on bucket policy uh i can actually go ahead when you say arn it is the path to my bucket okay so i can decide uh, what kind of bucket policy that i want to use so we just talked about cross region replication as well right crr so when you talk about crr you are planning to replicate your data from a bucket in one particular region to a bucket in the other region right so this is where this bucket policy comes into picture you need to have a policy that ensures that when you actually make a copy of a data in a particular bucket when do you want to or how do you want to replicate it to the other bucket so this is where something like bucket policy comes into picture the applications are wider but this is just one example as to what you can do with bucket policies so i believe a gist or a general idea as to what a bucket policy is and what you can do with it um is clear to you people in a nutshell right so um then you have cors to be very frank i've never used uh, cors so i do not have a lot of idea about it so i'm not going to just go ahead and talk about it so let's just skip this for now okay and then you have your management in management you have life cycle so when you say add a life cycle here right so we just discussed those three types of um, storage classes that we have so when you talk about life cycle rule what it does is it gives you the freedom to decide as an okay if this data is residing in my s3 um, normal standard access right in that case if i'm not using this data for this longer duration why don't you instead move it to infrequent access and after a month's time even if it is not getting used in the infrequent access then move it to my glacier storage so what that would do is instead of that data lying useless or not being used in a particular class it would actually move to the other level other transitioning uh, class that aws offers to you and you would be charged at a cheaper rate at an optimized rate right so you won't end up paying the money um, that you would for a standard class otherwise right so you can actually go ahead and add a name of a rule this is a general procedure that we follow here okay so once you fill in all this data next you get into the transition phase so which uh, class do you want to transition to do you directly want do you directly want to transition to your um, infrequent access right or do you want to move back to your standard access you can decide all those things here okay in the transitions expiration is the time duration that you set in right i mean um after what duration do you want to move your data into the other storage class and finally you review all the things and you actually go ahead and approve this process so this is how you actually go ahead and create a life cycle rule when you talk about moving your data from standard access to infrequent to um your glacier or vice versa right so this is about the life cycle rule um 
now let us just go back to the overview part right uh, let me show you how to actually go ahead and do these things or upload certain files to it right i mean since we are talking about s3 let's see what happens here actually so this is my bucket that i have with me right and in this bucket i can actually go ahead and add a particular file let's say i add a file called as one okay one dot png so that's a snapshot that i have it says next um, I can actually set up rules here and here. Okay. Set permissions, set properties, review it. And then I can actually publish. If I go to previous, you can see all the information here. So by default, it is going into my standard frequently accessed data, right? So, um, I can decide what tier do I want to move my data into? Do I want to move it to Glacier directly? I can do that as well here, right? Uh, Glacier Deep Archive is something that is one facility that AWS provides you or EC2 rather. It's not EC2, S3 rather. So, uh, see, there are options here that you want to choose into if you want to, right? And this is where you set in permissions, right? It says uh, user ID. Mm. Apart from that, you can access or decide the access to an object. Now, there's an object level access as well that you have, right? Once we get into the CloudFront part, I'll discuss uh, why access is important. I'll show it to you in the form of demo. So, basically, what happens is uh, when you say an object access, let us see that I have a particular object uh, that is being hosted on a particular website for me. So to do that, what I do is I use a particular domain name to access that data, right? So if these objects are not public, if they are private, I might not be able to access them through an HTTP or HTTPS uh, mode if I've not set the properties correctly. So that is why setting up right access is important. In our case, we are giving it public access to everything that we are doing right now, right? So it should not be a concern for us. Let's just go ahead and say upload. So once I go ahead and actually upload my data, my data would be visible to me here. Okay. hundred percent successful, but why can I not see my object? This should have been here by now. Just two success. One in progress. Shall we refresh it? Normally it does not take this long. It happens quicker. Let me upload one more file. Let's just say select a file. And let's just say upload. Now I just say upload. The bucket is empty. Upload new objects. Okay. This is new. says it's successful and it has uploaded the file that I was looking for but then why do I not see it right I should be able to see it let's just close this and let's see if there's some problem with it this is really the first time that I've experienced something like this never seen anything like this happening so let's just go back and use some other bucket maybe there's some problem with the bucket I have let me just go ahead and say I create a folder Okay, let's just upload a file instead. Let me choose a file. And this time I'm going to choose a different file just for the sake of uh, simplicity. Yeah, standard storage, successful. Mm. Mm -hmm. Do not create a folder, refresh this thing. What is happening to my buckets? Nope. Still a no. Let me just create a folder and see if we can upload it there.
Okay, so a folder is created at least, that is for sure. Mm, it says successful one error. There's some error here. 100% failed. And why is that? Let's view the details. Options request denied. Okay. Let's see if we can upload a file here. There's no object in this path. Next, read, write, manage permissions, standard frequently access data. Next, upload. And one in progress, it says now. Last time it had shown success. In the previous attempt, it showed failure. Upload successful, it says. Last, let's just go ahead and create a new bucket. Probably I messed it up when you talk about giving it certain access. So let's just say um, demo two, demo two today, and let's just say next, next. Let's just say create demo to today now let's upload a file here see if it works for us and i say upload so hopefully we get something uploaded this time round Why are our buckets not getting uploaded or why are our objects not getting uploaded? So for that, we'll have to get into the properties part or maybe go back here, um, select a particular bucket and edit public access block or turning this uh, on is same thing as turning all four settings below on block public access. Say save. I say confirm. And I say confirm here. So what it says now here is if I select this bucket name, if I close this part, say so save, say so confirm again. Okay, so this was successful for us. Now let's see if we can upload a file here. For that, I'm gonna just go ahead and choose another file. And I'm gonna say upload. If this is something weird that is happening, this is something that absolutely never happens when you use an S3 bucket. But do not worry, we will get this fixed later, right? We'll come back to this demo and we'll talk about it as in why is this happening. For now, let's skip this part, okay? So the gist is clear. Once you actually go ahead and upload a file here, 
it becomes visible to you right away here and then you can do all those things i mean i was trying to show you how versioning works but since we are not able to upload any files here for some reason i do not understand why that is happening because uh, our accesses are okay but for some reason it says you are not permitted to upload anything if you click here options request denied okay so you cannot upload this for some reason i'll get this fixed and then we can actually get go back and take a look at how these things are happening or how it is working in person okay okay so let's just go ahead and talk about something else um i'll go back to the presentation we'll talk about the other pointers right i'll talk about glacier and then i'll come back and talk about ebs and then we'll see a demo for both okay so uh, when you talk about glacier in particular right so as i've already mentioned we have three s3 classes with us so glacier is a part of it but when you treat glacier as an object storage think of it as a storage that is cold in nature so when you say cold storage right so what happens with cold storage is basically we are talking about data that we do not need to access like right away to give you an example um let's uh, see or let's uh, discuss this uh, scenario okay um if you go to hospitals right i mean uh, if you go ahead and tell them that okay i need my birth certificate especially this happens in india if you are listening to me from some other part of the world so this could be different for you but in india it's like if you want to get your birth certificate and if especially if you go to small places small towns and if you go there and tell them that give me my birth certificate they'll say come back a couple of days later probably they might not have resources to retrieve it for you right away or it might be documented in such a form that it takes time for them to actually go ahead and get hold of that data right this is something that you cannot get right away to give you my personal experience it was in 2014 15 if i'm not wrong that i was applying for a passport and i needed my birth certificate so i happened to visit um the hospital that i wanted to and i realized that the hospital was closed there so i had to actually work under the table to get my uh, birth certificate up and ready so the point that i'm trying to make here is not all the data that you access is something that you'll be needing every day right the day i went to get a copy of my birth certificate it was already like 20 plus years of my life that had passed already right so i don't think anybody from my family might have visited that place so what this tells you is there could be data that you might not um, explore every day right some records that stay uh, hospital is one example that i gave you not all the data in your database is something that you'd be exploring or using every day right you'll go there once in a while to get some receipt or something right if you visit a doctor like in 3 months time you'll access that after that duration right so this kind of data is something that you do not need every day let's assume that your hospital maintains a data store for this data that is very costly in nature right they'll have to increase the fees they charge from you right the reason for that is some of the storages where you access data frequently are very costly so in order to make sure that this data is not um, put in storages that are costly and you end up paying a lot of money instead what you can do is you can always go ahead and opt for storages like amazon glacier now amazon glacier is a kind of storage that stores vault data archival data or data that does not get accessed frequently something that you can put in there and stay assured that even if you want it um, you would be able to do without it so this is not business or mission critical data something that you store in your s3 something that needs processing in real time so this is where your glacier comes into picture now when you talk about glacier right let's see if there are any other features that we need to discuss but if you take a look at the definition i've actually gone ahead and talked about all the pointers here so let's just go ahead and talk about something else this is the data that uh, i would rather discuss right or these are the pointers that i rather discuss so when i say that your storage is cheaper with amazon glacier what am i trying to refer to so here when you retrieve your data there are two options that you have one is your expedited retrieval uh this is the case let's assume that you want your data right away frequently right so uh, in case you put in your data there and you are being charged at a minimal level because you've stored it there for on a subscription basis right something that you would be using for like or not using for something like 3 months 4 months but then you go there some day and say that okay i need this data so they'll come and tell you that the standard retrieval period here is like 4 hours 
So you can retrieve this data within four hours, but then you have a requirement where you feel that you need the data like now or in minimal amount of time that you can retrieve that data in. So in that case, you would be charged at an expedited rate, okay, an increased rate for retrieving that particular set of data. So this is what um, your data retrieval might be like when you talk about using Amazon Glacier or AWS Glacier for that matter sake. What are the other features it offers? Glacier Select. Glacier Select lets you operate and work on some selected amount of data that you want to. Let's assume that you define something in your Glacier Select. This is the data that would be available to you quicker if you want to actually go ahead and access that piece of data. Then we have other services that AWS Storage supports. One is your AWS Snowball and Direct Connect. So as the name suggests, Snowball is um, basically think of it as a smaller storage, like a ball that lets you store and move your data physically. It is not always possible for you to actually move your data from one data center to the other or the network. Why? Because the volume of data could be larger. So in that case, if you want to avoid your network latency or there are other security concerns that you have, you can actually move um, your data physically. That is something can be done using Snowball. Now Snowball is like a hard drive that you're moving physically, just like you copy, uh, uh, at least you used to copy movies, right? If you go back like five years from now, we used to copy our movies into hard drives. I used to do that at least and then move it to my system and watch it. With the streaming part these days, we don't do that. But uh, you can actually physically move your data with your hard drives, right? So that is something your Snowball lets you do. Direct connect is something that lets you connect two points for data movement, okay, with security. You have something called a Snowball as well, or Snowmobile rather, which is similar to Snowball, but larger in size. Something that lets you move huge data center data into, or from one data center to the other. So when you talk about Amazon Glacier, it actually lets you ready, readily um, connect or basically readily um, integrate with Snowball, Direct Connect and Snowmobile with ease. You have Vault Access Policies and Inventory as well. Vault Lock and Vault Access Control. Now what do these things do is they let you make sure that your vault is secured, locked, unless and until you get in um, eventual or proper credentials, you won't be able to log into your vault. Vault is something that we'll discuss. Do not worry about that. Uh, I believe it was there in the previous slide. We missed out on that. We'll talk about that. And then it ensures that your data is highly durable and reliable. Okay. So I believe we've discussed availability and reliability already. So let's not get into security services for now. Let's go back quickly and discuss these pointers. So just we have buckets and objects when you talk about S3. When we talk about um, storage services or Glacier in particular, here we have archives. Um, archives are nothing but your data that you are not going to access right away. And vaults are something as folders where you actually go ahead and put in your data when you talk about Glacier. Okay. So this was about Glacier. Let's quickly talk about EBS first and then we'll get into the demo part again. EBS, I'll have to walk back fairly long. This is where we have EBS. I've, I had said that we'll talk about EBS um, in the other half, right? Or once we are done with the S3 part. Unfortunately, we cannot or could not get into the S3 demo. We'll figure that out later and see why we could not uh, see or do that, right? So when you talk about Elastic Block Store in particular, um, or EBS, this is that storage. That is block in nature. It is a storage which comes in the form of blocks where you can store your data. But guys, this is more of a um, symbiote kind of a relationship between an instance and your storage, or I would say give and take kind of a relationship. So for your block storage to exist, not to exist, but to work at least, we need an instance that it can get attached to. So if you have to access that storage, you'll need an instance. Say for example, your hard drive, right? I mean, you cannot just play something on your hard drive, can you? You need some system that is connected to it. You can connect it to your TV sets, you can connect it to your laptop. And once you do that, it becomes active. You can connect it even to some other devices as well. So where you can actually go ahead and watch the images, the files or the videos that you put forth there, right? So when you talk about Elastic Block Store, it is that kind of a storage where you actually go ahead and connect um, your device to a system and then you can access that device or that particular storage. So when you talk about elastic block store, it comes in two um, types, two natures, right? So 
I had launched an EC2 instance to show you how it works, but we did not discuss that in detail because we were focusing on the compute part then. We'll again go back to the storage part and we'll talk about in the, about it in detail. So when you talk about persistent storage, persistent as the nature or the name suggests, um, it is basically something that persists even without its um, other supporting system. So in this case, when you actually go ahead and launch an EC2 instance, a volume or some storage would come attached to it by default, right? So if I delete this um, instance, that volume will also go with it. But if I create a volume separately, right? So that volume would exist irrespective of if I delete the instance or not. Yes, to access that uh, volume, you need an instance attached to it. But for its existence, you might not need an instance always. So the instance which survives even without the, or sorry, the volume which survives even without the instance, that is called as persistent volume in nature. Um, this is something called as an attached volume, not the root volume. Root volume, on the other hand, by default, it comes as ephemeral in nature. That means if my instance ceases to exist, so will the volume that is attached to it. I have an option of making sure that I can actually convert this ephemeral instance or volume to persistent, something that we'll see once we get into the demo part. Okay. So that is what your elastic block store is in general. What are the types that AWS offers to you or EBS volumes offer to you? Basically, you have your two types, right? One is your SSD and the other one is your HDD. So when you say your solid state disk drives, basically these are something that are used for high IOPS actions. Okay. So these give you higher performance and they come by default attached to your instance. SDD is something that is your secondary volume, just like your systems, right? I mean, to give you an example, if I have a hard disk drive that is attached to my system, let's assume that I want to throw my system away because it's not working well for me. I can remove this storage, right? And throw the system away. So I can use the storage somewhere else. But let's assume that I throw my system away with the storage. So my storage will also go to trash, right? I won't be able to use that. So SDD is something that gives you an option of uh, making sure that you have secondary volumes um, that can be attached or detached from your instance. Okay. SSD is something that mostly comes attached with your instance. Again, this is something we'll see in the demo part. Okay. So when you talk about SSD in general, these are used for high IOPS performance. There are two types here. One is your general purpose. Okay. And the other one is your provisioned IOPS. So when you say IOPS, it stands for your input output per second, right? So how do you decide that? So the size of your volume would decide how good are IOPS can you use? Okay. What kind of performance can you get? The more the size, the more is the probability of you getting better performance. Okay. But then again, there are certain defined um, IOPS that come assist, come associated rather, sorry, with the SSD based uh, volumes that you have. So if you talk about general purpose, these are used for standard IOPS performance, which where you need good performance. Okay. So it is around 16,000 IOPS if I'm not wrong. So you can get a performance up to this level. Let's assume you want more performance than this. So this is where you can use a provisioned IOPS. So that is above 16,000. How high can it go? It can go somewhere around 64,000 IOPS. Okay. If you talk about its performance. Let's assume that you need consistent performance, but at a lower IOPS. This is where your HDD based uh, devices come into picture. Now, what do these devices do is they give you two options. One is your throughput optimized SDD. Again, good performance, but IOPS is less. It is as low as 500 IOPS. So that is max it can go to. Cold HDD other hand, on the other hand is more low than this. So it's mostly for that data that you do not access frequently because it's called as cold, right? So you can have like 250 IOPS here. So this is what your cold HDD or basically your SDD based um, storages are like. Let's get into the demo part and see how, um, what can we do with the storages that we have. Let's hope that our EC2 or rather AWS console works smoothly. For some reason it wasn't working well enough, right? Um, EBS, for that I'll have to get into EC2. And meanwhile, let me just, okay, something is uh, happening here. Every place I'm getting um, 
everywhere i'm getting some updates right so probably aws is un- under the process of updating certain things let's just go ahead and see what we can do so we've talked about instances right as in um how to launch it what all can we do with it and stuff like that so we are not going to stick around and talk about those pointers we are going to launch an instance and i want to show you certain things what all can we do with it so let's just say i say select and in that i select the basic one you can see that it is ebs only right virtual cpu is one memory is one gigabyte something that i can change um, network performance low to moderate it is a minimum instance that i'm using here and if i get into the storage part see guys this is where i have an option of deciding uh, what kind of uh, storage i want do i want it to be ephemeral in nature or do i want it to be persistent in nature right so when i say persistent storage it is going to stay whether the instance is not there or not right so you can see there's a tick here that says delete on termination so basically if i untick it right so this volume would stay even if i delete the instance right so uh, i have an option here i can do that okay so let's not do that for now because i think i have an attached volume already if not we'll create one and i say create an instance just say launch we know that we need a key pair here let's say create new demo download and i say launch my instance so there you go my instance would be launched now okay in a couple of minutes so by the time that happens let's just go back to the volumes part so i'll have to go back to ec2 and in ec2 i'm going to go ahead and say volumes so you can see this is the volume that is in use that got created with our instance i can actually go ahead and say create a new one let's say i want a 100 gb volume here i can say create so i can actually go ahead and detach my existing volume and attach a new one to it okay so i can do that so you see there are two volumes here right now what i'm going to do is once my instance is launched i'm going to delete my instance and we'll see that this volume is gone with it this will stay this is persistent in nature okay another important point that you need to know here is your snapshots so what can i do is i can actually create a snapshot of volume that i have okay so basically it is like creating a template of the volume that i have so if i lose my instance i'll have a snapshot of it so i cannot actually go ahead and use a snapshot directly i'll have to replicate that snapshot into a volume first and then attach it back to my instance so that is what a snapshot does for us okay let's see if our instance is up and ready for launching okay we are not going to get into the details of launching it we've done that already but i just want to see whether my instance is ready for connection okay if it is ready for connection we'll launch it and then we'll delete and we'll talk about the volumes that we have okay so it's running let's see if i can connect to it download rdp and meanwhile that happens get the password how um i need to choose a file the name of my file is demo and it should be in downloads so i say demo.pem select and i say open decrypt and i say copy my password i did that i'm closing it i'm going to launch my rdp and i'm going to say connect okay yes and the instance should be up and ready for usage right so the instance is performing fine right like like we do normally and there should be a 30 gb of storage in this instance as we had seen last time as well Mm-mm. there you go the instance is there right so if i come here and i say file explorer there you go and there should be an attached volume to it 30 gb right 
so we have a 30 GB volume that is attached. Let's just close this. Say OK. If I come back to the volumes again, okay, there you go. The internet is working very slow today. I do not know the reason for it. Whatever it is, it is unfortunate. See, this one is the one in use. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to my EC2 dashboard to the instance. And I'm just gonna go ahead and say instant terminate. So it will delete my instance. On EBS, on an EBS backed up instance, the default action for the EBS root volume to be deleted when the instance is terminated. So we ticked it again, right? So if I delete this one, my volume will also go with it. Okay, so let this thing get deleted. Meanwhile, I'm going to quickly jump and do something that does not concern this demo. I just want to see if uh, my Elastic Beanstalk has something in it that needs deleting, right? I think there are buckets in it in my S3 where I have Elastic Beanstalk and attached to it. So let's see if I have left something in Elastic Beanstalk up and running or up and working, right? So we're going to go ahead and just uh, delete that if there's anything here i go to applications okay this is terribly slow today absolutely nothing is happening here so okay let's not hang around here probably our instance would be deleted by now so let's just see if the instance is out of our way. So if it says zero instance, that means our instance has been terminated. So if I go back to the volumes, I'm sure there would only be one volume there. That is that 100 GB volume. There you go. The other one is deleted. We do not need this as well. So we'll just delete it, right? And I say delete. So good riddance. We, um, neither have a volume now nor an instance and we saw what ephemeral and persistent storage is so similarly if you go to glacier right you have an option of creating vault and all those things there we cannot actually go ahead and retrieve the data right now the reason for that is i do not have a third party tool we need a third party tool actually to do that if we have to do it through the console so i can actually go ahead and create a, a vault here let's say sample the next do not enable notifications okay next review asia pacific mumbai is where the vault would be created there you go so i can create a vault like this right so i have a vault here with me so all the information is here what all can you do with it what are the permissions it has and stuff like that right as i mentioned you need a third party tool to actually connect to your vault so i'm just gonna go ahead and delete it okay so this was about different storage services that we had on our plate as i've mentioned i'll fix the um storage part right the s3 storage part and see why that did not work and uh, once we are done with the next bit we will actually go ahead and take a look at the demo of s3 as well okay Guys, storage services were very, very important as it was being reiterated so many times. With this, next we're going to take a look at the networking services which are offered by AWS. Again, as a cloud computing expert, it is very, very important for you guys to understand these services as well. So let's get started. So let us go ahead and now talk about AWS networking services, right? So when you say networking services, so we are talking about cloud platform and on cloud, as we know, everything is connected through a network, right? So when you say network, we are talking about a network that exists for these devices that are virtually present, right? So this network is a little different from a normal network. Let's try and understand that a little more. So uh, when you talk about AWS networking services, uh, this is what the definition says, what I just explained you, right? We know that cloud connects data and applications around the world. And that is why it is very important uh, to put this data and these applications under networks, right? 
So AWS provides a series of services that caters this need. Okay. So we'll understand these services that help you control the network and certain security aspects as well when you talk about cloud and AWS in particular. But before we do that, let's uh, differentiate between what a virtual network is, what a traditional network is, right? So when you say a traditional network, so for people who have studied networking in their college, they would know that um, we have different layers of networking, one that exists, right? And then you have physical components that support this networking. It can be your routers, right? It can be um, your network wires that basically help you communicate with each other, right? So traditionally, this is how security or rather networking used to work. So I remember in my college, all the laptops were connected by wires. Okay. So getting one of those wires actually at home to connect multiple systems was a big thing for us because uh, I mean, we were doing something that was nice and something different, right? Picking up those uh, long wires, uh, bringing them home and doing all these things, connecting them to system and transferring data and doing a number of other things, right? So this was one example of physical network, right? I mean, um, when you talk about applications that still run on physical networks, uh, then we are talking about routers that are physically present, right? And uh, the wires that connect these routers and quite a few other things. So when you talk about traditional network, this is how it would look. But these days with the advent of internet, even the definition of networks has changed, right? I mean, we send images through WhatsApp. And when we use WhatsApp, it is in our phone, right? We are not connecting any wire to share any data, not any pen drive to do that, right? It is happening over a network that is virtually present, right? It is actually present, but uh, you cannot touch it physically. That is what I'm trying to make a point here. Okay. So when you talk about virtual networks, these are the best that can be used to govern your cloud services as well. Now, why is that? So when you talk about your cloud services in particular, what happens is basically we are talking about uh, we are talking about uh, resources that are uh, that reside in different parts of the world, right? There could be resources that reside in Mumbai. There could be resources that reside in uh, US, right? So basically, they are residing in different parts of the world, and I cannot connect resources in US and Mumbai, right? Let's assume that there's a resource in North Virginia. I cannot connect it with a resource in Mumbai through a cable network, right? Through a physical network or a traditional network that I have. I would need a network that governs all those properties that concern that particular cloud resource or a cloud domain, right? So that is what your virtual network does. It gives you room to have a network that surrounds those particular requirements or those particular resources. So as we go further, we'd understand this concept in little more detail. Do not worry about that. Okay. So one of the services that lets you do this on cloud is VPC. So when you say VPC, we are talking about uh, virtual private cloud. So as the name suggests, this device is present um, virtually in your network and it helps you connect all the resources that lie under that network. So basically what it does is it creates a bubble for your resources. Let's assume that you have 100 resources lying in a particular region or in a particular area, right? So I'll be having a bubble around it. It's called as virtual private cloud, right? This bubble gives me all the networking requirements that my system has, okay? Or my resources have. So what does the definition has to say here? It says that Amazon VPC can configure AWS services resources in virtual sub network, right? That bubble that I just mentioned. So default VPC. Um, now, when you talk about virtual private clouds, there are two types in it. One is your default and one is your non-default. So default, as the name suggests, it is something that comes attached to your resources, right? So when I create a resource, it has to be under some bubble, right? Under some network for me to uh, move my data, to actually communicate with other resources and stuff like that, right? Or even to ensure that I put it under certain security groups, I need to have a network around it, right? So whenever a resource is created, it falls under your default VPC, okay? You can also have a non-default VPC, something where you can actually go ahead and make modifications to suit your needs of the applications. So this is about your VPC, right? Uh, let's see how it works, actually. So this is a diagram of Amazon VPC and it's working. So when you say it's working, 
we are talking about how resources lie. Let's assume that we are talking about EC2 instances, right? We've discussed EC2 instances, what those are. So when you say an EC2 instance, basically what happens is um, we are referring to a resource that lies in a particular region. Let's assume your EC2 instance is residing in um, Mumbai again, right? And the other one as discussed is residing in um, in some other region. So when you say VPC, what VPC does is it puts both of these instances under particular region. Okay. So say for example, I have a VPC, a network. Okay. Um, in this network, I have two EC2 instances as you see on your screen. So both these instances are put in different regions as you can see. So uh, VPC for EC2 one um, has a separate subnet and the other EC2 has one more subnet. So when you say a subnet, we are talking about a subnetwork. So there's an intra network as well that is region based. So if I have a resource that lies in a particular region, it would be under a smaller bubble. Okay. Where all its necessary resources are there. Okay. That concern that particular network. Similarly, if you have another instance in another region, it will be having a similar sub network, a similar VPC sub network. Okay. That would be concerned for that other region. And now, these two regions can be connected by router, right? One, they're connected over a router that is virtual in nature again. And both these regions lie under a bigger umbrella, a bigger network that's called as VPC for you. Okay. So we are having networks inside a network. Basically, that is what I'm trying to convey here. And how do you communicate with each other? One, there are routers. Okay. And let's assume that you want to connect to external data, external sources you have a gateway, internet gateway that ensures your encrypted or your protected data moves smoothly in and out from your network to the other physical devices that are out there. So as you can see, there's internet and through internet, we are connecting to an internet gateway and you have remote management and administration. Okay, so this was about VPC. Uh, we will get into the demo part and we'll understand what VPC is. Do not worry about that. But in a nutshell, it is a virtual network that cloud provides, right? And uh, it provides further isolations by giving you sub networks under it as well. Okay. And all these networks are connected through routers and internet gateways to ensure that our applications are secure and good enough for working. Then we have other services, right? With AWS that are concerned networking that is, uh, your Amazon route 53. So when you say route 53, we are basically referring to a resource um, that provides domain naming system, um, which is also scalable in nature. So basically when you say a domain name system, right? So what we are referring to here is we are referring to a system or a resource that basically um, lets us convert our uh, data, right? Our human like data into IP addresses that is understood by my computer. To give you one simple example, let's assume that I have um, a website, right? My website would be called by a particular humanly name. Let's assume that the website is for AWS tutorials. Okay. So if I name it as www.awstutorials.com. So basically this is something that is understood by me as a human. But my computer will not understand this. That is www.awstutorials.com, right? So for them to actually access the data, they are more concerned about uh, databases or resources that are connecting to each other. And a computer understands these resources or your uh, systems understand these resources by the IP addresses they have. So what route 53 does is it understands that this particular domain name is associated with these IP addresses and diverts your traffic accordingly to those IP addresses. Okay. So this is what route 53 does for you. Now that we know what the definition is. So when you talk about route 53, again, the other services like AWS provides, it has to be available, right? Because when you talk about domain names, uh, you want resources that are accessible always to you, right? Apart from that, these resources have to be reliable and flexible as well. So when you talk about Route 53, it is all of these. Okay. So another service under networking domain is your Amazon Direct Connect. Okay. So when you talk about Amazon Direct Connect, it lets you actually go ahead and establish connections between your cloud platform that you have 
in this case aws and your on premise infrastructure right so this is more of a private network that is established and what it does is it gives you better bandwidth faster data transfer right and more consistent internet based network performance so basically this is a secured line okay a secured virtual line that aws lets you establish um with your on premise infrastructure now when you talk about cloud as i mentioned it is not always that everything that you do will be on top of cloud right some of your resources would still be residing on your uh, um on your on premise uh, infrastructure right it's not always possible that you move everything to cloud let's assume that you have an application that is completely on cloud but there's a possibility you need to connect to something that is on premise not on cloud so in that case you need a dedicated network that dedicated network in terms of aws is your amazon direct connect now what are the features it offers uh, those are visible on the screen one it gives you good network performance right the other one is it has lesser bandwidth cost okay uh, enhanced security so now this is a particular vlan through which you can actually ensure that it gives you more security uh, again private connectivity to amazon vpc ensuring more security highly elastic in nature and it can be operated through your amazon web services management console so whatever you do through amazon web services management console as we have seen it is actually easy for you to work you do not have to hard code anything go into the back end and work on other things as well right so uh, you have more of an interface that is click and drop click and play kind of an inter interface when you talk about the console and it uh, supports easy management access using that console and is highly compatible with different um, platforms as well okay so these are some of the features that aws direct connect has to offer to us okay so let us just go ahead and get into the demo part um, and see what aws vpc is i would also like to see if our s3 is working there was some problem when we tried the last time right so let me quickly see if our s3 is up and working for that let me quickly again sign into my console these things are working slow so let's see if s3 is working again right we tried doing that a lot uh, when we were talking about the s3 buckets so let me quickly see if it is working demo for today okay there's a file here let's see if we can upload more files i'm going to say upload one Hundred percent successful. It says in progress. You gotta be kidding me! This error again. Hundred percent failed. there you go it got uploaded there's something wrong with that file maybe so this thing got uploaded like right away as you can see it's called as images jpg right if i click on it um okay let's not do that let's go back here and uh, what i'm going to do now is i'm going to get into properties i'm going to say enable versioning right so versioning is enabled now I think I should have enabled versioning before I move the file but let's see that still works or not for us okay I'm going to say upload I'm going to pick this image again and say open and upload no sooner i try to give you all a demo on um, s3 something happens and i mean this is one of those services that is smoothest and works very instantly but for these demos somehow it's taking longer than other services so uh, i had enabled versioning right we talked about previous versions of file being available right you see there are two versions here 
now i uploaded one at a particular time and the other one at the other time right you can see one is uploaded at 10 and the other one is uploaded at 10 1 right so that tells you as in um that gives you a picture of uh, how versioning works right i mean i have access to my previous versions as well so if i click on this i should be able to access the previous version of the file that i've used you see here right i can actually use the latest one as well it will say latest than so guys try and understand this thing right i mean when you talk about versioning in this case i'm using plain images so there's not a lot of problem with it but let's assume that i'm talking about data that needs little more editing right in that case these versions might be a lot more useful for you you can actually i mean then plan if you wish to go back you can do that and then actually take up your resources accordingly based on the um data that you're trying to look into or process basically okay so this is what versioning does i think this was the part that was left uh we can also do cross region replication where just like we enabled versioning we have to actually go ahead and enable cross region replication and then you have to set up one simple bucket policy you don't have to write code for it if you go online you'll get on amazon documentation you'll get uh, a piece of code for it all you have to do is create two buckets in two different regions and look for a policy that helps in crr cross region replication just copy paste that in your bucket policy and uh, what it will do is it will automatically replicate a piece of data from one bucket to the other okay so this is how a cross region replication also works so this was about s3 uh, since we had missed out on what s3 does what you can do with s3 i just wanted to come back here and uh, show it to you thankfully it has worked this time around so we haven't missed out on any demo that uh, we are supposed to take into consideration okay now let's just go ahead and talk about uh, vpc a little once we are done with vpc and these services that we've discussed we have uh, certain important things or some other services that we need to look into that concern networking as well okay so we'll talk about that in detail and i'll give you a good nice demo on that as well but let's quickly walk through the interface of vpc see what vpc is right so when you click on vpc right there you go uh i see see if i launch an ec2 instance it will actually go ahead and create um a vpc that is needed for that instance okay to give you an example if i say launch so this interface has changed again this wasn't the interface uh, when i checked a couple of weeks back okay so the interface again has changed this happens with uh, aws a lot they change or they tinker their interfaces once in a while so let's just go ahead and pick up one instance that is free tier eligible okay finally it is loading so um how it got refreshed it did not launch any instance for me let's just launch this one okay so when i say next so guys when you see this it creates a by default vpc for me right so when a vpc is created it would come up with certain policies okay subnet again it says it's a by default subnet that i have i can choose a region for it right where i want my resource to lie basically okay so i can choose a region based on that or i can create a new vpc as well right create a new subnet as well depending upon my requirements if i have any and i can actually go ahead and update those uh subnet settings it is enabled here right so all your networking concerns are taken care in this tab here so for every resource that you create there would be a vpc that would be associated with it a network a private cloud that would be associated with it okay now uh if i go to vpcs right i have a vpc that is available it is uh, it might be connected to something i can also say create one i can add name to it and then i can give in these details as well right the ip address range that i have right i can choose what block i want to use right and i can decide on tenancy as well then when i say create there are some other formalities that i need to fill in and then my vpc would be up and ready to use so based on the vpc that i have i can actually go ahead and select one of these for the instances that i launch as well okay 
and then when you click on or search for direct connect so you can create a connection here right decide whether you want a classical one or you want to use a wizard to get some of these things done quicker and faster you have to give in details here what is the location that you're looking for port speed um, what are you trying to connect to and stuff like that and accordingly you'll establish a connection to actually go ahead and move your data here okay and then you have your route 53 that is for your domain names yeah so basically whether you talk about your dns management traffic management availability monitoring and domain registration so guys this is more concerned towards your website so when you say domain registration see it's giving you options like .net, .com, .org, right because your website can have different uh, extensions with it right uh, you can also manage your domain name system right uh, your uh, c tags a tags that you do when you create a website right you have canonical names there so uh, it lets you control those as well so when it says dns management it helps you setting up those processes for you okay so this was about route 53 okay uh, let's just go back and discuss one more important service that concerns networking and we'll take a look at its demo in detail okay so let's just quickly switch back to the presentation okay so the next concept on our plate is cdn that is your content delivery network. So when you say a content delivery network, we are referring to um, basically you can think of it as a point that delivers content to multiple points. Okay, we'll talk about that in detail. Do not worry about it. So let's first understand this example. Okay, so let's assume that I have a server based in Mumbai. Now Mumbai is a city in India. Okay. So guys, these are different cities that India has to offer to us in case if there are people who are from different parts of the world and do not know what I'm referring to. So Mumbai is a city in India. You have other cities. Chennai is based in Tamil Nadu state. Bengaluru is based in Karnataka state. Mumbai and Pune are based in Maharashtra. And you have Ahmedabad or Ahmedabad that is based in uh, Gujarat, uh, India again. Okay. So... Uh, let's assume that you want to travel to these pointers right so chennai is the farthest it will take like around 12 units of time to reach to mumbai right bengaluru will take lesser it will take like eight ahmedabad is closer it will take six and mumbai is the closest like 170 kilometers if i'm not wrong that is uh, roughly 110 kilometers roughly or miles rather okay so 110 miles roughly so basically uh, when you talk about Pune, it is the closest and it would take lesser time. Let's assume that two units of time is what it takes to reach Mumbai, right? So basically, let's assume that if I want to connect with Mumbai, the farther I am, the more time it will take for me to connect to Mumbai, right? Same is with your data movement as well, right? Let's assume that I have a Mumbai server where I have a website that I'm using and my data is residing on this Mumbai server. Okay, so I try to access that data from Chennai. So Chennai will take the longest time. Why? Because it is farthest away from it. So it is understandable that there's going to be a latency between these two servers, right? So since there's latency, right, it will take more time to reach to Chennai comparatively to Pune, Ahmedabad and Bangalore. But then when you talk about highly available systems, right, you do not want waiting time for your customers or for your consumers, right? So in that case, how do you solve this problem? Now, this is where your content delivery network comes into picture. What content delivery network does is it helps you increase the speed, uptime and security of your resources. How? So what content delivery network does is it creates an edge location. So when we say an edge location, think of it as a point that connects these two locations. In this case, let's assume Chennai and Mumbai server. Okay. So when you talk about uh, an edge location, it would be on this route, which is uh, close to Chennai. Now what this does is when you talk about an edge location, an edge location basically backs up your data. Okay. It makes a copy of your data, caches your data, not backs up, it cache, it creates a cache of your data. Okay. 
that is close to Chennai in this case. And whenever Chennai user throws in a request to that data set, it would be available there. So how it works is now it is not always possible to cache all the data that Mumbai server has, right? So when a Chennai server throws in a specific request for a particular set of data, in that case, if that data is not available at Chennai server, it would actually go ahead and look at the edge location that is close to it. Now, uh, if in that edge location, if the data is not there, the request would be routed to the Mumbai server and a copy of it would be stored one in your edge location and moved to Chennai. So whenever a request is made to that data, we have a cache copy of that data to be delivered to the user at a faster pace going ahead. So that is what your content delivery network does. It ensures that your content gets delivered through the network to the user without having to worry about the latency part. So what it does is it gives you following benefits. One, there's an increase in speed, right? So when you say speed, yes, your data is getting transferred at a faster pace, right? Because there's an edge location that is present. There's a decrease in load that your central server might face. Now, in this case, if your data is getting cached, right, at four edge locations that are close to these cities, not all the requests will go to Mumbai server, right? Those would be fetched through the um, edge location that is close to them. And this in one way or the other reduces traffic on your Mumbai server, making it more available uptime. Obviously, if you have a greater speed and your server is also not getting loaded with work or with uh, requests, uh, your uptime is naturally going to increase. One, since not all the, sorry, the final point is security. Now, since all the resources are not trying to connect to Mumbai server, they are dealing with the cache. So the security threats for a Mumbai server are also less. Why? Because lesser number of requests are coming to it from different servers, from different regions, right? So that is what your CDN is all about. Okay. Now, when you talk about AWS in particular, there's a service called as AWS CloudFront. What AWS CloudFront does is it actually lets you go ahead and perform these CDNs or create these CDNs for your AWS network or CloudFront distributions for your AWS network. As the name suggests, AWS CloudFront is a service that speeds up the distribution of a static and dynamic web content, it can handle files in formats like HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and even images. So basically, as it says, it speeds up the process of distributing your data across different servers, different regions, right? So basically, it is a CDN service that AWS provides to you. What are the pointers it considers? One is your routing, the other one is your edge location, and the third one is your availability, right? So uh, when you say routing, so basically what we are doing here is we want to move our data through the network and it has to be delivered to different regions, right? Different servers, different locations. So data routing becomes important. So when you talk about CloudFront, it routes your data as well. It controls your domain names as well so that it knows what IP addresses to connect to and how, okay? Edge locations, when you talk about an edge location, Again, edge location is nothing but your distribution or a location that is close to the area where you want to serve your data. Okay. Availability, when you talk about availability, ensuring that your resources are available 24 seven um, is what CloudFront lets you do. So these are some of its features. Let's not get into the details of it. It's not very important, but I believe you have a gist as to what CloudFront does and what CDNs are. Okay. So how does it work exactly? So I had explained this when I was talking about CDN. Let's talk about it from a CloudFront perspective, right? So basically, let's assume you are a user, right? Now you set forth a request for a resource that is again based in Mumbai server and you're based in Chennai. So the amount of time it will take to normal latency is a lot and it would be frustrating for you. But let's assume that you have AWS CloudFront with you. What it will do is there would be a CloudFront distribution that would be created, an edge location for you. Um, so whatever request you send, it will go through S3 bucket and CloudFront where a copy of this data is maintained. Okay. And um, once it fetches that copy, it will make a copy of it at the edge location 
and it would be distributed to you as a copy that uh, you requested for and whatever requests you put forth going ahead the requests get speed up because now there's a copy maintained at the edge location so what are the applications of aws cloudfront so when you say applications right um there are quite a few things that you can do with uh, aws cloudfront or there are quite a few features that aws cloudfront offers to you one it accelerates your web content delivery and that is obvious right so uh, when you talk about uh, your web content if it is moving through a network that ensures there's no latency or lesser latency you are not spending a lot of time waiting for the resources i mean good examples of this are the streaming websites that we use right you always have data that is cached somewhere and whenever you put forth a request for it it gets available to you right away serve on demand or live streaming as well so as i've just mentioned i mean it serves both for your static data that you want to move and also for your streaming data so when you talk about streaming data the streaming data is delivered to a particular edge location or your server in packets right so no sooner these packets are available those start getting streamed or delivered to your location one after the other okay so uh, in in the form of packets in this case so that is what live streaming also is supported by your aws cloudfront and the cdn service it offers data encryption now there's an option of data security as well you can encrypt your data that you want to move over the network okay so yes there's an option for data encryption as well here okay and customize your edge locations as well to ensure that there's proper data maintenance there security and ease of transfer to the closest region that you want to transfer your data to okay so this was about cloudfront features okay let's just go back and take a look at the demo that cloudfront has to offer to us okay so i've actually gone ahead and came back uh, to my console so let's just go ahead and create a cloudfront distribution to see how it works okay so for your cloudfront distribution to work we'd be needing two important things i think i have those with me already um there you go so guys there's a great learning logo that i have and I, ha i have an index file let me delete this for now i'll create a new one instead okay so let's just say html right let's okay so i made a blunder out of there i hate html to be very frank he doesn't i do not like using it i know it's fairly easy but not one of things one of those things that i'm fond of uh, these tags make me confused a lot or get me confused so next one is your head tag and inside your head tag let's call it say okay demo right and let's have a body tag as well let the body tag say successfully routed data okay and let me just save it as index.html so there you go my html file is created okay so we are going to go ahead and create a cloudfront distribution that and try to access these two files there okay let's just come here and for that we'll need to create a bucket to start with so we already have a bucket with us right let's just go ahead and say delete and then upload the files that concern us so i say upload i go to desktop and aws demo 
I select this file, I select this file and I say open and I say upload. So both my files are here with me uh, demo for today, demo to today is the name of the bucket. So guys, now we are going to go ahead and create a CloudFront distribution. For that, I'll have to search for AWS CloudFront. I open it. And I say create a distribution. Okay. So there are two options. One is that says create a distribution for uh, static data. And the other one that says RTMP is for one for your uh, uh, streaming data, basically. So let's create the first one and let's use this bucket, right? So it will use it as my origin domain name. Okay. Um, so it has created a domain name based on the bucket that I have. Okay. Original path. I do not have to get into these things. Do I No. So origin ID, it is this bucket, right? So it will use this bucket as a server that I want to use. Are the other things that I need to make changes to restrict bucket access? I say yes. Choose an identity. I would say create one on your own. Okay. If I say do not restrict bucket access, uh, anybody can access this bucket. I think this will create a problem for us, but let it be for now and uh, redirect my HTTP to HTTPS. Okay. Rest, I think we do not get into the details of let's just go ahead and say create. So this creation takes time guys. It takes like a few minutes for your distribution to get created cloudfront private content getting started uh, using cloudfront to serve private content so basically it's giving me some information as to what all is happening here so as mentioned guys the distribution will take time if i go to distributions so as you can see guys this thing is taking a lot of time right to load so it might take like five six minutes more once that happens, we would should be able to basically go ahead and access a piece of data. So basically what it will do is since I have my data that is rested in my bucket, right? So whenever I actually go ahead and type a particular domain name, right? So what happens is let's assume that I have my data residing in my bucket. Now, in this case, my bucket is that server point of connection, right? So you can see that there was a domain name that was created. So what it does is when I look for that particular domain name and for a particular file, it would fetch that file for me um, from the bucket in first place and then put it on the CloudFront distribution so that going ahead whenever I want to access it, I can access it quicker and faster. Okay, so you can see that our CloudFront application is up and running, right? So let's just go ahead and uh, use a particular piece of domain name Control C let's type it here and let me say index dot html okay there's an error here it says access denied so let's just see what we can do okay um, let me go through the s3 bucket first so inside this S3 bucket, guys, uh, let's see. Block all public accesses. Don't do that. I say confirm. And then I open the bucket and I have certain files, right? make public now my buckets are public as well and the objects as well so let's just try it out now if it works okay it should demo successfully routed data it will basically uh, route the data to me 
through my distribution at a faster pace. Let's try it out for the um, PNG as well. There you go, right? The logo that we had put forth. And if I look for index.html, it does that instantly for me, right? Because it is getting distributed to me through a cache that I have, and that is located close to the region that I'm based in, okay? So this is what CloudFront does. It ensures speedy caching of data and delivery to you that is closest to your place, okay? So this was about some of the popular networking services that we have in hand. Let's now just uh, go ahead and see what all can we talk about. But ensure one thing that before you leave, you delete your distributions as well, okay? So if I select this now, it would say delete. So delete your resources. Disable this one to start with and once it is disabled, and once this is disabled, you can actually go ahead and delete it as well. So guys, I hope this comprehensively put together uh, hands-on helped you a lot uh, in terms of AWS. Now again, let us start with a couple of demos. The first one that we're going to be doing is building a simple chatbot with AWS. So um, what exactly is Honeycode? Well, when you talk about Honeycode, it is a fully managed AWS service. It lets you develop powerful mobile and web applications without writing any code. Yes, you don't have to write code. You can write certain, um, basically you can put in certain filters or uh, basically put in certain conditions that are similar to writing code. So that is why I've said that almost zero code in the title. The reason for that is uh, you could be required to code a little if necessary. If not, uh, you can have it as a plain usage for plain usage as well, right? So that is what Honeycode is. It is more of a worksheet access kind of a thing where you can create worksheets, workbooks and on top of that you can build applications that you can share with others and you can interact with those applications as well. And you do not need to code for this particular service that is AWS Honeycode. I'll give you a walkthrough as to how it works, right? And it is very true what you see here. You can build apps in minutes and you do not need code for that. All right, guys, so it was really easy to go on to build that chatbot, right? Now, what we're going to do is, as discussed in the agenda, we're going to take a look at AWS Honeycode and Amplify and see how we can uh, get started with building our own first mobile application uh, using AWS. The next one is your AWS Amplify. It is an end-to-end -end solution that enables mobile and front-end web developers to build and deploy secure, scalable, full-stack applications powered by AWS. So again, with Amplify, you can build web apps, you can build mobile apps. Now you'd wonder as in when you have honey code, why do you need something like Amplify where you are gonna code? See, there are quite a few functionalities that you can add using Amplify, right? Whether you want to connect to a backend, right? Whether you want to um, build applications and migrate it for different platforms, you can do all these things. So you get more functionality here. When you talk about Honeycode, it was released in um, May, June, July, somewhere during that time this year. And it still has quite a few functionalities that needs to be added to it. Say, for example, now you can add Honeycomb APIs to basically connect with the backend, but that has started recently. So there are not a lot of options that you have with Honeycode. But the best thing about Honeycode is if you do not have coding knowledge, you can still work with it. So we're gonna go ahead and build an app using Honeycode. And post that, I'm gonna also tell you how you can actually go ahead and approach building applications process using AWS Amplify. All right, guys, now that we checked out the theoretical aspect of things, it's vital that we have a hands-on experience with it. So let's get started with the demo of building our first mobile application using Honeycode. I'm gonna switch into my console here. So guys, uh, for people who were asking about AWS free tier, while we start the demo, I'm gonna answer quite a few questions. All you have to do is look for AWS free tier console. You would be redirected to this page and it would ask you to sign up. Enter your credit card or debit card details. They would charge you like two Indian rupees. I'm not sure about the US charges, but in India, it's like two Indian rupees um, for the verification process. Post that you won't be charged anything, okay? All you have to do is uh, ensure that you follow the free tier limits and you'll, you won't be charged. So when you uh, do that, and if you log in, I'll show you how the AWS console looks like. Yeah, there you go. So it, it's logged in now, you see, this is how the interface looks like when you talk about AWS, right? 
So um, again, some of you asked about what are these uh, security options that we have. If you click on services here, you see there's a separate domain for security. It should be somewhere here. Scroll down. And where do you read security in here? You see security, identity and compliance. So there's so many services that you have which serve different purposes, right? From encryption to SSHing to IAM accesses, right? Uh, to getting in firewalls in place, right? Uh, whether you talk about putting in shields, right? All these things can be taken care of by these services that you see here. Security, identity and compliance, okay? Internet of things, somebody asked me about that. See, you can connect or do these many things. All these different things let you set up the infrastructure, uh, right from setting up a router kind of a thing where you can connect to other devices, have a central management system, to basically having one click devices and um, audio video streaming and all kind of these options that you want. So all these things can be done by using IoT services that AWS offers. Now, the question on our plate is what can we do when you talk about Honeycode? I search for Honeycode here, it would take me to a new page. So guys, once you connect to Honeycode, So this is where it will bring you don't do that just look for this particular link right so this is the developer link that you have and it's this that is builder.honeycode.aws so you would be redirected to this space so guys again you would be required to sign up here once you do sign up uh, you can do quite a few things with uh, this uh, particular uh, tool that you have which is an aws product again so note one thing all you have to do is put in your email ID and your password and you would be logged into this thing. Another thing that you can do is you can download this thing on Play Store so that you can actually go ahead and take a look at all the workbooks and applications that you create. So uh, in Play Store, go ahead and look for AWS Honeycode and you should be able to see this app there. If you download it, you'll be able to see all the apps that you want to. Let's create a workbook, guys. This is a fairly simple thing. I'll show you how can you actually go ahead and set up uh, an uh, interface here. Again, guys, there are options for you to go ahead and create custom applications, right? Which are true for web and for mobiles. And you can also go ahead and um, basically create everything from scratch. So I'm going to show you both the processes. So let's start by creating a workbook quickly. Since we are very less on time, I'm not going to add, add in too much functionalities here and we are not going to um, spend too much time beautifying our app. I'm going to rather quickly show you how to get this done and I'm sure you all can do it. Okay, let's call this workbook as demo workbook. Okay, and I'm going to say create. So guys, if you've noticed, I've selected an option called as create from scratch here. Okay, so you can actually go ahead and use custom templates as well if you want to. That is also an option that you have. I've personally never tried creating custom templates. So when you do that, you get more functionality there. But since it is so easy, why create custom templates, right? You can do everything from scratch. So the first thing that I have is I have tables here so I can put in my data in the table. Do not worry. I'll tell you why Honeycode is important. What are its applications? But let's just go ahead and quickly build an application from scratch first. Okay. So um, let's just assume that I want to have an application where I'm managing my employee attendance. Okay. So let's just go ahead and try and do that. Okay. So again, this is something that thought came into mind right away. So I'm, I've never built an employee app before. I've mostly built other apps, but uh, for now, let's just try and build one. There's no rocket science here. Let's rename this particular folder and let's call it uh, employee attendance. We would first build the backend part of things, right? And once we are done with that, then we'll actually go ahead and see how the interface looks in the front end. Okay, so I'm going to hit the enter button, right? So the name has been changed now. And let's just give it give this column a certain name. Let's call it say name of the employee. Okay, uh, what are the other things that we can add here? ID, right? And what is the other thing that we can add here? attendance okay so we are building a very basic app here okay do not put in a lot of thought process let's give in certain names we have ram we have shampriti right 
we have mudita we have chirag we have bhavya and we have someone like vishal okay let this field have ids right and let's just go ahead and um, add attendance here okay so uh, okay so we have one table that is in place we'll align everything later but that's for the later part let's create another table here right and let's just go ahead and say let's call this table as what should we call it let's call it rename as id i do not want these so this table is not adding a lot of value but still let's have one right and i'm going to add i'm just going to take a look at some of the data that we have in this table quickly so we have six records here let it be six let me add one more table now and let's call this table status that is for the attendance that we have okay so let's call it attendance that let's delete these mm, let's delete this as well so if i go to employee attendance i have present and absent there you go so guys the table is in place we have all these three tables with all the records that we need now let's go ahead and create an interface for the app that we need so we've created a workbook in which we put in certain um, sets of details that we require i'm gonna go ahead and open this workbook again and i'm gonna come here and say click on builder add a new app you can use an app wizard that again beautifies stuff for you so you can try those things out the aim is you understand how the basics work here right so for now let's not get into the details of those things let's call it employee attendance to start with right so once you do that you should be having an interface that you need to put in place uh, let's just go ahead and add some other features functionality is here right now we know that we have these things in place we can also go ahead and beautify these things a little so you have an option of adding an object here so this is how the template would look for you more or less right so we can just go ahead and say add when you say add you're gonna go ahead and add a content box here let's call this content box as details maybe daily details and inside this i'm going to go ahead and add a list here where we are going to go ahead and import all the data that we put in three tables that we've just created so employee attendance is what i want to do here and within a minute you should see that this has been put in place let's see if we can beautify this a little i'm going to select this part and i'm going to change color for this particular theme let's keep it a little formal so i'm going to go ahead and use uh, maybe this color and in the interim let me go ahead and change this piece of color let's make it white so there you go we have our text in place we have uh, all the details that we need let's bold this text that we have right so that it looks a little better 
and I'm gonna select this text as well unfortunately I cannot format it I do not know why that is the case I'll have to look into it but as you can see we have a template in place right so what you can also do is you can actually go ahead and have a different table here in that table or different list here where you can add some functionality saying that if somebody is present then show that person's attendance here if somebody is absent you can go ahead and show that person's attendance here that is doable okay so let's just skip that for now let's just go ahead and see how does this app look like the one that we've created so i'm gonna view this app here and so guys when you create these applications and if you download the honeycode app on from your play store in your phone whatever changes you make here those would be visible in your app that you have with you so make sure you go ahead and take a look at that as well okay so guys you see the app is visible now right in the um web domain right now if you want to take a look at this app in your mobile you can take a look at it and all this data would be visible there as well again the formatting is not in place you can edit that later but that is not a purpose right now our main focus is how to go ahead and create an app right so again if somebody is present right so what i want is i want this present or absent button to have a specific color so can i go ahead and add a button here instead right let's try and do that so when you talk about somebody being present uh let this content box can i add a particular color to it right i can so um let's add your text a particular color making it white right and instead you can even have a button here if you want to so you can add buttons here when you add a button if you click on this particular thing it will have certain functionality you can make it move around so that is the other thing that you can do now if i go back to the app again you see there's an instant reflection here right so guys when you ask about these kind of applications you might have a question here right what is the use of this kind of an app now if you add more functionality here as i've mentioned you can have another table here let me show you then probably that would make little more sense to you uh let's just select a column list and in the column list again import this data right and as i've mentioned here you can actually go ahead and represent the data where people are present so if you can just go ahead and delete this for now and add a button here instead so in this button you can have another text like present and you can probably add in some colors okay so if you just come back here okay this is not reflecting here you see it's reflecting now unfortunately it is showing showing that everybody is present here that is not true about this data though what you can do is you can actually come here and select this functionality and probably add a source code here saying, right so if you add a filter here saying that um for the particular table and particular column uh, uh, uh what is the name of this thing attendance equal to present so if you do that only the people who are present in your table that data would be uh, reflected here and you can do that so again you might ask a question as in what is the benefit of having an application like this right what all can you do with it uh, okay so let's go ahead and continue with the session that we are having on our plate right uh, um, let's just go ahead and talk about the stuff so guys this is how you can create an application i stopped midway when i said that um, you, what is the use of these kind of applications so when you add functionality here what all can you do is you can actually go ahead and ensure that um, uh, you can actually go ahead and add in more functionality like we could have even had an application here where you can actually go ahead and process attendance for people right what if we have an in-house tracker that we need right in a company um, you have tools like jira and all those that you use which are very good but again their functionality is very structured and you have to follow the structure that is there what if you need to have an in-house or in-team app that works differently for the team you can create an attendance tracker there right you can create a sheet that meets your particular requirements and you can probably share it in the form of apps where people can view that on their mobile phones on their web apps and whatever changes the admin or whoever has access to can make to it those would be reflected for everyone and everyone can see those changes right so that is one benefit uh, you can also have basic setups let's assume that you want to start a business where you want to deliver groceries to people please forgive me guys there's a call that my mother's getting since i've 
have tried all the mobile phones to connect to the internet so that is the reason um, there are a couple of mobiles lying here and her phone is unfortunately on not on silent let me just quickly make it or put it on silent yeah so um let's assume that you want to create an online grocery delivery app you can do that right you can create a worksheet here put in the products that you want and you can have buttons there so people can actually go ahead and put in all the information that they want now you might ask can we connect it to a back end the functionalities here are still limited but that is pretty much doable okay so this is how you actually go ahead and build an app as i've already mentioned you can go ahead and create some template apps as well so if i just come back here right and if i okay if i just come back here and if i delete this workbook all that i've created would go okay i want to do that the reason for that is i'll show you why um let's say create a workbook now and this time let's say i want to pick something that is more of a template so if i use a template say team task tracker create so these are some templates that aws also gives you right so let's just go ahead and see how it works and there you go there's a template in place for you you can actually go ahead and create right an app for this uh, th there's all the information here that you need so you can actually go ahead and just come here and say build an app let's time let's try and use an app wizard i've never done that before so i'm doing it with you people for the first time i'm just going to say next for now choose a table it says right so what was the name of the table that we just created team tasks let's see if we can just go ahead and have a team tasks table here so there was some table that i randomly picked up i just want to see how does this wizard work for you right so have that we are making an app for you and it is getting that done for you on its own right so for this uh, m team this is an app that is getting created i'm not sure how that app is going to look let's just go ahead and see so it shows my name there as well that's nice and if you try to share this app which i cannot for now i'm just going to say next to see how does this wizard work and i say apply so by default also you can go ahead and create a template let me just see how does the template look like so i've just picked up a random table a random data set and i've just gone ahead and seen how it looks this is how it looks it's not very interactive so this is a basic app that it has created you can go ahead and create one more yourself right come here and just say create an app this is your team tasks app that was created by default and you see all the functionality is here right so if you view it in the app form you can see there would be some interaction that you can do with this app which is again a template app okay you see uh these are the details about the work whether it's in progress as it high on priority and all those things right so it's created a daily update tracker so you can add filters here as well what are the filters you can select an option the newsletter is what you can look for right assignee is shal padghan again guys this is something that i'm doing just for the name sake i'm just not aware about all the details so there's no such thing in this record so whatever data i've entered it's not valid for assignee vishal so he's not worked on any of these kind of projects so the task says there's nothing that we can display you can actually go ahead and do quite a few things in aws amplify as well let's just come here and look for aws amplify right i'll just tell you what all can you do here you see in aws amplify you can again develop web apps here amplify provides you frameworks for command line interface and library for creating applications so if you come here uh, you can choose all these platforms for web applications and for mobile you can use your android again there are step to step guides here how you can go ahead and do that if you start the free tutorial you'd be actually going ahead and putting in all these requirements you you have to create an android studio project though so it's a time consuming process to start with because you'll need to install node js android studio and android sdk that is android uh, level api level 29 basically and also install aws amplify cli 
so once you install all these things you can actually go ahead and create a project here as well but again this is uh, something where you would be needing coding say for example if you come here this is the android studio that you look uh, this is how it looks like if you just click on new project right you can just come here and say select a basic activity click on next um you can go ahead and say create an application all the details are here i'm using java platform you can use kotlin as well if you want to that's up to you right what platform do you want to use and just say finish and if you click on finish within few minutes your application should be um your basic code should be up and running here now you might wonder as in once i have this code this is something that is giving me an application in my um it is giving me application in my android studio how what is aws doing here in that case guys what you people can do is you can actually go ahead and edit this code how do you edit that code you see if you come here there are certain instructions here what they want you to do is in your main activity file or in your xml files just replace some of these steps that are mentioned here you'll have to replace these certain pieces of code with the aws amplify code and once you do that and if you set it up using the flame framework terminal here that you have you see you have a terminal here if you set it up using the terminal um, you can actually go ahead and um, install uh, these applications and once you build it you can basically have it run one on your mobile phones as well and uh, also on the cloud so since they are based on aws cloud now these applications is something that you can put in your play store as well but again this is a tedious task and a complicated process so if you want to you can definitely give it a try uh, building these applications here from the scratch okay so by now i believe guys we've talked about quite a few pointers i hope that you understood how to go ahead and build honey code apps and what aws amplify is all about so all right guys i hope this module added a lot of value to your learning we checked out everything from the aws uh, services like uh, you know all the core services we took in depth look at uh, you know the compute services storage services networking services you know in another demo we also built our first mobile application using aws as well so this is a, a very very important module you can watch this module uh, you know rewatch this module a couple of times guys it's extremely important that you have this kind of a practical knowledge you know a hands on uh, experience uh, you know before continuing ahead right perfect guys on this note you've come to the end of this module i'll see you on the next one hey guys welcome to module number 7 now module number 7 is going to be a really really interesting module because we have multiple demos uh, that we're going to take a look at uh, especially when using with microsoft azure uh, now as we have done with module number 6 as well you'll realize that these hands on sessions are going to add a lot of value uh, to your theoretical learning now that being said azure is always neck to neck when it comes to services when it comes to being really powerful with aws of course aws has the bigger market it but then uh, azure is catching up really really fast and there are companies who prefer azure uh, over aws as well so at this again to make sure that we are covering off your knowledge in terms of practicality in terms of you actually using the uh, azure user interface module number 7 uh, is going to be really important for you all now uh, there are three important things that we are going to check out here guys firstly uh, you know we'll take a quick introduction to understand what wordpress is and once we know what wordpress is uh, you know it will help you create a very easy uh, you know very fast uh, website uh, by using microsoft azure now uh, if you have ever read a blog written a blog or if you are into content creation there's a good chance that you will have used this tool uh, called as wordpress now it's a really simple one we do not need complete uh, knowledge about how it works and all of that and uh, you know at the end of uh, the first demo as you can see on your screen right now on the agenda we're going to we're going to have a website which is created hosted it has its own uh, domain name all of that and again all of this is completely free you will not be charged uh, for any of these right now once we're done with the first demo next we're going to take a look at one fantastic service which azure is really 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 popular for uh, which is azure ml right so the machine learning service that's provided by azure uh, is being used by thousands of companies out there uh, if you go into these job hunt sites like uh, linkedin uh, indeed.com uh, if you just type in azure machine learning you will see that there's thousands of jobs uh, looking for specialists uh, you know with respect to azure machine learning so to make sure that you guys get started uh, you know just to give you a heads up of uh, how things work there as well we again uh, will take a quick introduction to understand machine learning you know quickly we'll check out the types of machine learning algorithms and we're going to jump straight into the demo of that right perfect 
Now, after the second demo is done, uh, you know, the third thing that we're going to check out is how we can go on to build fantastic chatbots using Azure. Now, a chatbot, again, I, uh, there's a good chance you might have used it every time you talk to a customer support executive, uh, you know, maybe on Zomato, Swiggy or all these food delivery apps until it comes to a point where it says connect me to an agent or something. You're talking to a bot on the other side, right? So uh, we'll take an introduction to that, how it works, all of that. And eventually we're going to create our own chatbot uh, very similar to that by making use of Azure guys. So I hope the agenda that we're going to cover uh, in this particular module is clear for you all. Right. Without further ado, let's begin. Uh, we're going to start out this particular module by taking an introduction to understand what WordPress is and we can go from there. So when you talk about WordPress guys, um, think of WordPress as an open source tool or a platform where you can actually host your websites, right? You can put forth your articles and stuff like that. So when it initiated, that is what it was initiated for. Publishing written content and giving a platform to people where they can actually publish their written content. But as somebody just mentioned CMS, right? So with time, it has evolved into providing quite a few services. It is now a CMS as well, right? Uh, apart from that, what it also does is it also acts as LMS for quite a few organizations. LMS are nothing but a learning management systems. So basically, when you talk about these learning platforms, e-learning companies, just like great learning when you talk about it. I'm not saying great learning is based on WordPress. I'm just giving you an example. Online companies like great learning and quite a few other companies to be very frank, not great learning. Uh, they use WordPress platform to have the learning management systems. So when you do enroll for a particular course, right? You get that access to some data there, right? There are presentations, there's stuff where you can download it from, where you can take your tests. Those are your learning management systems. And even those can be hosted by using WordPress. So the applications have gotten into plenty of domains now. And WordPress is something that is used for quite a few things. I personally use WordPress for blogging a lot. All right, guys. So I hope that quick introduction that we took uh, with uh, WordPress was clear for you all. Now we're going to take a look at the actual hands-on demo. We're going to be getting our hands dirty with Microsoft Azure and we're going to be building a fantastic website. Right? So let's get started. So let's quickly get into the demo part and understand how we can create a website using WordPress right, and Microsoft Azure. So. For that, I'll have to quickly switch into my console, right? <clears throat> so for that, I'll get into the Azure portal. So guys, this is the free tier place that I was referring to. This is what you need access for when you start with. How would you like to recommend Azure portal to someone? I really like it. So I'm going to give it like eight. So guys, this is the free tier account that I have. And this is how the free tier account looks like. Okay. As you can see on the screen, um, with my Azure account, I have like 12,200 credits available. So what Microsoft Azure does is it tells you that, okay, take this money. When it when they say money, they do not give it to you physically, but they have that money added to your free tier account. So um, when you talk about Azure, they give you like uh, 13,000 uh, free credits. Okay. Roughly 13,000 something in India. Rupees is what I'm talking about. In USDs, it is around 200 US dollars, roughly 200 US dollars. So um, you get these many credits and you can use these resources. You can spend money on these resources from the credit that you have. You can exhaust these resources in one year's time. So you have access to these resources for a one complete year. OK, so let's just go ahead and see um, how can we create a WordPress website? OK, we'll talk about quite a few other pointers because in the interim, these resources take time to create. OK. So let's quickly just go ahead and spawn a website an instance first. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to use this WordPress Bitnami. No result found. Okay. That is surprising. Let's just search for, okay. Yeah. So guys, WordPress certified by Bitnami. Okay. Um, let's just go ahead and, uh, create a virtual machine. So when I say a virtual machine, guys, I would be launching a website. So it has to lie on some platform, right? Some instance, some virtual machine. So for that, we need to create a virtual machine, a plat, an infrastructure where my website would reside on. So what Microsoft Azure does is it creates a ready to use platform for you. Okay. Or an infrastructure for you on top of which you can have your website up and running. So let us just go ahead and create that instance first. Um, what should I call my resource? Okay, first they say create a resource group. So resource group is nothing but a group where all your resources lie in guys. When you talk about an instance, all its resources would be in this group. 
so demo rg okay i'm bad at naming conventions let's hope this is accepted yep virtual machine let us call it website or uh, let's call it sample for today okay guys keep your naming conventions as uh, constant as you can as consistent as you can because later it creates problem otherwise okay where do i want to host it let's go to east us um no other infrastructure required how do i want to sign in i want to sign in with a password okay so as your user add in a particular password guys okay okay i also need to have characters in it and numbers six okay so i say review and create okay so guys what this will do is it will launch that virtual machine for me now this is the most time taking process here it is showing me some error something has gone wrong let's quickly see what has gone wrong okay validation passed but why is this mark here does it need more information on something let's see if we can create an instance it should not give you this error but for some reason it is okay validation passed it says now okay let's see what is the problem there would be a problem somewhere that is why it says there's an error okay sample for today ip has been entered everything looks in place networking looks in place and all this data here to looks in place let's just go ahead and say review and create again okay this is unexpected changing basic options may reset but to be bit nami the instance is correct okay there you go it has passed the validation and let's just say create so guys this creation process will take longer you can see the pricing here on the screen right it says per hour it will charge me rupees 4 that is indian rupees uh, 4 per hour right so um that is like very less if you compare it with indian cost site so uh, i have 13000 of credits here so it would be minus from there in this case and uh, my deployment is on the way guys again guys once we launch this website right i would be getting a particular ip address through which i can uh, launch my website so when you talk about launching a particular website you always um, won't be entering your ip address right when you search something on google what you do you look for keywords right and then you get certain results so those are your domain names we'll be learning about domain names as well do not worry about that but for that let our website be up and running now the deployment has succeeded right as you can see on the screen let's quickly go ahead and see if our uh, instance is up and running right there you go i'm going to copy this thing i'll just go to incognito mode just to avoid some unnecessary issues if there are any normally security if you are connected through a network there would be security concerns here right this page isn't working so this is what i was afraid of yeah at times we get similar problems guys the reason for that is um times when we launch these instances what happens is occasionally what happens is basically there is some data that is cached and when that data gets cached you normally get such errors okay so let me just try something else this is my public ip i should not be having problem launching this 
but there is one okay no worries guys we will quickly launch this instance again there could be some issue with it we'll get that sorted but i do not want to waste you people's time here let's just quickly go to dashboard and clear all our resources that we have here it's always wise to delete all these resources before we launch them again relaunch them again meanwhile we'll talk about some of the steps that we are going to implement again so none of our time gets wasted here okay so let's just go ahead and get into azure portal again and quickly launch this website okay okay let's just say create wordpress by bitnami create create a new resource group let's call it second demo or at least the second attempt that we are doing and let's just say that the virtual machine be sample demo okay it's available and uh, uh, this should be fine let's just see if this works for us and it a be pair no let's just quickly say and then i say review and create so i'm hopeful this time we should be able to launch the website guys uh, meanwhile our website gets launched uh, let me tell you what we are going to do this time we have passed the validation successfully without any error so i'm hopeful that we should be able to launch this website correctly so meanwhile guys what i would also like to inform you people is when you talk about these websites right i just entered the ip address as you saw right there were some numbers there so when you launch a website using these numbers what happens here is uh, basically your computers understand these numbers right better uh, so, but as a human being, if I ask you that, oh, go register to or just um, open great learning website, right? You won't be typing 3048-5862, right? Instead, you'd want to have a proper name that you can call and use. So that is where domain names come into picture. So what you do here is basically you actually go ahead and assign a particular domain to your website. Okay. So when you say domain, that is more human or more speakable name. So for that, there are quite a few domain hosting websites out there that let you do that. Okay. Let us take a look at, or let us just go ahead and have a domain name for our website because we do not want to use the IP address here that we have, right? Instead, we can use a domain name. Okay. So, um, I'm going to go to free gnome here. Okay. So Freenome is a website guys that lets you create or have free domain names. Again, they will charge you for some premium names, but there are some free domain names that are available. I'm going to just go ahead and have or create a simple domain name by a simple domain name. Okay. Uh, register a new domain. When I do that, it will give me option. What should we call it? Let's call it. Sample dem v21 check availability. It is available, guys, with an extension of dot pk. Let me buy that and say check out here. Okay, now this is where I would be needing to actually go ahead and enter my DNS details, right? But we do not have the DNS details yet. For that, we'll have to wait for this deployment to get complete. Let's see whether the deployment is complete or not. Yes, it says the deployment is complete. Let me just go back. Let me close this. Um, why is it not letting me go to the resource?
there's something seriously wrong with my WordPress today. Not WordPress, sorry, my Microsoft Azure. Okay, let's go to the dashboard. And this is the application that we've created. So we should be having all the data here. There you go. Let me copy this and let us try it again. If something is seriously wrong with my instances, I do not know why am I just not able to um, access these instances today. Let's see if there is any networking issue here. Now this looks in place, but for some reason it is just not receiving data here. Let me check into boot diagnostics if everything is in place. We'll go ahead and check for the serial log. Okay, the log is generated correctly. Yeah, that's the problem. I just do not see any password here. I do not see anything related to Bitnami. Okay, there you go. Okay, Ravi is asking that is something that we have to do to add it to port 80. In this case, we do not need it, Ravi, because this is quite an open demo. Uh, we've just launched an instance and it actually releases a basic IP for you based on which you can actually go ahead and connect. So. Okay, this is not the resource group that we need to look into. There you go guys, finally it has loaded. Uh, this thing had me all scared up. I apologize for that. Uh, there you see, the WordPress website is up and running for us. 
I apologize for the delay guys. Um, so we have our WordPress that is ready, right? As you can see here. So when you talk about this WordPress, again, this is something that is a template website here. You can see it says hello world, right? Let's just come here. Let's just get into boot diagnostics, right? Here I'm going to get into the serial lock thing. I'll tell you why I'm doing this guys. Control F. So guys, when you look for a password, there's a password that is generated for you in these files. Okay. So we are looking for that particular password. Let's quickly search for that password. Okay. So guys, when you actually create this WordPress website, what we do is we actually go ahead. And now when you see in this website, what you see here is basically what we have here is a template, right? But now this is just another plain WordPress template. But as a user, I would be wanting to edit this template as well, right? I mean, I do not just want to uh, have it as a temporary website, right? For that, I would be needing to log in somewhere, right? So how do I do that? To log in or to have an admin access to this website, what I have to do is I have to get my boot diagnostic password, okay? So how do I get the password? So it should be somewhere in the settings. Bitnami. Okay, there you go. Here's the password. So guys, to access this password or this website, as you can see, what I have to do is I have to actually sign into my admin account. For that, I'd be needing a password. So by default, what Azure does is it uses the name called as user. You can just go ahead and sign in here. Okay. So when you sign in, this is how your WordPress interface should look like. So guys, by default, what we've done is we've actually gone ahead and launched a VM. And by using the IP address, what I've done is I've just uh, created a WordPress website, right? Launched a WordPress website. And this is where I can add in my articles and stuff like that. So let's say you say click on new. So you can actually go ahead and post something here. So maybe you can add a title, say delayed demo, just to symbolize the misery that we were in today. Okay. And guys, when you actually go ahead and have a WordPress, there are quite a few customizations that you do here as well. Okay. So you can make quite a few changes. So, you can add those changes and save it to the draft as per your need. And you can even publish these videos. So since we do not have a domain name system, we are not going to get into the details of those things. Okay. Let's just go ahead and quickly go to the overview part. Let's just copy this IP address that we have and let me paste it. Not secure. And just decide to type it and save it. Okay. So you can make all the changes that you want here. Now, if I just go ahead and enter this, there you go. It has been updated, right? So you can make changes here as well to meet your needs, depending upon the uh, 
articles that you want to write or stuff that you want to write you can have your own wordpress page you can actually go ahead and uh, publish quite a few things here unfortunately since we are running a little slow on chat okay uh, or since we are running a little slow on the demo part let me just quickly go ahead and walk you through the domain name process okay what we can do with it so guys we just bought a website right uh, this is the domain name that i had copied let me copy it again let me come here okay in the free norm part let me enter my domain name details here okay we continue and i purchase this domain name ask me to sign in again this is a painful process you are already signed in it says let's see if the domain name that we purchased we have it with us or not my domains no i don't have it so i'll have to again buy it unfortunately um register a new domain let's call it sample domain Three to one. I say okay. Check out. And so guys we have actually gone ahead and bought a domain name now next what we do is we actually go ahead and attach this domain name to our website okay so the reason we do this is because i do not want to call it by my ip address i want to call it by my domain name as well right so to do that what you have to do is you have to uh, since this has been bought our order is in place i'm going to just go ahead here and look for dns zones now dns zone is something that lets me use the zone to connect to my website through the domain name that i've bought so i say add okay and here i will go back to my subscriptions or to my domain names just to see if my domain name is there or not this is my domain name right let me just quickly copy this domain name i'm going to use this name constantly so that we do not have to again and again go ahead and do other things right so let's just quickly come here resource group uh, let's just use the resource group that we had created second demo one right and let's just go ahead and give it this name let me just quickly say east us and i say create so guys a dns zone would be created here and this dns zone is something that would actually let me go ahead and uh, uh, have my domain name attached here once that is attached i can attach it to the website and we can access that website using that domain name this should not take long So guys when you create a domain name right there are two things that you need to know one is your um, a record and the other one is your c name record so c name record is something that is called as a canonical name so it connects your canonical name to your website ip or to another canonical name okay so for that we'll have to go to the resource first okay i'm here already and in this i'll have to go ahead and create that record first one is a record and time to load for this would be 300 seconds seconds um for ip address i will have to actually go back to my portal again or i can just pick it up from here my ip address let's just copy it and paste it here and i say okay i need to add one more record here guys
okay and one more record set this record set uh, will This time we'll give in the domain name guys that we have, right? So copy this and paste it there. Okay, that is why. So this is where I enter in the alias. Not worry, I'll be explaining the whole process to you people if you missed out on anything. C name. No, this is not ours. This is seconds and I say there you go. Okay, so the records have been created guys. One final step and we should be able to access our website from here. So to do that again, I'll come to my domain. I'll say manage my domain. Okay. In manage domain, I'll say manage free DNS. Okay. And here I'm going to just go ahead and take a look at some of the records that we've entered. But why are these records entered wrongly? You have to delete this. We do not need this. Here we'll add one more record. This is the one where I'll say C name. This has to be w w and this has to be a 300. And my target here would be my domain name. And I say save changes. Records modified successfully. Okay, so guys, what has happened is let me tell you one thing. We've accidentally attached another IP address to our sample domain name dot tk and that is why it has redirected us to this thing. So uh, let me explain you what process we've done here to keep it simple. Basically what we've done is uh, I've actually gone ahead and created a WordPress website but initially there were problems so I had to actually go ahead and launch two WordPress websites here. That was sad and uh, I apologize for the delay. Later what we did was we actually did go ahead and buy a domain name the reason we bought this domain name guys was because we actually wanted to refer to our website using a particular domain name, right? Not the IP address that we enter here. So instead of entering the IP address so that we can be able to enter a name, we actually bought a domain name and we registered that domain name connecting to our instance so that we can redirect to the website using the domain name. Okay. So as you can see, if I enter the IP address, I would still be taken to the page. And even if I enter the domain name, I would be taken to the uh, website in general, right? So that is what it does. But since there's a problem, we launched two instances. I have not been able to redirect to this page. Instead, I was redirected here to a sample template to which I attach this record set for. So that is why we see this movement. So guys, we've actually gone ahead and created a sample website. Okay. How to know TTL to select, right? Uh, this is a general standard TTL that is given every tech to us. Okay. So it is somewhere in the range of like, um, it can be NAS as well, but you do not want that much time for it to load. Right. So th that is why I mean, depending on the data that you're trying to move it to mostly when you say TTL 300, that is a standard, uh, uh, time duration that you put in for these websites and that is why I put in that. Okay. So now that we're done with our first demo guys, the next thing, as I told you in the agenda itself, uh, we're going to be taking a look at machine learning. We're going to be understanding a bit about machine learning and uh, moving to the demo part as well. So let's begin. Okay. So, um, machine learning, what exactly is machine learning, right? Because when you talk about machine learning to keep it very simple, it is nothing but your ability of the machines 
to learn and to become smarter right i mean to provide you smart solutions that is what machine learning means and it is as simple as that right to give you an example how are we humans different from machines right we humans basically have our heads our minds hardwired in such a way that we learn from what we do right that is most of us do we learn from our mistakes we learn from what we see and stuff like that what happens here is when we are born in the childhood right we all are born as a clean slate and we do not know what colors are we do not know what languages are it's something that is ingrained into us by preaching and preaching and something that we listen to listen to listen to right and we get used to it to give you an example i come from maharashtra so um i was born and brought up in a maharashtrian family so i speak marathi at home so my parents did not put in a different effort to teach me marathi it's just that they used to speak marathi at home i used to listen to it listen to it listen to it and i started learning right i learned these things and probably it was in school that i learned a square is a square a circle is a circle red is red blue is blue how because i saw it i heard about it again and again and that got ingrained in my brain machines are no different right i mean when you talk about machines you can actually pass on data to them and when you pass this data to them again and again and again and again and again and again right your machines learn this is what machine learning is this is what artificial intelligence is you teach your machines to behave in situations which they are not trained to do right but as you pass on data to them they get trained 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 and then they start understanding how to react to particular triggers how to react to in a particular situation so that is what machine learning is in a nutshell it is nothing but the ability of your machines to learn from the data you have from the past and then come up with decisions or help us crack the data down into um decisions that we can take to impact our future uh movements or happenings right what you see on the screen i'm sure you all know about it what it is right it's um this logo is familiar familiar to many of you i'm sure it's similar to a very popular company's logo so i'm sure you all know what this is right it's similar to youtube right i mean this is how youtube logo looks like um the reason we have this logo here is right um i wanted to talk about an example that i've noticed and i'm sure you people have also noticed right if you listen to particular songs on youtube or listen to particular videos what youtube does is it suggests similar content to you people right the feature is called as collaborative filtering that means based on the data that the machine in this case youtube's machine receives from us it understands that maybe someone like vishal watches n kind of movies n kind of series n kind of songs right and then it um, basically st starts suggesting me those things now collaborative filtering is something that all these online streaming channels are using and not just these streaming channels whether you talk about shopping websites whether you talk about even your uh, food um, websites or your apps right these days they have your data and they know that previously you ordered from this particular place so you might like food from here so they'll suggest those kind of things right so or three nats that kind of touch up on those things this is called as collaborative filtering it is based on laws of association what that means is normally companies understand that people's behavior is like this based on the data they have that people might like this and they try to put forth those products in front of them trying to tell them okay buy these set of products and your need would be satisfied here so that is what collaborative filtering is in a nutshell okay um so that is an example of machine learning i just it just hit my mind and i thought i should talk about that okay so um this is what machine learning is we've talked about it at stretch at length um here are two major types of algorithms that um machine learning supports right you have a supervised learning algorithm and your unsupervised learning algorithm so when you talk about your supervised learning algorithm right um, this is where you know your end goal right so when i say an end goal that means uh supervised learning algorithms are best implemented where uh, you know what you are trying to achieve suppose i want to find out whether an x person would have a cancer or not based on the data that i have so i know my final goal right i want to find out whether there is a cancer or not to a particular person similarly what you see in the first images um i want to figure out whether in the given data set if i pass in a particular value is it apple or not right so i know what i am trying to predict here 
So when I have such kind of problems, those are called as your supervised learning algorithms. It can be your regression algorithm, right? Uh, linear regression, logistic regression. It can be a classification algorithm as well, where you classify your data into certain groups. The other type of machine learning algorithm is your unsupervised learning algorithm. Now, what is an unsupervised learning machine al machine learning algorithm? As you can see here too, my data is getting classified into groups, right? I have apples, I have what? What are those? I think peaches and then I have bananas, right? But when you talk about unsupervised learning algorithm, you pass in a data to the algorithm and it compares this data with each other, understands, okay, these values, these points are closer to each other. So it clusters them into one group. This is what unsupervised learning algorithm is. Yes, I'm getting clusters at the end of the um, implementation, but when I start, I do not know what kind of clusters I'm going to get, right? It can be apples, it can be peaches, bananas, it can be grapes, right? So what I've done is I've given an input of fruits here and it has clustered those fruits into different types. So that is what unsupervised learning algorithm is. And then you have reinforcement learning as well, which is an iterative process where you take in certain set of data and then pass it to a machine and based on feedback mechanism, you keep on training the same data, same data, same data till you get the best result out of it. So this is what, uh, these are how machine learning algorithms work, okay? This can be a supervised, unsupervised, iterative learning algorithms, right? So um, there are plenty of uh, subtypes as well, but that is not the point of discussion today. So let's uh, skip that for now, okay? All right, guys, so I hope that introduction to machine learning was of a good use for you all. Now that we know what it is theoretically, let us quickly take a look at, uh, you know, implementing machine learning with Microsoft Azure. You're not going to require uh, any sort of in-depth knowledge with machine learning. It's going to be a quick walkthrough. It's going to be a quick hands-on uh, to see how we can go on to implement solutions, right? Let's begin. So guys, let's try and understand how machine learning can be implemented using Microsoft Azure. So when we talk about Microsoft Azure, it provides us with um, quite a few services. You have pre-trained models or API services. We'll take a look at all of these, do not worry, like uh, the vision, the speech, the language and search. So these are APIs where you can give in inputs and it would generate output for you. Some of them are based on machine learning. Some of them are based on natural language processing and AI, right? So we'll try and understand them as much as we can. Okay. Popular frameworks, you have your PyTorch, you have Keras, you have TensorFlow, right? And then you have product queue services as well as your machine learning. You have your Azure data breaks. Now these are some of these services. So guys, try and understand them. Okay. So when you say Azure machine learning, this is where, uh, this is more of a platform as a service, right? Where basically you have a platform where you can actually put in your data. You can set up certain rules and you don't have to sit and code. Your applications will start running there. Why? Because it's more of a platform for you. You do not have to sit and code here completely. Um, then you have some of your popular frameworks like you have your PyTorch, TensorFlow, Keras, which again help you in doing machine learning and data science. Okay. And then you have your APIs where you don't have to do anything, just pass in data here and it would start giving in results for you as simple as that. So that is what machine learning with Azure lets you do. Okay. Um, let us now switch into the demo part. I'm going to sign into my Azure portal and show you some of these services. How do these services work and what all can you do with these services? Okay. So let's do that. I'm going to quickly log into my Azure portal. Okay. And there you go, guys. This is how the Azure portal looks like. Okay. So when you talk about Microsoft Azure portal, um, this again is a free tier account that is made available to you by Microsoft Azure. So if you do not have this account, make sure you go ahead and create one. There are a lot of things that you can do with Microsoft Azure portal. Okay. Um, in order to create this account, what do you need to do? Okay. So ensure first you look for Microsoft Azure portal. Once you do that, create a free tier account for doing that. You'll have to enter your credit card details. That is unfortunate, but do not worry. Microsoft Azure will not charge you okay it is for the verification purpose that you are a legit user and once you do create a free tier account um you can avail these services for one year so how it provides services to you is in india it gives you like three thirteen thousand credits that means you have thirteen thousand uh, virtual rupees that are there in your account and you can continue using those thirteen thousand rupees 
for one complete year that means you can exhaust all that money in one year's duration okay if you are in usa it, they basically provide you like 200 usd worth free credits and using those credits you can run these services in the allotted amounts that they charge you for okay so if you don't have a free tier account okay guys so let's see what can we do again i'm not gonna go ahead and build a machine learning model here not one of my expertise but i'm gonna actually go ahead and show you how the process works here and then we'll get into the cognitive services that we have with us okay so let's just go ahead and create or work with machine learning studio okay so you have this service here called as machine learning studio classic okay you see this is the service that offers a suit of um, offerings basically that are designed to enable customizers customers sorry to build deploy and share advanced analytics applications so if you have had attended my previous session or one of my sessions in azure that is where i talked about um, a movie recommender system how can we do that using uh, microsoft azure okay so visit one of those videos on our youtube channel you'll get access to that okay let's just try and create a studio here i'll explain the process to you how it works okay okay it's asking me to sign in uh, i am signed in actually so why is it asking me to sign in again there you go so um, this is how the machine learning studio looks like okay and in this studio there are quite a few things that you can do you can uh, create your own experiments you can even create your own projects if you want to okay so you have the options here to create a project and all those things if i click on new and i say create a new project okay let's call it sample proj okay for today's demo and then you can say add assets right see you can choose what are the data sets that you want to do what are the experiments that you want to add you can pick up notebooks that are there if you want to if you click on experiments okay So if you go to sample projects and say add assets here okay okay there are certain experiments that we have by default i cannot see all of them right now let me see if there are any databases there you go so we have data sets at least right so you can use these data sets and work on these as well right you can build your models using these data sets that you have at your plate movie ratings is one of those data sets so if i move it here see i'll be having that particular data set with me there you go so inside that movie ratings data set basically using this data set what you can do is you can actually go ahead and build a machine learning model as well to recommend certain set of movies if you want to so you can do all these things using um, this particular uh, website sorry not website this particular exercise or service rather and in this service you can actually go ahead and build models if you want to okay but as i've mentioned i'm not gonna do that for now okay i'm gonna talk about the cognitive services that we have on our hand and i'm gonna show you how to work with azure cognitive services okay let's see what all do we have on our plates here yeah so if you go to apis right there are quite a few apis that are there for you to use suppose if i click on the um 
language part you see there are these kind of services that are made available to you the options are plenty right whether you talk about decision making language speech right all of these are there we'll see or we'll see some of these one by one let's say we talk about text to speech okay so if i click on this let me give you an example here let's look for some random text okay let's search for azure only okay and see what text do we get the, this is what wikipedia has to say right let's just copy this piece of information from here okay and let me just paste it here and if i play it microsoft azure commonly referred to as azure is a cloud computing service created by Microsoft for building, testing, deploying, and managing applications and services through Microsoft managed data centers. So there you go. What it is doing is we can actually go ahead and see that it has converted my text into speech. Okay. So this again is an NLP API or application that I have with me. I have quite a few options here, right? I can actually go ahead and choose different kinds of, uh, speakers as well you see right now it was indian english i can try something else as well right let's assume i'm taking arabic and i say play now microsoft azure commonly referred to as azure is a cloud computing service created by microsoft for building testing deploying and managing applications and services through data centers so i hope you people can hear it whatever is happening here or whatever is the output from the um, input that we are passing into our machines right so i hope that you people are able to hear it able to listen to whatever is happening here okay so this is how text to speech works like okay if i go to language let's see what all we have here right mm. let's try out text analytics for now okay let's see what it does Okay, so if I scroll down again into the API, okay, you see, let's copy this piece of text again and let's try and see what output we get here, okay. Let's just roll this out and paste it here, okay. So once that is done, right, what you can see here is it's giving you this information here. Languages, it is confident 100% that it is English. Key phrases, we Microsoft, I mean, it would pick up certain words, right? So this is where text analysis happens, guys, okay? So they'll take in the text, whatever text that you've given to this machine, okay? And um, basically, it would break it down into syllables, break it down into um, grammatical sentences and stuff like that. Sentiment, right now it says document, okay? Let's just look for a bad review and see if the result changes a little. Okay, no, this is not the best place. So yeah, I just look for bad reviews. The reason I want a bad review is I want to see if the text behaves any differently. Okay. Okay. So this is something else. Ignore that. Do not worry. So I believe by now you've gotten a picture as in what we are trying to do here, what we are trying to achieve here, right? So that put forth some light on what we were looking at. So um, what I'm trying to make a point here is it is 100% neutral. Why? Because it is more or less a definition of what we are trying to tell you here. So if you look for certain reviews, if you put forth a bad book review or put forth anything, the sentiment would be negative here. What this API does is it tries and understand the sentiment as well. So it does sentiment analysis here. That means basically what it is doing here is um, it is picking up words like not bad experience, stuff like that. Right. And on that, it is understanding that the sentiment of the writer is negative here. That is how it is analyzing the text. Here, okay. It is one of the applications. 
you see this is the json file it is using right and this is the piece of code that is helping us text analyze all the data that is there with us what kind of key phrase it is what kind of um, sentiment it is and stuff like that you see whether it's positive negative and stuff like that all the data is being processed here in this piece of code see there's a complete json file here so this is how you do it okay let's just go back and let's get into vision for now okay so when you say vision it does face detection as well so it helps you understand emotions of people okay let's try and do that as well i think we'll have to upload an image here to understand this part of it okay so um let me just look for a particular image that is there with me i'm sure there should be some image that i have with me i'm gonna go to this pc i'm gonna scroll down So there should be one of my images here. I'm gonna just go ahead and pick this one. Okay. Okay. So when I say submit, let's see what information it gives me about the face. Okay. Yeah, there are the some of the attributes here, right? Um, result detection okay, no this is not giving us the best of results see there has to be more um face verification is one what face verification does is okay this one basically helps you compare two different faces now let's try this one out okay let's select one of my images and let's try and select other images that i have okay okay let's submit this and then let's submit this as well okay the image is too large is what it is saying let's just download two images i'll tell you what images to download Let's call it TM1. Okay. Say save. Let's download this one as well. TM2. Now let us just go ahead and compare these two images. Okay. I say browse. And then I'm going to go back to my downloads and I'm going to search for TM1. You say open. I browse for another image and let's call it TM2 now. Okay. Say open. Let's submit this. Okay there are certain problems here i've done these things using aws as well let me quickly show you with aws as well how do these things work so if we just come back here and scroll down to machine learning services right so you have these services here you have your comprehend which is for the text part that we discussed and uh, i think there's a service called as amazon recognition that aws has which lets us do this okay so there's a face comparison thing where you can compare your faces you see you get all the information here how similar these images are so you can upload two images here as well let's try and see whether it works here say tm1 open and then i say tm2 here so it says 99.9% .9 they are safe right so the software is good i mean these apis are good 
The other thing is also similar. The only problem there was it had sizes that did not fit in there. That is why it was giving us all the errors that we had. Okay. Um, again, there too you have this option of celebrity recognition as well. Okay. Say for example, I put forth the pick here, the same one that we did, right? And it should tell you who that person is. Right, it is hundred percent confident that it is Tom Cruise. Right, that is the image that we look for. So if you try out other images as well, even that would be given to you. Right, there are other things as well here. You can do, to some extent, you can do sentiment analysis as well. Right, you can understand what kind of emotion uh, emotion the person is giving. So when you do facial analysis, it will tell you how happy a person is, how angry it is. See, looks like a face appears to be female, age range, and smiling. Right. So if you take an angry image and put it here, it would give you information on that image as well. So you can do that by using Microsoft Azure as well. Do give it a try, right? Visit here, open these APIs and try how to do it. I'm sure that you'll get to do this, get to try and do these. Okay, guys. So I hope uh, the second demo was fascinating as well. Now we're going to take a look at the third uh, item on the agenda, which is going to be chatbots. As I told you, we're going to take an introduction to chatbots, understand how they were, the evolution of chatbots, uh, and all of that. Once uh, that is done, we can take a look at the hands-on session. But before we get to the hands-on, we need a bit of theoretical knowledge. Let's get started. So, guys, um, since we are talking about chatbots. Let me quickly tell you how communication has evolved, how chatbots have evolved with them, right? Because that is the point of discussion today. So guys, uh, let's try and understand what happened. I believe most of you are aware the fact that you people are attending this session. You must be more or less of my age, lesser or little more as well. So probably you too might have experienced all these things that I, I have experienced. And that is what I'm going to talk about to start with. Now, guys, if I go back to my childhood days, right? Um, I remember my father writing letters. Okay. I was very small then. So my father used to take me to post office where we used to put in those letters, right? Uh, add those stamps on top of it, um, which uh, give a meaning to that letter, right? I mean, oh, what purpose it is for, where do you need to deliver it? Based on that, you have that different stamps. So what we used to do was write letters to people, uh, send it to them, right? Because telephones, mobile phones, mobile phones were not available to be frank and telephones were not very common then. I too did not have a telephone till I was in sixth standard. So that can tell you, right? So we used to write these letters and then these letters used to take days, right? Postman would go and put that letter somewhere, right? To that, uh, the place to, to where it needs to be delivered, right? And it used to take few days, then the person would reply and then, right? The communication would go on. But then we had telephones, right? When people started calling each other, now uh, people could talk to each other through calls, right? And slowly we started moving to mobile phones. Uh, I remember I had my first mobile phone in 2009, 2000, not 2009, 2008 actually. So, and um, there were limited options there. We could send text messages to people, right? Call them through those mobile phones, right? So that also evolved as we moved into like 2012, 13, I think we had WhatsApp that was being used prominently. So we could share images with people. We could share videos with people. And that was like a revolution, right? At least for me, it was, I mean, uh, it was so cool. You could just share your pics. You could tell people what you could do and all those things. So I've seen this transition with time, right? I mean, um, writing right from writing letters to directly sending images to people, telling them as in, okay, what should be done, right? What can you do with it? Or uh, what am I doing right now? I can tell all these things to people in mere minutes, mere seconds, right? So that is how uh, chatting or basically how communication has evolved, right? We do not have to wait for days. We do not have to wait for hours to get in touch with people. Same is here. I mean, I'm working from home. If something is wrong, somebody will directly call me and tell me, can we get this fixed and stuff like that, right? So this is what has changed. And even if we do not um, visit our relatives, people, we can still stay in touch with them without visiting them for like six months, nine months. And that is possible because of the way in which media communication and technology has evolved. But then have we stopped at that? No, right? Uh, now this way of communication is also being used in business. You can reach out to people through mobile phones. You can reach out to people on calls, right? And uh, one more advanced approach towards is having bots or chatbots that can actually communicate with you. 
a very common example would be uh, since i'm based in india i would be giving an example that concerns indian people right or indian audiences because uh, i can more relate to it uh, but do not worry people from other parts of the world will also be able to relate to this so we have this uh, um food delivery app called as zomato so based on which we can place order for food right and the delivery guy reaches out to that restaurant picks up my order and delivers it to me in the interim if something goes wrong i can always chat with people right when you talk about zomato these are uh, i mean what happens is initially when i put forth a message i get an instance reply saying that select what is your problem then i select my problem then i get deeper and then they connect me to an actual agent right somebody who can deal with me as a customer support agent right so meanwhile before that customer agent support or support agent basically connects to me i am conversing with a bot right this is nothing but a machine that has predefined set of replies that it can give to me and i'm actually um chatting with this uh, bot and unless and until i connect to an agent i do not get a reply on these pointers right so uh, when you talk about these chatbots basically their job is to make business processes easy so this is a new advancement when you talk about chatbots as we move further we'll be discussing chatbots do not worry about that but this is how i feel communication has evolved with time okay so let us go ahead and understand the term chatbots a little more right i gave you an example of zomato app now there are quite a few other apps to give you another example if you um, try to read articles online right you visit a particular website now most of these articles are related to, to some learning institute right some organization that is either having certification courses some plans or something like that right so when i look for maybe an article let's assume we are talking about cloud computing so if i go around looking for an aws article so again if i open a particular article there, there would be an instant pop up saying as in do you need any assistance can i guide you through some of the other articles can i guide you through some courses that we have right so what are these these instant pop ups are nothing but your chatbots right and the reason we use chatbots is they make our life easy right end of the day as a human all we want is less amount of work that we do that is why we use machines right we use laptops because we do not have to sit and use pen and paper which can be a tedious task right uh we have fans because we do not want to blow air for somebody manually right as simple as that so all these machines are aim is to make our life easy right get rid of all the mundane activities that we do and that is what chatbots are for so guys let's quickly take a look at the definition here and i'll try and explain that definition a little more okay and i apologize for the noise happening around guys uh, this is a bright afternoon right now here and there are quite a few people i live in an open space that is close to main road so that is why there is a lot of noise happening around so i apologize for that and there's also a construction that is happening uh, but i'll ensure that this session goes smoothly and without any streaming effects so talking about chatbots guys uh, it these are nothing but your software basically that um, lets you simulate a conversation or a chat with a user using natural language so did somebody ask me about natural language processing so yes the bot we are going to create will also use it to some extent but we are not going to discuss that in detail what it also does is um, it lets you or it resides on a website mobile phone or applications and basically it gives you manual replies or human like replies to the questions that you have and these bots are basically trained on certain pointers or they have certain database or data that they are based on and when you throw in a question to them they actually look into that database that data source and try to fetch information out of it so that they can reply to you aptly right so there are your standard bots and there are your self learning bots right so when you talk about a standard bot a standard bot is nothing but a bot that i just mentioned right there would be a simple um data set with me that i give it to this bot it uh, basically uh, replies to me or if i throw in a particular query it would reply to me based on the data i fit to it right i mean it would be having some standard set of questions that we fit to it which there would be some standard set of replies and if i put in that question or that keyword this bot will reply to me with the answer that is stored with it right so uh, say for example the zomato bot that i just mentioned right 
uh, what it does is when I actually have a query, it will give me three to four options. And after that, it would ask me, do you want to connect to a customer agent? Because uh, it is not trained that deeply to be self-learning or to be self-smart enough to give a solution to my problem. Now, this is where self-learning bot comes into picture. When you talk about a self-learning bot, they are mostly based on AI practices, right? These bots understand your requirements. And uh, when I say understand, again, these are trained, continuously trained with data, more and more data, more and more data. So when a particular question comes in, uh, at times they know what to reply and they could adapt to some of these replies. So this is what a self-learning bot is. Again, let's not get into the details of these pointers. There's a lot that can be talked about them. But since we are in a process of creating a chatbot today, I would want to keep this discussion as short as possible. So let us move ahead and try to understand the service that Microsoft Azure offers that lets us create these chatbots. Now that service is called as Azure Bot Service. Okay. So when you talk about Azure Bot Service, again, it is used to develop intelligent enterprise grade bots that help you enrich the customer experience while maintaining control over your data. Okay. So uh, basically what this service does is it lets you create bots. It has quite a few templates, ready to use templates. You have to just put in some data and your template bot is ready. You do not have to sit and code for it. There's also a platform that is available. I mean, you can choose whether you want to use what kind of programming language to create this bot. There are certain options that are given to use um, for you to use and you can use one of those options and create these bots, right? If you already have a bot with you, you can actually migrate that to Microsoft Azure to um, use it on top of Microsoft Azure. So when you talk about Azure bot service, it is this app that lets you create these web app bots. Now what the text on the screen has to say, it says build any type of bot from QA bot to your own branded virtual assistant, right? To quickly connect to your users and give answers to the questions that they need, right? So um, that is what I mean. When you say a Q&A bot, this is where you'll put forth a question and your bot is supposed to reply with you an answer that is relevant to the question that the user has asked. So there are quite a few bots that you can create using Azure bot service. We are going to create a normal bot, give it some data, and then we're going to publish that bot. Once that is done, we will actually go ahead and connect it to a Facebook messenger. So guys, I believe um, Azure bot service in general is clear to you people. And uh, I believe all the pointers that I've talked about are also clear to you people. So guys, this is going to be the final demo for this particular module. We're going to be creating a complete end-to-end -end chatbot my making use of Microsoft Azure. It's going to be a fantastic one. You guys should definitely be doing it side by side alongside uh, me, right? So let's get started. So guys, uh, first pointer that I would like to put forth is when you create a chatbot, right? I mentioned the fact that it needs some data source. Okay. Uh, when I say a data source, some data based on which it would answer your question, right? My bot is not uh, God gifted where it's going to just go ahead and answer whatever question I throw to it, right? It should have some data source which it can learn to, right? So the uh, first thing that we are going to do is now we are going to create that um, knowledge base first, that data source first. Once we have that data source, we'll create a bot. Once a bot is ready, uh, in the process, we'll also create an application on Facebook quickly. Okay. And once the application is ready, we are going to connect that application um, through a chatbot using Facebook Messenger. Okay. So this is in short, the things that we are going to do now. I believe the agenda is clear to all of you. So guys, let us go ahead and see um, how do we create our uh, knowledge base in first place, right? So guys, there's a link it's called as QA maker.ai, right? You can see it here on the screen. Okay, there you go. So it has opened finally. Guys, but I'm gonna just quickly sign out and sign in again. The reason I'm doing this is um, again, if uh, your QA maker does not know what account you're signed in from, it creates problems. So that is why I want to sign in. I faced quite a few problems day before yesterday when I was trying to create a chatbot. So this is my demo account, which I use for all the demo sessions that I do. Let me quickly sign into it. Okay. So guys, let us go ahead and 
create a chatbot. So here, when I click on create a knowledge base, it says you need a QA service first, right? So I'm creating this knowledge base for my Microsoft Azure bot. So I need a QA service. Uh, that can handle this knowledge base that I'm trying to create. So how do I do that? I click on create QA service. Okay, so once I click on that, it will take me to Microsoft Azure. Okay, again, I'll have to sign up and it will throw in a code on my mobile phone. Once I enter that code, I should be logged into my Microsoft Azure account. So it would directly take me to this ML service which says QA service, QA maker, right? And there all I have to do is enter the details. So with Microsoft Azure, I get these many credits in Indian rupees when I sign up for a free tier account. So it is somewhere around 13,300 or 600 credits. I've used like 1,300 credits already, okay? Not already as it in my past. This session, we haven't used any credits yet. So let us name our bot something. Let's call it Azure Demo Bot. The demo bot and use a number guys because normally these names are taken subscription it is free tier pricing tier i want free again and azure search pricing tier again free okay okay resource group guys i normally keep the resource group name same as my chatbot name now what is a resource group resource group is nothing but guys when you create any resource on these cloud platforms like Azure and AWS, they let you have a resource group in which all the data similar to a particular resource is put in that group. So when you delete that resource, the group also gets lost with it, right? Uh, what this does is this lets you get rid of all the resources that are there in first place. And also you can track these resources using this particular group. So that is why we have this uh, Azure demo bot uh, resource group that we are creating. Again, guys, the region, okay, uh, be specific, use all the regions in one place or use one region throughout. The reason I'm doing that is guys, I tried creating this bot day before yesterday and due to these regions, I faced a lot of problem. I would be using US West, West, sorry, two. So I'm going to cross check if everything is in place here. Um, US West 2 again and finally US West 2. So guys, uh, let's quickly verify this. It's free trial, free trial, user demo, West US 2, West US 2, West US 2 and West US 2 and I say create. So guys, my chatbot would be created here, not chatbot, I'm creating a QA service right now. So this is something that will handle our um, knowledge base. Before we do that, uh, meanwhile, since it's gonna take a minute or two, uh, let me quickly go ahead and move to Facebook and let's create an app there, a page there, okay? So guys, I'm gonna log into my Facebook account and I'm gonna just say, create a page, okay? So let's create a template page. Let's say get started. And let me have a business page in place. Um, page name, let it be Azure Bot 321. Category, let's say education, since we are trying to use it for the demo sake, and I say continue. It says add a profile picture, guys. Get a profile picture added because otherwise um, what happens is later on it asks you to add a picture or something i've been through all that i'm just gonna go ahead and add some uh, random pick of mine i normally need these pictures for the live session the ones that you see on youtube right um upload a cover photo as well let's upload the same thing there you go and guys, uh, just like that, your page is created. Okay. So guys in this page, when you scroll down here and click on about, we'll be having a page ID here. This is something that we would be needing. Make sure that you have a text document open with you because there's going to be a lot of sharing of information. So you might want to copy that information and move it around. So have a text document open just like I have done here. Okay. Now 
my bot is ready and it has been deployed. Let me refresh this page first. And let me go back to my Q&A service. Guys, if you are confused, do not worry. I again would be repeating some of these pointers so that you feel connected. I hope that we all are moving smoothly and you all are following me. Okay, so let's pray that we do not face that problem that I faced the last time around. This thing accepts my free tier chatbot. For some reason, it just refused to accept my free tier chatbot the last time I created it. Because if that happens, then we'll have to go ahead with a bot that is without the knowledge base, something that I do not want to do. Okay, the refreshing thing takes time. There you go, guys. The problem is persistent. I constantly get this problem, something that is very irritating. So let's see whether this can be worked. If this does not work, guys, I'm going to just go ahead and create a simple template bot and uh, we'll just connect it to our uh, Facebook then. But if we can connect it through a knowledge base, what that would do is we can select a knowledge base here as in we can decide what data to give to it. That is why I want this to work. But this is something that has been giving me a lot of trouble as I've mentioned since yesterday, right? Since day before yesterday, to be frank. Can we integrate chatbot with any Azure hosted website? Uh, there's room to do that. Okay, no. So we are still persistent with this problem. Right. So let me quickly just log out and sign in again. Let's see if it works. Because I've created a bot, it is just refusing to connect to that bot. That is the problem. You can see the bot is ready. But what this does is it is not letting me select my subscription part. Um, why that is happening, I'm not aware about that. This is something that I've been facing since yesterday. So let's give it a one more try. See if we can get this part sorted. Meanwhile, let me just refresh this part as well. I'm hopeful that once I refresh it, we can actually go ahead and create or connect it to this app. The fact that internet is working this slow, it is again, uh, probably slowing down our process in all together, but do not worry. I'll get your problem solved and I'll ensure that you all go home with a happy and satisfied dome, uh, demo. Okay. So do not worry about that. Okay. Let's hope that this time around we can connect to it. Default directory. Nope. For some reason it says, no, we won't let you do that. So guys, let's do one thing. Let's quickly uh, give it one more try. We can spend like two to three minutes for sure. I'm sure. So let's repeat this, these steps. It's still, if it still does not work, then we'll just create a sample bot and connect it to a Facebook thing. Okay. So let me try and delete all these resources because at a time you are only allowed to use one free bot. Okay. Just say yes here. So guys, again, the reason we are having a knowledge base is because we want our chatbot to have some data it can react to, right? If this does not work out for us, then we'll have to create an echo bot. Echo bot is something that when you type something, it just replies with the same comment, right? But if you have a knowledge based chatbot, it will reply to your questions based on the database that I have given to it. Okay. So let's just go ahead and see if we can create a QA service again. This time I'm hopeful we would be able to connect. So I'm going to randomly name this board guys. Do not take these names very seriously. I'm bad at naming conventions. Uh, pricing tier, it would be this again. Create, add this, say OK. Again, the regions part, let's just go ahead and have it in one region. The reason I'm choosing West US is it gave me success after trying a lot. So I'm still sticking to that US West 2.
okay so us west to us west to us west to and one more time we need us west to so since it is us west to everywhere it is free tier free trial new demo and okay so guys this will take another two minutes so meanwhile let us do one thing let's not waste our time now since we have a page we also need a facebook app on which we can host this page through which we can communicate to our chatbot right so guys for this what i'm going to do is i'm going to get into developers.facebook.com okay so this is where you can create your own app so meanwhile our bot gets ready let us try and create an app okay so my apps if i click on my app there should not be any app i'm gonna create new year so again business integrations say yes uh, let's name it demo session app just me and people in the industry and say create an id are you a robot no i'm not uh crosswalks one two three and that's it let's say verify there you go and i say submit so guys my web app would be created okay so meanwhile my bot is ready there or meanwhile um okay it's still getting created guys this is how it gets created when you talk about um microsoft azure uh, you see all the deployment process here and you can see that it is getting deployed down here right so i'm gonna click on refresh guys pray to god that we get this sorted if not we'll just go ahead and create a simple bot and connect it okay uh, meanwhile if you talk about this uh, knowledge base uh, we can actually go ahead and put in data from uh, anything if i were to put data let's say Azure FAQs is what I'll pick. Okay, I'll just copy this thing and let's see if it works here or not. Okay. So let's just refresh this once. If it does not work, then we are off to creating our chatbot uh, using direct our web app bot service or Azure bot service. We are not going to spend our time doing this. selected a tenant here uh, no it's not working for me guys so i'm gonna just uh, let go of this whole subscription thing let's just go ahead and move to microsoft azure okay and let's just create a simple chatbot and connect that chatbot to our uh, uh, to our facebook app right so how do we do that for that first we'll just go back to our dashboard we'll get rid of all these resources that we've connected and after that we'll create a chatbot using azure bot service so let me just go ahead and say delete i say yes and it's deleted should not take more than a minute there you go everything is clear now guys so i go back to dashboard uh, here i'll go into my resources say create a resource i'll go to ai plus machine learning and there should be web app bot so let's say demo session bot three to one free trier resource group create a new one copy the name and paste it there say ok there you go region again i'm gonna stick to my the region that is not working for me after having tried daily for it west us2 rising tier 10k messages even if it is premium it should not be a problem I have quite a few free credits that are there. Guys, I would be creating an echo bot here. Echo bot is something that does not need your knowledge base. It replies, whatever you type in there, it replies with the same keyword back to you. But when you add a knowledge base that I just was trying to do that, 
it will take data from the knowledge base okay so you have an option of choosing few things here let's go ahead and create this dotnet bot let's not spend too much time here if i click on it you will see that there are some options you can have qna bots you can have basic bot as well right so it lets you do this bot analysis and stuff as well okay so let's just go ahead and create an echo bot right now okay um region us west 2 oh no okay so most of it appears to be in place skip premium us west is in one region okay hmm. this is the only thing that we need to change now let's say us west 2 and let's say create okay now i say create so it's validating guys and it will create a bot now so guys once the bot is ready we should be able to connect it to facebook bot name is demo 321 guys remember the bot name because we are going to use this it is demo 321 is the handle name that we would be using since it's going to take a couple of minutes guys for this bot to get created let us go ahead and look into our application that we have created right i tried very hard to connect it to the knowledge base but i could not let's try and do it differently meanwhile let me see what are the questions yeah for more and now deepak ki i'll answer that question to you once the bot is ready okay uh, pranesh you also says you are really working hard to bring some changes in education system your contents are really helping a lot uh, of struggling students thank you for that guys if you have any questions make sure your questions keep coming I know last half a minute has been little dull. Let's try to make it little more interesting. Let your opinions keep coming. Um, we'll talk about quite a few pointers. Do not worry about that. Okay. So, um, can we get a course use course on use of ML and AI in geoinformatics? Satyam, I'll come into that. There are quite a few courses that we have at Great Learning. <coughs> Sorry for that. That basically work on machine learning and stuff. I'll guide you to that. Do not worry about that. uh guys there are other questions as well but let's quickly take a look at the demo part now so guys what we've done is we've created a chatbot already okay i wanted to connect it to knowledge base but i could not do that so i've created a simple bot that might not reply to my query but when it replies it will reply to whatever i've said that is what an echo bot it bot bot is whatever you say it echoes to that bot it is a simpler application so we are going to attach that bot to our facebook app that we just created so i created a page called as demo session right sorry azure bot 321 is the name of my page which is here right uh what i'm going to do is i'm going to move into this app that we just created and in that we are going to copy some data guys now the process that we are going to do is we are going to connect this application and this page to our azure chatbot right that we just created or something that is getting created now right in the background so meanwhile let us get some data that we need to connect to our chatbot let's see what is that data okay okay so when you click on settings you have two options first we go to basic guys in this setting i need two important things okay one is my application id using this application id i can actually connect to the bot that i create so i paste it here i and i keep it on hold as i mentioned make sure that you all have a text file open with you people because guys this text file is important okay let's say submit because we'll be doing a lot of copying and pasting things so i need a text file for you people to be open if you're doing it with me parallelly 
सो आई हैव माई फेसबुक आई डी एंड आई हैव माई सीक्रेट की आई नीड टू गो टू एडवांस फर्स्ट एंड इन एडवांस वॉट एम गोन डू इज सी गाइज आई हैव टू स्क्रोल डाउन या अलाउ ए पी आई एक्सेस टू एप सेटिंग्स राइट बिकॉज आई एम ट्राइंग टू कनेक्ट टू अ पर्टिकुलर चैट बॉर्ड राइट विच आई गेट इज एन एप्लीकेशन सो आई नीड टू एंश्योर आई डू दैट एंड इज देर एनीथिंग एल्स दैट वी नीड टू डू यर नो वी जस्ट से सेव चेंजेस ओके सो आई वेंट टू दी बेसिक सेटिंग आई गॉट दी डेटा आई वेंट टू एडवांस सेटिंग एंड आई क्लिक ऑन ए पी आई सेटिंग्स ऑन राइट सी माई ए पी आई सेटिंग्स आर ऑन यर एंड आई सेव डेट ओके नाउ नेक्स्ट वॉट वी डू इज गाइज वी एक्चुअली नीड टू गो बैक टू द डैशबोर्ड इन दी डैशबोर्ड एम गोना स्क्रोल डाउन नाउ आई वॉन्ट टू सेट अप माई फेसबुक मैसेंजर ओके सो आई क्लिक ऑन सेट अप फेसबुक मैसेंजर सो गाइज दे क्वाइट अ फ्यू स्टेप्स यूर मेक श्योर यू पे अटेंशन टू द डिटेल्स दैट वी आर गोना डू नाउ आई नीड टू गेट एन एक्सेस टोकन ओके दैट मीन्स सी वॉट आई डू इज I own a particular Facebook page. I need to have access to that page and to the chatbot that I'm creating. So I need to add my page here. So I'm gonna say add or remove the page. So I'm gonna just go to my Facebook account. When I click on add that page, it takes me to my Facebook. I say continue as Vishal, and this is the page that I have. That is the only page that is suggesting me. I say next. It says uh, it might not work properly if you turn. of these things so i'm not going to turn off any of these things right it's on so let's just say done so guys it will connect i'm linked to my demo session app on facebook okay you can see the data is here and my uh, page id is here guys okay so now i say generate a token i say i understand and i keep this token copied this token is important guys okay make sure you copy this token and keep it with you so guys my basic app setting is in place already now what do i have to do next okay so i have to connect to my web hooks what are web hooks i'll tell you but before that since i have all this information i have my facebook details let us add those details to my bot right because i'm integrating my bot with my facebook so to do that i'll have to go to my uh, we don't need this qna maker now uh, we we'll, we are just going to go ahead and switch into our chat bot okay go to the resource you can pin it to the dashboard if you want to access it quickly but let's just say go to the resource now in this resource guys there are quite a few things right i can test my chat bot as well let us quickly test it it's not very intelligent since it is an echo bot it will just echo back whatever i've said because we could not connect to the knowledge source let's just say hi hello and welcome so echo says hi right so there's an echo so i say support it will also say support why because it is an echo bot it echoes whatever you say right okay so guys let's go back to the channels when i click on channel this is where i can connect it to my facebook so let's just say facebook now guys this is where i have to enter all the information that i just copied first thing is i just copied a access token let me copy it here so this is done with now what i need is my facebook app id right so this is something that i copied it here so guys this facebook app id is available in the basic setting of your facebook app so make sure you copy it from there keep it somewhere and paste it here okay again i need my secret app key once i add these things i know that this bot is something that i can connect to now the last thing that i need is page id where is the page id guys do you remember where the page id is i had told you that we have a page id something that we'd be needing later do you remember where it is if yes let me know in the comment section quickly Okay so we go back to our demo page right on Facebook and if i scroll down you'll see the page id here let's copy this page id quickly and quickly let us go back to our bot there you go i enter the page id guys now i have actually i entered my facebook app id app secret key page access token that we generated when we um, connected our facebook page to the app 
and the page ID from the Facebook page that I have. Now I need two important things that I would be using later. So I copied from here. This is the thing guys. Uh, this is your callback URL. I'll tell you what a callback URL is. Do not worry. So I do not need this now. I've pasted my callback URL. So guys, there are a lot of copying and pasting things. So you might wonder what is Vishal doing here? Do not worry. I'll answer all your questions one by one. We'll discuss these pointers as to why am I copying these things. So guys, what I have done now is I've copied all the Facebook details that I had as in Facebook ID and stuff. So my chatbot knows that this is the page, this is the ID, this is the token using which I have to connect to the application and the application page on Facebook, right? So it will use that information. Now this callback information, right? Now for communicating between two applications, we need webhooks. So what are webhooks? Basically, they let you do the messaging part or the communication part between two devices. So for my Facebook page to communicate with this thing. Now my app can communicate, sorry, my chatbot can communicate with my Facebook now because I've entered the Facebook details here, but my Facebook also needs to communicate back to the chatbot, right? For that, I would be needing callback details. So this is where my Facebook would be calling back. Hence I've copied the URL and the verify token. Now I say save. So guys, our page is created. Now I have to go back to my app. In this app, there are quite a few things that I would be doing. Uh, first thing that we go is we go to messenger settings. In the messenger settings, I scroll down. I say add callback URL here. So this is where I have to enter the details. So I copy this control C. I enter it here. I again go back to the page. I copy this data. Say control C. I paste it here and I say verify and save. So guys, now these are some final steps that we have to do. Okay. Let's quickly get these out of way. And I say add subscriptions. Now this is the way I want to communicate. Okay. So post packs, options, reads and deliveries. I say save. Okay. And these are few basic details. Do you want it to support NLP? Yes. I say on. I scroll down. Okay. And this is where default language is English. And these are few formalities guys. This is not very important. Pages messaging. I'll say add 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 all these submissions guys okay and you'll have to enter some data here you read through it later it's not very important details agree send and respond to messages and say save select a page what is the page as a bot let's say save okay we are almost there guys close to getting it done. Do not worry. Why do you need act? Okay. I need, I'm going to copy this guys and paste it here. This is a sample question that it will throw in. I'm just going to add same details everywhere. I do not want to spend too much time doing this. And the final one. Two minutes and we will be having our bot connected to our Facebook thing. And now I say submit for review. I cannot submit it to review. Why is that? Could it be because of this page? Let's delete this. Do not need it. Okay. There are some formalities that I need to fulfill here. That is the reason. Let's see what are those formalities. So guys, I say there are these three informations that is missing here. One is it says add an icon. So let's just add the same icon that I added. Okay. The image is added. Choose a category. It is education. And I need one final thing that says policy URL sample.tv. This is not important guys. You can enter anything here. Now that it is done, I should be having access to publishing this thing. Let me quickly refresh it. 
and see if I can publish this thing now. Okay, everything in place. In place, I say submit. I accept and I say submit. I say OK. There's some review that it needs because it says that it is an organization account. I'm going to skip that. It's not very important because it is a demo page. Let's not get into the details. So guys, I've put this app into development now. That means it should be ready to use. OK, so let us just go back here. Go back to our channels again. Right. So when I click on channels. OK, I need to refresh this thing. Yep, I click on Facebook. This is where I wanted to connect to, right? And it will direct me to my messenger. In my messenger, you can see that my Azure app is available to me. If I say hi, it would say hi and welcome and it will reply back to me with an echo again. Right? So it is replying me to here, right? So basically guys, when you, the everybody asked me as in why, what is the difference between connecting a knowledge base here? Guys, the difference here is when you connect a knowledge base, your bot replies to your questions based on the question that you've thrown. So I was going to add the Azure FAQs thing to my knowledge base. So if we were able to connect to that knowledge base, what it would have done is if I throw in a question that relates to these topics, say for example, if I type support, so it will give me all the details that Azure support has, support has to offer to me. But unfortunately, we could not do that and we had to connect an eco bot. So what an eco bot does is it replies to whatever I type with the same reply. But with a knowledge base bot, if we were able to connect it, it would have replied. If I had said support, it would have given me support. If I had connected that FAQs thing, it would have given me Azure support details here. Okay. So that is what it does. And to give you or show you another thing, if I go back to my page here, right? You can see that I'm actually getting the notifications here that people are trying to communicate with me. There you go. So guys, since it has said, uh, let me give you a simple example. This works manually as well. Let's see. I type. Hello. Tell me about your page. So if I come back here, it has replied by echo. I can also reply something like this. Maybe later. I'm doing this manually now. So I'll get a reply here saying maybe later. There you go. So guys, that is the only down part of this session that we were not able to connect to this QA maker knowledge base. Had we done that, we would have gotten more apt replies to whatever we would expect. Okay. QA service is a Azure service that lets you have a knowledge base connected to a chatbot. Now, what is a knowledge base? See guys, uh, as I've already mentioned, a chatbot needs information based on which it is going to reply to you. If I have a Zomato app, I need to know about the restaurants or the common practices that Zomato follows, right? So I'll be feeding in a database to my chatbot. In this case, it is called as knowledge base. To create a knowledge base, I have to create an Azure service. I click on create QA. And we follow the steps that we did at the starting of the process or starting of the session, right? Unfortunately, since it was, it was not accepting that session for some un unforeseen reason, it works. Try it yourself. It definitely works. Uh, once you create a resource, then you have to select all the details here and then you can connect to your bot. Okay. If I say this, see, I still do not get an option. You'll get an option here of your uh, legitimate subscription. If it is paid, it works more smoothly. Uh, and then you enter the URL to your knowledge base. Now, when I say URL, if I put in this URL here, okay. And if I paste it here, I'm sorry for that. If I just paste it here, right. And I say enable multi-term extraction. That means each time I put in a question, it would reply to me multiple times. Okay. 
not multiple times, but for multiple queries, it will keep replying to me. So I can put forth my knowledge base link here. Okay. And once you do that, you say or choose the type of bot you want, whether it's friendly, professional, something like that. And then it gives you an option of creating a chat bot, something that we did going ahead, right? So this is what a knowledge base is and this is what it lets you do. Okay. So how do I go on uh, to learn more about uh, the, cloud, the cloud computing world or any other domain uh, as such, right? Guys, I have an important piece of advice for all of you all. There is a lot of content on the web. If you just go on to Google and type learn cloud computing, you will be given millions of articles by before even you can snap your finger, right? This is a good thing and a bad thing. Good thing is that you have access to a lot of material. The bad thing here is that if you do not know how to navigate across these material and how to effectively grasp them, it becomes very, very difficult because there is so much to learn here. It can get confusing really quick and it can get tiring and you guys can quit. Our job here at Great Learning is to make sure that, you know, you guys see through whatever it is that you have started, that you guys complete all the courses, you guys complete your learning. And as always, right, whenever you're talking to us, as experts here, uh, you know, we are subject matter experts. Uh, we completely know the subject in and out. So whenever you talk to us, we will uh, give you the aspect of what the industry wants. So when we give you our views based upon uh, the exact requirement in the industry, it will add a huge amount of advantage to your particular learning, right? So whenever we have these live sessions, that's why I always suggest subscribe to the Great Learning YouTube channel and make sure you guys are tuning in for this session. If you subscribe and hit that bell, the second we put out a video, you you guys will be notified of it. So you can join us that instant, you can learn and you can take away a fantastic amount of knowledge with the sessions, right? Perfect. Now to talk about uh, the free content we have on cloud computing, guys, there are three platforms where you definitely can take away a good amount of knowledge. Uh, first, we have Great Learning Academy. Great Learning Academy is a place where 200 plus courses taught by subject matter experts. You can learn for free, get a certificate of completion absolutely free of cost as well. There's no hidden charges there. Are, first of all, there's no charges there at all, right? The second thing is the Great Learning YouTube channel as you have tuned in and, uh, you know, as all of our beloved audience always absolutely Absolutely love to join us on all our sessions. I am sure, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we hope uh, that you guys are having a fantastic ride with us here at Great Learning, right? Perfect. The third thing is for all the people who absolutely love reading. Now, I am a person who loves reading. So, uh, you know, again, we have blogs written by subject matter experts that you guys can definitely check out. So based on what it is that you want to do, if you want a certificate of completion, look at Great Learning Academy. If you want, uh, you know, comprehensively put together courses, live sessions, uh, expert sessions, talk shows, whatever it is guys make sure you guys are subscribing to the great learning youtube channel right now coming to this part where i told you that uh, you know i'm going to be guiding you guys on how you can become experts in cloud computing all these particular free content uh, you know they are fantastic they're uh, keeping you in mind your time uh, you know our efforts all of these things make sure that you guys are getting the best uh, uh, you know learning material possible as you can see here right but then uh, if you guys have to go from being complete beginners and then go all the way to becoming an expert i highly suggest uh, you know you guys put your efforts uh, into working on a post graduation program we have here at great learning now this is india's first mentorship driven program this is a six month program done in collaboration uh, with the great lakes executive learning powered by aws uh, educate of course uh, you know we can talk about this for a lot of uh, different, uh, uh, you know, we can go on hours and hours to talk to you about why, uh, you know, this program is fantastic. But if you go on to head to this particular page, you will see, uh, you know, you'll be learning 90 plus cloud services. You'll be learning AWS, you'll be learning Azure, you'll be learning GCP, you'll be learning DevOps, you'll be working on 15 plus hands-on project, ladies and gentlemen. And of course, the most advantage that this program is going to add is uh, because of the live, uh, you know, personalized mentorships, right? So we have 100 plus hours of instructional content. We have live sessions. You will be taught by some of the most fantastic uh, faculty out there, right? Okay, so this is a certificate. Uh, this is what the certificate looks like. It's from Great Lakes Executive Learning. It'll have your name. It'll say you're a person who completed the postgraduate program in cloud computing, right? Now, guys, when we take a look at the curriculum out here, first of all, you will have to 
master the basics thoroughly so we have complete foundations courses with multiple different modules uh, each of these modules you can check out what it is that you will learn all the quizzes all the projects you'll be doing and then we're going to take a look at aws we're going to take a look at azure in detail and then we're going to take a look at gcp in uh, detail as well right so this is a cloud computing course uh, you know this is a cloud computing program which will get you started with both uh, aws and azure and if you think that's the end of it no you will also uh, get complete uh, you know have a self paced uh, program on the google cloud platform as well there's a lot of things to learn and at the end of it you will be completing a capstone project now a capstone project is going to add immense amount of value to your resume right now guys you can find out a lot of different things for example you can find out the details of which project you guys will be working on all of that as i mentioned uh, you guys will be learning from leading academicians in this particular field these guys are uh, uh, you know top practitioners from all these top organization these guys are thorough expert uh, you know in all of these particular uh, concepts right so be it faculties be it mentors uh, you know you are getting the best of your time and money ladies and gentlemen you know there are many many advantages you can check out the reviews you can check out the testimonials and all of that and at the end of it right guys since this is a program which is comprehensively put together to make sure you guys become thorough experts it is six months long and it is 300 plus hours of learning with 90 plus cloud services and multiple multiple other benefits it's you can get all the details of it on our greatlearning.in website make sure you guys are uh, you know reaching out to our experts here at great learning there's an application process for this program you'll have to fill an application form and there's a, there's going to be a short interview process at the screening call after which there are limited seats uh, you know you'll be rolled out an offer letter to join these particular uh, courses guys okay, so there's multiple deadlines as you can see there's a deadline tomorrow there's multiple batches uh, starting soon as you keep scrolling down you can find out more faqs or also called as frequently asked questions and all of that but i'm sure at the end of it you guys will have more questions right so you can put on your name email and your phone number and you can submit it we will make sure uh you know in the next four hours as soon as you do this it is usually the next moment as soon as you go on to do this we'll make sure our experts uh, are in touch with you and they can guide you completely about the program right in the meantime you can check out the website you can download the brochure and i and i believe that this program is going to add a lot of value uh into your life especially now that you guys are looking towards cloud specializations right so guys, I hope you were able to complete all the three demos that were shown in this particular module. Now we discussed a lot of things here, right guys? We started out uh, by checking out what is WordPress and we created a simple website, hosted it on Azure and we made sure that everything was working fine. Secondly, we understood machine learning, types of machine learning algorithms, the implementation, development, deployment of machine learning algorithms on the Azure platform. Third, we also made sure that uh, we have an understanding of chatbots, evolution of chatbots, theoretical aspect of things, how we it works and also a comprehensive demo uh, that will help you create your own chatbot and host it on Azure, right? So guys, with this, I believe that, uh, you know, we have covered a good amount of detail with respect to Microsoft Azure and that you guys followed through everything that was covered in this particular module, right? All right, guys, you've come to the end of this module uh, and I'll see you on the next one. All right, guys, welcome to module number eight. So with the previous modules, I hope that you have a good amount of knowledge with respect to using AWS, with respect to using Azure. Now in module number eight, similarly, we're going to be taking a look at the Google Cloud platform, right? So quickly, here's the agenda for this particular module. We'll start out by taking an understanding of what the GCP global infrastructure is like. This is a very important part of this particular module, after which we're going to practically walk through and take a look at the user interface of how, you know, you guys can actually start working uh, with GCP after which guys again we're going to take a look at one very important reason why GCP is very popular it's because of its Google cloud storage uh, you know as we already discussed in terms of big data and in terms of storage Google is the most popular platform out there so of course it adds a lot of value to uh, you know have a demo on it so we're going to be having a small demo where we're going to be discussing uh, you know about the cloud storage services in GCP as well guys so without further ado let's get started so the first item on the agenda is introduction to GCP global infrastructure. So let's take a look at that. When you talk about GCP or talk about any cloud platform, right? How it operates is what it does is it strategically puts its data centers in different parts of the world. To give you an example, let's assume that you are based in maybe South Africa. Okay. So it would be wise if there's a data center in South Africa, which is close to you, right? So people in South Africa can um, have access to those resources easily, right? What this means is 
you can keep your business close to you and if your audience is in south africa in that case these people when they're accessing your data the latency would be lesser for them so that is why it is important to make sure that the data centers are located in different parts of the world now the image that you see on the screen is not correct this is a wrong image that we've put forth here that was an accident that happened so you may ignore that but do not worry we'll discuss these pointers in detail and i'll give you an idea so you won't miss out on anything okay so do not refer that image that i just removed okay so um when you talk about a uh, gcp regions so regions are nothing but these are strategic locations where gcp or google cloud platform plans to put their resources their data centers okay so um, when you put forth these data centers in different parts of the world you are basically ensuring that your data is available across the globe and uh, people find it easier to use a platform to give you another example let's assume that there are two data centers maybe in america okay so um, what people can do is they can actually go ahead and back up their data in different regions this is where availability comes into picture now you might ask what is availability vishal so availability is nothing it is the process where uh, you ensure that your data is always available to give you an example let's assume that we have netflix right netflix resides on amazon web services cloud platform now netflix is something that has gained momentum in recent times due to corona obviously so all of us are using netflix we are streaming netflix and the data is always available if you have internet you can always watch movies from there how does this streaming happen so smoothly the point to note here is the data is always available why because it is backed up in different regions so if one of the data centers goes down you would always have a copy somewhere that is there which you can just start switching to and start operating from there so as a user you won't be having any downtime right these platforms are highly available they hardly go down like 20 minutes in a complete year's time and that too won't be noticeable for you if that happens i'm telling you it might not happen as well okay so if it goes down it might go down for like 20 minutes to the max throughout the year so that is what tells you how available these resources are so in case if there's a calamity as well you can always back up your data let's assume that you are residing in a region which is maybe volcano prone earthquake prone right and uh, you're forced to put your data there for some reason so you can always back up your data somewhere else so uh, somewhere around maybe 200 kilometers from there or some other place because these uh, data centers are located at a strategic position they are put forth at a distance like 60 kilometers or 100 kilometers 150 kilometers 200 kilometers so that um, if one of the region gets affected affected the others would still be safe okay so even if you are in a region that is prone to these natural calamities if you back it up somewhere if this region goes down you can always switch to the other region that is what availability means i hope i've answered that point for you people and disaster recovery has also been explained here if there's a disaster you have a backup somewhere you can recover your recover your data right away so that is what regions are all about okay and then the next point is your zones so guys understand one thing the geographical region where you plan to put your data it is called as a region suppose if gcp has region in n country so um or data center in n country so the place the region where the data center lies is called as gcp region for strategical or logical um regioning okay so um when you say a gcp region it is nothing but a geographical location where the data center lies and the place where the data center lies or the data center itself is called as an availability zone or a zone that means let's assume that a particular region has two data centers you would say that this particular region has two gcp zones now these zones are connected by low latency network so if there are two regions in one particular sorry if there are two zones or availability zones or data centers in a particular region let's assume that we have a region called as x in that x region we have two zones now these two zones inside the region are connected by low latency network ensuring there is a fast transfer of data between these two zones you can also connect to zones that are located in other regions by using something called as a local zone okay so this is how the global infrastructure of gcp looks like 
I'm sorry you cannot see it on the screen because uh, there was a wrong image there but this is how it is and um, the other important point that you need to note here is when you talk about GCP is it has like 34 not 34 sorry 61 zones across the globe and it serves in 35 logical regions across the globe. All right, guys, now that we have a basic understanding of the infrastructure, I think it's high time we go on to take a practical approach. So we're going to take a quick walkthrough to understand what the GCP user interface is like. So let's just go ahead and take a look at the demo part. OK, and we'll see what we can do with Google Cloud Platform. See, let me first introduce you to the platform that Google has to offer to us. OK, so um, in Google, what you do is you first have to create a project. So let's assume that you want to set up certain resources here you would have to put that under some umbrella okay let's call it say project x so when you create a project x under that you can set up your instances you can set up your resources and do quite a few other things okay um, so that is one thing that we can do with it okay and um, what are the things that are there on a plate you see um, you see there's one project that is already there with me mm, we call it my first project this was created by default when i uh, signed up for this account yesterday okay and um, there are other things here the interface with aws and azure is a little different let me show you that as well so that we can compare them face to face right aws management console let me see how the management consoles for aws looks like so that you can compare it right i mentioned the fact that aws console or aws is smoother to use the reason i said that was because of the interface as well you see it the interface for aws is way cleaner compared it with azure and gcp okay so let me quickly sign into it and let me show you how the interface looks like okay now here with gcp you see um, we have all this information on the dashboard and if i have to look through the services i have to come here i can either pin these services to the dashboard for easy access um, but in order to look at the services, see, I have to scroll down like this, right? I have to look for those particular tools and look what services are there on the plate. Amazon Web Services is easier, right? You just click on services and everything gets organized here. You can even decide how to group it, these services, how to uh, put forth these services under one channel, okay? Uh, you can even search for a particular service if you know its name. So I search for S3, you see it gets shown here right away. And just like I showed that you have option of pinning it to dashboard here, here too you can pin your services. You click on it and say you pick up a particular service. Since we talked about S3, let me pin S3 only. Okay, I just pick it and drop it here. And there you go, my S3 service is pinned. Right? I can use it from here. Let's assume that I want to unpin this service. I don't need it here. I just put it back. And there you go, it has been unpinned. So this is where the interface is smoother and easier to use is what I feel when you talk about Amazon Web Services. But that could be a personal call because I've been using Amazon Web Services for a longer while. GCP, this is how it looks. Let's continue with the discussion part. Um, I'm gonna actually go ahead and launch instances for you and I'm gonna do it in GCP as well and I'm gonna do it um, in AWS as well, just to show you how the instance launching process works in both the platforms, okay? So to do that, here basically what you do is you click on services um, if you do not have a project you will have to create one and what is the service we are looking for we are trying to launch a virtual machine or an instance here so that is your compute engine and i'll say vm instances okay i'll click on here and if i say i want to launch an instance i'd have to say create okay so let's try and do it with um, Amazon Web Services as well parallelly um, here we have a service called as EC2 okay and in EC2 we basically say launch instance here all the data would be here you see EC2 directly gives you an option of choosing what instance you want to launch so let's say I want to launch a Windows server this is free tier eligible that means I won't be charged here so I say select and I can check for the configuration. What is the um, network I want to put under it? What is the storage I want to attach to it? Security groups, right? And um, if not, I can just say launch. You just have to create a key here to log into your instance. Call it say sample key. Okay. And I just download the key pair. You need the key pair. So always ensure you have your key pair up and ready for you. And say launch the instance. Okay. There you go. So, um, instance is launched in aws here it takes a little longer compared to it you see you say instance one what is the region you want so you'll be filling in this data here as well okay 
and then you'd say just go ahead and create my instance you see it would create my instance here as well once the instance is created you see there are status checks happening here as well the instance is getting created right okay i accidentally launched a linux instance here to connect to a linux instance we need um a key generator something that we won't be able to do right now i'll show you this instance here the one that has been launched here so um, it should look similar if you launch a windows instance here okay all you have to do is wait for the status checks to happen and once that happens we can launch these instances okay um let me go back and show you something else with aws you have a service called as s3 okay when you talk about um google cloud you have something called as google storage with you okay where is the storage part okay i'm in compute engine that is why i cannot see it so here should be google storage somewhere that we can work with storage i click google storage there you go and see s3 is an object storage now google storage also lets you create buckets where you can store objects so i say create a bucket again the name for these kind of storages are always unique globally you cannot use same name again okay let's call it bucket 54321 and say continue and then you say you can select whether it should be multi region accessible or only in one region so i say one region and i say create okay similarly with s3 you can actually go ahead and say create a bucket here okay give a unique name let's call it bucket Five, four, three, two, one, and I say create. Okay, okay. The name already exists, so let's say one, two, three. Okay, and just like that, my bucket would be created. Okay, this is the bucket that I've just created. Here, I can put forth my objects, upload my objects. I say um, upload a particular file. Let's try and do that. Let's upload any file that is there with us. Let's pick this image and put it here, and just like that. my upload part is done okay you see within a second my file would be uploaded here you can add replication policies versioning policies to these files same is with google cloud as well okay now we've created a bucket here i open the bucket okay um you don't have to you can just upload a folder of file here you say upload file and i select an image here okay and there you go just like that within a minute here to the file would be added you see retentions life cycles i mean you can add life cycle management policies that means you can expire a particular object after a duration if you feel that you are not going to use it and you might forget it suppose you are using a particular file for like 15 days and after that you don't want to use it but you are in a situation where you might forget so after 15 days you can set a life cycle expiration policy where you can delete these files from here so that is what life cycle means you can set up a life cycle for the objects for the files you store same is with aws as well you can do all these things here uh, we've launched an instance here right so let's just or created one so we just need to launch it so i'm going to show you how to do that as well so let me download the remote desktop process file here okay this is something that lets you connect to your instance okay here and uh, okay it will ask me for the password first so for that i'll have to get the password we had taken up our sample key file right so i'll have to choose that file my sample key file this is the one right and i decrypt it so this is the password that lets me log into my console please note guys that when you talk about um, aws it gives you a key pair a private key is given to you public key is with aws when you combine them you can log in so i'm entering my private key here and i'm saying login and just like that my instance would be up and running you see it took us like a couple of minutes and within couple of minutes even before we created a bucket and put some data there we had a virtual machine on our disposal a windows virtual machine and if we were to do this using something like vmware i'm sure there would be a longer time duration that you would invest in doing that isn't it so this is how cloud solves quite a few problems you can see in these in this instance as well there are a lot of things that you can do it just works like a windows machine here on your system which is a separate machine you see i can open it i can close it and there are other things that i want you to see
okay so for every machine that you create there's some storage that comes attached with it okay and that is the case in case of compute services as well so um since we are talking about vms here let me come here and go here okay gcp takes longer to load for some reason you see it will give you all the details where is this located right what are the recommendations that are there okay so you can start stop close these instances as you want all of these instances come with a separate external ip and they have a storage that comes attached to it and you can even actually go ahead and add more storages to these instances okay all right guys so now that we took a look at the interface aspect of things and now let us take a look at a small amount of theory in terms of google cloud storage this is very very important for all of you all going ahead so we're going to get started with some theory and later we're going to take a look at the practical aspects of it now let us go ahead and understand google cloud storage what it is and what all can we do with it okay what is google cloud storage now there's not a lot of text here the reason for that is i don't feel that we need to discuss this a lot we've already understood what cloud storage is and when we talk about google cloud storage in specific or in particular so we are talking about a similar storage which is restful in nature and basically it lets you manage a storage on top of google cloud okay so google cloud has its has its own infrastructure and you are talking about data again that which comes in different forms it can be your um file store your object store your multimedia data your structured data right um and basically you do n number of things with it right it can be your hot storage it can be your cold storage something that we'll discuss as we get into the demo part the hot storage and cold storage part okay so it can be that kind of a storage right so these kind of storages are all um supported by a google cloud and there are different services provisions that let you store this kind of data if you talk about its features right one of the features is um i think we have these features in the next slide let me see if there are some yeah there are quite a few features here uh, and unfortunately the presentation work today done by me is not very good i've um, made some mistakes there was a mistake at the uh, first slide as well and there's a mistake here as well i've written strongly consistent twice so you might just go ahead and um ignore the mishap that i've done so um these are some of the features but apart from that there are other features as well like when you talk about it from a latency perspective that is the delay in which you request a data and the time it reaches you right uh, when you talk about um google cloud platform it gives you data at a latency of less than 10 milliseconds i'm sure none of us can even count 10 milliseconds right so that is the lesser amount of time um it takes to actually go ahead and deliver the data to you apart from that um google claims that its data is infinitely scalable that means there's no upper limit to which you want to scale to and they cannot support that that is what it means literally but again i'm sure everything has a limit but what they're trying to put forth is the amount of data this world has they can handle any amount of data is what they're trying to say so um that is one of the features it offers right again what are the kind of storage services it offers that we'll discuss at length as we move further these are some of the features it offers single api for all storage classes um so when you talk about an interface right application programming interface or protocol interfaces these are something that let you communicate with your data with your applications right so with a single api you can communicate with different storage classes in hand the next thing is it's highly durable it says 11 nines right so that is 99. Point, what 9 times 9 that is something like that so it is that durable that available as well that means to give you an example let's assume that your data center is available 24/7 in a year if this data center goes down which happens rarely but even if it does to the max it will go down for like 20 minutes so that is what 99.9 times durability means okay so um highly scalable high performance i've talked that it google claims that it can scale as high as you want right performance again we've talked about the 10 millisecond thing and strongly consistent now what do you mean by strongly consistent so when we say strongly consistent data right let's take this to the database part right so if you talk about a database not every database is designed similarly so when you look at it from a developer's perspective 
when you try to put forth some amount of data on any particular resource right or on a particular database now the schema for that database would be different from other databases and this is highly likely to happen now in that case when you try to move your data when you try to transact data across different databases a developer might face a lot of problems if the schemas are different what google cloud platform does is it gives you consistency when having these schemas in place these databases in place so that as a developer your read writes your transactions are highly consistent okay so these are some of the features that google cloud store offers let's just go ahead and understand what are the different storages or services that it offers so guys we'll divide this discussion in two pointers one we'll understand the different types of stores or storages it offers and then we'll discuss the different types of databases it offers because it is little critical when we talk about cloud storages to understand databases as well google cloud storage services that are there on a plate right first one is your cloud storage which lets you store data in the form of blobs objects and files not just sorry not files objects and blobs basically okay if you're talking about file systems you have a file store which stores data in form of file systems okay so when you talk about cloud storage that we have on a screen right um, it lets you store uh, data in the form of objects as well it can be your images right it can be um, your videos and stuff like that right so we'll see how this works in the demo part then you have your persistent disks does anyone know the difference between what a persistent storage is and an ephemeral storage is please try answering this question without googling it that would be really nice okay so just tell me what a persistent storage is to start with we'll discuss this at stretch how it is different when you talk about it from a cloud perspective okay so let your questions sorry let your answers come in meanwhile um cloud storage for firebase so firebase again this is a little tricky to understand to start with basically we are talking about data that is getting stored okay uh, it can be in your objects as well and when you say a firebase there's a different layer of security that we add to our firebase to ensure that our data is secure there so that is what this particular service lets you do okay then you have your data transfer services now guys when we talk about data one your data moves from one resource to the other it can move from one class to the other as well or in many cases it can move from one application to the other and in worst case from an on-premise resource to your cloud platform you see so your data can transfer from anywhere to anywhere and this happens vice versa as well okay so um, to transfer this data we need certain set of services so what data transfer services does is they let you transfer data one over the network another one physically okay so that is what your data transfer services let you do so we've discussed these things in a nutshell so when you talk about uh, persistent data store we are talking about that data store okay which again is something that we can um, actually go ahead and keep hold of even when um, the connecting device is not there first of all to understand this point i'll have to make sense of what am i talking about the connecting device when i say a connecting device okay so basically when you talk about virtual machines or instances or anything that we launch on our cloud platform that has a storage attached to it now for this storage to survive or this storage to operate we always need this virtual machine just like in a laptop right we have hard drives so even though your hard drive can hold like tbs of data right gbs of data but in order to take a look at that data you need some machine on which you can see that data right say for example if i have images in my hard drive unless and until i connect it to a laptop i cannot see those images right so i need my laptop functioning for that so this kind of storage is something that is dependent on your virtual machines on your systems to have an access to that data now when you talk about this data source maybe your hard drive or in this case your disks so there are two types of it okay so this kind of storage falls under two brackets one is your ephemeral storage something that dies when your instance or system dies and the other one is your persistent storage you can create this separately and then attach it to your system so in order to access this storage you'll be needing a system but even if the system is dead the storage would be there somewhere 
you can connect it to other system and access it just like our hard drive so this is what a persistent storage is all about let's now go ahead and talk about the databases part right so um, I believe the storage part is clear to you what cloud storage is, what persistent storage is, how file stores work, how Google Cloud storage for Firebase works and what data transfer services are. Let's now go ahead and go ahead and talk about some other pointers, right? Let's try and understand what Bigtable is, what Cloud SQL is, what Cloud Spanner is, what Cloud Data Store is. Now as I've mentioned, these are your data stores, database stores to be frank. So this is where your structured data lies in. So when you talk about Bigtable, it handles data that is SQL in nature, that is structured in nature and no SQL in nature. That is not only structured. That means it can be semi-structured as well. So since we are talking about big data uh, evolution, big data world, we are dealing with data that may not always be very structured. It would be structured in some forms. You'll have your key value, uh, key value pairs and stuff like that but it won't be very, very structured. So that is something we call it as semi-structured data. So when you talk about semi-structured data these days, um, the amount of data that we generate is mostly semi-structured because we are generating data in heaps and bounces. So that is where your big table, your cloud spanner comes into picture, okay? And uh, not cloud spanner, sorry, your cloud data store. So your big table and cloud data store basically lets you store your data, right? Um, in SQL and NoSQL manner as well. Bigtable in specific is more useful when you talk about dealing with data that is for analytics purposes. Whereas when you talk about cloud data store, it can let you store data that deals with applications, mobile applications and stuff like that. Okay. Now, apart from that, we have other storages that focus on your SQL kind of data, right? So you have a cloud SQL. This is mostly used to deal with your relational databases. Okay. So whatever relational database requ requirements that you have that can be handled by your cloud SQL database. And then you have your cloud spanner, which basically lets you hold data again, which is SQL in nature, but it gives you more availability and more scalability when you compare it with your cloud SQL. So guys, this was about the theory part. Since we've lost some important minutes in the discussion, or sorry, in the power cut, right? So let's just go back and take a look at the demo. Let's see how cloud storage works on top of Google Cloud, okay? So let's just go ahead and switch into the Google Cloud console. All right, guys, so this is gonna be the last demo. Here, we're gonna be taking a look at, uh, you know, Google Cloud services to a good amount of detail, right? So let's begin. Okay, so guys, let's just go ahead and take a look at the demo part. and see what we can do with our cloud storage, okay? Um, for that, I'm gonna sign up into my console. I'm gonna just look for GCP to go ahead with. To be very honest with you guys, I use GCP lesser compared to the other platforms. I've been more um, adept in using AWS and Azure or more familiar in using those because I've spent a lot of time working on those uh, platforms. Uh, Google Cloud Platform is fairly new for me, but it is something that gives me um, a lot of pleasure when I work with Google Cloud Platform because this is also called as the new baby of this cloud computing world and there's so many things that you can do with it. Okay, so let's just go ahead and see how storages work here, right? So if I scroll down, I'll be having my storage options with me. Okay, you see, you have a big table, you have a data store. In data store, you have options of entities, dashboards, indexes and getting in all these things you have your file store here so you can store your data um, or your file systems here okay in your file system here sorry not in fire store okay and then you have your storage so if you click on storage you'll see that okay uh, you have option of storing these kinds of data here i've mentioned right when you talk about a cloud storage you can store data in different forms different ways so that is what a cloud storage lets you do so let's just go ahead and click on browser data right So you see, there's a bucket that has been created already. Um, I'm gonna delete this. Because it has been active for a fairly long time and I don't want to incur any charges here. 
So guys, this is a free tier account that I'm using. That means uh, there are quite a few resources that are made available to me free of cost. So you would want to create a free tier account if you're interested in these things and we can, I mean, you can avail benefits of doing that. So let's just go ahead and take a look at the um, process of creating a bucket here. So guys, when you talk about a bucket, we are talking about a folder in which we can store our data, right? So uh, this kind of a storage is called as bucket object kind of a storage. So whatever file we store, it is in the form of objects that we are storing here. Okay. So let's just go ahead and create a bucket. Let's call it demo for today. Guys, note one thing. These names are unique. So if you like just go ahead and write a name, say Vishal's bucket, there's a high probability that somebody's already taken that name because these names are unique globally. So be careful when you choose your names. Okay. So, I mean, there's nothing about being uh, careful. It's just that you won't be allowed to create a bucket if the name already exists or a similar bucket with same name already exists. Okay. Okay. Tips don't include sensitive information. That is fine. We are not doing that. Okay, what is the next step? Select the type of location that you want your data to be stored. Now guys, see, this is an important information. See, as you go down the ladder, you'll be charged more. Okay, if you are using a paid account. Okay, so when you create a bucket, do you want to store data in the same region? If you do that, you'll have low latency. Why? Because the what your data transfer is happening, what your data is there, it's there in one bucket only. The thing is here, it is little less when you talk about security part. Why is that? Now, when you talk about it from a security perspective, right? We are talking about our data not being backed up. We have a copy of it in one region only. When you say dual region, basically it replicates your data in two regions, giving you more availability and low latency in some cases. Okay. Multi-region here. Um, your latency is less from one perspective. If you have your data backed up in different regions and if somebody is trying to access that data from a region which is close to that particular backed up bucket, then the latency would be low. Why? Because that person would be able to access your data quickly and at a better pace, right? So that is what a multi-region does. Also, it gives you more availability. If one of the data center goes down, a backup is there in the other region, right? So you can do that as well. By default, it says multi-region, but let's have it for a single region only. We are not working on applications that need you to operate from different regions. US East one, South Carolina is the data center or the location of the data center where my data resides. So I say continue. Okay. What kind of storage do I want guys? I told you about cold storage, hot storage and different kinds of storages that we have on our plate, right? So what exactly is a cold storage, right? What can you do with a cold storage? Let's try and understand that to start with. So when you say a cold storage, right? Basically, we are talking about archival storage. Now what that is, I'll come to a point, come to that in a minute. Okay. So first let's try and understand how data is stored here in a normal storage. So this is a normal storage is more costly for you. Why? Because you put your data there and you can access your data from there right away you put an image you can go ahead and take that image out right away okay now when you talk about the other storages you see here then there's a near line storage now these start falling under your archival storage what is an archival storage or a cold storage we are talking about that data where you put your data but you cannot access it right away retrieval time for that data is more now this data sources are cheaper now the reason the retrieval time here is more is because archival storages are meant for storing data that you might not access frequently this is something that helps you do cost cutting now when you talk about an organization 50 percent maybe its data is something that is used every day and there's other 50 percent that you use in like months or maybe in years so why pay a lot of money for using that data instead we can store that in a storage where we are getting charged lesser and the reason we get charged lesser here is because if you put that data there here or in that particular resource, you won't be able to access it right away. It will take time for you to access that data. And that is what your um, archival data is all about or archival storage is all about. You see in nearline, if you store your data, it cannot be accessed or it can be accessed once a month. Okay. If you talk about cold line, you can access this data in less than a quarter. And if you have data that you don't want to use for a year, you can put it in archival. It is the cheapest of all where you can access this data once 
in a year and for the data retrieval these resources charge you okay now let's go ahead and say continue how do you want to access your data whether it should be fine grained or whether it should be uniform it says that specific access to individual objects by using object level permission in addition to your buckets that is by using IAM which is a way to access your data uniform ensure that access to all the buckets by using bucket level permissions so when you say fine grained you can define your access to an individual object right how do you want to access that object who all gets to access that object when you talk about uniform all the objects in the bucket are getting accessed in the same manner okay so you can have it uniform that should not be a problem let's say continue and the final bit is your retention policies whether you want to use a google managed key a customer managed key or do you want to add any uh, retention policies to ensure that um, you can retain this data after a duration okay so let's just go ahead and say create and just like that guys within a minute your bucket was created i was explaining it so it took a longer while else you could have done it faster okay so you see guys uh, if i click on buckets my bucket would be here so if i open this bucket i can upload files in this bucket so let's say whether i want to upload a file folder i do i want to create a new folder so i can just pick up a folder and upload it if i want i can just upload a file or i can create a new folder and then upload files on it let's say upload a file let's just upload this image there you go and see within few seconds you'll be having your file uploaded here and all the information related to your file would be somewhere here right is there any retention expiration date so when you say retention or expiration date do you want to retain that data or in some cases what you can also do is let's assume that you want to use this data only for maybe 10 days so you can set up a retention policy like 15 days and say that after 15 days just expire this data just get rid of this data because you are sure that you're not going to use it after that right accordingly you can set retention policies as well is the bucket public no it's not public right now but i can change the accesses if i want to for my bucket okay if i come here and i say see you can edit your metadata as well if you want to hmm okay this is a problem here um these are the things that has happened here i've created a bucket with different policy that is why i cannot else you get an option here right where you can actually go ahead and decide who gets to access what who gets to delete what and who gets to work on what so just go ahead and create one more bucket if you require just stick to the basic policies that you have on your plate and i'm sure that it should not be a problem for you so let's just say create a bucket again i'm gonna just call it demo bucket okay so i'm gonna stick to all the basic policies that we have okay and i'm then just gonna go ahead and say create my bucket so if we create a new bucket and just upload a file here not a folder just upload a file within a minute you'll be having your file here right you see edit permissions you can decide who the user is what the name is and what kind of access do they have is it a reader access is it owner access you can edit these things here depending upon your needs you can add new users and you can add new rules for them as well just like that and then you can control all these accesses the way you want to so I hope these pointers are making sense to you people and you've understood what are pointers that I'm trying to put forth here. Okay.
All right, guys, with this, we have come to the end of this particular module. We started out this module uh, by understanding the GCP global infrastructure. Now, after that, we made sure that we had an understanding of the user interface of GCP itself, uh, upon which uh, I told you a very important aspect of Google Cloud Platform is its storage services. So we understood all of that theoretically and also had a small demo checking it out practically as well, right? So guys, I hope all of you all are clear with all of these concepts that are discussed in this module. So guys, with this, we have come to the conclusion conclusion part of our full course in cloud computing. I hope all of you all were able to take away a good amount of knowledge, uh, you know, from this particular full course. So quickly, let us take a look at some of the important concepts that we learned over this full course, right? To start off with, we understood the basics of the domain, everything from what is cloud computing, why it's required, popular applications, uh, you know, how you should learn the domain, the top companies that use the domain, and of course, what it means to have a career in this domain as well. So module one gave you a quick introduction to know everything there is to know about this particular domain. And with module number two, we understood the current requirement and we uh, analyzed and assessed everything there is to know about the domain itself and bring it together, right? Now you can go ahead in the learning track, but if the learning track is away from what the industry is expecting, that wouldn't add value, right? So keeping that in mind, module two uh, was very carefully put together to make sure that, you know, it aligns with the industry, everything from trends, roles and responsibilities. We took a look at a couple of sample job descriptions. We understood to the amazing salary trends as well. Now, after that, in module number three, we dived right into the heart of cloud computing. We looked at it in depth. You know, how does the domain work? Is redundancy a good thing? All the types of cloud deployment, the architecture, cloud versus on-premise architecture. Uh, you know, we even took a look at, um, you know, one or two disadvantages of actually using cloud computing. Now, that is a very important thing that you guys have to know. It's actually a very common question that's asked in the interviews as well. You know, like, what are the drawbacks? Uh, because, uh, you know, the majority of the module, we always keep covering the advantages, right? But it is extremely important for you to know that. So we covered it in module number three. And with module number four, we took a look at the top cloud computing providers out there, right? Everyone from AWS, Azure, GCP, and we took a look at the popular clients of these providers as well. We, we had a quick numerical comparison between uh, what each of these providers has to offer, that is AWS versus uh, Azure versus GCP as well. So module number four covered a good amount of, uh, you know, depth in terms of cloud computing computing providers. And uh, to add on to module number four, we took a look at module number five, uh, where we had the introduction to these certifications, be it in AWS, be it in Microsoft Azure, or be it the Google Cloud Platform. The module number five is very, very important if you're very serious about your career, as you would have seen in that module. Uh, I am just saying this to reiterate the fact again. Right. After module number five came module number six. Here is where we took an in-depth uh, look at AWS. Everything from core services, compute services, storage services, network services. We took a look at AWS Honeycode and Amplify. We saw how you can build a fantastic uh, mobile application without having to use, uh, you know, any code. Right. So module number six was uh, very comprehensive in terms of getting you started with AWS. So I hope uh, this helped you a lot. Uh, similarly, with Microsoft Azure and module number seven, we took a look at how we can go on to create a website using Microsoft Azure. We took a look at a very popular library, which is Azure uh, ML. Uh, you know, we did, we, did, we did a bit of machine learning on Azure, as you saw. And of course, here as well, uh, we saw how we can implement chatbots. Right? So module number seven adds, again, a lot of value to your hands-on experience uh, with Azure. And finally, with module number eight, again, we had multiple hands-on sessions with GCP, where we took a look at the GCP global infrastructure in itself. We had a walkthrough of what the user interface is like, and we picked up one demo where, uh, you know, we took a look at Google Cloud Storage Services to a good amount of detail. So with these uh, particular modules, uh, you know, we do believe that it is uh, put, it has been put together in a very structured way, considering the industry, considering absolute beginners. Uh, so to make sure that, you know, all of you all who are watching this video can uh, get the full benefits out of it, guys. So with this, uh, I hope, uh, you know, I was able to provide a good amount of knowledge uh, in this particular domain of cloud computing. Uh, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you on the next one. Okay, so I don't know the thank you part. There might be a conclusion. Okay, wait. Oh, okay. Okay. So uh, the edit instruction here is before the conclusion part, uh, this part where I talk about cloud computing online and cloud computing specializations, you have to cut this out from module number five and paste the same thing here as well. Copy that exact same thing, paste it here again, and then just, uh, you know, just put a thank you know, on this slide, uh, just put myself saying thank you, right? So if you want, I can say that again. 
So all right guys thank you so much for watching this particular video uh, you know uh, make sure to subscribe to the great learning youtube channel and make sure you guys are checking out great learning academy we have fantastic courses and even uh, you know detailed look at career paths so make sure you guys are checking out great learning academy as well so guys on that note stay safe take all the required measures and of course keep learning we'll be more than uh, happy to see you on the next couple of videos cheers I want to introduce you to Great Learning Academy. This is a free initiative by Great Learning where you get access to over 200 plus courses with 1000 plus hours of free content on all of the trending high demand domains that we have be it uh, data science, machine learning, artificial intelligence, programming, cloud computing, digital marketing, devops, management and a lot more absolutely free. Now we have award winning academicians and leading industry experts who design all of these courses and the best part you can also get a free certificate of completion when you enroll and complete all of these free courses you will of course get access to all the presentations be it the code notebooks data sets and the quizzes as well so as of now we have courses in english and hindi you can use these multilingual approach to make sure that you have the best learning experience possible in the language that you are comfortable with so So make sure you check out the description box of this video to get access to all of the relevant courses on Great Learning Academy. So what are you waiting for? Register now and start your learning journey today. If you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, I want to request you to hit the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell. This is done to make sure you do not miss out on any of the new updates or video releases from Great Learning. And of course, guys, if you enjoy this video, show us some love and do like this video. Knowledge increases by sharing, right? So make sure you share this video with your friends, colleague and everyone who can make use of it. And at the end of it, make sure to comment on the video if you have any queries or any suggestions and i'll be more than happy to respond to all of your comments